the gospel mystery of sanctification by walter marshall that we may acceptably perform the duties of holiness and righteousness required in the law our first work is to learn the powerful and effectual means whereby we may attain to so great an end explication this direction may serve instead of a preface to prepare the understanding and attention of the reader for those that follow and first it acquainteth you with the great end for which all those means are designed that are the principal subject to be here treated of the scope of all is to teach you how you may attain to that practice and manner of life which we call holiness righteousness or godliness obedience true religion and which god requires of us in the law particularly in the moral law summed up in the ten commandments and more briefly in those two great commandments of love to god and our neighbour matthew twenty two twenty seven and thirty nine and more largely explained throughout the holy scriptures my work is to show how the duties of this law may be done when they are known therefore expect not that i should delay my intent to help you to the knowledge of them by any large exposition of them which is a work already performed in several catechisms and commentaries yet that you may not miss the mark for wanting of discerning it take notice in a few words that the holiness which i would bring you to is spiritual romans seven fourteen it consists not only in external works of piety and charity but in the holy thoughts imaginations and affections of the soul and chiefly in love from whence all other good works must flow or else they are not acceptable to god not only in refraining the execution of sinful lusts but in longing and delighting to do the will of god and in a cheerful obedience to god without repining fretting grudging at any duty as if it were a grievous yoke and burden to you take notice further that the law which is your mark is exceeding broad psalm a hundred and nineteen ninety six and yet not the more easy to be hit because you must aim to hit it in every duty of it with a performance of equal breadth or else you cannot hit it at all james two ten the lord is not at all loved with that love that is due to him as lord of all if he be not loved with all our heart spirit and might we are to love everything in him his justice holiness sovereign authority all seeing eye and all his decrees commands judgments and all his doings we are to love him not only better than other things but singly as only good the fountain of all goodness and to reject all fleshly and worldly enjoyments even our own lives as if we hated them when they stand in competition with our enjoyment of him or our duty towards him we must love him so as to yield ourselves wholly up to his constant service in all things and to his disposal of us as our absolute lord whether it be for prosperity or adversity life or death and for his sake we are to love our neighbour even all men whether they be friends or foes to us and so do to them in all things that concern their honour life chastity worldly wealth credit and content whatever we would that men should do to us in the like condition matthew seven twelve this spiritual universal obedience is the great end to the attainment whereof i am directing you and that you may not reject my enterprise as impossible observe that the most i promise is no more than an acceptable performance of these duties of the law such as our gracious merciful god will certainly delight in and be pleased with during our state of imperfection in this world and such as will end in perfection of holiness and all happiness in the world to come before i proceed further stay your thoughts a while in the contemplation of the great dignity and excellency of these duties of the law that you may aim at the performance of them as your end with so high an esteem as may cast an amiable lustre upon the ensuing discovery of the means the principal duties of love to god above all and to each other for his sake from whence all the other duties flow are so excellent that i cannot imagine any more noble work for the holy angels in their glorious sphere they are the chief works for which we were at first framed in the image of god engraven upon man in the first creation and for which that beautiful image is renewed upon us in our new creation and sanctification by jesus christ and shall be perfected in our glorification they are works which depend not merely on the sovereignty of the will of god to be commanded or forbidden or left indifferent or changed or abolished at his pleasure as other works that belong either to the judicial or ceremonial law or to the means of salvation prescribed by the gospel but they are in their own nature holy just and good romans seven twelve and meet for us to perform because of our natural relation to our creator and fellow creatures so that they have an inseparable dependence upon the holiness of the will of god and an indispensable establishment thereby 
they are works sufficient to render the performers holy in all manner of conversation by the fruits which they bring forth if no other duties had ever been commanded and by which the performance of all other duties is sufficiently established as soon as they are commanded and without which there can be no holiness of heart and life imagined and to which it was one great honour of mosaical and is now of evangelical ordinances to be subservient for the performance of them as means which shall cease when their end this never-failing charity is perfectly attained 1 Corinthians 13. They are duties which we were naturally obliged to, by that reason and understanding which God gave to man at his first creation, to discern what was just and meet for him to do, and to which even heathens are still obliged by the light of nature, without any written law or supernatural revelation. Romans 2, 14 and 15. Therefore they are called natural religion, and the law that requires them is called the natural law, and also the moral law, because the manners of all men, infidels as well as Christians, ought to be conformed to it and if they had been fully conformable they would not have come short of eternal happiness matthew five nineteen luke ten twenty seven and twenty eight under the penalty of the wrath of god for the violation of it this is the true morality which god approves of consisting in a conformity of all our actions to the moral law and so if those who in these days contend so highly for morality understand no other than this i dare join with them in asserting that the best morally honest man is the greatest saint and that morality is the principal part of true religion and the test of all other parts without which faith is dead and all other religious performances are a vain show and mere hypocrisy for the faithful and true witness has testified concerning the two great moral commandments of love to god and our neighbour that there is no other commandment greater than these and that on them hang all the law and the prophets matthew twenty two thirty six thirty eight thirty nine and forty mark twelve thirty one the second thing contained in this introductory direction is the necessity of learning the powerful and effectual means whereby this great and excellent end may be accomplished and of making this the first work to be done before we can expect success in any attempt for the attainment of it this is a very needful premonition because many are apt to skip over the lesson concerning the means that will fill up this whole treatise as superfluous and useless when once they know the nature and excellency of the duties of the law they account nothing wanting but diligent performance and they rush blindly upon immediate practice making more haste than good speed they are quick in promising exodus nineteen eight all that the lord hath spoken we will do without sitting down and counting the cost they look upon holiness as only the means of an end eternal salvation not as an end itself requiring any great means for attaining the practice of it the inquiry of most when they begin to have a sense of religion is what good thing shall i do that i may have eternal life matthew nineteen sixteen not how shall i be enabled to do anything that is good yea many who are accounted powerful preachers spend all their zeal in earnestly pressing the immediate practice of the law without any discovery of the effectual means of performance as if the works of righteousness were like those servile employments that need no skill and artifice at all but industry and activity that you may not stumble at the threshold of a religious life by this common oversight i shall endeavour to make you sensible that it is not enough for you to know the matter and reason of your duty but that you are also to learn the powerful and effectual means of performance before you can successfully apply yourselves to immediate practice and for this end i shall lay before you the considerations following first we are all by nature void of all strength and ability to perform acceptably that holiness and righteousness which the law requires and are dead in trespasses and sins and children of wrath by the sin of our first father adam as the scripture witnesses romans five twelve fifteen eighteen and nineteen ephesians two one two and three romans eight seven and eight this doctrine of original sin which protestants generally profess is a firm basis and groundwork to the assertion now to be proved and to many other assertions in this whole discourse if we believe it to be true we cannot rationally encourage ourselves to attempt a holy practice until we are acquainted with some powerful and effectual means to enable us for it while man continued upright in the image of god as he was at first created ecclesiastes seven nineteen genesis one twenty seven he could do the will of god sincerely as soon as he knew it but when he was fallen he was quickly afraid because of his nakedness and could not help it at all until god discovered to him the means of restoration genesis three ten and fifteen say to a strong healthy servant go and he goeth come and he cometh do this and he doeth but a bedridden servant must know first how he may be enabled no doubt the fallen angels know the necessity of holiness and tremble at the guilt of their sin but they know of no means for them to attain to holiness effectually and so continue still in their wickedness it was in vain for samson to say i will go out as at other times before and shake myself when he had sinned away his strength judges sixteen twenty 
men show themselves strangely forgetful or hypocritical in professing original sin in their prayers catechisms and confessions of faith yet urging upon themselves and others the practice of the law without the consideration of any strengthening enlivening means as if there were no want of ability but only of activity secondly those that doubt of or deny the doctrine of original sin may all of them know concerning themselves if their conscience be not blind that the exact justice of god is against them and they are under the curse of god and sentence of death for their actual sins if god should enter into judgment with them romans one thirty two 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 and three nine galatians three ten is it possible for a man who knows this to be his case and has not learned any means of getting out of it to practice the law immediately to love god and everything in him his justice holiness power as well as his mercy and to yield himself willingly to the disposal of god though god should inflict sudden death upon him is there no skill or artifice at all required in this case to encourage the fainting soul to the practice of universal obedience thirdly though heathens might know much of the work of the law by the common light of natural reason and understanding romans two fourteen yet the effectual means of performance cannot be discovered by that light and therefore are they to be wholly learned by the teaching of supernatural revelation for what is our natural light but some sparks and glimmerings of that which was in adam before the fall and even then in its brightest meridian it was not sufficient to direct adam how to recover ability to walk wholly if once he should lose it by sin nor to assure him beforehand that god would vouchsafe to him any means of recovery god had set nothing but death before his eyes in case of transgression genesis two seventeen and therefore he hid himself from god when the shame of his nakedness appeared as expecting no favour from him we are like sheep gone astray and know not which way to return until we hear the shepherd's voice can these dry bones live to god in holiness o lord thou knowest and we cannot know except we learn it of thee fourthly sanctification whereby our hearts and lives are conformed to the law is a grace of god communicated to us by means as well as justification and by means of teaching and learning something that we cannot see without the word acts twenty six seventeen and eighteen there are several things pertaining to life and godliness that are given through knowledge two peter one two and three there is a form of doctrine made use of by god to make people free from sin and servants of righteousness romans six seventeen and eighteen and there are several pieces of the whole armour of god necessary to be known and put on that we may stand against sin and satan in the evil day ephesians six thirteen shall we slight and overlook the way of sanctification when the learning of the way of justification has been accounted worth so many elaborate treatises fifthly god has given in the holy scriptures by his inspiration plentiful instruction in righteousness that we may be thoroughly furnished for every good work two timothy three sixteen and seventeen especially since the day spring from on high hath visited us by the appearance of the lord jesus christ to guide our feet in the way of peace luke one seventy eight and seventy nine if god condescend to us so very low to teach us this way in the scriptures and by christ it must needs be greatly necessary for us to sit down at his feet and learn it sixthly the way of attaining to godliness is so far from being known without learning out of the holy scriptures that when it is here plainly revealed we cannot learn it so easily as the duties of the law which are known in part by the light of nature and therefore the more easily assented to it is the way whereby the dead are brought to live unto god and therefore doubtless it is far above all the thoughts and conjectures of human wisdom it is the way to salvation wherein god will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent by discovering things by his spirit that the natural man receiveth not for they are foolishness to him neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned one corinthians one nineteen and thirty one and two fourteen without controversy great is the mystery of godliness one timothy three sixteen the learning of it requires double work because we must unlearn many of our former deeply rooted notions and become fools that we may be wise we must pray earnestly to the lord to teach us as well as search the scriptures that we may get this knowledge o oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes teach me o lord the way of thy statutes and i shall keep it unto the end psalm one hundred nineteen five and thirty three teach me to do thy will psalm one hundred forty three ten the lord direct your hearts into the love of god two thessalonians three five surely these saints did not so much want teaching and direction concerning the duties of the law to be done as concerning the way and means whereby they might do them seventhly the certain knowledge of these powerful and effectual means is of the greatest importance and necessity for our establishment in the true faith and avoiding errors contrary thereto for we cannot rationally doubt that the moral duties of love to god and our neighbour are absolutely necessary to true religion so that it cannot subsist without them 
and from this principle we may firmly conclude that nothing repugnant to the practice of these holy duties ought to be received as a point of faith delivered to us by the most holy god and that whatsoever is truly necessary powerful and effectual to bring us to the practice of them ought to be believed as proceeding from god because it has the image of his holiness and righteousness engraven upon it this is a sure test and touchstone which those who are seriously religious will use to try spirits and their doctrines whether they be of god or not and they cannot rationally approve any doctrine as religious that is not according to godliness one timothy six three by this touchstone christ proves his doctrine to be of god because therein he seeks the glory of god john seven seventeen and eighteen and he teaches us to know false prophets by their fruits matthew seven fifteen and sixteen wherein the fruits which their doctrine tends unto are especially to be considered hence it appears that until we know what are the effectual means of holiness and what not we want a necessary touchstone of divine truth and may be easily deceived by false doctrine or brought to live in mere suspense concerning the truth of any religion like the seekers and if you mistake and think those means to be effectual that are not and those that are effectual to be weak or of a contrary effect your error in this will be a false touchstone to try other doctrines whereby you will readily approve of errors and refuse the truth which has been a pernicious occasion of many errors in religion in late days get but a true touchstone by learning this lesson and you will be able to try the various doctrines of protestants papists arminians sicinians antinomians quakers and to discover the truth and cleave to it with much satisfaction to your judgment amongst all the janglings and controversies of these times hereby you may discover whether the protestant religion established among us have in it any sinews of antinomianism whether it be guilty of any insufferable defect in practical principles and deserves to be altered and turned almost upside down with new doctrines and methods as some learned men in late times have judged by their touchstones eighthly it is also of great importance and necessity for our establishment in holy practice for we cannot apply ourselves to the practice of holiness with hope of success except we have some faith concerning the divine assistance which we have no ground to expect if we use not such means as god has appointed to work by god meeteth them that remember him in his own ways isaiah sixty four verse five and makes a breach upon them that seek him not after the due order one chronicles fifteen thirteen he has chosen and ordained such means of sanctification and salvation as are for his own glory and those only he blesses to us and he crowns no man that strives except he strive lawfully two timothy two five experience shows plentifully both of heathens and christians how pernicious ignorance or mistaking of those effectual means is to holy practice the heathens generally fell short of an acceptable performance of those duties of the law which they knew because of their ignorance in this point one many christians content themselves with external performances because they never knew how they might attain to spiritual service two and many reject the way of holiness as austere and unpleasant because they know not how to cut off a right hand or pluck out a right eye without intolerable pain whereas they would find the ways of wisdom if they knew them to be ways of pleasantness and all her paths to be peace proverbs three seventeen this occasions the putting off repentance from time to time as an uncouth thing three Many others set upon the practice of holiness with a fervent zeal and run very fast, but tread not to step in the right way, and find themselves frequently disappointed and overcome by their lusts. They at last give over the work and turn to wallow again in the mire, which has occasioned several treatises to show how far a reprobate may go in the way of religion, whereby many weak saints are discouraged, accounting that these reprobates have gone further than themselves, whereas most of them never knew the right way, nor trod one step aright in it, for few there be that find it. Matthew 7.14 for some of those ignorant zealots do inhumanly macerate their bodies with fasting and other austerities to kill their lusts and when they see their lusts are still too hard for them they fall into despair and are driven by horror of conscience to make away with themselves wickedly to the scandal of religion peradventure god may bless my discovery of the powerful means of holiness so far as to save some one or other from killing himself and such a fruit as this would countervail my labour though i hope god will enlarge the hearts of many by it to run with great cheerfulness joy and thanksgiving in the ways of his commandments direction two several endowments and qualifications are necessary to enable us for the immediate practice of the law particularly we must have an inclination and propensity of our hearts thereunto and therefore we must be well persuaded of our reconciliation with god and of our future enjoyment of the everlasting heavenly happiness and of sufficient strength both to will and perform all duties acceptably until we come to the enjoyment of that happiness explication those means that are next to the attainment of the great end aimed at 
are first to be discovered that we may learn how to get them by other means expressed in the following directions. Therefore, I have named here several qualifications and endowments that are necessary to make up that holy frame and state of the soul, whereby it is furnished and enabled to practice the law immediately, and that not only in the beginning but in the continuation of that practice. And therefore, note diligently that these endowments must continue in us during the present life, or else our ability for a holy life will be lost, and they must be before practice, not in any distance of time, but only as the cause is before the effect. I do not say that I have named particularly all such necessary qualifications, but this much I dare say that he who gains these may, by the same means, gain any other that should be ranked with them. And this is a matter worthy of our serious consideration, for few understand that any special endowments are required to furnish us for a holy practice more than for other voluntary actions. The first Adam had excellent endowments bestowed upon him for a holy practice when he was first created according to the image of God, and the second Adam had endowments more excellent to enable him for a harder task of obedience. And seeing obedience is grown more difficult by reason of the opposition and temptations that it meets with since the fall of Adam, we that are to be imitators of Christ have need of very choice endowments as Christ had, at least as good or something better than Adam had at first, as our work is harder than his. What king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able, with ten thousand, to meet him that cometh against him, with twenty thousand? And shall we dare to rush into battle against all the powers of darkness, all worldly terrors and allurements, and our own inbred domineering corruptions, without considering whether we have sufficient spiritual furniture to stand in the evil day? Yet many content themselves with such an ability to will and do their duty, as they would have to be given to men universally, whereby they are no better enabled for the spiritual battle than the generality of the world, that lie vanquished under the wicked one, and therefore their standing is not at all secured by it. It is a hard matter to find what this universal ability is, that so many contend so earnestly for, of what it consisteth, by what means it is conveyed to us and maintained. Bodily agility has spirits, nerves, ligaments, bones to subsist by, but this spiritual universal ability seems to be some occult quality that no sufficient account can be given how it is conveyed, or of what it is constituted, that none may deceive themselves and miscarry in their enterprises for holiness by depending on such a weak occult quality. I have here showed four endowments of which a true ability for the practice of holiness must necessarily be constituted, and by which it must subsist and be maintained. I intend to show afterwards by what means they are given to us, and whether the inclination or propensity here mentioned be perfect or imperfect. And they are of such a mysterious nature that some who own the necessity of endowments to frame them for holiness are prone to think that less than these will serve, and that some of these frame us rather for licentiousness than holiness, as they are here placed before any actual performance of the moral law, and that some things, contrary to them, would put us into a better frame for holiness. Against all such surmises I shall endeavour such a demonstration of these endowments particularly as may gain the assent of right reason, insisting on them in the same order wherein I have placed them in the direction. In the first place I assert that an inclination and propensity of heart to the duties of the law is necessary to frame and enable us for the immediate practice of them, and I mean not such a blind propensity as inanimate creatures and brutes have to their natural operations, but such a one as is meet for intelligent creatures, whereby they are, by the guidance of reason, prone and bent to approve and choose their duty, and averse to the practice of sin. And therefore I have intimated that the three or other endowments mentioned in the direction are subservient to this as the chief of all which is sufficient to make it a rational propensity. This is contrary to those who out of zeal for obedience, but not according to knowledge, contend so earnestly for free will as a necessary and sufficient endowment to enable us to perform our duty when once we are convinced of it, and of our obligation to it and who extol this endowment as a great benefit that universal redemption has blessed all mankind with, though they consider this free will without any actual inclination to good, yea, they cannot but acknowledge that, in most of mankind that have it, it is encumbered with an actual bent and propensity of the heart altogether to evil. Such a free will as this is can never free us from slavery to sin and Satan, and fit us for the practice of the law, and therefore is not worthy the pains of those that contend so hotly for it. Neither is the will so free as is necessary for the practice of holiness until it be endued with an inclination and propensity thereunto, as may appear by the following arguments. 
first the duties of the law are of such a nature that they cannot possibly be performed while there is wholly an aversion or mere indifference of the heart to the performance of them and no good inclination and propensity toward the practice of them because the chief of all the commandments is to love the lord with our whole heart might and soul to love everything that is in him to love his will and all his ways and to like them as good and all duties must be influenced in their performance by this love we must delight to do the will of god it must be sweeter to us than the honey or honeycomb psalm forty eight job twenty three twelve psalm sixty three one a hundred and nineteen twenty and nineteen ten and this love liking delight longing thirsting sweet relishing must be continued to the end and the first indeliberate motion of lust must be regulated by love to god and our neighbour and sin must be lusted against galatians five seventeen and abhorred psalm thirty six four if it were true obedience as some would have it to love our duty only as a market man loves foul ways to the market or as a sick man loves an unpleasant medicinal potion or as a captive slave loves his hard work for fear of a greater evil then it might be performed with averseness or want of inclination but we must love it as the market man gain as the sick man health as pleasant meat and drink as the captive liberty doubtless there can be no power in the will for this kind of service without an agreeableness of our inclination to the will of god a heart according to his own heart an aversion of our hearts from sin and a kind of antipathy against sin for we know the proverb like loveth like there must be an agreeableness in the person or thing beloved to the disposition of the lover love to god must flow from a pure heart one timothy one five a heart cleansed from evil propensities and inclinations and reason will tell us that the first motions of lust which fall not under choice and deliberation cannot be avoided without a fixed propensity of the heart to holiness secondly the image of god wherein god according to his infinite wisdom judged it meet to frame the first adam in righteousness and true holiness and uprightness genesis one twenty seven ephesians four twenty four ecclesiastes seven twenty nine consisted in an actual bent and propensity of heart to the practice of holiness not in a mere power of will to choose good or evil for this in itself is neither holy nor unholy but only a groundwork on which either the image of god or of satan may be drawn nor in an indifference of propensity to the choice of sin or duty for this is a wicked disposition in an intelligent creature that knows his duty and fits us only to halt between god and baal god set adam's soul at first wholly in a right bent and inclination though adam might act contrary to it if he would as we may be ural inclinations and it is easy to fail of our duty as we may be prevailed upon to do some things contrary to our natural inclinations and it is easy to fail of our duty though great preparation and furniture be required for the performance of it the second adam also the lord jesus christ was born a holy thing luke one thirty five with a holy disposition of his soul and propensity to goodness and can we reasonably hope to arise to the life of holiness from which the first adam fell or to be imitators of christ since duty is made so difficult by the fall if we be not renewed in a measure according to the same image of god and enabled with such a propensity and inclination thirdly original corruption whereby we are dead to god and godliness from the birth and made willing slaves to the performance of all actual sins until the son of god make us free consists in a propensity and inclination of the heart to sin and averseness to holiness without this propensity to sin what can that law of sin in our members be that warreth against the law of our mind and leadeth us captive to the service of sin romans seven twenty three what is that poison in us for which men may be called serpents vipers what is that spirit of whoredoms in men by reason of which they will not frame their doings to turn to god hosea five four how is the tree first corrupt and then its fruit corrupt matthew twelve thirty three how can man be said to be abominable and filthy that drinketh iniquity like water job fifteen sixteen how should the mind of the flesh be continual enmity to the law of god romans eight seven i know there is also a blindness of understanding and other things belonging to original corruption which conduce to this evil propensity of the will but yet this propensity itself is the great evil the indwelling sin which produces all actual sins and must of necessity be removed or restrained by restoring that contrary inclination wherein the image of god consists or else we shall be backward and reprobate to every good work and whatever freedom the will has it shall be employed only in the service of sin fourthly god restores his people to holiness by giving to them a new heart and a new spirit and taking away the heart of stone out of their flesh and giving them a heart of flesh ezekiel thirty six twenty six and twenty seven 
and he circumciseth their heart to love him with their whole heart and soul. And he requires that we should be transformed in the renewing of our mind, that we may prove what is his acceptable will. Romans 12.2 And David prays for the same end that God would create in him a clean heart, and renew a right spirit within him. Psalm 51.10 if any one can judge that this new, clean, circumcised heart, this heart of flesh, this new right spirit, is such a one as has no actual inclination and propensity to good, but only a power to choose good or evil, undeservedly called free will, with a present inclination to evil, or an indifference of propensity to both contraries, it will not be worth my labour to convince such a judgment, only let him consider whether David could account such a heart to be clean and right when he prayed, Psalm 119.36, Incline mine heart unto thy testimonies, and not to covetousness. The second endowment necessary to enable us for the immediate practice of holiness, and concurring with the two others that follow to work in us a rational propensity to this practice, is that we be well persuaded of our reconciliation with God. We must reckon that the breach of amity which sin has made between God and us is made up by a firm reconciliation to his love and favour and herein i include the great benefit of justification as the means whereby we are reconciled to god which is described in scripture either by forgiving our sins or by the imputation of righteousness to us romans four five six and seven because both are contained in one and the same justifying act as one act of illumination comprehends expulsion of darkness and introduction of light one act of repentance contains mortification of sin and vivification to righteousness and every motion from anything to its contrary is but one and the same though it may be expressed by diverse names with respect to either of the two contrary terms the one of which is abolished the other introduced by it this is a great mystery, contrary to the apprehensions not only of the vulgar, but of some learned divines, that we must be reconciled to God and justified by the remission of our sins and imputation of righteousness before any sincere obedience to the law that we may be enabled for the practice of it. They account that this doctrine tends to the subversion of a holy practice and is a great pillar of antinomianism, and that the only way to establish sincere obedience is to make it rather a condition to be performed before our actual justification and reconciliation with God. Therefore some late divines have thought fit to bring the doctrine of former Protestants concerning justification to their anvil and to hammer it into another form, that it might be more free from antinomianism and effectual to secure a holy practice. But their labour is vain and pernicious, tending to antinomian profaneness or painted hypocrisy at best. Neither can the true practice of holiness be secure, except the persuasion of our justification and reconciliation with God be first obtained, without works of the law, that we may be enabled thereby to do them, as I shall now prove by several arguments, intending also to show in the following directions that such a persuasion of the love of God, as God giveth to his people, tends only to holiness, though a mispersuasion of it be in many an occasion of licentiousness. First, when the first Adam was framed for the practice of holiness at his creation, he was highly in the favour of God, and had no sin imputed to him, and he was accounted righteous in the sight of God, according to his present state, because he was made upright according to God's image. And there is no reason to doubt that these qualifications were his advantage for a holy practice, and the wisdom of God judged them good for that end, and as soon as he lost them, he became dead in sin. The second Adam, also in our nature, was the beloved of the Father, accounted righteous in the sight of God, without the imputation of any sin to him, except what his office was to bear on the behalf of others. And can we reasonably expect to be imitators of Christ, by performing more difficult obedience than the first Adam's was before the fall, except the like advantages be given to us by reconciliation and remission of sins, and the imputation of a righteousness given by God to us, when we have none of our own? Secondly, those that know their natural deadness under the power of sin and Satan are fully convinced that if God leave them to their own hearts, they can do nothing but sin, and that they can do no good work except it please God of his great love and mercy to work it in them. John 8.36, Philippians 2.13, Romans 8, verses 7 and 8. Therefore, that they may be encouraged and rationally inclined to holiness, they must hope that God will work savingly in them. Now I leave it to considerate men to judge whether such a hope can be well grounded without a good persuasion of such a reconciliation and saving love of God to us, as depends not upon any precedent goodness of our works, but is a cause sufficient to produce them effectually in us. Yea, we know further, if we know ourselves sufficiently, 
that our death in sin proceeded from the guilt of the first sin of Adam, and the sentence denounced against it, Genesis 2.17, and that it is still maintained in us by the guilt of sin and the curse of the law, and that spiritual life will never be given us to free us from that dominion, except this guilt and curse be removed from us, which is done by actual justification. Galatians 3, verses 13 and 14, Romans 6, verse 14. And this is sufficient to make us despair of living to God in holiness, while we apprehend ourselves to be under the curse and wrath of God, by reason of our transgressions and sins lying upon us. Ezekiel 33, verse 10. Thirdly, the nature of the duties of the law is such as requires an apprehension of our reconciliation with God, and his hearty love and favour towards us for the doing of them. The great duty is love to God with our whole heart, and not such a contemplative love as philosophers may have to the objects of science, which they are concerned in no further than to please their fancies in the knowledge of them, but a practical love whereby we are willing that God should be absolute Lord and governor over us and all the world, to dispose of us and all others according to his will, as to our temporal and everlasting condition, and that he should be the only portion and happiness of all those that are happy, a love whereby we like everything in him as he is our Lord, his justice as well as any other attribute, without wishing or desiring that he were better than he is, and whereby we desire that his will may be done upon us and all others, whether for prosperity or adversity, life or death, and whereby we can heartily praise him for all things and delight in our obedience to him in doing his will, though we suffer that which is ever so grievous to us, even present death. Consider these things well, and you may easily perceive that our spirits are not in a fit frame for the doing of them, while we apprehend ourselves under the curse and wrath of God, or while we are under prevailing suspicions that God will prove an enemy to us at last. Slavish fear may extort some slavish, hypocritical performances from us, such as that of Pharaoh in letting the Israelites go soar against his will. But the duty of love cannot be extorted and forced by fear, but it must be won and sweetly allured by an apprehension of God's love and goodness towards us, as the eminent, loving, and beloved disciple testifies, 1 John 4, verses 18 and 19, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Observe here that we cannot be beforehand with God in loving him before we apprehend his love to us and consult your own experience if you have any true love to God, whether it were not wrought in you by a sense of God's love first towards you. All the goodness and excellency of God cannot render him an amiable object to us, except we apprehend him an agreeable good to us. I question not, but the devils know the excellency of God's nature, as well as our greatest metaphysical speculators, and this only fills them the more with tormenting horror and trembling that is contrary to love. James 2 verse 19. The greater God's excellency and perfection is, the greater evil he is to us if he hate and curse us, and therefore the principle of self-preservation, deeply rooted in our natures, hinders us from loving that which we apprehend as our destruction. If a man be an enemy to us, we can love him for the sake of our loving, reconciled God, because his love will make man's hatred to work for our good. But if God himself be our enemy, for whose sake can we love him? Who is there that can free us from the evil of his enmity, and turn it to our advantage until he be pleased to reconcile himself to us? Fourthly, our conscience must of necessity be first purged from dead works, that we may serve the living God. And this is done by actual remission of sin, procured by the blood of Christ, and manifested to our consciences, as appeared by Christ's dying for this end. Hebrews 9 verses 14 and 15 and chapter 10, verses 1, 2, 4, 14, 17, and 22. That conscience whereby we judge ourselves to be under the guilt of sin and the wrath of God is accounted an evil conscience in Scripture, though it perform its office truly, because it is caused by the evil of sin, and will itself be a cause of our committing more sin, until it can judge us to be justified from all sin, and received into the favour of God. Love, which is the end of the law, must proceed from a good conscience as well as from any other cleanness of heart. 1 Timothy 1 5. David's mouth could not be opened to show forth the praise of God until he was delivered from blood guiltiness. Psalm 51 verses 14 and 15. This evil, guilty conscience, whereby we judge that God is our enemy, and that his justice is against us, to our everlasting condemnation, by reason of our sins, 
strongly maintains and increases the dominion of sin and Satan in us, and works most mischievous effects in the soul against godliness, even to bring the soul to hate God, and to wish there were no God, no heaven, no hell, so that we might escape the punishment due to us. It so disaffects people towards God, that they cannot endure to think or speak, or hear of him and his law, but strive rather to put him out of their minds by fleshly pleasures and worldly employments. And thus they are alienated from all true religion, only blinding it and stopping the mouth of it. It produces zeal in many outside religious performances, and also false religion, idolatry, and the most inhuman superstitions in the world. I have often considered by what manner of working any sin could effectually destroy the whole image of God in the first Adam, and I conclude it was by working first an evil, guilty conscience in him, whereby he judged that the just God was against him, and cursed him for that one sin. And this was enough to work a shameful nakedness by disorderly lusts, turning his love wholly from God to the creature, and a desire to be hidden from the presence of God, Genesis 3 verses 8 and 10, which was a total destruction of the image of God's holiness. And we have cause to judge that from the same cause proceeds the continual malice, rancor, rage, and blasphemy of the devil, and many notorious wicked men against God and godliness. Some may think Job uncharitable in suspecting not merely that his sons had sinned, but that they had been so abominably wicked as to curse God in their hearts. Job 1.5. But Job well understood that if the guilt of any ordinary sin lie upon the conscience, it will make the soul to wish secretly that God was not, or that he was not so just a judge, which is a secret cursing of God that cannot be avoided, until our consciences be purged from the guilt of sin, by the offering of Christ for us, which was then figured out by the burnt offerings of Job for his sons. Fifthly, God has abundantly discovered to us in his word that his method in bringing men from sin to holiness of life is first to make them know that he loves them, and that their sins are blotted out. When he gave the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, he first discovered himself to be their God, that had given them a sure pledge of his salvation by their delivery from Egypt, in the preface, Exodus 20, verse 2. And during all the time of the Old Testament, God was pleased to make the entrance into religion to be by circumcision, which was not only a sign, but also a seal of the righteousness of faith, whereby God justifies people, while they are considered as ungodly, Romans 4, verses 11 and 15. And this seal was administered to children eight days old, before they could perform any condition of sincere obedience for their justification, that their furniture for a holy practice might be ready beforehand. Furthermore, in the time of the Old Testament, God appointed diverse washings and the blood of bulls and goats, and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean to prepare and sanctify them for other parts of his worship in his tabernacle and temple, to figure out his purging their consciences from dead works by the blood of Christ, that they might serve the living God. Hebrews 9, verses 10, 13, 14, and 22. This, I say, was then figurative sanctification, as the word sanctification is taken in a large sense, comprehending all things that prepare us for the service of God, chiefly the remission of sin. Hebrews 10, verses 10, 14, and 18. Though if it be taken in a strict sense, respecting only our conformity to the law, it must necessarily be placed after justification, according to the usual method of Protestant divines. God also reminded them of the necessity of purging away their guilt first, that their service might be acceptable, by commanding them to offer the sin offering before the burnt offering. Leviticus 5 verse 8 and 16 verses 3 and 11. And lest the guilt of their sins should pollute the service of God, notwithstanding all their particular expiations, God was pleased to appoint a general atonement for all their sins, one day every year, wherein the scapegoat was to bear upon him all their iniquities into a land not inhabited. Leviticus 16 verses 22 and 34. Under the New Testament, God uses the same method in loving us first and washing us from our sins by the blood of Christ, that he may make us priests to offer the sacrifices of praise and all good works to God, even the Father. He enters us into his service by washing away our sins in baptism, he feeds and strengthens us for his service by remission of sins, given to us in the blood of Christ at the Lord's Supper. He exhorts us to obey him, because he has already loved us, and our sins are already pardoned. Forgive one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ hath loved us.
Ephesians 4.32 and 5 verses 1 and 2. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. 1 John 2 verses 12 and 15. I might quote abundance of texts of the same nature. We may clearly see by all this that God has accounted it a matter of great importance, and has condescended to take wonderful care in providing plentiful means both under the Old and New Testament, that his people might be first cleansed from guilt and reconciled to himself, to fit them for the acceptable practice of holiness. Away then with all the contrary methods of the new divinity. The third endowment necessary to enable us for the practice of holiness, without which a persuasion of our reconciliation with God would be of little efficacy to work in us a rational propensity to it, is that we be persuaded of our future enjoyment of the everlasting heavenly happiness. This must precede our holy practice, as a cause disposing and alluring us to it. This assertion has several sorts of adversaries to oppose it. Some account that a persuasion of our own future happiness before we have persevered in sincere obedience tends to licentiousness, and that the way to do good works is rather to make them a condition necessary for the procuring of this persuasion. Others condemn all works that we are allured or stirred up to by the future enjoyment of the heavenly happiness as legal, mercenary, flowing from self-love and not from any pure love to God, and they figure out sincere godliness by a man bearing fire in one hand to burn up heaven and water in the other to quench hell, intimating that the true service of God must not proceed at all from hope of reward or fear of punishment, but only from love. To establish the truth asserted against the errors that are so contrary to it and to each other, I shall propose the ensuing considerations. First, the nature of the duties of the law is such that they cannot be sincerely and universally practised without this endowment. That this endowment must be present in us is sufficiently proved already by all that I have said concerning the necessity of the persuasion of our firm reconciliation with God by our justification to prepare us for this practice because that includes a persuasion of this future happiness, or else it is of little value. All that I have to add here is that sincere obedience cannot rationally subsist except it be allured, encouraged, and supported by this persuasion. Let me therefore suppose a Sadducee, believing no happiness after this life, and put the question, Can such a one love God with his whole heart, might, and soul? Will he not think it reasonable rather to lessen and moderate his love towards God, lest he should be overmuch troubled to part with him by death. We account it most reasonable to sit loose in our affections from things that we must part with. Can such a one be satisfied with the enjoyment of God as his happiness? Will he not rather account that the enjoyment of God and all religious duties are vanities, as well as other things, because in a little time we shall have no more benefit by them than if they had never been? How can such a one be willing to lay down his life for the sake of God, when by his death he must part with God, as well as with other things? How can he willingly choose affliction rather than sin, when he shall be more miserable in this life for it, and not at all happy hereafter? I grant, if affliction come unavoidably upon such a person, he may reasonably judge that patience is better for him than impatience, but it will displease him that he is forced to the use of such a virtue, and he will be prone to fret and murmur at his Creator and to wish he had never been, rather than to endure such miseries and to be comforted only with vain, transitory enjoyments. I think I have said enough to show how unfurnished such a man is for holiness, and he that will burn up heaven and quench hell, that he may serve God out of love, thereby leaves himself little better furnished than the Sadducee. The one denies them, the other will not have them at all to be considered in this case. Secondly, the sure hope of the glory of heaven is made use of ordinarily by God since the fall of Adam as an encouragement to the practice of holiness, as the scripture abundantly shows. Christ, the great pattern of holiness, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Hebrews 12.2 And though I cannot say that the first Adam had such a sure hope to preserve him in innocence, yet he had instead of it the present possession of an earthly paradise and a happier state in it which he knew would last if he continued in holiness, or be changed into a better happiness. The apostles did not faint under affliction because they knew that it wrought for them a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. 2 Corinthians 4 verses 16 and 17 The believing Hebrews took joyfully the spoiling of their goods, knowing in themselves that they had in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Hebrews 10.34 
the Apostle Paul accounts all his sufferings unprofitable were it not for a glorious resurrection, and that Christians would be of all men most miserable, and that the doctrine of the Epicures were rather to be chosen, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. And he exhorts the Corinthians to be abundant in the work of the Lord, knowing that their labour shall not be in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 As worldly hope keeps the world at work in their various employments, so God gives his people the hope of his glory to keep them close to his service. Hebrews 6, verses 11 and 12, 1 John 3, verse 3. And it is such a sure hope as shall never make them ashamed. Romans 5, 5. Those that think it below the excellency of their love to work for a hope of the heavenly reward, thereby advance their love beyond the love of the apostles and primitive saints, and even of Christ himself. Thirdly, this persuasion of our future enjoyment of everlasting happiness cannot tend to licentiousness if we understand well that perfect holiness is a necessary part of that happiness, and that, though we have a title to that happiness by free justification and adoption, yet we must go to the possession of it in a way of holiness. 1 John 3, verses 1, 2, and 3. Neither is it legal nor mercenary to be moved by this persuasion, seeing the persuasion itself is not gotten by the works of the law, but by free grace through faith. Galatians 5, 5. And if it be a working from self-love, yet, for certain, it is not that carnal self-love which the Scripture condemns as the mother of sinfulness, 2 Timothy 3, 2, but a holy self-love, inclining us to prefer God above the flesh and the world, such as God directs us unto when he exhorts us to save ourselves, Acts 2, verse 40, 1 Timothy 4, verse 16. And it is so far from being contrary to the pure love of God that it brings us to love God more purely and entirely. The more good and beneficial we apprehend God to us, to all eternity, doubtless the more lovely God will be to us, and our affections will be the more inflamed towards him. God will not be loved as a barren wilderness, a land of darkness to us, neither will he be served for naught. Jeremiah 2.31, Isaiah 45.19 He would think it a dishonour to him to be owned by us as our God, if he had not prepared for us a city. Hebrews 11.16 and he draws us to love him by the cords of a man, such cords as the love of man uses to be drawn by, even by his own love to us, in laying his benefits before us. Hosea 11.4 Therefore the way for us to keep ourselves in the love of God is to look for his mercy unto eternal life. Jude verse 21 The last endowment for the same end as the former is that we be well persuaded of sufficient strength both to will and perform our duty acceptably until we come to the enjoyment of the heavenly happiness. This is contrary to the error of those that account it sufficient if we have strength to practice holiness, if we will or to will it if we please. And this is the sufficient strength which they earnestly contend for as a great benefit bestowed on all mankind by universal redemption. It is also contrary to the error of those that think the practice of godliness and wickedness to be alike easy, excepting only some difficulty in the first alterations of vicious customs and in bearing persecutions, which they account to be a rare case, since the kingdoms of the world have been brought to the profession of Christianity, or that think that God requires of men only to do their endeavour, that is, what they can do, and it is nonsense to say they cannot do what they can do. According to their judgment, it is needless to concern themselves much about sufficient strength for holy practice. For the confirmation of the assertion against those errors, take these arguments. First, we are by nature dead in trespasses and sins, unable to will or to do anything that is spiritually good, notwithstanding the redemption that is by Christ, until we be actually quickened by Christ. Ephesians 2 verse 1, Romans 8 verses 7, 8 and 9. Those that are sufficiently enlightened and humbled, know themselves to be naturally in this case, and that they do not only want executive power to do good, but chiefly a heart to will it and to be pleased with it, and that if God work not in them both to will and to do, they shall neither will nor do anything pleasing to him, Philippians 2.13, and that if he leave them to their own corruption, after he has begun the good work, they shall certainly prove vile apostates, and their latter end will be worse than their beginning. We may conclude from hence that whoever can courageously attempt the practice of the law without being well persuaded of a sufficient power, whereby he may be enabled to be heartily willing, as well as to perform when he is willing, until he has gone through the whole work of obedience acceptably, such a one was never yet truly humbled and brought to know the plague of his own heart, neither does he truly believe the doctrine of original sin, 
whatever formal profession he may make of it. Secondly, those that think sincere conformity to the law in ordinary cases to be so very easy show that they neither know it nor themselves. Is it an easy thing to wrestle not against flesh only, but against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in high places? Ephesians 6.12 is it an easy thing not to lust or covet according to the tenth commandment? The Apostle Paul found it so difficult to obey this commandment that his concupiscence prevailed the more by occasion of the commandment. Romans 7, verses 7 and 8. Our work is not only to alter vicious customs, but to mortify corrupt natural affections which bred those customs, and not only to deny the fulfilling of sinful lusts, but to be full of holy love and desires, yet even the restraining the execution of corrupt lusts and crossing them by contrary actings is in many cases like the cutting off of a right hand and plucking out of a right eye. Matthew 5 verses 29 and 30. If obedience be so easy, how came it to pass that the heathens generally did those things for which their own consciences condemned them as worthy of death? Romans 1 verse 32. And that many among us seek to enter in at the straight gate and are not able Luke 13 verse 24, and break so many vows and purposes of obedience, and fall back to the practice of their lusts, though in the meantime the fears of eternal damnation press hard upon their consciences. As to those that find persecution for religion to be so rare a thing in late days, they have cause to be suspected that they are of the world, and therefore the world loveth its own, else they would find that natural profession of religion will not secure those that are truly godly from several sorts of persecutions. And suppose men do not persecute us for religion, yet there is great difficulty in bearing great injuries from men on other accounts, and losses, poverty, bodily pains, long diseases, and untimely deaths, from the ordinary providence of God, with such a hearty love to God and to injurious men for his sake, and such a patient acquiescence in his will, as the law of God requires. I acknowledge that the work of God is easy and pleasant to those whom God rightly furnishes with endowments for it but those that assert it to be easy to men in their common condition show their imprudence in contradicting the general experience of heathens and Christians. Though many duties do not require much labour of body or mind, and might be done with ease if we were willing, yet it is easier to remove a mountain than to move and incline the heart to will and effect the doing of them. I need not concern myself with those who account that all have sufficient strength for a holy practice, because they can do their endeavour, that is, what they can do for God requires actual fulfilling of his commands. What if by our endeavours we can do nothing in any measure according to the rule? Shall the law be put off with no performance? And shall such endeavours be accounted sufficient holiness? And what if we cannot so much as endeavour in a right way? If a man's ability were the measure of acceptable duty, the commands of the law would signify very little. Thirdly, the wisdom of God has ever furnished people with a good persuasion of a sufficient strength that they might be enabled both to will and do their duty. The first Adam was furnished with such a strength, and we have no cause to think that he was ignorant of it, or that he needed to fear that he should be left to his own corruptions, because he had no corruptions in him until he had produced them in himself by sinning against strength. And when he had lost that strength, he could not recover the practice of holiness until he was acquainted with a better strength, whereby the head of Satan should be bruised. Genesis 3 verse 15. Our Lord Jesus Christ doubtless knew the infinite power of his deity to enable him for all that he was to do and suffer in our nature. He knew the Lord God would help him, therefore he should not be confounded. Isaiah 50 verse 7. The scripture shows what plentiful assurance of strength God gave Moses, Joshua, and Gideon, when he called them to great employments, and to the Israelites when he called them to subdue the land of Canaan. Christ would have the sons of Zebedee to consider whether they were able to drink of his cup and to be baptized with the baptism that he was baptized with. Matthew 20 verse 22. Paul encourages believers to the life of holiness by persuading them that sin shall not prevail to get the dominion over them, because they are not under the law but under grace. Romans 6 verses 13 and 14 and he exhorts them to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, that they might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Ephesians 6 verses 10 and 11. John exhorts believers not to love the world nor the things of the world, because they were strong and had overcome the wicked one. 1 John 2 verses 14 and 15. They that were called of God heretofore to work miracles were first acquainted with the gift of power to work them, and no wise man will attempt to do them without knowledge of the gift. 
Even so, when men that are dead in sin are called to do the works of a holy life, which are in them great miracles, God makes a discovery of the gift of power unto them, that he may encourage them in a rational way to such a wonderful enterprise. Direction 3. The way to get holy endowments and qualifications necessary to frame and enable us for the immediate practice of the law is to receive them out of the fullness of Christ by fellowship with him, and that we may have this fellowship, we must be in Christ and have Christ himself in us by a mystical union with him. Explication. Here, as much as anywhere, we have great cause to acknowledge with the Apostle that, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, even so great that it could not have entered into the heart of man to conceive it, if God had not made it known in the gospel by supernatural revelation. Yea, though it be revealed clearly in the holy scriptures, yet the natural man has not eyes to see it there, for it is foolishness to him, and if God expresses it ever so plainly and properly, he will think that God is speaking riddles and parables. And I doubt not, but it is still a riddle and parable, even to many truly godly who have received a holy nature in this way, for the apostles themselves had the saving benefit of it, before the Comforter discovered it clearly to them. John 14 verse 20 and they walked in Christ as the way to the Father before they clearly knew him to be the way. John 14 verse 5. And the best of us know it but in part, and must wait for the perfect knowledge of it in another world. One great mystery is that the holy frame and disposition whereby our souls are furnished and enabled for immediate practice of the law must be obtained by receiving it out of Christ's fullness, as a thing already prepared and brought to an existence for us in Christ, and treasured up in him, and that, as we are justified by a righteousness wrought out in Christ and imputed to us, so we are sanctified by such a holy frame and qualifications as are first wrought out and completed in Christ for us and then imparted to us. And as our natural corruption was produced originally in the first Adam and propagated from him to us, so our new nature and holiness is first produced in Christ and derived from him to us, or, as it were, propagated so that we are not at all to work together with Christ in making or producing that holy frame in us, but only to take it to ourselves and use it in our holy practice, as made ready to our hands. Thus we have fellowship with Christ in receiving that holy frame of spirit that was originally in him. For fellowship is when several persons have the same thing in common. 1 John 1 verses 1, 2 and 3. This mystery is so great that, notwithstanding all the light of the gospel, we commonly think that we must get a holy frame by producing it anew in ourselves, and by forming and working it out of our own hearts. Therefore many that are seriously devout take a great deal of pains to mortify their corrupt nature and beget a holy frame of heart in themselves, by striving earnestly to master their sinful lusts, and by pressing vehemently upon their hearts many motives to godliness, laboring importunately to squeeze good qualifications out of them as oil out of a flint. They account that, though they be justified by a righteousness wrought out by Christ, yet they must be sanctified by a holiness wrought out by themselves. And though out of humility they are willing to call it infused grace, yet they think they must get the infusion of it by the same manner of working as if it were wholly acquired by their own endeavours. On this account they acknowledge the entrance into a godly life to be harsh and unpleasing because it costs so much struggling with their own hearts and affections to new frame them. If they knew that this way of entrance is not only harsh and unpleasant, but altogether impossible, and that the true way of mortifying sin and quickening themselves to holiness is by receiving a new nature out of the fullness of Christ, and that we do no more to the production of a new nature than of original sin, though we do more to the reception of it. If they knew this, they might save themselves many a bitter agony, and a great deal of misspent, burdensome labor, and employ their endeavors to enter in at the straight gate, in such a way as would be more pleasant and successful. Another great mystery in the way of sanctification is the glorious manner of our fellowship with Christ in receiving a holy frame of heart from him. It is by our being in Christ and having Christ himself in us, and that not merely by his universal presence as he is God, but by such a close union as that we are one spirit and one flesh with him, which is a privilege peculiar to those that are truly sanctified. I may well call this a mystical union because the Apostle calls it a great mystery in an epistle full of mysteries, Ephesians 5 verse 22 intimating that it is eminently great above many other mysteries. It is one of the three mystical unions that are the chief mysteries in religion. The other two are the union of the trinity of persons in one Godhead, and the union of the divine and human natures in one person, Jesus Christ, God and man. Though we cannot frame an exact idea of the manner of any of these three unions in our imaginations, because the depth of these mysteries is beyond our comprehension, Yet we have cause to believe them all, because they are clearly revealed in Scripture, and are a necessary foundation for other points of Christian doctrine. Particularly, this union between Christ and believers is plain in several places of Scripture, affirming that Christ is and dwelleth in believers, and they in him.
john six verse fifty six and chapter fourteen verse twenty and that they are so joined together as to become one spirit one corinthians six verse seventeen and that believers are members of christ's body of his flesh and of his bones and they too christ and the church are one flesh ephesians five verses thirty and thirty one furthermore this union is illustrated in scripture by various resemblances which would be very much unlike the things which they are made use of to resemble and would rather seem to beguile us by obscuring the truth than instructing us by illustrating it if there were no true proper union between christ and believers it is resembled by the union between god the father and christ john fourteen verse twenty and chapter seventeen verses twenty one twenty two and twenty three between the vine and its branches john fifteen verses four and five between the head and body ephesians one verses twenty two and twenty three between bread and the eater john six verses fifty one fifty three and fifty four it is not only resembled but sealed in the lord's supper where neither the popish transubstantiation nor the lutheran's consubstantiation nor the protestant's spiritual presence of christ's body and blood to the true receivers can stand without it and if we can imagine that christ's body and blood are not truly eaten and drunk by believers either spiritually or corporally we shall make the bread and wine joined with the words of institution not only naked signs but such signs as are much more apt to produce false notions in us than to establish us in the truth and there is nothing in this union so impossible or repugnant to reason as may force us to depart from the plain and familiar sense of those scriptures that express and illustrate it though christ be in heaven and we on earth yet he can join our souls and bodies to his at such a distance without any substantial change of either by the same infinite spirit dwelling in him and us and so our flesh will become his when it is quickened by his spirit and his flesh ours as truly as if we did eat his flesh and drink his blood and he will be in us himself by his spirit who is one with him and who can unite more closely to christ than any material substance can do or who can make a more close and intimate union between christ and us and it will not follow from hence that a believer is one person with christ any more than that christ is one person with the father by that great mystical union neither will a believer be hereby made god but only the temple of god as christ's body and soul is and the spirit's lively instrument rather than the principal cause neither will a believer be necessarily perfect in holiness hereby or christ made a sinner for christ knows how to dwell in believers by certain measures and degrees and to make them holy so far only as he dwells in them and though this union seems too high a preferment for such unworthy creatures as we are yet considering the preciousness of the blood of god whereby we are redeemed we should not dishonour god if we should not expect a miraculous advancement to the highest dignity that creatures are capable of through the merits of that blood neither is there anything in this union contrary to the judgment of sense because the bond of the union being spiritual falls not at all under the judgment of sense several learned men of late acknowledge no other union between christ and believers than such as persons or things wholly separated may have by their mutual relations to each other and they interpret accordingly the places of scripture that speak of this union when christ is called the head of the church they account that a political head or governor is the thing meant when christ is said to be in his people and they in him they think that the proper meaning is that christ's law doctrine grace salvation or that godliness is in them and embraced by them so that christ here must not be taken for christ himself but for some other thing wrought in them by christ when christ and believers are said to be one spirit and one flesh they understand it of the agreement of their minds and affections as if the greatness of the mystery of this union mentioned ephesians five verse thirty two consisted rather in a harsh trope or a dark improper expression than in the depth and abstruseness of the thing itself and as if christ and his apostles had affected obscure intricate expressions when they speak to the church of things very plain and easy to be understood thus that great mystery the union of believers with christ himself which is the glory of the church and has been highly owned formerly both by the ancient fathers and many eminent protestant divines particularly writers concerning the doctrine of the lord's supper and by a very general consent of the church in many ages is now exploded out of the new model of divinity the reason of exploding it as i judge in charity is not because our learned refiners of divinity think themselves less able to defend it than the other two mysterious unions and to silence the objections of those proud sophists that will not believe what they cannot comprehend but rather because they account it to be one of the sinews of antinomianism that lay unobserved in the former usual doctrine that it tends to puff up men with a persuasion that they are justified and have eternal life in them already and that they need not depend any longer upon their uncertain performances of the condition of sincere obedience for salvation whereby they account the very foundation of a holy practice to be subverted but the wisdom of god has laid another manner of foundation for a holy practice than they imagine of which this union which the builders refuse is a principal stone next to the head of the corner 
and in opposition to their corrupt glosses upon the scriptures that prove it, I assert that our union with Christ is the cause of our subjection to Christ as a political head in all things, and of the abiding of his law, doctrine, grace, salvation, and all godliness in us, and of our agreement with him in our minds and affections, and therefore it cannot be altogether the same thing with them. And this assertion is useful for a better understanding of the excellency of this union. It is not a privilege procured by our sincere obedience and holiness, as some may imagine, or a reward of good works reserved for us in another world, but a privilege bestowed upon believers in their very first entrance into a holy state, in which all ability to do good works depends, and all sincere obedience to the law follow after it, as fruit produced by it. Having thus far explained the direction, I shall now show that, though the truth contained in it be above the reach of natural reason, yet it is evidently discovered to those that have their understandings opened to discern that supernatural revelation of the mysterious way of sanctification which God has given to us in the Holy Scriptures. First, there are several places in Scripture that plainly express it. Some texts show that all things pertaining to our salvation are treasured up for us in Christ, and comprehended in his fullness, so that we must have them thence or not at all. Colossians 1 verse 19. It pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And in the same epistle, Colossians 2 verses 11, 12, and 13, the apostle shows that the holy nature whereby we live to God was first produced in us by his death and resurrection in whom also ye are circumcised in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, buried with him, quickened together with him, when you are dead in your sins, Ephesians 1 verse 3, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. A holy frame of spirit with all its necessary qualifications must needs be comprehended in all spiritual blessings, and these are given us in Christ's person in heavenly places, as prepared and treasured up in him for us while we are upon earth and therefore we must have our holy endowments out of him or not at all. In this text, some choose rather to read heavenly things as in the margin, because neither places nor things are expressed in the original, but the former textual reading is to be preferred before the marginal as being the proper sense of the original Greek phrase, which is and must necessarily be so rendered in two other places of this same epistle, chapter 3 verse 10 and chapter 4 verse 12. Another text is 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30, which shows that Christ is of God made unto us sanctification, by which we are able to walk holily, as well as wisdom, by the knowledge of which we are savingly wise, and righteousness, by the imputation of which we are justified, and redemption, whereby we are redeemed from all misery, to the enjoyment of his glory, as our happiness in the heavenly kingdom. Other texts of scripture show plainly that we receive our holiness out of his fullness by fellowship with him. John 1 verses 16 and 17. Of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace, and it is understood of grace answerable to the law given by Moses, which must needs include the grace of sanctification, 1 John 1, verses 3, 5, 6, and 7. Truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. God is light. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Hence we may infer that our fellowship with God and Christ includes particularly our having light and walking in it holily and righteously. There are other texts that reach the proof of the whole direction fully, showing not only that our holy endowments are made ready first in Christ for us and received from Christ, but that we receive them by union with Christ. Colossians 3 verses 10 and 11. He hath put on the new man which is renewed after the image of him that created him, where Christ is all and in all. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 17. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Galatians 2 verse 20. I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. 1 John 5 verses 11 and 12. This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. Can we desire that God should more clearly teach us that all the fullness of the new man is in Christ, and all that spiritual nature and life whereby we live to God in holiness, and that they are fixed in him so inseparably that we cannot have them except we be joined to him and have himself abiding in us? Take heed, lest, through prejudice and hardness of heart, you be guilty of making God a liar in not believing this eminent record that God hath given to us of his Son. Secondly, God is pleased to illustrate this mysterious manner of our sanctification by such a variety of similitudes and resemblances as may put us out of doubt that it is truth, and such a truth as we are highly concerned to know and believe. I shall endeavour to condense the chief of these resemblances and the force of them briefly into one sentence, leaving it to those that are spiritual to enlarge their meditation upon them. We receive from Christ a new holy frame and nature, whereby we are enabled for a holy practice by union and fellowship with him. In like manner, first, as Christ lived in our nature by the Father, John 6 verse 57, secondly, as we receive original sin and death propagated to us from the first Adam, 
Romans 5, verses 12, 14, 16, and 17. Thirdly, as the natural body receives sense, motion, nourishment from the head. Colossians 2, verse 19. Fourthly, as the branch receives its sap, juice, and fructifying virtue from the vine. John 15, verses 4 and 5. Fifthly, as the wife bringeth forth fruit by virtue of her conjugal union with her husband. Romans 7, verse 4. Sixthly, as stones become a holy temple by being built upon the foundation and joined with the chief cornerstone. 1 Peter 2, verses 4, 5, and 6. Seventhly, as we receive the nourishing virtue of bread by eating it and of wine by drinking it. John 6, verses 51, 55, and 57 which last resemblance is used to seal to us our communion with Christ in the Lord's Supper. Here are seven resemblances adduced, whereof some illustrate the mystery spoken of more fully than others. All of them in some way intimate that our new life and holy nature is first in Christ, and then in us, by a true proper union and fellowship with Him. If any should urge that the similitude of Adam and his seed, and of married couples, do make rather for a relative than a real union betwixt Christ and us, let them consider that all nations are really made of one blood, which was first in Adam, Acts 17, verse 26, and that the first woman was made out of the body of Adam, and was really bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And by this first married couple, the mystical union of Christ and his church is eminently resembled. Compare Genesis 2, verses 22, 23, and 24, with Ephesians 5, verses 30, 31, and 32. And yet it supposes both these resemblances in the nearness and fullness of them, because those that are joined to the Lord are not only one flesh but one spirit with him. Thirdly, the end of Christ's incarnation, death, and resurrection was to prepare and form a holy nature and frame for us in himself, to be communicated to us by union and fellowship with him, and not to enable us to produce in ourselves the first original of such a holy nature by our own endeavours. 1. By his incarnation there was a man created in a new holy frame, after the holiness of the first Adam's frame had been marred and abolished by the first transgression. And this new frame was far more excellent than ever the first Adam's was, because man was really joined to God by a close, inseparable union of the divine and human nature in one person, Christ, so that these natures had communion each with the other in their actings, and Christ was able to act in his human nature by power proper to the divine nature, wherein he was one God with the Father. The words that he spake while he was upon earth, he spoke not of himself by any mere human power, but the Father that dwelt in him, he did the works. John 14, verse 10. Why was it that Christ set up the fallen nature of man in such a wonderful frame of holiness, in bringing it to live and act by communion with God, living and acting in it? One great end was that he might communicate this excellent frame to his seed, that should be born of him and in him, by his Spirit, as the last Adam, the quickening Spirit, that, as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so we might also bear the image of the heavenly. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 45 and 46, in holiness here and in glory hereafter. Thus he was born Emmanuel, God with us, because the fullness of the Godhead with all holiness did first dwell in him bodily, even in his human nature, that we might be filled up with that fullness in him. Matthew 1, verse 23, Colossians 2, verses 9 and 10. Thus he came down from heaven as living bread, that as he lives by the Father, so those that eat him may live by him, John 6, verses 51 and 56, by the same life of God in them that was first in him. 2. By his death he freed himself from the guilt of our sins imputed to him, and from all that innocent weakness of his human nature which he had borne for a time for our sakes. And by freeing himself he prepared a freedom for us from our whole natural condition, which is both weak as his was, and also polluted with our guilt and sinful corruption. Thus the corrupt natural estate, which is called in Scripture the old man, was crucified together with Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed. And it is destroyed in us, not by any wounds that we ourselves can give to it, but by our partaking of that freedom from it and death unto it, that is already wrought out for us by the death of Christ, as is signified by our baptism, wherein we are buried with Christ by the application of his death to us, Romans 6, verses 2, 3, 4, 10, and 11. God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, for sin, or by a sacrifice for sin, as in the margin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, that walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans 8, verses 3 and 5. Observe here, that though Christ died, that we might be justified by the righteousness of God and of faith, not by our own righteousness, which is of the law. Romans 10, verse 4, 5, and 6. Philippians 3 verse 9, yet he died also that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, and that by walking after his spirit as those that are in Christ. Romans Ibid. He is compared in his death to a corn of wheat dying in the earth, that it may propagate its own nature by bringing forth much fruit. John 12 verse 24, 
to the Passover that was slain, that a feast might be kept unto it, and to bread broken, that it may be nourishment to those that eat it, 1 Corinthians 5, verses 7 and 8, and chapter 11, verse 24, to the rock smitten, that water may gush out of it for us to drink, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4. He died, that he might make of Jew and Gentile one new man in himself, Ephesians 2, verse 15, and that he might see his seed, i.e. such as derive their holy nature from him, Isaiah 53, verse 10. Let these scriptures be well observed, and they will sufficiently evidence that Christ died, not that we might be able to form a holy nature in ourselves, but that we might receive one ready prepared and formed in Christ for us, by union and fellowship with him. 3. By his resurrection he took possession of spiritual life for us, as now fully procured for us, and made to be our right and property by the merit of his death. And therefore we are said to be quickened together with Christ, even when we were dead in sins, and we raised up together, yea, and be made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, as our head, while we continue upon earth in our own persons. Ephesians 2, verses 5 and 6. His resurrection was our resurrection to the life of holiness, as Adam's fall was our fall into spiritual death. And we are not ourselves the first makers and formers of our new holy nature, any more than of our original corruption, but both are formed ready for us to partake of them, and by union with Christ we participate of that spiritual life that he took possession of for us at his resurrection, and thereby we are enabled to bring forth the fruits of it, as the scripture shows by the similitude of a marriage union, Romans 7 verse 4. We are married to him that is risen from the dead, that we might bring forth fruit unto God. Baptism signifies the application of Christ's resurrection to us as well as his death. We are raised up with him in it to newness of life, as well as buried with him, and we are taught thereby that because he died unto sin once and lived unto God, we should likewise reckon ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6 verses 4, 5, 10 and 11. Fourthly, our sanctification is by the Holy Ghost, by whom we live and walk holily. Romans 15, verse 16, Galatians 5, verse 25. Now the Holy Ghost first rested on Christ in all fullness, that he might be communicated from him to us, as was signified to John the Baptist, by the similitude of the descending of a dove from the opened heavens, resting on Christ at his baptism. John 1, verses 32 and 33. And when he sanctifies us, he baptizes us unto Christ, and joins us to Christ by himself as the great bond of union, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, so that, according to the scriptural phrase, it is all one to have Christ himself and to have the Spirit of Christ in us. Romans 8, verses 9 and 10. He glorifieth Christ, for he receiveth those things that are Christ's, and showeth them to us. John 16, verses 14 and 15. He gives us an experimental knowledge of those spiritual blessings which he himself prepared for us by the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Christ. Fifthly, the effectual causes of those four principal endowments, which in the foregoing direction were asserted as necessary to furnish us for the immediate practice of holiness, are comprehended in the fullness of Christ, and treasured up for us in Him, and the endowments themselves, together with their causes, are attained richly by union and fellowship with Christ. If we be joined to Christ, our hearts will be no longer left under the power of sinful inclinations, or in a mere indifference of inclination to good or evil, but they will be powerfully endued with a power, bent and propensity to the practice of holiness, by the Spirit of Christ dwelling in us and inclining us to mind spiritual things, and to lust against the flesh, Romans 8 verses 1, 4 and 5, Galatians 5 verse 17. And we have in Christ a full reconciliation with God, and an advancement into higher favor with him than the first Adam had in the state of innocency, because the righteousness that Christ wrought out for us by his obedience unto death is imputed to us for our justification, which is called the righteousness of God, because it is wrought by one that is God as well as man, and therefore it is of infinite value to satisfy the justice of God for all our sins, and to procure his pardon and highest favor for us. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, Romans 5 verse 19. And that we may be persuaded of this reconciliation, we receive the spirit of adoption through Christ, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, Romans 8, verse 15. Hereby also we are persuaded of our future enjoyment of the everlasting happiness, and of sufficient strength both to will and to perform our duty acceptably, until we come to that enjoyment. For the spirit of adoption teaches us to conclude that, if we be the children of God, then we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, and that the law of the spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus maketh us free from the law of sin and death, and that nothing shall be against us, nothing shall separate us from the love of God in Christ, but notwithstanding all the opposition and difficulties we meet with, we shall be at last more than conquerors through him that loved us. Romans 8, verses 17, 23, 35, 37, and 39. 
Furthermore, this comfortable persuasion of our justification and future happiness, and all saving privileges, cannot tend to licentiousness, as it is given only in this way of union with Christ, because it is joined inseparably with the gift of sanctification by the Spirit of Christ, so that we cannot have justification or any saving privilege in Christ, except we receive Christ himself and his holiness, as well as any other benefit, as the Scripture testifies that there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans 8 verse 1. Sixthly, whereas it may be doubted whether the saints that lived before the coming of Christ in the flesh could possibly be one flesh with him and receive a new nature by union and fellowship with him, as prepared for them in his fullness, we are to know that the same Christ that took our flesh was before Abraham, John 8 verse 58, and was foreordained before the foundation of the world to be sacrificed as a lamb without blemish, that he might redeem us from all iniquity by his precious blood, 1 Peter 1 verses 18, 19, and 20. And he had the same spirit then which filled his human nature with all its fullness afterwards and raised it from the dead and he gave that spirit then to the church 1 peter 1 verse 11 and chapter 3 verses 18 and 19 now this spirit was able and effectual to unite these saints to that flesh which christ was to take to himself in the fullness of time because he was the same in both and to give out to them that grace with which christ would afterwards fill his flesh for their salvation as well as ours Therefore David accounted Christ's flesh to be his, and spoke of Christ's death and resurrection as his own, beforehand, as fully as any of us can do since their accomplishment. Psalm 16, verses 9, 10, and 11. My flesh also shall rest in hope, for thou wilt not leave my flesh in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. Yea, and saints before David's time did all eat of the same spiritual meat, and drink of the same spiritual drink even of the same Christ as we do, and therefore were partakers of the same privilege of union and fellowship with Christ, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 3 and 4. And when Christ was manifested in the flesh, in the fullness of time, all things in heaven and on earth, all the saints departed, whose spirits were then made perfect in heaven, as well as these saints that then were, or should afterwards be on earth, were gathered together into one, and comprehended in Christ as their head, Ephesians 1, verse 10. And he was the chief cornerstone, in whom the building of the whole church upon the foundation of the prophets, before, and the apostles after his coming, being fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. Ephesians 2, verses 20 and 21. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, and today, and forever. Hebrews 13, verse 8. His incarnation, death, and resurrection were the cause of all the holiness that ever was or shall be given to man, from the fall of Adam to the end of the world and that by the mighty power of his Spirit whereby all saints that ever were or shall be are joined together, to be members of that one mystical body whereof he is the head. Direction 4. The means or instruments of this union and all fellowship are the gospel and faith. What faith is. The means or instruments whereby the Spirit of God accomplishes our union with Christ and our fellowship with him in all holiness are the gospel, whereby Christ enters into our hearts to work faith in us, and faith whereby we actually receive Christ himself with all his fullness into our hearts. And this faith is a grace of the Spirit whereby we heartily believe the gospel, and also believe on Christ as he is revealed and freely promised to us therein for all his salvation. Explication That which I asserted in the foregoing direction concerning the necessity of our being in Christ and having Christ in us by a mystical union to enable us for a holy practice might put us to a stand in our endeavours for holiness, because we cannot imagine how we should be able to raise ourselves above our natural sphere to this glorious union and fellowship, until God be pleased to make known to us, by supernatural revelation, the means whereby his Spirit makes us partakers of so high a privilege. But God is pleased to help us when, at a stand, to go on forward by revealing two means or instruments whereby his Spirit accomplishes the mystical union and fellowship between Christ and us, and whereby rational creatures are capable of attaining thereunto by his Spirit working in them. One of these means is the gospel of the grace of God, wherein God makes known to us the unsearchable riches of Christ, and Christ in us the hope of glory, Ephesians 3 verse 8, Colossians 1 verse 27, and also invites us and commands us to believe on Christ for his salvation, and encourages us by a free promise of that salvation to all that believe on him, Acts 16 verse 31, Romans 10 verses 9 and 11. This is God's own instrument of conveyance wherein he sends Christ to us to bless us with his salvation. Acts 3 verse 26. It is the ministration of the Spirit and of righteousness. 2 Corinthians 3 verses 6, 8 and 9. Faith comes by the hearing of it, and therefore it is a great instrument whereby we are begotten in Christ, and Christ is formed in us. Romans 10 verses 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 15. Galatians 4 verse 19. 
There is no need for us to say in our hearts, Who shall ascend into heaven to bring Christ down from above? Or, Who shall descend into the deep to bring up Christ from the dead, that we may be united and have fellowship with him in his death and resurrection? For the word is nigh to us, the gospel, the word of faith, in which Christ himself graciously condescends to be nigh to us, so that we may come at him there, without going any further, if we desire to be joined to him. Romans 10 verses 6, 7, and 8. The other of these means is faith, that is wrought in us by the gospel. This is our instrument of reception, whereby the union between Christ and us is accomplished on our part, by our actual receiving Christ himself, with all his fullness into our heart, which is the principal subject of the present explanation. The faith which philosophers commonly treat of is only a habit of the understanding, whereby we are sent to a testimony upon the authority of the testifier. Accordingly, some would have faith in Christ to be no more than believing the truth of things in religion, upon the authority of Christ testifying them. But the Apostle shows that the faith whereby we are justified is faith in Christ's blood, Romans 3 verses 24 and 25, not only in his authority as a testifier. And though a mere assent to a testimony were sufficient faith for knowledge of things, at which the philosophers aimed, yet we are to consider that the design of saving faith is not only to know the truth of Christ and his salvation, testified and promised in the gospel, but also to apprehend and receive Christ and his salvation as given by and with the promise. Therefore saving faith must necessarily contain two acts, believing the truth of the gospel and believing on Christ as promised freely to us in the gospel for all salvation. By the one it receives the means wherein Christ is conveyed to us, by the other it receives Christ himself and his salvation in the means as it is one act to receive the breast or cup wherein milk or wine are conveyed, and another act to suck the milk in the breast and to drink the wine in the cup. And both these acts must be performed heartily with an unfeigned love to the truth and a desire of Christ and his salvation above all things. This is our spiritual appetite which is necessary for our eating and drinking Christ, the food of life as a natural appetite is for bodily nourishment. Our assenting to or believing the gospel must not be forced by mere conviction of the truth, such as wicked men and devils may be brought to, when they had rather it were false. Neither must our believing on Christ be only constrained for fear of damnation, without any hearty love and desire towards the enjoyment of him. But we must receive the love of the truth by relishing the goodness and excellency of it, and we must account all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus our Lord, and count them but dung, that we may win Christ and be found in him, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10, Philippians 3 verses 8 and 9, esteeming Christ to be all our salvation and happiness, Colossians 3 verse 11, in whom all fullness doth dwell, Colossians 1 verse 19. And this love must be to every part of Christ's salvation, to holiness as well as to forgiveness of sins. We must desire earnestly that God would create in us a clean heart and right spirit, as well as hide his face from our sins, Psalm 51 verses 9 and 10 not like many that care for nothing in Christ, but only deliverance from hell. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Matthew 5 verse 6. The former of these acts immediately unites us to Christ, because it is terminated only on the means of conveyance the gospel. Yet it is a saving act, if it be rightly performed, because it inclines and disposes the soul to the latter act, whereby Christ himself is immediately received into the heart. He that believes the gospel with hearty love and liking, as the most excellent truth will certainly with the like heartiness believe on Christ for his salvation. They that know the name of the Lord will certainly put their trust in him. Psalm 9 verse 10. Therefore in scripture saving faith is sometimes described by the former of these acts, as if it were a mere believing the gospel, sometimes by the latter as a believing on Christ or in Christ. Romans 10 verse 9. If thou believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Verse 11. The scripture says that whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, 1 John 5 verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. For the better understanding of the nature of faith, let it be further observed that the second and principal act of it, believing on Christ, includes believing on God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, because they are one and the same infinite God, and they all concur in our salvation by Christ, as the only mediator between God and us, in whom all the promises of God are yea and amen. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20. By him, as mediator, we believe on God, that raised him from the dead, and gave him glory, that our faith and hope might be in God. 1 Peter 1 verse 21. And it is the same thing with trusting on God, or on the Lord, which is so highly commended in the whole scripture, especially in the Old Testament, 
as may easily appear by considering that it has the same causes, effects, objects, adjuncts, opposites, and all the same circumstances, excepting only that it has a respect to Christ, as promised before his coming, and now it respects him as already come in the flesh. Believing in the Lord and trusting on his salvation are equivalent terms that explain one another. Psalm 78 verse 22. I confess that trusting on things seen or known by the mere light of reason, as on our own wisdom, power, riches, on princes or on any arm of flesh, may not so properly be called believing on them, but trusting on a Saviour, as discovered by a testimony, is properly believing on him. It is also the same thing that is expressed by the terms of resting, relying, leaning, staying ourselves on the Lord, called hoping in the Lord, because it is the ground of that expectation which is the proper act of hope, though our believing and trusting be for the present as well as future benefit of this salvation. The reason why it is so commonly expressed in the scriptures of the New Testament by the terms of believing on Christ might be probably because, when that part of scripture was written, there was cause in a special manner to urge believing the testimony that was then newly revealed by the gospel. Having thus explained the nature of faith, I come now to assert its proper use and office in our salvation, that it is the means and instrument whereby we receive Christ and all his fullness actually into our hearts. This excellent use and office of faith is encountered by a multitude of errors. Men naturally esteem that it is too small or slight a thing to produce so great effects, as Naaman thought washing in Jordan too small a matter for the cure of his leprosy. They contemn the true means of entering in at the straight gate because they seem too easy for such a purpose, and thereby they make the entrance not only difficult but impossible to themselves. Some will allow that faith is the sole condition of our justification and the instrument to receive it, according to the doctrine maintained formerly by the Protestants against the Papists, but they account that it is not sufficient or effectual to sanctification, but that it rather tends to licentiousness if it be not joined with some other means that may be powerful and effectual to secure a holy practice. They commend this great doctrine of Protestants as a comfortable cordial for persons on their deathbeds or in agonies under terrors of conscience, but they account that it is not good for ordinary food, and that it is wisdom in ministers to preach it seldom and sparingly, and not without some antidote or corrective to prevent the licentiousness to which it tends. Their common antidote or corrective is that sanctification is necessary to salvation as well as justification, and that though we be justified by faith, yet we are sanctified by our own performance of the law, and so they set up salvation by works, and make the grace of justification to be of no effect, and not at all comfortable. If it had indeed such a malignant influence upon practice, it could not be owned as a doctrine proceeding from the most holy God, and all the comfort that it affords must needs be ungrounded and deceitful. This consequence is well understood by some late refiners of the Protestant religion, and therefore they have thought fit to new model this doctrine, and to make saving faith to be only a condition to procure a right and title to our justification by the righteousness of Christ, which must be performed before we can lay any good claim to the enjoyment of it, and before we have any right to use any instrument for the actual receiving of it, and this they call an accepting of or receiving Christ, and that they may the better secure the practice of holiness by their conditional faith, they will not have trusting in God or Christ for salvation to be accounted the principal saving act of it, because, as it seems to them, many loose, wicked people trust on God and Christ for their salvation as much as others, and are by their confidence hardened the more in their wickedness, but they had rather it should be obedience to all Christ's laws, at least in resolution, or a consent that Christ should be their Lord, accepting of his terms of salvation and a resignation of themselves to his government in all things. It is a sign that the scripture form of teaching is grown into disesteem with our great masters of reason, when trusting in the Lord, so much commended in scripture, is accounted a mean and ordinary thing. They endeavor to affright us from owning faith to be an instrument of justification, by telling us that thereby we that use the instrument are made our own principal justifiers to the dishonor of God, though it might be easily answered that we are made thereby only the principal receivers of our own justification from God, the giver of it, to whom all the glory belongs. All these errors will fall if it can be proved that such a faith as I have described is an instrument whereby we actually receive Christ himself into our hearts, and holiness of heart and life, as well as justification by union and fellowship with him. For the proof of it, I shall offer the following arguments. First, by faith we have the actual enjoyment and possession of Christ himself, and not only remission of sins, but of life and so of holiness. Christ dwelleth in our hearts by faith. Ephesians 3 verse 17. We live to God, and yet not we, but Christ liveth in us by the faith of the Son of God. Galatians 2, verse 19 and 20. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the Son and everlasting life that is in him. 1 John 5, verse 12 and 13. John 3, verse 30. 
He that heareth Christ's word, and believeth on him that sent Christ, hath everlasting life, and is passed from death unto life. John 5, verse 24. These texts express clearly such a faith as I have described. Therefore, the efficiency or operation of faith in order to the enjoyment of Christ and his fullness cannot be the procurement of a bare right or title to this enjoyment, but rather it must be an entrance into it and taking possession of it. We have our access and entrance by faith into that grace of Christ wherein we stand. Romans 5 verse 2. Secondly, the scripture plainly ascribes this effect of faith, that by it we receive Christ, put him on, are rooted and grounded in him and also that we receive the Spirit, remission of sins, and an inheritance among them which are sanctified, John 1 verse 12, Galatians 3 verses 26 and 27, Colossians 2 verses 6 and 7, Galatians 3 verse 14, Acts 26 verse 18, and the scripture illustrates this receiving by the similitude of eating and drinking. He that believeth on Christ drinketh the living water of his Spirit, John 7 verses 37, 38 and 39. Christ is the bread of life, his flesh is meat indeed, and his blood is drink indeed. And the way to eat and drink it is to believe in Christ, and by so doing we dwell in Christ and Christ in us, and have everlasting life. John 6, verses 35, 47, 48, 54, 55, 56. How can it be taught more clearly that we receive Christ himself properly into our souls by faith, as we receive food into our bodies by eating and drinking, and that Christ is as truly united to us thereby as our food when we eat and drink it? So faith cannot be a condition to procure a mere right or title to Christ, any more than eating or drinking produces a mere right or title to our food, but it is rather an instrument to receive it as the mouth that eats and drinks the food. Thirdly, Christ, with all his salvation, is freely given by the grace of God to all that believe on him. For we are saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. We are justified freely by his grace through faith in his blood. Romans 3 verses 24 and 25. The Holy Ghost, who is the bond of union between Christ and us, is a gift. Acts 2 verse 38. Now that which is a gift of grace must not at all be earned, purchased, or procured by any work or works performed as a condition to get a right or title to it, and therefore faith itself must not be accounted such a conditional work. If it be by grace, it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. Romans 11 verse 6. The condition of a free gift is only take and have, and in this sense we will readily acknowledge faith to be a condition, allowing a liberty in terms where we agree in the thing, but if you give a peppercorn to purchase a title to it, then you spoil the freeness of the gift. The free offer of Christ to you is sufficient to confer upon you a right, yea, to make it your duty to receive Christ and his salvation as yours, and because we receive Christ by faith as a free gift, therefore we may account faith to be the instrument, and as it were the hand whereby we receive him. Fourthly, it has been already proved that all spiritual life and holiness is treasured up in the fullness of Christ, and communicated to us by union with him. Therefore, the accomplishing of union with Christ is the first work of saving grace in our hearts, and faith itself, being a holy grace and part of spiritual life, cannot be in us before the beginning of this union, but rather it is given to us and wrought in the very working of the union. And the way wherein it conduces to the union cannot be by procuring a mere title to Christ as a condition, because then it should be performed before the uniting work begins but rather by being an instrument whereby we may actively receive and embrace Christ, who is already come into the soul, to take possession of it as his own habitation. Fifthly, true saving faith, such as I have described, has in its nature and manner of operation a peculiar aptitude or fitness to receive Christ and his salvation, and to unite our souls to him, and to furnish the soul with a new holy nature, and to bring forth a holy practice by union and fellowship with him. God has fitted natural instruments for their office, as the hands, feet, etc., so that we may know by their nature and natural manner of operation for what use they are designed. In like manner, we may know that faith is an instrument formed on purpose for our union with Christ and our sanctification, if we consider what a peculiar fitness it has for the work. The discovery of this is of great use for the understanding of the mysterious manner of our receiving and practicing all holiness by union and fellowship with Christ, by this precious grace of faith and to make you, as it were, to see with your eyes that it is such an instrument as I have asserted it to be, I shall present it to your view in three particulars. One, the grace of faith, is as well fitted for the soul's receiving Christ and union with him, as any instrument of the body is for receiving and closing with things needful for it. By the very act of hearty trusting or believing on Christ for all salvation and happiness, the soul casts and puts away from itself everything that keeps it at a distance from Christ, as all confidence in our strength, endeavors, works, privileges, or in any worldly pleasures, profits, honors, or in any human helps and succors for our happiness and salvation, because such confidences are inconsistent with our confidence in Christ for all salvation. 
Paul, by his confidence in Christ, was taken off from all confidence in the flesh. He suffered the loss of glorying in his privileges and legal righteousness, and counted all other enjoyments in matters of the world or of religion to be but dung, that he might win Christ and be found in him. Philippians 3, verses 3, 6, 7, 8, and 9. The voice of faith is, Ashur shall not save us, we will not ride upon horses, neither will we say any more to the work of our hands. Ye are our gods, for in thee the fatherless findeth mercy. Hosea 14, verse 3. We have no might against this great company of our spiritual enemies, neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. 2 Chronicles 20, verse 12. I might multiply places of scripture to show what a self-emptying grace faith is, and how it casts other confidences out of the soul by getting above them to Christ, as the only happiness and salvation. The same act of trusting or believing on Christ or on God is the very manner of our souls coming to Christ. John 6 verse 35. Drawing near to the Lord. Psalm 73 verse 28. Fleeing unto the Lord to hide us. Psalm 143 verse 9. Making our refuge in the shadow of his wings. Psalm 57 verse 1. Staying ourselves and our minds upon the Lord, Isaiah 50 verse 10, and chapter 26 verse 3. Laying hold on eternal life, 1 Timothy 6 verse 12. Lifting up our souls to the Lord, Psalm 25 verse 1. Rolling our way and casting our burden upon the Lord, Psalm 37 verse 5, and 55 verse 22. And of our eating and drinking Christ, as has already appeared, let us consider that Christ and his salvation cannot be seen or handled or attained to by any bodily motion, but are revealed and promised to us in the word. Now let any invent, if they can, any way for the soul to exercise any motion or activity in receiving this unseen promised salvation, besides believing the word and trusting on Christ for the benefit promised. If Christ were to be earned by works, or any other kind of conditional faith, yet a faith must be instrumental to receive him. Some think love as fit to be the uniting grace, but I have showed that love to Christ's salvation is an ingredient of faith, and though love be an appetite to union, yet we have no other likely way to fill this appetite while we are in this world besides trust on Christ for all his benefits as he is promised in the gospel. 2. There is in this saving faith a natural tendency to furnish the soul with a holy frame and nature, and all endowments necessary thereunto out of the fullness of Christ. A hearty affectionate trusting on Christ for all his salvation, as freely promised to us, has naturally enough in it to work in our souls a rational bent and inclination to and ability for the practice of all holiness, because it comprehends in it a trusting that through Christ we are dead to sin and alive to God, that our old man is crucified, Romans 6 verses 2, 3 and 4, and that we live by the Spirit, Galatians 5 verse 25, and that we have forgiveness of sin, and that God is our God. Psalm 31 verse 14, and that we have in the Lord righteousness and strength, whereby we are able to do all things. Isaiah 45 verse 24, Philippians 4 verse 13, and that we shall be gloriously happy in the enjoyment of Christ to all eternity. Philippians 3 verses 20 and 21. When the saints in Scripture speak so highly of such glorious spiritual privileges, as I have here named, they acquaint us with the familiar sense and language of their faith, trusting on God and Christ, and they give us but an explication of the nature and contents of it, and they speak of nothing more than what they receive out of the fullness of Christ, and how can we otherwise judge but that those that have a hearty love to Christ, and can, upon good ground, think and speak such high things concerning themselves, must needs be heartily disposed and mightily strengthened for the practice of holiness. 3. Because faith has such a natural tendency to dispose and strengthen the soul for the practice of holiness, we have cause to judge it a meet instrument to accomplish every part of that practice in an acceptable manner. Those that with a due affection believe steadfastly on Christ for the free gift of all his salvation may find by experience that they are carried forth by that faith according to the measure of its strength or weakness to love God heartily because God has loved them first. 1 John 4 verse 19 to praise him, to pray unto him in the name of Christ, Ephesians 5 verse 20, John 16 verse 26 and 27, to be patient with cheerfulness under all afflictions, giving thanks to the Father who hath called them to his heavenly inheritance, Colossians 1 verses 11 and 12, to love all the children of God out of love to their heavenly Father, 1 John 5 verse 1, to walk as Christ walked, 1 John 2 verse 6, and to give themselves up, to live to Christ in all things as constrained by his love in dying for them. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14. We have a cloud of witnesses concerning the excellent works that were produced by faith. Hebrews 11. And though trusting on Christ be accounted such a slight and contemptible thing, yet I know no work of obedience which it is not able to produce. And note the excellent manner of working by faith. By it we live and act in all good works, as people in Christ, as raised above ourselves and our natural state by partaking of him and his salvation, 
and we do all in his name and on his account. This is the practice of that mysterious manner of living to God in holiness, which is peculiar to the Christian religion, wherein we live, and yet not we, but Christ liveth in us. Galatians 2 verse 20. And who can imagine any other way but this for such a practice, whilst Christ and his salvation are known to us only by the gospel? The explanation that I have made of the nature and office of true faith, and of its aptitude for its office, is sufficient to evidence that it is a most holy faith, as it is called Jude verse 20, and that such a trusting on Christ as I have described in its own nature cannot have any tendency to licentiousness, but only to holiness, and that it roots and grounds us in holiness more than the mere accepting of any terms of salvation and consenting to have Christ for our Lord can do and is more powerful to secure a holy practice than any of those resolutions of obedience or resignating acts that some would have to be the great conditions of our salvation, which are indeed no better than hypocritical acts if they be not produced by this faith. There is indeed a counterfeit dead faith such as wicked men may have, and if that tend to licentiousness, let not true faith be blamed, but rather mark the description of it which I have given, that you may not be deceived with a counterfeit faith instead of it. I shall add something concerning the efficient cause of this excellent grace and of our union with Christ by it, whereby it may appear that it is not so slight and easy a way of salvation as some may imagine. The author and finisher of our faith and of our union and fellowship with Christ by faith is no less than the infinite Spirit of God, and God and Christ himself by the Spirit. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body of Christ, and are all made to drink into one Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 and 13. God granteth us, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with all might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith. Ephesians 3, verses 16 and 17. If we do but consider the great effect of faith, that by it we are raised to live above our natural condition by Christ and his Spirit living in us, we cannot rationally conceive that it should be within the power of nature to do anything that advances us so high. If God had done no more for us in our sanctification than to restore us to our first natural holiness, yet this could not have been done without putting forth his own almighty power to quicken those that are dead in sin. How much more is this almighty power needful to advance us to this wonderful new kind of frame wherein we live and act above all the power of nature by a higher principle of life than was given to Adam in innocency, even by Christ and his Spirit living and acting in us? The natural man brings forth his offspring according to his image, by that natural power of multiplying with which God blesses him at his first creation. But the second Adam brings forth his offspring, newborn according to his image, only by the Spirit. John 3 verse 5. As many as receive him, even those that believe on his name, are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John 1 verses 12 and 13. Christ took his own human nature into personal union with himself in the womb of the Virgin Mary, by the Holy Ghost coming upon her, and the power of the Highest overshadowing her, the same power whereby the world was created, Luke 1 verse 35. So he takes us into mystical union and fellowship with himself, by no less than an infinite creating power, for we are the workmanship of God, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, Ephesians 2 verse 10. And if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. For the accomplishing this great work of our new creation in Christ, the Spirit of God first works upon our hearts, by and with the gospel, to produce in us the grace of faith. For if the gospel should come to us in word only, and not in power, and in the Holy Ghost, Paul might labor to plant and Apollos to water without any success, because we cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. Yea, we shall account them foolishness, until the Spirit of God enable us to discern them. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 5, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 6, and chapter 2 verse 14. We shall never come to Christ by any teaching of man, except we also hear and learn of the Father, and be drawn to Christ by his Spirit. John 6 verses 44 and 45. And when saving faith is wrought in us, the same Spirit gives us fast hold of Christ by it. As he opens the mouth of faith to receive Christ, so he fills it with Christ, or else the acting of faith would be like a dream of one that thinks he eats and drinks, and when he awakes he finds himself empty. The same Spirit of God both gave that faith whereby miracles are wrought, and worked also the miracles by it, so also the same Spirit of Christ works saving faith in us, and answers the aim and end of that faith by giving us union and fellowship with Christ by it, so that none of the glory of this work belongs to faith, but only to Christ and his Spirit. And indeed faith is of such an humble, self-denying nature, that it ascribes nothing that it receives to itself, but all to the grace of God, and therefore God saves us by faith, that all the glory may be ascribed to his free grace. Romans 6 verse 16. 
if adam had strength enough in innocency to perform the duty of faith as well as we yet it will not follow that he had strength enough to raise himself above his natural state into union with christ because faith does not unite us to christ by its own virtue but by the power of the spirit working by it and with it thus are we first passive and then active in this great work of mystical union we are first apprehended of christ and then we apprehend christ christ enters first into the soul to join himself to it by giving it the spirit of faith and so the soul receives christ and his spirit by their own power as the sun first enlightens our eyes and then we can see it by its own light we may note further to the glory of the grace of god that this union is fully accomplished by christ giving the spirit of faith to us even before we act that faith in the reception of him because by this grace or spirit of faith the soul is inclined and disposed to an active receiving of christ and no doubt christ is thus united to many infants who have the spirit of faith and yet cannot act faith because they are not come to the use of their understandings but those of riper years that are joined passively to christ by the spirit of faith will also join themselves with him actively by the act of faith and until they act this faith they cannot know or enjoy their union with christ and the comfort of it or make use of it in acting any other duties of holiness acceptably in this life direction five we cannot attain holiness by our endeavors in a natural state without union and fellowship with christ we cannot attain to the practice of true holiness by any of our endeavors while we continue in our natural state and are not partakers of a new state by union and fellowship with christ through faith explication it is evident all have not that precious faith whereby christ dwells in our hearts yea the number of those that have it is small comparatively to the whole world that lieth in wickedness 1 john 5 verses 19 and 20 and many of those that at length attain unto it do continue without it for some considerable time ephesians 2 verse 12 and though some may have the spirit of faith given to them from their mother's womb as john the baptist luke 1 verses 15 and 44 yet even in them there is a natural being by generation before there can be a spiritual being by regeneration 1 corinthians 15 verse 46 hence arises the consideration of two states or conditions of the children of men in matters that appertain to god and godliness the one of which is vastly different from the other those that have the happiness of a new birth and creation in christ by faith are thereby placed in a very excellent state consisting in the enjoyment of the righteousness of christ for their justification and of the spirit of christ to live by in holiness here and glory hereafter as has already appeared those that are not in christ by faith cannot be in a better state than that which they received together with their nature from the first adam by being once born and created in him or than they can attain to by the power of that nature with any such help as god is pleased to afford it this latter i call a natural state because it consists in such things as we have either received by natural generation or can attain to by natural power through divine assistance as the scripture calls man in this state the natural man 1 corinthians 2 verse 14 the former i call a new state because we enter into it by a new birth in christ and i may call it a spiritual state according to the scripture because it is received from christ the quickening spirit and the natural and spiritual man are opposed 1 corinthians 2 verses 14 and 15 though some call both these states spiritual because the everlasting weal or woe of the soul or spirit of man is chiefly concerned in them it is a common error of those that are in a corrupt natural state that they seek to reform their lives according to the law without any thoughts that their state must be changed before their lives can be changed from sin to righteousness the heathens that knew nothing of a new state in christ were urged by their own consciences to practice several duties of the law according to the knowledge they had by the light of nature romans 2 verses 14 and 15 israel according to the flesh had a zeal of god and godliness and endeavored to practice the written law at least in external performances while they were enemies to the faith of christ and paul attained so far that he was blameless in these external performances in the righteousness of the law while he persecuted the church of christ philippians 3 verse 6 some are so near the kingdom of god while they continue in a natural state that they are convinced of the spirituality of the law that it binds us principally to love god with all our heart soul mind and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves and to perform universal obedience to god in all our inward thoughts and affections as well as in all our outward actions and to do all the duties that we owe to our neighbor out of this hearty love mark 12 verses 33 and 34 and they struggle and labor with great earnestness to subdue their inward thoughts and affections to the law of god and to abstain not only from some sins but from all known sins and to perform every known duty of the law with their whole heart and soul as they think 
and are so active and intent in their devout practice that they overwork their natural strength, and so fervent in their zeal that they are ready even to kill their bodies with fastings and other macerations, that they may kill their sinful lusts. They are strongly convinced that holiness is absolutely necessary to salvation, and deeply affected with the terrors of damnation, and yet they were never so much enlightened in the mystery of the gospel as to know that a new state in Christ is necessary to a new life, therefore they labor in vain to reform their natural state instead of getting above it in Christ. And some of these, when they have misspent many years in striving against the stream of their lusts without any success, do at last fall miserably into despair of ever attaining to holiness and turn to wallowing in the mire of their lusts, or are fearfully swallowed up with horror of conscience. There are several false opinions whereby such ignorant zealots encourage themselves in their fruitless endeavors. Some of them judge that they are able to practice holiness because they are not compelled to sin, and may abstain from it if they will. To this they add that Christ, by the merit of his death, has restored that freedom of will to good which was lost by the fall, and has set nature upon its legs again, and that, if they endeavor to do what lies in them, Christ will do the rest by assisting them with the supplies of his saving grace. So they trust upon the grace of Christ to help them in their endeavors. They plead further that it would not consist with the justice of God to punish them for sin if they could not avoid it, and that it would be in vain for the ministers of the gospel to preach to them and exhort them to any saving duty if they cannot perform it. They produce examples of heathens and of such as had the name of Christians without any acquaintance with the faith that I have described, who have attained to a great excellency in religious words and works. My work at present is to deliver those ignorant zealots from their fruitless, tormenting labors by bringing them to despair of the attainment of holiness in a natural state, that they may seek it only in a new state by faith in Christ, where they may certainly find it without such tormenting labor and anxiety of spirit. For this end I shall confirm the truth asserted in the direction and fortify it against the before-mentioned false opinions by the ensuing considerations. First, the foundation of this assertion is firmly laid in the directions already explained and confirmed by many places of Scripture. For, if all endowments necessary to enable us for a holy practice are to be had only in a state of union and fellowship with Christ by faith, and faith itself, not by the natural power of free will, but by the power of Christ, coming into the soul by His Spirit, to unite us with Himself, who does not see that the attainment of true holiness by any of our most vigorous endeavors, while we continue in our natural condition, is altogether hopeless? I need add no more, were it not to show more fully what abundance of light the Scripture affords to guide us aright in this part of our way, that those who wander out of it, by following any false light of their own, or other corrupted judgments, may find themselves the more inexcusable. Secondly, it is evident that we cannot practice true holiness while we continue in a natural state, because we must be born again of water and of the Spirit, or else we cannot enter into the kingdom of God. John 3 verses 3 and 5 and we are created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2 verse 10. If we could love God and our neighbor as the law requires, without a new birth and creation, we might live without them. For Christ has said, This do, and thou shalt live. Luke 10 verse 28. Now a new birth and creation is more than a mere reforming and repairing our natural state. If we were put into a certain state and condition by the first birth and creation, much more are we by the second. For the first produces the substance of a man, as well as a state. The second has nothing to produce but a new state of the same person. And note that we were first created and born in Adam, the natural man, but our new birth and creation is in Christ, the spiritual man. And if any man be in Christ, he is in a new state, far different from the state of Adam before the fall. He is wholly a new creature. As it is written, Old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 Thirdly, it is positively asserted by the Apostle Paul that those that are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans 8 verse 8 Many are too remiss and negligent in considering the sense of this gospel phrase, what it is to be in the flesh. They understand no more by it than to be sinful or to be addicted inordinately to please the sensitive appetite. They should consider that. The Apostle speaks here of being in the flesh as the cause of sinfulness, as in the next verse he speaks of being in the flesh as the cause of holiness, and whatever cause it be, it must needs be distinct from its effect. Sin is a property of the flesh, or something that dwells in the flesh, Romans 7 verse 18, and therefore it is not the flesh itself. The flesh is that which lusteth against the spirit, Galatians 5 verse 17, and therefore it is not merely sinful lusting. 
the true interpretation is that by flesh is meant the nature of man, as it is corrupted by the fall of Adam, and propagated from him to us, in that corrupt state by natural generation, and to be in the flesh is to be in a natural state, as to be in the spirit is to be in a new state, by the spirit of Christ dwelling in us. Romans 8 verse 9. The corrupt nature is called flesh because it is received by carnal generation, and the new nature is called spirit because it is received by spiritual regeneration. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. John 3 verse 6. So the apostle, if he be rightly understood, has said enough to make us despair utterly of attaining to true holiness while we continue in a natural state. Fourthly, the apostle testifies that those that have been taught as the truth is in Jesus have learned to avoid the former sinful conversation by putting off the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and by putting on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, Ephesians 4 verses 21, 22 and 24. Putting off the old man and putting on the new man is the same with not being in the flesh but in the spirit in the foregoing testimony, that is, putting off our natural state and putting on a new state by union and fellowship with Christ. The apostle himself shows that by the new man is meant that excellent state where Christ is all and in all. Colossians 3 verse 11. Therefore by the old man must needs be meant the natural state of man, wherein he is without the saving enjoyment of Christ which is called old because of the new state to which believers are brought by their regeneration in Christ. It is a manner of expression peculiar to the gospel, as well as the former, and as slightly considered by those that think that the apostle's meaning is only that they should put off sinfulness and put on holiness in their conversation, and so they think to become new men by turning over a new leaf in their practice and leading a new life. Let them learn here that the old and new man are two contrary states, containing in them not only sin and holiness, but all other things that dispose and incline us to the practice of them, and that the old man must be put off as crucified with Christ before we can be freed from the practice of sin, Romans 6 verses 6 and 7, and therefore we cannot lead a new life until we have first gotten a new state by faith in Christ. Let me add here that the meaning of the apostle is the same, Romans 13 verses 12, 13 and 14 where he directs us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ as the means whereby we may cast off the deeds of darkness and to walk honestly as in the daytime, not fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. Fifthly, our natural state has several properties that wholly disable us for the practice of holiness and enslave us to the practice of sin while we continue in it. Here I shall show that the old man, the flesh or natural state, is not only sin as some would have it, but it contains in it several things which I shall name that make it to be sinful besides several other things that make it miserable. I have showed that in Christ we have all endowments necessary to frame us for godliness. So in our fleshly state we have all things contrary to that holy frame. One thing belonging to our natural state is the guilt of sin, even of Adam's first sin, and of the sinful deprivation of our nature and of all our own actual transgressions, and therefore we are by nature the children of wrath, Ephesians 2 verse 3, and under the curse of God. The benefit of remission of our sins and freedom from condemnation is not given to us in the flesh or in a natural state, but only in Christ. Romans 8 verse 1, Ephesians 1 verse 7. And can we imagine that a man should be able to prevail against sin, while God is against him and curses him? Another property inseparable from the former is an evil conscience, which denounces the wrath of God against us for sin, and inclines us to abhor him as our enemy, rather than to love him as hath been showed. Or, if it be a blind conscience, it hardens us the more in our sins. A third property is an evil inclination tending only to sin, which therefore is called sin that dwelleth in us, and the law of sin in our members, that powerfully subdues and captivates us to the service of sin. Romans 7 verses 20 and 23. It is a fixed propensity to sin against the law without any deliberation, and therefore its lustings are not to be prevented by any diligence or watchfulness. The mind of the flesh is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Romans 8 verse 7. How vain then is it to plead that they can do no good if they will, when their minds and the will itself are enslaved in sin. A fourth property is subjection to the power of the devil, who is the god of this world that has blinded the minds of all that believe not. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, and will certainly conquer all whom he fights with upon his own ground, that is, in a natural state. And from all these properties we may well conclude that our natural state has the property never to be good, to be stark dead in sin, Ephesians 2 verse 1, according to the sentence denounced against the first sin of mankind in Adam, In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die, Genesis 2 verse 17, for you can no more bring it to holiness by any the most vehement motives and endeavours than you can bring a dead carcass to life by chafing and rubbing it. 
You can stir up no strength or fortifying grace in the natural man by such motives and endeavours, because there is no strength in him to be stirred up. Romans 5, verse 6. Though you do all that lies in you to the utmost, while you are in the flesh, you can do nothing but sin, for there is no good thing in you, as the Apostle Paul shows by his own experience. I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Romans 7, verse 18. Sixthly, we have no good ground to trust on Christ, to help us to will or to do that which is acceptable to him, while we continue in our natural state, or imagine that freedom of will to holiness is restored to us by the merit of his death. For, as it hath been already showed, Christ aimed at a higher end in his incarnation, death, and resurrection than the restoration of the decay and ruins of our natural state. He aimed to advance us by union and fellowship with himself to a new state, a more excellent than the state of nature ever was, that we might live to God not by the power of a natural free will, but by the power of his spirit living and acting in us. So we may conclude that our natural state is irrecoverable and desperate because Christ, the only Saviour, did not aim at the recovery of it. It is neither holy nor happy, but subject to sin and to all miseries, as long as it remains. Even those that are in a new state in Christ and serve the law of God with their mind, do yet with their flesh serve the law of sin. Romans 7, verse 25. As far as it remains in them, it lusts against the Spirit. Galatians 5, verse 17. And it remains dead because of sin, even when the Spirit is life to them because of righteousness. Romans 8, verse 10. It must be wholly abolished by death before we can be perfected in that holiness and happiness that is by faith in Christ. After God had promised salvation by Christ, the seed of the woman, he placed cherubim and a flaming sword to keep man out of paradise thereby teaching him that his first state was lost without hope, and that the happiness intended for him was wholly new. Our old natural man was not revived and reformed by the death of Christ, but crucified together with him, and therefore to be abolished and destroyed out of us by virtue of his death. Romans 6 verse 6. It is like the part of a garment infected with the plague of leprosy, which was to be rent off as incurable, that the garment might be clean. Leviticus 13 verse 56. If Christ be not in us, we are reprobates. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5. That is, we are in a state which God has rejected from partaking of his salvation, so that we are not to expect any assistance from God to make us holy in it, but rather to deliver us from it. Seventhly, this does not at all discharge those that are in a natural state from obligation to holiness of life, nor render them excusable for their sins at the tribunal of God's justice. For God hath made men upright, but they sought out many inventions. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 29. Observe well the words of this text, and you will find that all they who have sought out many inventions, rather than upright walking, are comprehended in man that was at first made upright. And man, in the text, signifies all mankind. The first Adam was all mankind, as Jacob and Esau were two nations in the womb of Rebekah. Genesis 25 verse 23. God made us all, in our first parent, according to his own image, able and inclined to do his law. And in that pure nature, our obligation to obedience was first laid upon us, and the first willful transgression, whereby our first parent bereaved himself of the image of God, and brought upon himself the sentence of death, was our sin as well as his. For in one man, Adam, all have sinned, and so death is passed upon all. Romans 5 verse 12, because all mankind were in Adam's loins when the first sin was committed, even as Levi may be said to have paid tithes in Abraham before he was born because when his father Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, he was yet in his loins, Hebrews 7 verses 9 and 10, that the promise of God, that he will not charge the iniquities of parents upon their children, is a promise belonging to the new covenant confirmed in the blood of Christ, and it is yea and amen to us only in Christ, in whom we have another nature than that which our parents conveyed to us, so that we cannot justly claim the benefit of it in our old natural state, Jeremiah 31 verses 29, 30 and 31, and 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20. Those that account their impotency a sufficient plea to excuse them or others show that they were never truly humbled for that great willful transgression of all mankind in the loins of Adam. Inability to pay debt excuses not a debtor who has lavished away his estate, neither does drunkenness excuse the mad actings of a drunkard, but rather aggravates his sin. And our impotency consists not in a mere want of executive power, but in the want of a willing mind to practice true holiness and righteousness. Naturally, we love it not, we like it not, but lust against it, Galatians 5 verse 17, and hate the light, John 3 verse 20. If men in a natural state had a hearty love and liking to true holiness, and a desire and serious endeavour to practice it, out of hearty love and yet failed in the event, then they might, under some pretense, plead for their excuse, as some do for them, that they were compelled to sin by an inevitable fate. But none have just cause to plead any such thing for their excuse, because none endeavour to practice true holiness, out of hearty love to it, 
until the good work be begun in their souls, and when God has begun, he will perfect it, Philippians 1 verse 6, and will, in the meantime, accept their ready mind, though they fall short in performance, 2 Corinthians 8 verse 12. How abominable then and filthy is man that drinketh iniquity as water, Job 15 verse 16, that cannot practice holiness because he will not. This is their just condemnation, that they love darkness rather than light. They deserve to be partakers with the devils in torments, as they partake with them in evil lusts, and their inability to do good will no more excuse them than it excuses the devils. Eighthly, neither will this assertion make it a vain thing to preach the gospel to natural people, and to exhort them to true repentance, and faith in Christ for their conversion and salvation, for the design of our preaching is not to bring them to holiness in their natural state, but to raise them above it, and to present them perfect in Christ to the performance of those duties, Colossians 1 verse 28. And though they cannot perform those duties by their natural strength, yet the gospel is made effectual for their conversion and salvation by the power of the Holy Ghost, which accomplishes the preaching of it, to quicken those that are dead in sin, and to create them anew in Christ by giving to them repentance unto life and a lively faith in Christ. The gospel comes to the elect of God, not only in word, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in such assurance that they receive it with the joy of the Holy Ghost. 1 Thessalonians 1 verses 5 and 6. The gospel is the ministration of the Spirit that giveth life. 2 Corinthians 3 verses 6 to 8. It is mighty through God. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4. It depends not at all upon the power of our free will to make it successful for our conversion, but it conveys into the soul that life and power whereby we receive and obey it. Christ can make those that are dead in sin to hear his voice and live. John 5 verse 25. Therefore he can speak to them by his gospel and command them to repent and believe with good success, as well as he could say to dead carcasses, Talitha kumi, Mark 5 verse 41, Lazarus come forth, John 11 verses 43 to 44, and to the sick of the palsy, arise, take up thy bed and go into thine house, Matthew 9 verse 6. Ninthly, there is no reason that the examples of heathen philosophers, or any Jews or Christians by outward profession that have lived without the saving knowledge of God in Christ, should move us by their wise sayings and renowned attainments in the practice of devotion and morality, to recede from this truth that has been so fully confirmed out of the Holy Scriptures. Have we not cause to judge that the Apostle Paul, while he was a zealous Pharisee, and at least some few of the great multitude of the Jews in his time that were zealous of the law and had the instruction of the Holy Scriptures attained as near to that true holiness as the heathen philosophers or any others in their natural state. Yet Paul, after he was enlightened with the saving knowledge of Christ, judged himself the chief of sinners in his highest former attainments, though in the judgment of others he was blameless touching the righteousness which is in the law, and he found it necessary to begin to live to God in a new way by faith in Christ, and to suffer the loss of all his former attainments, and to count them but done, that he might win Christ. 1 Timothy 1 verse 15, Philippians 3 verses 6, 7, and 8. And none of the great multitude of Jews that followed after the law of righteousness ever attained to it, while they sought it not by faith in Christ. Romans 9 verses 31 and 32. What performances are greater in outward appearance than for a man to give all his goods to the poor and to give his body to be burnt? And yet the scripture allows us to suppose that this may be done without true charity, and therefore without any true holiness of the heart and life. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 3. Men in a natural state may have strong convictions of the infinite power, wisdom, justice, and goodness of God, and of the judgment to come, and the everlasting happiness of the godly, and torments of the wicked. And these convictions may stir them up, not only to make a high profession, and to utter rare sayings concerning God and godliness, but also to labor with great earnestness to avoid all known sin, to subdue their lusts, to perform universal obedience to God in all known duties, and to serve him with their lives and estates to the utmost, and to extort out of their hearts some kind of love to God and godliness, that, if possible, they may escape the terrible torments of hell and procure everlasting happiness by their endeavors. Yet all their love to God is but forced and feigned. They have no hearty liking to God or his service. They account him a hard master, and his commandments grievous, and they repine and fret inwardly at the burden of them, and were it not for fear of everlasting fire, they would little regard the enjoyment of God in heaven, and they would be glad if they might have the liberty to enjoy their lust without danger of damnation. The highest preferment of those that are born only after the flesh in Abraham's family is bound to be children of the bondwoman, Galatians 4 verse 23, and though they toil more in God's service than many of his dear children, yet God accepts not their service because their best performances are slavish, without any childlike affections towards God, and no better than glittering sins. And yet these natural men are not at all beholden to the goodness of their natures for these counterfeit shows of holiness, or for the least abstaining from the grossest sin. If God should leave men fully to their own natural corruptions, and to the power of Satan as they deserve, all show of religion and morality would be quickly banished out of the world, 
and we should grow past feeling in wickedness, and like to the cannibals, who are as good by nature as ourselves. But God, who can restrain the burning of the fiery furnace without quenching it, and the flowing of water without changing its nature, also restrains the working of natural corruption without mortifying it, and, through the greatness of his wisdom and power, makes his enemies to yield feigned obedience to him, Psalm 66, verse 3, and to do many things good for the matter of them, though they can do nothing in a right holy manner. He has appointed several means to restrain our corruptions, as the law, terrors of conscience, terrible judgments and rewards in this life, magistrates, human laws, labor for necessaries, as food and raiment, and those gospel means that are effectual for sanctification serve also for restraint of sin. God has gracious ends in this restraint of sin, that his church may be preserved, and his gospel preached in the world, and that these natural men may be in a better capacity to receive the instructions of the gospel, and that such of them as are chosen may in due time be converted, and that those of them that are not truly converted may enjoy more of the goodness of God here, and suffer the less torments hereafter. As vile and wicked as the world is, we have cause to praise and to magnify the free goodness of God, that it is no worse. Direction 6. Those that endeavour to perform sincere obedience to all the commands of Christ as the condition whereby they are to procure for themselves a right and title to salvation, and a good ground to trust on him for the same, seek their salvation by the works of the law, and not by the faith of Christ, as he is revealed in the gospel, and they shall never be able to perform sincerely any true, holy obedience by all such endeavours. Explication for the understanding the terms of this direction, note here that I take salvation as comprehending justification as well as other saving benefits, and sincere obedience as comprehending holy resolutions as well as the fulfilling of them. The most of men that have any sense of religion are prone to imagine that the sure way to establish the practice of holiness and righteousness is to make it the procuring condition of the favour of God and all happiness. This may appear by the various false religions that have prevailed most in the world, in this way the heathens were brought to their best devotion and morality by the knowledge of the judgment of God that those that violate several of the great duties to God and their neighbor are worthy of death, and by their consciences accusing or excusing them, according to the practice of them, Romans 1 verse 32 and chapter 2 verses 14 and 15. Our consciences are informed by the common light of natural reason that it is just in God to require us to perform these duties that we may avoid his wrath and enjoy his favor, and we cannot find any better way than this to obtain happiness, or to stir up ourselves to duty without divine revelation. Yet because our own consciences testify that we often fail in the performance of those duties, we are inclined by self-love to persuade ourselves that our sincere endeavours to do the best we can shall be sufficient to procure the favour of God and pardon for all our failings. Thus we see that our persuasion of salvation by the condition of sincere obedience has its original from our corrupt natural reason and is part of the wisdom of this world. It is none of the wisdom of God in a mystery, that hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world to our glory. It is none of those things which the Spirit of God, which have not entered into the heart of man, and which the natural man cannot receive, for they are foolishness to him, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2 verses 6, 7, 9, and 14. It is none of the foolishness of preaching, whereby it pleased God to save them that believe. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21 and though we have a better way revealed to us in the gospel for the enjoyment of the favour of God and holiness itself, and all salvation, without any procuring condition of works, by the free gift of God's grace, through faith in Christ, yet it is very difficult to persuade men out of a way that they are naturally addicted to, and that has forestalled and captivated their judgments, and is bred in their bone, and therefore cannot easily be gotten out of the flesh. Most of those that live under the hearing and profession of the gospel are not brought to hate sin as sin, and to love godliness for itself, though they be convinced of the necessity of it to salvation, and therefore they cannot love it heartily. The only means they can take to bring themselves to it is to stir up themselves to a hypocritical practice in their old natural way, that they may avoid hell and get heaven by their works, and their own consciences witness that the zeal and love that they have for God and godliness, their self-denial, sorrow for sin, strictness of life, are in a manner forced and extorted from them by slavish fear and mercenary hope, so that they are afraid that, if they should trust on Christ for salvation by free grace without works, the fire of their zeal and devotion would be quickly extinguished, and they would grow careless in religion, and let loose the reins of their lusts, and bring certain damnation upon themselves. This moves them to count them the only boagenesies and powerful preachers who preach little or none of the doctrine of free grace, but rather spend their pains in rebuking sin, and urging people to get Christ and his salvation by their works, and thundering hell and damnation against sinners. 
It has been further observed that some that have contended much for salvation by free grace, without any condition of works, have fallen into antinomian opinions and licentious practices. The experience of these things has much prevailed with some learned and zealous men, of late among ourselves, to recede from the doctrine of justification by faith without works, formerly professed unanimously, and strongly defended by the Protestants against the Papists, as a principal article of true religion. They have persuaded themselves that such a way of justification is ineffectual, yea, destructive to sanctification, and that the practice of sincere obedience cannot be established against antinomian dotages and prevailing lusts, except it be made the necessary condition of our justification, and so of our eternal salvation. Therefore they conclude that God has certainly made sincere obedience to be the condition of our salvation, and they have endeavoured to new-model the Protestant doctrine and to interpret the Holy Scriptures in a way agreeable and subservient to this, their only sure foundation of holiness. But I hope to show that this, their imagined sure foundation of holiness, was never laid by the Holy God, but that it is rather an error in the foundation, pernicious to the true faith and to holiness of life. I account it an error especially to be abhorred and detested because we are so prone to be seduced by it, and because it is an error whereby Satan, transforming himself into an angel of light and a patron of holiness, has greatly withstood the gospel in the apostles' times, and stirred up men to persecute it out of zeal for the law, and has since prevailed to set up and maintain popery, whereby the mystery of iniquity works apace in these days, to corrupt the purity of the gospel among Protestants, and to heal the deadly wound that was given to popery by preaching the doctrine of justification by faith without works. One thing asserted in the direction against this fundamental error is that it is a way of salvation by the works of the law, and not by the faith of Christ, as revealed in the gospel. Though the maintainers of it would have us believe that it is the only way of the gospel, that so we may not doubt of its power and efficacy for our justification, sanctification, and our whole salvation. Their reasons are, because the law, as a covenant of works, requires us to do all its commandments perfectly, that we may live, whereas they plead only for a milder condition of sincere doing, that we may live, and they plead not for doing duties, as obliged thereunto by the authority of the law given of God by Moses, but only in obedience to the commands of Christ in the gospel. Neither do they plead for salvation by sincere obedience without Christ, but only by Christ, and through his merit and righteousness. And they acknowledge that both salvation itself and sincere obedience are given to them freely by the grace of Christ, so that all is of grace. They acknowledge also that their salvation is by faith, because sincere obedience is wrought in them by believing the gospel, and is included in the nature of that faith which is the entire condition of our salvation, and some call it the resignating act of faith. But all these reasons are but a fallacious mask upon a legal way of salvation to make it look like pure gospel, as I shall evince by the following particulars. First, all that seek salvation by the sincere performance of good works, as the procuring condition, are condemned by the Apostle Paul for seeking righteousness by the works of the law, and not by faith. Romans 9 verse 32, and for seeking to be justified by the law, and falling from the grace of Christ. Galatians 5 verse 4. This one assertion, if it can be proved, is enough to pluck off the fallacious mask from the condition of sincere obedience, and to make men abhor it as a damning legal doctrine that bereaves its followers of all salvation by Christ. And the proof of it is not difficult to persons that carefully consider a point of so great moment for their salvation. The Jews and Judaizing Christians, against whom the Apostle chiefly disputed in his whole controversy, did not possess any hope of being justified by perfect obedience, according to the rigour of the law, but only by such obedience as they accounted to be sincere and not hypocritical. And we have no cause to doubt but that the Judaizing Galatians had learned by the Gospel to distinguish sincere obedience from hypocrisy. The Jewish religion bound all that professed it to acknowledge themselves to be sinners, as appears by their anniversary humiliation on the Day of Atonement, and several other rites of the law, and many clear testimonies in the oracles of God that were committed to them. Psalm 143 verse 2, Proverbs 10 verse 9, Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20. Yet they knew they were bound to turn to the Lord with all their hearts in sincerity and uprightness, and that God would accept of sincere obedience, for which cause they might better put it for the condition of the law than we can of the gospel. Psalm 51 verses 6 and 10. Deuteronomy 6 verse 5 and chapter 30 verse 10, so that if the apostle had disputed against those that held only perfect obedience to be the condition of justification, he had contended with his own shadow, and they might as readily judge sincere obedience to be the condition of justification under the law, as we can judge it to be the condition under the gospel. Neither does the apostle condemn them merely for accounting sincere obedience to the law as given by Moses to be the condition of their justification, but more generally for seeking salvation by their own works. 
and he alleges against them that Abraham, who lived before the law of Moses, was not justified by any of his works, though he performed sincere obedience, and that David, who lived under the law of Moses, was not justified by his works, though he performed sincere obedience, and was as much bound to obey the law given by Moses as we are to obey any commands of Christ in the gospel. Romans 4, verses 2, 3, 5, and 6. Neither does he condemn them for seeking their salvation only by works, without respecting at all the grace and salvation that is by Christ. For the Judaizing Galatians were yet professors of the grace and salvation of Christ, though they thought obedience to the law a necessary condition for the partaking of it, as also many other Judaizing believers did. And doubtless they accounted themselves obliged thereunto, not only by the authority of Moses, but of Christ also, whom they owned as their Lord and Saviour. And we may be sure it was no damning error to account Moses' law obliging at that time, for many thousands of the Jews that were found believers held the ceremonies of Moses to be in force at that time, and Paul was tender towards them in it. Acts 21 verses 20 and 26, and chapter 15 verse 5. And other Jews sought justification not only by their sincere works, but also by trusting on the promise made to Abraham, and on their priesthood and sacrifices, which were types of Christ and the most legal Pharisees would thank God for their works as proceeding from His grace, Luke 18, verse 11. And they could as well acknowledge their salvation to be by faith, as the asserters of salvation by sincere obedience can in these days, for they accounted that their sincere obedience was wrought in them by believing the word of God, which contained gospel as well as legal doctrine in it, and therefore it must be included in the nature of faith, if faith were taken for the condition of their whole salvation. Let the asserters of the condition of sincere obedience learn from hence that they are building again that Judaism which the Apostle Paul destroyed, whereby the Jews stumbled at Christ, Romans 9 verse 32, and the Galatians were in danger of falling from Christ and grace, Galatians 5 verses 2 and 4, and let them beware of falling under that curse which he has denounced on this very occasion against any man or angel that shall preach any other gospel than that which he has preached, Galatians 1 verses 8 and 9. Secondly, the difference between the law and gospel does not at all consist in this, that the one requires perfect doing, the other only sincere doing, but in this, that the one requires doing, the other not doing, but believing for life and salvation. Their terms are different, not only in degree, but in their whole nature. The Apostle Paul opposes the believing required in the gospel to all doing for life as the condition proper to the law, Galatians 3 verse 12. The law is not of faith, but the man that doth them shall live in them, Romans 4 verse 5. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. If we seek salvation by ever so easy and mild a condition of works, we thereby bring ourselves under the terms of the law and become debtors to fulfill the whole law in perfection, though we intended to engage ourselves only to fulfill it in part. Galatians 5 verse 3. For the law is a complete declaration of the only terms whereby God will judge all that are not brought to despair of procuring salvation by any of their own works, and to receive it as a gift freely given to them by the grace of God in Christ. So that all that seek salvation, right or wrong, knowingly or ignorantly, by any works, less or more, whether invented by their own superstition or commanded by God in the Old or New Testament, shall at last stand or fall according to those terms. Thirdly, sincere obedience cannot be performed to all the commands of Christ in the gospel, except it be also performed to the moral law as given by Moses, and as obliging us by that authority. Some assenters of the condition of salvation by sincere obedience to the commands of Christ would fain be free from the authority of the law of Moses, because that justifies none but thunders out a curse against all those that seek salvation by the works of it, Galatians 3 verses 10 and 11. But... If they were at all justified by sincere works, their respect to Moses' authority would not hinder their success, for many that were good Christians accounted themselves bound to obey not only the moral, but the ceremonial law, and if they had sought justification by any works, they would have sought it by those. Acts 20 verses 20 and 21. They knew not of any justification by sincere works, as commanded only in the gospel, yet if they had erred in anything absolutely necessary to salvation, the apostles would not have tolerated their weakness. And whether they will or no, they must seek their salvation by the works of the moral law as given by Moses, or else they can never get it by sincere obedience to the commands of Christ. Christ never loved their new condition so well as to abolish the mosaical authority of the moral law for the establishment of it. He came not to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them in the practice required by them, and has declared that those that break one of the least of these commandments and teach men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, verses 17 and 19. He commands us to do to men whatsoever we would they should do to us, because this is the law and the prophets. 
which is sufficient to prove that he would have us to account the law authoritative to oblige us in this matter. He requires his disciples to observe and do whatsoever these scribes and Pharisees bid them, because they sat in Moses' seat, Matthew 23, verses 2 and 3. And to come to the point in hand, when Christ had occasion to answer the questions of those that were guilty of the same error that I am now dealing with, in seeking salvation by their own works, he showed them that they must obey the commands, as they were already established by the Mosaical authority in the scripture of the Old Testament. What is written, How readest thou? This do, and thou shalt live. Luke 5, verses 26 and 28. If thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments, which are, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, etc. In like manner, the apostles of Christ urged the performance of moral duties upon believers by the authority of the law given by Moses. The apostle Paul exhorts to love one another, because he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law, Romans 13, verse 8, and to honor our father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, Ephesians 6, verse 2. The apostle John exhorts to love others as no new but an old commandment. The apostle James exhorts to fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, and to keep all the commandments of the law, one as well as another, because he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. James 2, verses 8, 10, and 11. Sound Protestants have accounted the denial of the authority of the moral law of Moses to be an antinomian error. And though our late prevaricators against antinomianism maintain not this error, yet they establish a worse error, justification by their sincere gospel works. I think the denomination of the antinomians arose from this error. The law of Moses had its authority at first from Christ, for Christ was the Lord God of Israel that ordained the law by angels on Mount Sinai, in the hand of Moses, a mediator for the Israelites, who were then his only church, and with whom we believing Gentiles are now joined as fellow members of one and the same body, Ephesians 3 verse 6. And though Christ has since abrogated some of the commandments then given by Moses concerning figurative ceremonies and judicial proceedings, yet he has not annulled the obligatory authority of the moral law, but has left it in its full force to oblige in moral duties that still are to be practised, as when some acts of any parliament are repealed, the authority of the same parliament remains inviolable in other acts that are not repealed. I know they object that the ten commands of the moral law, the administration of death, written and engraven on stones, are also done away by Christ, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 7, but this makes altogether against their conditional covenant, for they are the ministration of death, and are done away, not as they commanded perfect obedience, for even Christ himself commands us to be perfect, Matthew 5 verse 48, but as they were conditions for procuring life and avoiding death, established by a promise of life to the doers, and a curse to the breakers of them, Galatians 3 verses 10 and 12. The covenant made with Israel on Mount Sinai is abolished by Christ, the mediator of the new covenant, Hebrews 8 verses 8, 9 and 13, and the Ten Commandments bind us not as they were words of that covenant, Exodus 34 verse 28. I mean they bind us not as conditions of that covenant, except we seek to be justified by works, for the law as a covenant still stands in force enough to curse those that seek salvation by their own works. Galatians 3 verse 10. And if abolished, it is only to those that are in Christ by faith. Galatians 2 verses 19 and 20, Acts 3 verses 20 to 25, and chapter 15 verses 10 and 11. But the Ten Commandments bind us still, as they were then given to a people that were at that time under the covenant of grace made with Abraham, to show them what duties are holy, just, and good, well-pleasing to God, and to be a rule for their conversation. The result of all this, that we must still practice moral duties as commanded by Moses, but we must not seek to be justified by our practice. If we use them as a rule of life, not as conditions of justification, they can be no ministration of death or killing letter unto us. Their perfection indeed makes them harder terms to procure life by, but a better rule to discover all imperfections, and to guide us to that perfection which we should aim at. And it will be our wisdom not to part with the authority of the Decalogue of Moses until our new divines can furnish us with another system of morality, as complete as that, and as excellently composed and ordered by the wisdom of God, and more authentic than that is. Fourthly, those that endeavour to procure Christ's salvation by their sincere obedience to all the commands of Christ act contrary to that way of salvation by Christ, free grace and faith, discovered in the gospel, though they own it in profession ever so highly. 1. They act contrary to the way of salvation by Christ, for they would heal themselves and save themselves from the power and pollution of sin, and procure God's favour by performing sincere obedience before they are come to Christ, the only physician and saviour. They lay their own obedience lowest in the foundation of their salvation, and build the enjoyment of Christ upon it, who ought to be the only foundation. They would sanctify themselves before they have a sure interest in Christ, and going about to establish their own righteousness, they do not submit themselves to the righteousness of God in Christ. 
Romans 10 verses 3 and 4. Sometimes they will call the righteousness of Christ their legal righteousness, that they may make room for an evangelical righteousness of their own works, to be the immediate procuring cause of their justification by Christ, whereas the Apostle Paul knew no evangelical righteousness but that of Christ, which he called the righteousness of faith without the law, Romans 3 verses 21 and 22, and not of the law, Philippians 3 verse 9. Thus they make void Christ's salvation while they pretend to own it, and Christ profits them nothing. Christ is become of none effect to them while they would be justified by the law, Galatians 5 verses 2 and 4. If we would be saved by Christ, we must own ourselves dead, lost sinners that can have no righteousness for justification but His, no life or ability to do good until God bring us into union and fellowship with Him. 2. They also act contrary to salvation by grace according to the true meaning of the gospel, for we are not saved by grace as the supreme cause of salvation by the intervention of works, given and accepted by grace as the procuring cause, in which sense we might be saved by grace, though by a covenant of works, as a servant that has money given him by his master, to purchase an annuity for his master at a low rate, may profess that he had an annuity given him freely, and yet that he has purchased it, and may claim it as a due debt. But we are saved by grace, as the immediate and complete cause of our whole salvation, excluding procurement of our salvation by the condition of works, and claiming it by any law as a due debt. The scripture teaches us that there is a perfect opposition and utter irreconcilableness between salvation by grace and works. If by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. Romans 11 verse 6, so also there is an opposition between a reward reckoned of grace and of debt. Romans 4 verse 4, between a promise of happiness by the law and by grace. Romans 4 verses 13 and 16. God is so jealous of the glory of his free grace that he will not save us by any works, though of his own working in us, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2 verse 9. He knows when he heals men by physic or maintains them by the labor of their hands that they are prone to attribute the glory rather to the means they use than to his sole bounty and goodness. 3. They do also exactly contrary to the way of salvation by faith, for, as I have showed already, the faith which is required for our salvation in the gospel is to be understood in a sense contrary to doing good works as a condition to procure our salvation, and so the true difference between the terms of the law and of the gospel may be maintained. Believing is opposed to all working for salvation and the law of works to the law of faith, Romans 4 verse 5 and chapter 3 verse 27, Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. Therefore we must not here consider faith as a work of righteousness, as comprehending any works of righteousness performed or done as a condition to procure a right and title to Christ, as the hand whereby we work to own him as our bread and drink, as our wages, but only as the hand whereby we receive Christ as freely given to us, or as the mouth whereby we eat and drink him, as has been proved. God gives a sufficient right to receive Christ and his salvation by the free gospel offer and invitation, so that he leaves nothing for our faith to do, but to lay hold of him as a free gift, that the glory of our salvation may not be ascribed at all to our faith or works, but only to this free grace of God in Christ. It is of faith that it may be by grace. Romans 4 verse 16. Fifthly, Christ or his apostles never taught a gospel that requires such a condition of works for salvation as they plead. The texts of scripture which they usually allege for their purpose are either contrary to it or widely distant from it, as they might learn from many Protestant interpreters if their affection to a popish tenant had not blinded them. I shall instance briefly only a few of those texts, whereby you may have some light to judge of the true meaning of the rest. That obedience of faith mentioned by the Apostle Paul as the great design of gospel preaching, Romans 1 verse 5, is as contrary to their condition of sincere obedience for salvation as the law of faith is to the law of works. Romans 3 verse 23. It is an obedience that consists in believing the report of the gospel, as the apostle explains himself. Romans 10 verse 16. They have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? Faith is to be imputed for righteousness, not because it is a work of righteousness itself, but because we do by it renounce all confidence in any righteous works whatsoever, and trust on him who justifies the ungodly, as is clear by that very text which they usually pervert for their purpose. Romans 4 verse 5. They grossly pervert those words of Paul, Romans 2 verses 6 and 7, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, where they will have Paul to be declaring the terms of the gospel when he is evidently declaring the terms of the law, to prove that both Jews and Gentiles are all under sin, and that no flesh can be justified by the works of the law, as appears by the tenor of his following discourse, Romans 3 verses 9 and 10. 
They join evidently with the papists against the concurrent judgment of the best Protestant divines in the interpretation of that text, James 2, verse 24. Ye see, then, how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only, where they will have James to deliver the doctrine of justification in more proper expressions than the Apostle Paul, who teaches justification by faith without works, though Paul treated on this doctrine as his principal subject, and James only speaks of it occasionally as a motive to the practice of good works, whereby we may easily judge which of their expressions are to be taken for the most proper. Protestants have showed sufficiently that James speaks not of a true saving faith, but of such a dead faith as devils have, not of justification in a proper sense, but of the declaration and manifestation of it by its fruits. Besides, he speaks of justification by works, as commanded in the law given by Moses, as appears by his citing the commandments of the law, verses 8 and 11, which our contrivers of the new divinity would have nothing to do with in their model of the doctrine of justification. Another text alleged by them is Revelation 22, verse 14, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. But the Greek word, which is here translated right, is translated power or privilege, John 1 verse 12. It signifies here a rightful possession of the fruit of the tree of life, and not a mere title to it. So this text proves no more than what the Protestants generally acknowledge, that good works are the way wherein we are to walk to the enjoyment and possession of the glory of Christ, though a title to Christ and his glorious salvation be freely given us without any procuring condition of works. They account also that, when the happiness of heaven is called a reward, it must needs imply a procuring condition of works, as Revelation 22 verse 12, Matthew 5 verse 12. But though it be called a reward because it is given after the doing of good works, and because it recompenses good works, better than any wages on earth can recompense the laborer, yet it is a reward of grace, not of debt. Romans 4 verse 4. It is no proper wages, but a free gift. Romans 6 verse 24. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Another thing asserted in the direction is that those who endeavor to perform this sincere obedience, as the condition to procure a right and title to Christ and his salvation, shall never be able to perform sincerely any true obedience by all such endeavors. Though they labor earnestly and pray fervently, fast frequently, and oblige themselves to holiness by many vows, and press themselves to the practice of it by the most forcible motives, taken from the infinite power, justice, and knowledge of God, the equity and goodness of his commands, the salvation of Christ, everlasting happiness and misery, or any other motive improved by the most affectionate meditation, yet they shall never attain to the end which they aim at in such an erroneous way. They may restrain their corruptions and bring themselves to many hypocritical, slavish performances whereby they may be esteemed among men as eminent saints, but they shall not be able to mortify one corruption, or to perform one duty in such a holy manner as God approves. Yet here I censure only an error, not the life of the persons that maintain it. I have heard that some preach legally and pray evangelically. I doubt not, but the frame of their hearts and lives is rather according to their prayers than their sermons. Though Peter complied with Judaism in an outward act of profession, yet he lived himself like a Christian, Galatians 2 verses 11 and 14. I affirm only that no godly person did or could attain to his godliness in this erroneous way. And what a lamentable disappointment this is to those that have attempted to alter the Protestant doctrine, and to pervert and confound law and gospel, and have bred much contention in the church, that they might secure the practice of sincere obedience against antinomian errors, by making it the procuring condition of their salvation. When... After all this ado, the remedy is found to be as bad as the disease, equally unserviceable and destructive to that great end for which they designed it, and that it has an antinomian effect and operation, contrary to the power of godliness. Much more might be said for the confutation of this novel doctrine, but if this one thing be well proved, it may be sufficient to make the zealous contrivers of it ashamed of their craft, and angry with themselves, and sorry, that they have taken so much pains and stretched their wits to maintain such an unprofitable, unsanctifying opinion. It will be sufficient for the proof of it if I show that the practice of true holiness cannot possibly be attained by seeking to be saved by the works of the law, because I have already proved that this doctrine of salvation by sincere obedience is according to the terms of the law and not of the gospel. And hereby those also may see their error that ascribe justification only to the gospel and sanctification to the law. Yet because those asserters of the condition of sincere obedience will hardly be persuaded by what has been said, that it is the way of the law of works, I shall, for their more full conviction, sufficiently manifest that it is of no other nature and operation than any other doctrine that is proper to the law and has no better fruit, as I proceed to prove by the following arguments that holiness cannot be attained by seeking it by the law of works, that so it may appear not worthy to be called gospel doctrine. 
First, the way of salvation by the works of the law is contrary and destructive to those necessary means of a holy practice that have been laid down in the foregoing directions, and manifestly proved out of the holy scriptures. I have made it appear that a hearty propensity to a holy practice cannot be attained without some good persuasion of our reconciliation with God by justification, and of our everlasting happiness, and of sufficient strength both to will and to perform our duty, and that these and all other endowments necessary to the same end are to be had only in Christ, by union and fellowship with him, and that Christ himself with all his fullness is united to us by faith, which is not a condition to procure a right or title to Christ, but an instrument whereby we receive him actually in our hearts, by trusting on him for all salvation freely promised to us in the gospel. All these means of a holy practice are things wherein our spiritual life and happiness consist, so that, if we have them, everlasting life is begun in us already, and because they are the necessary means of a holy practice, therefore the beginning of everlasting life in us must not be placed after such a practice as the fruit and consequence of it, but must go before it as the cause before the effect. Now the terms of the law are directly contrary to this method. They place the practice of holiness before life, and make it to be the means and procuring cause of life, as Paul describes them, Romans 10 verse 5, the man that doeth these things shall live by them. By these terms you are first to do the holy duties commanded, before you have any interest in the life promised, or any right to lay hold of it as yours by faith. And you must practice holiness without the before-mentioned means, or else you can never attain to them. Thus the true means are turned out of their office, and instead of being causes, they are made to be effects and fruits of a holy practice. And it will be in vain ever to expect such effects and fruits, for holiness itself, with all its effects, must needs be destroyed, when its necessary causes are taken away. Therefore the Apostle Paul testifies that the way of salvation by the works of the law makes faith void, and the promises of none effect, and frustrates the grace of God, as if Christ died in vain, and makes Christ to be of no profit, and of none effect to us, as those that are fallen from grace, Romans 4 verse 14, Galatians 2 verse 21, and chapter 5 verses 2 and 4. Let us now examine the modern doctrine of salvation by the condition of sincere obedience to all the commands of Christ, and we shall quickly find it to be a chip of the same block with the former legal way of salvation, in the same manner destructive to the means of holiness and to holiness itself. It requires of us the performance of sincere obedience before we have the means necessary to produce it, by making it antecedent to our justification and persuasion of eternal happiness and our actual enjoyment of union and fellowship with Christ, and of that new nature which is to be had only in him by faith. It destroys the nature of that saving faith, whereby we actually receive and enjoy Christ and all his benefits, and knocks off our hands for laying hold of Christ and his salvation, by telling us still, as Christ told the legal worker after all his labor, that yet we lack something, Mark 10 verse 21, that it is presumption to take him as our own until we have performed the condition for our right and title to him, which is another kind of saving faith, otherwise called sincere obedience. By this devised conditional faith, Satan keeps many poor souls at bay, pouring upon their own hearts for many years together, to find whether they have performed the condition, and whether they have as yet any right to Christ for their salvation, not daring to venture to take him as their own. It is a strong partition wall that will certainly hinder the soul from coming to Christ, until it be thrown down by the knowledge of salvation by grace, without any procuring condition of works. And though it be accounted but as the payment of a peppercorn for a great estate, yet it is enough to break the ablest man in the world, because it debars him from laying hold of the only effectual means of holiness whereby that peppercorn may be obtained. Secondly, those that seek salvation by the works of the law therein act contrary to their natural state. They live and walk according to the flesh or old man, not according to the new state, by Christ living in them. I doubt not, but several of them that live under the light of the gospel are partakers of a new state in Christ and walk wholly in it, but the best in this world have in them flesh as well as spirit, and may act according to either state in some measure, and in this matter they do act only according to their carnal natural state. When the believing Galatians were seduced to a legal way of salvation, the Apostle Paul charges it upon them as their folly, that having begun in the spirit, they would now be made perfect in the flesh, Galatians 3 verse 3 and he resembles those that desire to be under the law to Abraham's son born of Hagar, the bondwoman, to show that such walk as those that are born after the flesh, not after the spirit, Galatians 4 verses 19, 23, and 29. The law was first given to Adam in his pure natural state to prescribe terms for his continuance in the happiness which he then enjoyed. And ever since that time the flesh or natural man is married to the law, and the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth, that is, until he be dead to his fleshly state by the body of Christ, and married to him that is raised from the dead, Romans 7 verses 1 and 4. 
We are not at all under the law as a covenant of works, according to our new state in Christ, as the Apostle testifies, Romans 6, verse 14. Ye are not under the law, but under grace. And Galatians 5, verse 18. If ye be led by the Spirit, ye are not under the law. From hence we may firmly conclude that none can possibly attain to true godliness by acting according to legal terms, because I have fully proved already that it is impossible to be godly while we are in the flesh, or in a natural state, and that as far as we act according to it, we can do nothing but sin. The law is weak through the flesh, that it cannot bring us to fulfill its own righteousness, Romans 8 verses 3 and 4. It is married to a cross piece of flesh, that is enmity to it, and can never be subject to it, Romans 8 verse 8. It sues the natural man for an old debt of obedience, that he is utterly unable to pay since the fall, and the success accordingly. It gets nothing. Neither do those take a better course that would bring themselves to holiness by making sincere obedience to Christ's commands the condition of their salvation. Their way is the same for substance with that of the Galatians before mentioned, who would be made perfect in the flesh, not by perfect obedience, but sincere, as has been showed before. Their endeavours to procure an interest in Christ by their sincere obedience testify against themselves that they do not act as people that are in Christ, but rather as people that judge themselves to be without an interest in Christ, and to be yet to seek for it. And sincere obedience is as impossible to be attained as perfect obedience if we act according to our dead natural state. Thirdly, as the law bereaves us of all strengthening means that are to be had by faith in Christ and finds us without strength in our natural state, so of itself it affords us no strength to fulfill its own commands. If there had been a law given that could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Galatians 3 verse 21. It does not so much as promise life until we have performed the obedience required by it. The man that doeth these things shall live by them. Romans 10 verse 5. It is well called a voice of words, Hebrews 12 verse 19, because its high and big words are not accompanied with an enlivening power, and the doctrine of life and salvation by sincere obedience is no better natured or more bountiful to us, for it exacts of us the performance of the condition before it allows us any life or salvation by Christ. Can any man rationally expect strength to obey sincerely by following a doctrine that does not so much as promise it? The true gospel is of a more benign nature, for it promises that God will pour out of his Spirit upon all flesh, Acts 2 verse 17, and will put his laws into our mind, and write them into our hearts, Hebrews 8 verse 10, and will cause us to walk in his statutes, that we shall keep his judgments and do them, Ezekiel 36 verse 27. The word of God's grace, that requires not holiness of us as a condition, but promises it to us as a free gift, must needs be the only doctrine that is able to build us up and to give us an inheritance among them that are sanctified. Acts 20 verse 32. Seeing it pleases God to bring us to holiness by believing a doctrine, we may reasonably expect that God should work upon us suitably to the nature of the doctrine which we believe, that he should give by a giving doctrine and exact by an exacting doctrine. Fourthly, the way of procuring life and happiness by the condition of perfect or sincere works is not a rational method for the recovery of fallen man, though it were good for the preserving of life before the fall, for it prescribes the immediate practice of holiness to recover a man dead in sin, as if one should say to the sick of the palsy, Arise and walk, and then thou shalt be whole and be able to walk. We sometimes say jestingly to a child that is fallen on the ground, Come hither, and I will help thee up. But if we should say so to one that is cast on his bed by a dead palsy, we should be guilty of mocking and cruelly insulting the afflicted. Those that are humbled and made sensible of their original sin and natural deadness know that they must first live by the Spirit before they can act holily. Galatians 5 verse 25 they will inquire, how shall we have strength to perform the duty required? If you answer that they must trust in God and Christ to help them, they may readily reply that they have no sure ground to trust on God or Christ for any saving grace according to this doctrine before they have performed this condition, at least in a sincere resolution of obedience, and that they are as unable to bring their hearts to such a resolution as a dead man is to raise himself out of the grave. Take another instance. The method of the doctrine of works is, you must love God first, and then on that condition he will love you again. Whereas, on the contrary, we love God because he loved us first. 1 John 4 verse 19 And if God suspend his love to us upon any condition, our love to him will not be absolute, but suspended upon the same condition, and no way contrary to an actual hating of him. Fifthly, the law is so far from healing our sinful corruption, that it proves rather an occasion of sinful motions and actings in those that seek salvation by the works of it. This comes to pass by reason of the power of our natural corruption, which is stirred up and rages the more when the holy and just law of God is set in opposition against it, so that the fold is not in the law, but in our own hearts. 
those that find not this by their own experience should believe the apostle paul who teaches it plainly and that from his own experience romans seven verses five and fourteen he affirms that there are motions of sin by the law in a fleshly state and that sin taking occasion by the commandment thou shalt not covet wrought in him all manner of concupiscence deceived him slew him became exceeding sinful and that without the law he was alive and sin dead but when the commandment came sin revived and he died he shows the cause of this irreconcilable enmity and contrariety between his sinful nature and the law the law is spiritual but i am carnal sold under sin take notice here from the reason given by the apostle that the doctrine of salvation by sincere obedience will have the same event corrupt nature is contrary to sincere as well as perfect obedience and if we make it the condition of our salvation sin will take the same occasion by it to become exceeding sinful in its motions and actings the success of legal doctrine upon the natural man is according to the proverb reprove not a scorner lest he hate thee proverbs nine verse eight rebuking a madman is the way to enrage him and such is the natural man in spiritual things since he fell out of his right mind by the sin of adam we find by manifold experience that though men be generally addicted to the principle of salvation by works yet multitudes of them hate all strict preachers and professors of true holiness because they are a torment to their consciences they endeavour to shelter themselves in ignorance of the law accounting that the less they know the less they shall answer for and therefore they would not have right things prophesied unto them isaiah thirty verse ten and they have prevailed generally in the world to darken the natural knowledge of moral duties in such a degree that there is a necessity of learning them by divine revelation out of the scriptures we may find how prone legal writers are to corrupt the sense of the law that they may leave starting holes for their corruptions by the corrupt glosses of these scribes and pharisees from which christ vindicated it matthew five and as far as i have observed none more endeavour to discover the purity and perfection of the law than those who seek holiness and salvation without any legal condition by the mere free grace of god in christ the doctrine of salvation by sincere obedience is but mincing the perfection required in the law and yet how is this doctrine minced again and again until it is become so small that the substance of all true obedience is lost a willingness to be saved according to christ's terms or a resolution to obey his commandments which is little more than ignorant men trust on when they say they hope god will save them because they have a good meaning though they live in the neglect of all religion without any further practice of holiness shall pass with many for enough of sincere obedience both to enter them into a state of salvation and to continue them in it so that they shall never be accounted breakers of the gospel covenant while so much can be pretended the most that is made necessary for salvation shall be only to endeavour to do what we can to obey christ's commands though all that the most can do is nothing that is truly good those who have a little more zeal for their salvation by works are prone to spend it in superstitious observances because they suit better with their carnal nature than the spiritual commands of god and christ i doubt not but this has been one occasion of the prevalence of heathenish jewish and popish superstitions in the world we find by experience how popery fell in several nations in late years when the great pillar of it the doctrine of justification by works was overthrown by the protestant doctrine of justification by faith alone if these legal zealots be forced by strong conviction to endeavour the practice of spiritual duties for the quieting of their guilty consciences they may be brought to strive and labour earnestly and even to macerate their bodies with fasting that they may kill their lusts but still their lusts are alive and as strong as ever they were and show forth their enmity against the law of god by inward fretting repining and grudging at it as a grievous taskmaster though a slavish fear restrain their gross outward actings and if once these zealots be enlightened with the knowledge of the spiritual nature of the law to discern that god rejects all their slavish service and will not own it for sincere obedience then they fall into despair of their salvation because they see they have failed in their highest attempts to perform the condition and then they can easily discover themselves that their hearts swell in anger and manifest hatred against the law yea and against god and christ for prescribing such hard conditions of salvation which they cannot keep and yet must expect to be damned eternally for breaking them this fills them with blasphemous thoughts against god and christ and they can hardly refrain from blaspheming with their tongues and when they are brought to this horrible condition if god does not in mercy discover to them the way of salvation by free grace through faith alone they will endeavour if they can to sear their consciences past feeling of sin and fully to abandon all religion which has proved such an insufferable torment to them or if they cannot sear their consciences some of them are easily prevailed with by satan rather to murder themselves than to live longer in the hatred of god the spirit of blasphemy and continual horror of conscience this is the pestilent effect of legal doctrine upon a carnal heart that but rouses up and terribly enrages the sleeping lion our sinful corruption instead of killing it 
as is too evident by the sad experience of many that have endeavoured with all their might to practise it, and by the scripture that shows a sufficient cause why it cannot be otherwise. Therefore the doctrine of salvation by sincere obedience that was invented against antinomianism may well be ranked among the worst antinomian errors. For my part I hate it with a perfect hatred, and accounted mine enemy as I have found it to be. And I have found by some good experience the truth of the lesson taught by the Apostle, that the way to be freed from the mastery and dominion of sin is not to be under the law but under grace. Romans 6 verse 14. Sixthly, the way of salvation by works was blasted by the curse denounced against the first Adam's sin, so that now it cannot work life in us or holiness but only death, for the law which requires both sincere and perfect obedience to God in all things was made known to Adam at his first creation as the means of continuing the happy life that was then bestowed upon him, and it would have been effectual for this end if he had not transgressed in the forbidden fruit. But when he had once brought himself and his posterity under the terrible sentence, Thou shalt surely die, Genesis 2 verse 17, all that knowledge of God or his law that before wrought for continuance of life was turned by that cursing sentence the contrary way to work for his death, even for the death of his soul in sin, as well as for the death of his body, and therefore it quickly moved him to hide himself from God as an enemy. It was as if God should say, All the light and knowledge that thou hast shall not be able to continue thy life or restore it, but it shall rather tend to thy death. Therefore, while we continue in our natural state under the first Adam's guilt and curse, the knowledge of the law, yea, and all such knowledge of God and his attributes as natural men may attain to, must needs be in like manner a curse to us. And seeing man did not use his natural knowledge and wisdom aright, God is resolved to revenge the abuse of it, by giving us salvation in a way contrary to it, that seems foolishness to the natural man, and wholly to abolish the way of living by any of our works, or by any wisdom or knowledge, that the natural man can attain unto. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For, after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. 1 Corinthians 1 verses 19, 20, and 21. Hence we may conclude that no truth known by the light of nature can be an effectual principle or motive to work holiness in us, and gospel principles and motives are but abused when they are applied to a legal way of salvation. Seventhly, the end which God aimed at in giving the law to Moses was not that any should ever attain to holiness or salvation by the condition of perfect or sincere obedience to it, though if there had been any such way of salvation at that time, it must have consisted in the performance of that law which was then given to the church to be a rule of life, as well as a covenant. There was another covenant made before that time with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a covenant of grace, promising all blessings freely through Christ, the promised seed, by which only they were to be saved. And the covenant of the law was added, that they might see their sinfulness and subjection to death and wrath, and the impossibility of attaining to life or holiness by their works, and be forced to trust on the free promise only for all their salvation, and that sin might be restrained by the spirit of bondage, until the coming of that promised seed, Jesus Christ, and the more plentiful pouring out of the sanctifying spirit by him. This the Apostle Paul shows largely, Galatians 3 verses 15 to 24, Romans 5 verses 20 and 21, and chapter 10 verses 3 and 4. None of the Israelites under the Old Testament were ever saved by the Sinai covenant, neither did any of them ever attain to holiness by the terms of it. Some of them did indeed perform the commandments of it sincerely, though imperfectly, but those were first justified and made partakers of life and holiness by virtue of that better covenant made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which was the same in substance with the new covenant, or testament, established by the blood of Christ. Had it not been for that better covenant, the Sinai covenant would have proved to them an occasion of no happiness, but only of sin, despair, and destruction. Of itself it was only a killing letter, the ministration of death and condemnation, and therefore it is now abolished. 2 Corinthians 3 verses 6, 8, 9, and 11. We have cause to praise God for delivering his church by the blood of Christ from this yoke of bondage, and we have cause to abhor the device of those who would lay upon us a more grievous and terrible yoke, by turning our very new covenant into a covenant of sincere works, and leaving us no such better covenant as the Israelites had under their yoke to relieve us in our extremity. Direction 7. We are not to imagine that our hearts and lives must be changed from sin to holiness in any measure before we may safely venture to trust on Christ for the sure enjoyment of himself and his salvation. Explication. We are naturally so prone to ground our salvation upon our own works, that if we cannot make them procuring conditions and causes of our salvation by Christ, yet we endeavour at least to make them necessary preparatives to fit us for receiving Christ and his salvation by faith. And men are easily persuaded that this is not at all contrary to salvation by free grace, because all that is hereby ascribed to our works or good qualifications 
is only, quote, that they put us in a fit posture to receive a free gift. If we were to go to a prince for a free gift, good manners and due reverence would teach us to trim ourselves first, and to change our slovenly clothes, as Joseph did when he came out of the dungeon into the presence of Pharaoh. It seems to be an impudent slighting and condemning the justice and holiness of God and Christ, and an insufferable affront and indignity offered to the divine majesty, when any dare presume to approach his presence in the filthy garb of their sins, covered all over with putrefying sores, not at all closed, bound up, or cleansed much more when they endeavour to receive the Most Holy One into such an abominable stinking kennel as the sinner's heart is before it be at all reformed. The parable concerning the man who was to be bound hand and foot and cast into outer darkness for coming to the royal wedding without a wedding garment seems to be intended as a warning against all such presumption. End quote. Matthew 22, verses 11 and 13. Many that behold with terror the abominable filth of their own hearts are kept off from coming immediately to Christ by such imaginations, which Satan strongly maintains and increases in them by his suggestions, so that they can by no means be persuaded out of them until God teaches them inwardly by the powerful illumination of his Spirit. They delay the saving act of faith because they think they are not yet duly prepared and qualified for it. On the same account, many weak believers delay coming to the Lord's Supper for many years together, even as long as they live in this world, and would be as likely to delay their baptism if they had not been baptized in infancy. Against all such imaginations, I shall propose the following considerations. First, this error is pernicious to the practice of holiness and to our whole creation, in the same manner with that treated of in the foregoing direction, and may be confuted by the same arguments which are there produced, whether holiness be made a procuring condition of our salvation through Christ, or only a condition necessary to qualify us for the reception of Christ, we are equally brought under those legal terms of doing first the duties required in the law, that so we may live. Therefore we are equally bereaved of the assistance of those means of holiness mentioned in the foregoing directions, as union and fellowship with Christ, and the enjoyment of all his sanctifying endowments by faith, which should go before the practice of holiness, that they may enable us for it and we are equally left to labour in sin for holiness, while we are in our cursed natural state, whereby our sinful corruption will be rather exasperated than mortified, so that we shall never be duly prepared for the reception of Christ as long as we live in the world. Thus, while we endeavour to prepare our way to Christ by holy qualifications, we rather fill it with stumbling blocks and deep pits, whereby our souls are hindered from ever attaining to the salvation of Christ. Secondly, any the least change of our hearts, and lives from sin to holiness before our receiving of Christ and his salvation by faith is not at all necessary according to the terms of the gospel, nor required in the word of God. Christ would have the vilest sinners come to him for salvation immediately without delaying to prepare themselves for him. When the wicked jailer inquired, What must I do to be saved? Paul directed him forthwith to believe on Christ, with a promise that in so doing he should be saved, and straightway he and all his were baptized. Acts 16 verses 30 and 33. Paul does not tell him that he must reform his heart and life first, though he was in a very sinful condition at that time, having but a little before fastened Paul and Silas in the stocks, and just attempted a horrid willful self-murder. Those three thousand Jews that were converted by Peter's preaching and added the same day to the church by baptism, Acts 2 verse 41, seemed to have as much need of some considerable time to prepare themselves for receiving Christ as others, because they had but lately polluted themselves with the murder of Christ himself, verse 23. Christ commands his servants to go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and to bring into his feast the poor and the maimed, and the halt and the blind, yea, to come out into the highways, and to compel them to come in without allowing them to tarry until they had cleansed their sores, and shifted off their filthy rags and swarms of vermin. Christ would have us believe on him that justifies the ungodly, and therefore he does not require us to be godly before we believe. Romans 4 verse 5. He came as a physician for the sick, and does not expect that they should recover their health in the least degree before they come to him. Matthew 9 verse 12. The vilest sinners are fitly prepared and qualified for this design, which is to show forth the exceeding riches of grace, pardoning our sins and saving us freely. Ephesians 2 verses 5 and 7. For this end the law of Moses entered, that the offence might abound, that so where sin abounded, grace might much more abound. Romans 5 verse 20. He loved us in our most loathsome, sinful pollution, so as to die for us, and much more will he love us in it, so as to receive us when we come to him for the purchased salvation. He has given full satisfaction to the justice of God for sinners, that they might have all righteousness and holiness, and all salvation, only by fellowship with him through faith. 
Therefore it is no affront to Christ or slighting and condemning the justice and holiness of God to come to Christ while we are polluted sinners, but rather it is an affronting and contemning the saving grace, merit, and fullness of Christ if we endeavor to make ourselves righteous and holy before we receive Christ himself and all righteousness and holiness in him by faith. Christ loathed not to touch a leper and condescended to wash the feet of his disciples and did not expect that they should be washed and perfumed beforehand, as some great ones of the world are said to do when they wash the feet of poor men in imitation of Christ. Thirdly, those that receive Christ with an unfeigned faith shall never want a wedding garment to adorn them in the sight of God. Faith itself is very precious in the sight of God and most holy. 2 Peter 1 verse 1, Jude verse 20. God loves it because it gives the glory of our salvation only to the free grace of God in Christ, Romans 4 verse 16, and renounces all dependence upon any conditions that we can perform to procure a right to Christ or to make ourselves acceptable to him. It contains in it a hearty love to Christ as a saviour, and a hungering and thirsting appetite for his salvation, and it is the mouth whereby the soul feeds hungrily upon him. What wedding garment can sinners bring with them more delightful than this to their bountiful God, whose great design is to manifest the abundant riches of his glorious grace and bounty in this wedding feast? The Father himself loves them because they love Christ, and believe that he came out from God, John 16 verse 27. But yet we see that the excellency of faith lies in this, that it accounts not itself nor any other work of ours a sufficient ornament to make us acceptable in the sight of God. It will not be our wedding garment itself, but it buys of Christ white raiment, that we may be clothed, and that the shame of our nakedness may not appear. Revelation 3 verse 18. Though it loves and desires the free gift of holiness, yet it abandons all thoughts of practicing holiness immediately, before we come to Christ for a holy nature. It puts on Christ himself, and in him all things that pertain to life and godliness. Thus every true believer is clothed with the Son, Revelation 12 verse 1, even with the Son of Righteousness, the Lord Jesus, who is pleased to be himself both our wedding garment and feast, and all our spiritual and eternal happiness. For the more full satisfaction and consolation of those distressed souls that lie under terrible apprehensions of their own sinfulness and the wrath of God, and dare not venture to trust steadfastly on Christ for their salvation until they can find in themselves some change from sin to holiness, I shall mention particularly several of those things that such would find in themselves, and I shall show that, if some of them be not partly comprehended in faith itself, they are fruits and consequences of faith, and therefore they cannot be rationally expected before we trust on Christ for our salvation. 1. They think it necessary to repent before they believe on Christ for their salvation, because repentance is absolutely necessary to salvation. Luke 13 verse 3. Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And Christ places the duty of repentance before faith. Mark 1 verse 15. Repent and believe the gospel. But we are to know that Christ requires repentance first as the end to be aimed at, and faith in the next place as the only means of attaining to it. And though the end be first in intention, yet the means are first in practice and execution, though both be absolutely necessary to salvation. For what is repentance but a hearty turning from sin to God and his service? And what way is there to turn to God but through Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, without whom none cometh to the Father? John 14 verse 6. And what way is there of coming to Christ but by faith? Therefore, if we would turn to God in the right way, we must first come to Christ by faith, and faith must go before repentance as the great instrument afforded us by the grace of God for the effectual performance of it. Repentance is indeed a duty which sinners owe naturally to God, but the great question is, how shall sinners be able to perform it? This question is resolved only by the gospel of Christ, repent and believe. The way to repent is to begin with believing. Therefore, the great doctrine of John in his baptism of repentance was that they should believe in him that should come after him that is on Christ Jesus. Acts 19 verse 4. 2. Regeneration also is necessary to salvation. John 3 verse 3, and therefore many desire to find it wrought in themselves before they trust on Christ for their salvation. But consider what regeneration is. It is a new begetting or creating us in Christ. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 15, Ephesians 2 verse 10, in whom we are partakers of a divine nature far different from that which we received from the first Adam. Now faith is the uniting grace whereby Christ dwells in us and we in him, as hath been showed, and therefore it is the first grace wrought in our regeneration, and the means of all the rest. When you truly believe, you are regenerated, and not till then. Those that receive Christ by believing, and those only are the sons of God, which are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John 1 verses 12 and 13. 3. They account it necessary to receive Christ as their Lord and lawgiver by a sincere resignation of themselves to his government, and a resolution to obey his law before they receive him as their saviour. This is one principal lesson of the new divinity, and such a receiving Christ as Lord is made to be the great act of saving faith. 
without which such faith as I have described, whereby we trust on Christ for salvation, is reckoned no better than gross presumption. They teach that Christ will not bestow his salvation on those that do not first yield their subjection to his kingly authority, but he calls them his enemies, because they would not that he should reign over them, and requires that they be brought and slain before him, Luke 19 verse 27, and I own it as a certain truth that Christ will save none but those that are brought to resign themselves sincerely to the obedience of his royal authority and laws. But yet we must observe that they are not brought to this holy resignation or to any sincere purpose and resolution of obedience before they receive his salvation, but rather by receiving it. Men, who were never thoroughly sensible of their natural death and sin, easily bring themselves to resolve universal obedience to God when they are on their deathbeds or in any imminent danger or when they would prepare themselves for the Lord's Supper that so they may make their peace with God and trust securely on Christ for his salvation. But all resolutions of that kind are vain and hypocritical, sooner broken than made. Those that know the plague of their own hearts find that their mind is enmity unto the law of God and Christ, and cannot be subject unto it, Romans 8 verse 7, and that they can as soon remove a mountain as give up themselves sincerely to obedience before they trust on Christ for his salvation and for the gift of a new heart, whereby they may be enabled both to will and to do anything that is acceptable to God. We should have been under sufficient obligations to all obedient purposes, resolutions, and resignations, if Christ had never come into the world to save us. But he knew that we could perform nothing holily, except he made us first partakers of salvation, and that we shall never obey him as a lawgiver until we receive him as Saviour. He is a saving Lord. Trust on him first to save you from the guilt and power of sin and dominion of Satan, and to give you a new spiritual disposition. Then, and not till then, the love of Christ will constrain you to resign yourself heartily to live to him that died for you, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14, and you will be able to say with an unfeigned resolution, O Lord, truly I am thy servant, I am thy servant and the son of thy handmaid, thou hast loosed my bands. Psalm 116 verse 16. 4. It seems to them evident that some good works are necessary before we can trust on Christ safely for the forgiveness of sins, because our Saviour teaches us that if we forgive not men their trespasses, neither will our Heavenly Father forgive our trespasses, and it directs us to pray. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Matthew 6 verses 12 and 15. Restitution also was to be made of things wrongfully gotten from others before the sacramental atonement was made by the trespass offering. Leviticus 6 verses 5 and 7. I answer, this is sufficient to prove that forgiving others and restitution according to our ability, or at least a sincere desire and purpose so to do, are very closely joined with the forgiveness of our sins, and are very necessary to fit us for prayer and for sacramental applications of pardoning grace to ourselves. A lively faith cannot be without these fruits, and therefore we cannot pray or partake of sacraments in faith without them. But yet, if we strive to do either of these before we trust on Christ for our pardon and salvation, we shall do them slavishly and hypocritically, not in a holy, acceptable manner. Our forgiving others will not be accompanied with any hearty love to them as to ourselves for the sake of God, and our restitution will be but a forced act, like Pharaoh's letting the children of Israel go, or like Judas's restoring the pieces of silver, being compelled thereunto by terror of spirit. And when the terror that forced us is removed, we shall be as ready to recall our forgiveness, and to wrong others again, as Pharaoh was to bring the Israelites again into bondage, after he had let them go. Exodus 14 verse 5. If you would forgive others heartily, so as to love them again, you must first, by faith in Christ, apprehend the love and mercy of God towards yourselves, and then you will be able, according to the Apostle's instructions, to be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Ephesians 4 verse 32. The readiness of Zacchaeus to make restitution, followed upon a discovery of Christ's love to him, and his joyfully receiving Christ into his house, was fruit whereby he evidenced the truth of that faith that was already wrought in his heart. 5. I shall reckon up together several other qualifications that distressed souls would find in themselves that they may be duly prepared to trust on Christ for their salvation, and when they have laboured anxiously a long time and cannot get them, at last they lie down in sorrowful despondence, not daring to apply the consolations of the grace of God in Christ to their wounded consciences. Let perplexed souls mark the particulars and observe whether the condition of their own souls be reached in any of them. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempests and not comforted, what good qualifications are they that thou wouldst have, that thou mayest be encouraged to lay hold on Christ for salvation? It is likely thou wilt answer, in the bitterness of thy soul, O oh, let me first have some love to God and godliness in my heart, and freedom from my hateful heart-risings against him and his service. Let me have some good thoughts of God, his justice, mercy, holiness, that I may be able to justify him, though he damn me, and that I may not be filled with murmuring and hellish blasphemies in my mind against him. 
let the raging of my lusts be abated, and the pollutions of my wicked heart a little cleansed. Let me have some holy reverential fear of God, and not merely a panic-tormenting horror. I would be more affected with the wrath of God, and not be of a slighting, heedless spirit. I would be more humbled for sin, loathe it, and be ashamed of, and be sorry for it with a godly sorrow, not merely because of the punishment, but because it grieves and vexes the Holy Spirit of God. I would be able to make a willing and ingenuous confession of sin, and to pour out my soul to the Lord in lively affectionate prayer for forgiveness, and to praise and glorify Him heartily, and not be like a lifeless stone in the duty of prayer as I am. Are these the things thou desirest, O poor distressed soul? The best reply I can make for thy speedy comfort is to inform thee that the things are good, but thy desires are not well timed. It is unreasonable for thee to expect these holy qualifications, while thou art in thy natural state, under the guilt of sin and the apprehension of the wrath of God, before thou hast received the atonement, and the new spiritual life that is by Christ through faith in his name. Thou dost but exasperate the corruptions, and harden thy heart, and make thy wounds to stink the more because of thy foolishness. Such good qualifications are included in the nature of faith, and for the most part they follow after it, so that they cannot possibly be obtained before thou trustest in Christ for thy salvation, as I shall show concerning them particularly in their order. A love to the salvation of God and to the free gift of holiness is included in the nature of faith, so that it cannot be hearty without it. Act faith first, and the apprehension of God's love to thy soul will sweetly allure and constrain thee to love God and his service universally. We love him because he first loved us. 1 John 4 verse 19 We cannot be beforehand with God in love, and we must perceive his love to make us love him. For if we would look up to him as a God contrary to us, who hates us and will damn us, our own innate self-love will breed hatred and heart-risings against him in spite of our hearts. That love which is the end of the law must flow from faith unfeigned. 1 Timothy 1 verse 5 And if hatred work in thee more than love, how canst thou expect good thoughts of God or any other than blaspheming, or at least murmuring thoughts of him in this condition? Ill will never speaks or thinks well. The first right, holy thoughts thou canst have of God are thoughts of his grace and mercy to thy soul in Christ, which are included in the grace of faith. Get these thoughts first by believing in Christ, and they will produce in thee love to God and all good thoughts of him, and free thee from blasphemous and murmuring thoughts by degrees. For love thinks no evil. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 5 then wilt thou be able to account God just and merciful, if he had damned thee and extended his grace to others, and thou wilt be able to think well of his holiness and of his decrees, which many cannot endure to hear of. The way to get rid of thy raging lusts is by faith, that purifieth the heart and worketh by love. Acts 15 verse 9, Galatians 5 verse 6. The soul must be brought to take pleasure in God and Christ by faith, or else it will lust after fleshly and worldly pleasures. And the more you strive against lusts without faith, the more they are stirred up though you prevail so far as to restrain the fulfilling of them. Beg a holy fear of God, with fear of coming short of the promised rest through unbelief. Hebrews 4 verse 1. Such a fear is an ingredient of faith, and it will produce in us a reverential, yea, a childlike fear of God and his goodness. Hebrews 12 verse 28, Hosea 3 verse 5. We must have grace, whereby we may serve God with reverence, etc. It is in the margin, we must have or hold fast grace. And there is no other way to hold fast grace, but by faith and this will quickly calm all panic and tormenting horror. And if you would be free from carelessness and slighting the wrath of God, your way is first by believing to avoid despairing, for people grow careless by despairing, and for their own quiet they will endeavour to slight evils which they have no hope to prevent, according to the proverb, Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 32 True humiliation for sin is either a part or fruit of faith, for on our believing we shall remember our own evil ways and doings that were not good, and shall loathe ourselves in our own sight for all our abominations. Ezekiel 36 verse 31 We shall also then willingly renounce our own righteousness, and account it but dung, that we may win Christ by faith. Philippians 3 verses 7 and 8 But beggars will make the most of all their filthy rags, till they be furnished with better clothes, and cripples will not cast away their crutches, until they have a better support to lean on. Godly sorrow for sin is wrought in us by the pardoning grace of God, as it is found by experience that a pardon from a prince will sometimes sooner draw tears from a stubborn malefactor than the fear of a halter. Thus the sinful woman was brought to wash Christ's feet with her tears, Luke 7, verses 37 and 38. We are not likely to be sorry for grieving God with our sins while we look upon him as an enemy that will ease himself well enough of his burden and right himself upon us by our everlasting destruction. The belief of God's pardoning and accepting grace is a necessary means to bring us to an ingenuous confession of sins, 
The people freely confessed their sins when they were baptized of John in Jordan for the remission of sins, Mark 1, verses 4 and 5. The confession of despairers is forced, like the extorted confessions and cries of malefactors upon the rack. A pardon sooner opens the mouth to an ingenuous confession than confess and be hanged, or confess and be damned. Therefore, if you would freely confess your sins, believe first that God is faithful and just to forgive your sins through Christ, 1 John 1 verse 9. And if you would pray to God or praise Him with lively affections, you must first believe that God will hear you and give you what is best for you for Christ's sake, John 16 verses 23 and 24. Otherwise your praying will be only from the teeth outward, for how shall you call on Him in whom you have not believed? Romans 10 verse 14. You must come first to Christ, the older, by faith, that by Him you may offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. Hebrews 13 verses 10 and 15. Finally, to pass from particulars to the general assertion laid down in the direction, if you ask, what shall we do that we may work the works of God, or get any saving qualifications? I must direct you first to faith as the work of works and the great saving preparatory to all good qualifications by answering in our Saviour's words, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. John 6 verses 28 and 29. Direction 8. Be sure to seek for holiness of heart and life only in its due order, where God hath placed it, after union with Christ, justification, and the gift of the Holy Ghost, and in that order seek it earnestly by faith, as a very necessary part of your salvation. Explication I hope the reader will cautiously observe in all these directions that the holiness aimed at, as the great end in the whole discourse, consists not in the grace or act of faith required peculiarly by the gospel, which, though it be a saving gift of Christ, yet is here considered rather as a means precedent to the reception of Christ and all his salvation, than a part of his salvation received. But the holiness aimed at consists in conformity to the whole moral law to which we are naturally obliged, if there had never been any gospel or any such duty as believing in Christ for salvation. Now in this direction three things are contained that are very necessary to guide us to the attainment of this great end, and therefore worthy of our serious consideration. First, it is a matter of high concern to be acquainted with the due place and order wherein God has settled this holy practice in the mystery of our salvation, and a great point of Christian wisdom to seek it only in that order. We know that God is the God of order, and that his infinite wisdom has appeared in appointing the order of his creatures, which we are forced to observe for the attainment of our ends in worldly things. So also in spiritual things, God hath made an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure. 2 Samuel 23 verse 5 the benefits of it have an orderly dependence upon each other as links of the same golden chain, though several of them, and a title to them all, is given to us at one and the same time. And I think enough has been said already to show in what order God brings us to the practice of the moral law. He makes us first to be in Christ by faith as branches in the vine, that we may bring forth much fruit. John 15 verses 4 and 5. He first purges our consciences from dead works by justification, that we may serve the living God. Hebrews 9 verse 14. He makes us first to live in the Spirit and then to walk in the Spirit, Galatians 5 verse 25. This is the order prescribed in the Gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation, though the law prescribes a quite contrary method, that we should first perform its commands, that so we may be justified and live, and thereby it proves a killing letter to us. Now mark well the great advantages you have for the attainment of holiness by seeking it in a right Gospel order. You will have the advantage of the love of God manifested towards you, in forgiving your sins, receiving you into favour, and giving you the spirit of adoption, and the hope of his glory, freely through Christ to persuade and constrain you by sweet allurements to love God again, who has so dearly loved you, and to love others for his sake, and to give up yourselves to the obedience of all his commands out of hearty love to him. You will also enjoy the help of the Spirit of God to incline you powerfully to obedience, and to strengthen you for the performance of it against all your corruptions, and the temptations of Satan, so that you will have both wind and tide to forward your voyage in the practice of holiness. On the contrary, if you rush upon the immediate performance of the law without taking Christ's righteousness and his spirit in the way to it, you will find both wind and tide against you. Your guilty consciences and corrupt dead natures will certainly defeat and frustrate all your enterprises and attempts to love God and serve him in love, and you will but stir up sinful lusts instead of stirring up yourselves to true obedience, or at best you will but attain to some slavish and hypocritical performances. Oh, that people would be persuaded to consider the due place of holiness in the mystery of salvation, and to seek it only there, where they have all the advantages of gospel grace to find it. Many miscarry in their zealous enterprises for godliness, and after they have spent much labor in vain, 
God makes a breach upon them, even to their everlasting destruction, as he did upon Uzzah, to a temporal destruction, because they sought him not after a due order. First Chronicles 13, verse 10. Secondly, we are to look upon holiness as a very necessary part of that salvation that is received by faith in Christ. Some are so wrapped up in the covenant of works that they accuse us of making good works needless to salvation, if we will not acknowledge them to be necessary, either as conditions to procure an interest in Christ, or as preparatives to fit us for receiving him by faith. And others, when they are taught by the scriptures that we are saved by faith, through faith, without works, do begin to disregard all obedience to the law as not at all necessary to salvation, and do account themselves obliged to it only in point of gratitude. If it be wholly neglected, they doubt not, but free grace will save them harmless. Yea, some are given up to such strong antinomian delusions that they are counted a part of the liberty from the bondage of the law purchased by the blood of Christ, to make no conscience of breaking the law in their conversation. One cause of these errors, that are so contrary one to the other, is that many are prone to imagine nothing else to be meant by salvation but to be delivered from hell, and to enjoy heavenly happiness and glory. Hence they conclude that if good works be a means of glorification and precedent to it, they must also be a precedent means of our whole salvation, and that, if they be not a necessary means of our whole salvation, they are not all necessary to glorification. But though salvation be often taken in Scripture by way of eminency for its perfection in the state of heavenly glory, yet according to its full and proper signification, we are to understand by it all that freedom from the evil of our natural corrupt state, and all those holy and happy enjoyments that we receive from Christ our Saviour, either in this world by faith or in the world to come by glorification, Thus, justification, the gift of the Spirit to dwell in us, the privileges of adoption, are parts of our salvation, which we partake of in this life. Thus also the conformity of our hearts to the law of God, and the fruits of righteousness, with which we are filled by Jesus Christ in this life, are a necessary part of our salvation. God saves us from sinful uncleanness here, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, as well as from hell hereafter, Ezekiel 35 verse 29, Titus 3 verse 5. Christ was called Jesus, that is, a Saviour, because he saved his people from their sins, Matthew 1 verse 21. Therefore it is a part of our salvation to deliver us from our sins, which is begun in this life by justification and sanctification and perfected by glorification in the life to come. Can we rationally doubt whether it be any proper part of our salvation by Christ to be quickened, to live to God, when we were by nature dead in trespasses and sins, and to have the image of God in holiness and righteousness restored to us, which we lost by the fall? and to be freed from a vile, dishonorable slavery to Satan and our own lusts, and to made the servants of God, and to be honored so highly as to walk by the Spirit, and bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. And yet, what is all this but holiness in heart and life? We conclude then that holiness in this life is absolutely necessary to salvation, not only as a means to the end, but by a nobler kind of necessity, as part of the end itself. Though we are not saved by good works as procuring causes, Yet we are saved to good works as fruits and effects of saving grace, which God has prepared that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2 verse 10 It is indeed one part of our salvation to be delivered from the bondage of the covenant of works, but the end of this is not that we may have liberty to sin, which is the worst of slavery, but that we may fulfill the royal law of liberty, and that we may serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Galatians 5 verse 13, Romans 7 verse 6 Yea, holiness in this life is such a part of our salvation, as is a necessary means to make us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in heavenly light and glory. Without holiness we can never see God, Hebrews 12 verse 14, and are as unfit for the glorious presence as swine for the presence chamber of an earthly prince. I confess some may be converted when they are so near the point of death that they may have little time to practice holiness in this world, but the grace of the Spirit is active like fire, Matthew 3 verse 11, and as soon as it is given, it will immediately produce good inward working of love to God and Christ and his people, which will be sufficient to manifest the righteous judgment of God in saving them at the great day, when he shall judge every man according to his work, though some possibly may not have so much time to discover their inward grace in any outward works as the thief upon the cross, Luke 23 verses 40 and 43. The third and last thing to be noted in this direction is that holiness of heart and life is to be sought for earnestly by faith, as a very necessary part of our salvation. Great multitudes of ignorant people that live under the gospel harden their hearts in sin and ruin their souls forever by trusting on Christ for such an imaginary salvation as consists not at all in holiness but only in forgiveness of sin and deliverance from everlasting torments. They would be free from the punishment due to sin but they love their lusts so well that they hate holiness and would not be saved from the service of sin. 
The way to oppose the pernicious delusion is not to deny, as some do, that trusting on Christ for salvation is a saving act of faith, but rather to show that none do or can trust on Christ for true salvation, except they trust on him for holiness. Neither do they heartily desire true salvation if they do not desire to be made holy and righteous in their hearts and lives. If ever God and Christ give you salvation, holiness will be one part of it. If Christ wash you not from the filth of your sins, you have no part with him. John 13 verse 8 what a strange kind of salvation do they desire that care not for holiness. They would be saved and yet be altogether dead in sin, aliens from the life of God, bereft of the image of God, deformed by the image of Satan, his slaves, and vassals to their own filthy lusts, utterly unmeet for the enjoyment of God in glory. Such a salvation as that was never purchased by the blood of Christ, and those that seek it abuse the grace of God in Christ and to turn it into lasciviousness. They would be saved by Christ and yet out of Christ in a fleshly state, whereas God frees none from condemnation but those that are in Christ, that walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit, or else they would divide Christ and take a part of his salvation and leave out the rest. But Christ is not divided. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 13. They would have their sins forgiven, not that they may walk with God in love in time to come, but that they may practice their enmity against him without any fear of punishment. But let them not be deceived. God is not mocked. They understand not what true salvation is, neither were they ever yet thoroughly sensible of their lost estate, and of the great evil of sin, and that which they trust on Christ for is but an imagination of their own brains, and therefore their trusting is gross presumption. True gospel faith makes us come to Christ with a thirsty appetite, that we may drink of living water even of his sanctifying spirit, John 7 verses 37 and 38, and to cry out earnestly to save us not only from hell but from sin, saying, Teach us to do thy will, thy spirit is good. Psalm 113, verse 10. Turn thou me, and I shall be turned. Jeremiah 31, verse 18. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Psalm 51, verse 10. This is the way whereby the doctrine of salvation by grace necessitates us to holiness of life, by constraining us to seek for it by faith in Christ, as a substantial part of that salvation which is freely given to us through Christ. Direction 9 of the Gospel Mystery of Sanctification by Walter Marshall this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. We must first receive the comforts of the gospel that we may be able to perform sincerely the duties of the law. Explication. Since man fell from obedience to God, which he was enabled and engaged to perform by the comforts of his first happy state in paradise, God might have justly refused ever to give man again any comforts beforehand to encourage him to his duty, that the way to holiness being hedged up against him with the thorns and briars of fear, grief, and despair, he might never be able to escape the sentence of death which was denounced against his first transgression. This justice of God is manifest in the method of the legal covenant wherein God promises us no life, comfort, or happiness until we have thoroughly performed his law, and may be seen in the Mount Sinai promulgation, explicated, Leviticus 26, throughout. And we are by nature so strongly addicted to this legal method of salvation that it is a hard matter to dissuade those that live under the light of the gospel from placing the duties of the law before the comforts of the gospel. If they cannot make salvation itself, yet they will be sure to make all the comforts of it to depend upon their own works. They think it as unreasonable to expect comfort before duty as wages before work or the fruits of the earth before the husbandman's labor. 2 Timothy 2 verse 6. They consider that the only effectual way to secure the obedience we owe to the law of God is to ground all our comforts on the performance of it, and that the contrary doctrine strengthens the hands of the wicked by prophesying peace to them where there is no peace. Ezekiel 13 verses 16 and 22 and opens the floodgates to all licentiousness. Therefore some preachers will advise men not to be solicitous and hasty of getting comfort, but that they should rather exercise themselves diligently in the performance of their duty, and they tell them that in so doing their condition will be safe and happy at last, though they never enjoy any comfort of their salvation as long as they live in this world. That you may rightly understand what I have asserted in the direction against such vulgar errors, take notice that I do not make the only place of gospel comfort to be before the duties of the law. I acknowledge that God comforts his people on every side, Psalm 71 verse 21, both before and after the performance of their duty, and that the greatest consolations follow after duty, yet some comforts God gives to his people beforehand as advance money to furnish them for his service, though most of the pay comes in afterward. Neither do I hereby speak any peace to those that continue in their sinful natural state, for the comforts I speak of cannot be received without rejecting those false confidences whereby natural men harden themselves in sin nor without that effectual working of the Spirit, whereby we are made good trees, that we may bring forth good fruit. 
though they are given before the sincere practice of the law yet they are not given to us in our corrupt sinful nature but in and with the new holy nature which immediately produces a holy practice though it must necessarily go before as the cause before the effect and they are no other than comforts of those spiritual benefits by which our new state and nature is produced and of which it is constituted and made up as the comforts of redemption justification adoption the gift of the spirit and the like neither do i intend here any transport or ravishment of joy and delight but only such manner of comfort as rationally strengthens in some measure against the oppression of fear grief and despair which we are liable to by reason of our natural sinfulness and misery this explanation of the sense of my assertion is sufficient to answer some common objections against it and i hope the truth of it will be fully evidenced by the following arguments first this truth is clearly deducible from those principles of holiness that have been already confirmed I have showed that we must have a good persuasion of our reconciliation with God, and of our happiness in heaven, and of our sufficient strength both to will and to do that which is acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, that we may be rationally inclined and bent to the practice of holiness, and that these endowments must be had by receiving Christ himself with his spirit in all his fullness, by trusting on him for all his salvation, as he is freely promised to us in the gospel, and that by his faith we as really receive Christ as our food by eating and drinking, now let right reason judge can we be persuaded of the love of god of our everlasting happiness and our strength to serve god and yet be without any comforts can the glad tidings of the gospel of peace be believed and christ and his spirit actually received into the heart without any relief to the soul from oppressing fear grief despair can the salvation of christ be comfortless or the bread and water of life without any sweet relish to those that feed on him with hungering and thirsting appetites god will not give such benefits as these to those that do not desire and esteem them above the world and certainly the very receiving of them will be comfortable to such except they receive them blindfold which they cannot do when the very giving and bestowing them opens the eyes of a sinner and turns him from darkness to light whereby at least in some measure he sees and perceives spiritually the things that concern his present and future peace and reaps some encouragement and strengthening comfort thereby to the practice of holiness secondly peace joy hope are recommended to us in scripture as the spring of other holy duties and fear and oppressing grief forbidden as hindrances to true religion the peace of god keepeth our hearts and minds through christ jesus philippians 4 verse 7 be not sorry for the joy of the lord is your strength nehemiah 8 verse 10 every man that hath his hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure 1 john 3 verse 3 fear hath torment he that feareth is not made perfect in love 1 john 4 verse 18 this is the reason why the apostle doubles his exhortation to rejoice in the lord always as a duty of exceeding weight and necessity philippians four verse four what are such duties but comfort itself and can we think that these duties are necessary to our continuance in a holy practice and yet not to the beginning of it where the work is most difficult and encouragement most needful therefore we must make haste in the first place to get a comfortable frame of spirit if we would make haste and not delay to keep god's holy commandments thirdly the usual method of gospel doctrine as it is delivered to us in the holy scriptures is first to comfort our hearts and thereby to establish us in every good word and work to thessalonians 2 verse 17 and it appears how clearly this method is adjusted in several epistles written by the apostles wherein they first acquaint the churches with the rich grace of god towards them in christ and the spiritual blessings which they are made partakers of for their strong consolation and when they exhort them to a holy conversation answerable to such privileges and it is not only the method of whole epistles but of many particular exhortations to duty wherein the comfortable benefits of the grace of god in christ are made use of as arguments and motives to stir up the saints to a holy practice which comfortable benefits must first be believed and the comfort of them applied to our own souls or else they will not be forcible to engage us to the practice for which they are intended to give you a few instances out of a multitude that might be alleged we are exhorted to practice holy duties because we are dead to sin and alive to god through jesus christ our lord romans 6 verse 11 and because sin shall not have dominion over us for we are not under the law but under grace romans 6 verse 14 because we are not in the flesh but in the spirit and god will quicken our mortal bodies by his spirit dwelling in us romans 8 verses 9 11 and 12 because our bodies are the members of christ and the temples of the holy ghost 1 corinthians 6 verses 15 and 19 because god hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of god in him 2 corinthians 5 verse 21 and has promised that he will dwell in us and walk in us and be to us a father and we shall be to him sons and daughters 2 corinthians 6 verse 18 with chapter 7 verse 1 because god has forgiven us for christ's sake and accounts us his dear children 
that Christ has loved us and given himself for us, and we that were sometimes darkness are now light in the Lord, Ephesians 4, verse 32, and chapter 5, verses 1, 2, and 8. Because we are risen with Christ, and when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then we shall also appear with him in glory, Colossians 3, verses 1 and 4. Because God has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, Hebrews 13, verse 5. Because of the many promises made to us, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Search the scriptures, and you may with delight see that this is the vein that runs through gospel exhortations, and you may find the like vein of comfort running through the prophetical exhortations in the Old Testament. Some may object that the apostles used this method in their writings to saints who had practiced holiness already, that so they might continue and increase therein. But to that I may easily reply, if it be a method needful for grown saints, much more for beginners that find the work of obedience most difficult and have most need of strong consolation. And I hope to show how we may be able to lay hold of these consolations by faith in the very first beginning of a holy life. Besides, the gospel proposes peace and comfort freely to those that are not yet brought to holiness, that if they have hearts to receive it, that they may be converted from sin to righteousness. When the apostles entered into a house, they were first to say, Peace be to this house, Luke 10 verse 5. At their very first preaching to sinners, they acquainted them with the glad tidings of salvation by Christ, for every one that would receive it as a free gift by faith. Acts 3 verse 26 and chapter 13 verses 26, 32 and 38 and chapter 16 verses 30 and 31. They assured them if they would but trust heartily on Christ for all his salvation, they should have it, although they were at present the chief of sinners, which was comfort sufficient for all that duly esteem spiritual comfort, hungering and thirsting after it. And this is a method agreeable to the design of the gospel, which is to advance the riches of the grace of God in all our spiritual enjoyments. God will give us his consolations before our good works, as well as after them, that we may know that he gives us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, and not through the procurement of our works. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 6 Fourthly, the nature of the duties of the law require a comfortable state of the soul for the performance of them. I have before proved sufficiently that they require a persuasion of our reconciliation with God, and of our future happiness and strength whereby we may be able to walk in holy obedience, Joshua must be strong and very courageous, that he might observe to do according to the law that Moses the servant of God commanded him. Joshua 1 verse 7. I shall instance briefly some comforts, without which several great duties cannot be sincerely performed. Can we love God and delight in him above all, while we look upon him as our everlasting enemy, and apprehend no love and mercy in him towards us, that may render him a suitable good for us and lovely in our eyes? What doleful melody will the heart make in the duty of praise, if we consider that, all those perfections for which we praise him will rather aggravate our misery than make us happy. What a heartless work will it be to pray to him and to offer up ourselves to his service if we have no comfortable hope that he will accept us. It is possible for us to free ourselves from carking cares by casting our care upon the Lord if we do not apprehend he cares for us. Can we be patient in affliction with cheerfulness and under persecutions except we have peace with God and rejoice in hope of the glory of God? Romans 5 verses 1, 2 and 3. What reason can persuade us to submit willingly, according to our duty, to the stroke of present death, if God be pleased to lay it upon us, when we have no comforts to relieve us against the horrible fear of intolerable torments in hell forever? If we should be called to suffer martyrdom for the Protestant religion, as our ancestors in this nation have done, we should find it necessary to abandon the late upstart notions that have been bred in a time of ease, and to embrace the comfortable doctrine of former Protestants, which, through the grace of God, made so many courageous and joyful martyrs. Fifthly, the state of those that are to be brought from sin to godliness requires necessarily that, after they be convinced of the vanity of their former false confidences, and of their deadness in original sin, and subjection to the wrath of God, they should have a supply of new gospel comforts added to encourage their fainting souls to holy practices. How little do many physicians of souls consider the condition of their unconverted patients that are altogether without spiritual life and strength, and are or must be convinced thereof. He that prescribes bodily exercise to a man lying bedridden under a dead palsy, before any effectual means are used to strengthen him, deserves the name of a merciless, insulting tormentor, rather than of a wise and tender-hearted physician. How unreasonable is it to prescribe the immediate practice of love to God and universal obedience to him out of love, as the means of cure for those that see nothing but wrath and enmity in God towards them in their present condition? What is it but to require a man to work without strength, promising him that he shall have strength when his work is done? For comfort or joy is so called because it strengthens. Nehemiah 8 verse 10. True it is that the law which is the ministration of condemnation obliges them to obedience. 
But our merciful God expects no sincere performance of his law from such impotent, miserable wretches in order to their salvation by Christ, till he has first delivered them, in some measure, from those discomforts, slavish fears, and despondencies that hold them captive under the law of sin and death. We may require a strong, healthy person first to work, then to expect meat, drink, and wages, but a fainting, famished person must first have food, or a reviving cordial, to strengthen his heart before he can work. Sixthly, both scripture and experience show that this is the method whereby God brings his people from sin to holiness. Though some of them are brought under terrors for a while, that sin may be the more embittered, and the salvation of Christ rendered more precious and acceptable to them, yet such are again delivered from their terrors by the comfort of God's salvation, that they may be fitted for holiness. And generally, a holy life begins with comfort, and is maintained by it. God gave to Adam at his first creation the comfort of his love and favor, and the happiness of paradise, to encourage him to obedience, and when he had lost those comforts by the fall, he was no longer able to obey until he was restored by new comfort of the promised seed. Christ, the second Adam, set God always before his face, and he knew that because God was at his right hand, he should not be moved, therefore his heart was glad and his glory rejoiced. Psalm 16, verses 8 and 9. This made him willing to bear his agony and bloody sweat, and to be obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. God drew the Israelites to obedience with the cords of a man and with the bands of love by taking off the yoke on their jaws and laying meat before them. Hosea 9 verse 4. David tells us for our instruction how he was brought to a holy conversation. Thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. Psalm 26 verse 3. Lord, I have hoped for thy salvation and done thy commandments. Psalm 119 verse 166. We have several examples in the New Testament of the joy that sinners had in the first receiving of Christ, Acts 2 verse 41. And when the gospel first came to the Thessalonians, they received the word in much affliction, with joy in the Holy Ghost, 1 Thessalonians 1 verses 4, 5, and 6. When the Gentiles heard the word of God, they were glad, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed, Acts 13 verse 48. The apostle Paul was constrained by the love of Christ to give up himself to live to Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 verses 14 and 15. I dare appeal to the experience of any that obey God out of hearty love. Let them examine themselves and consider whether they were brought to give up themselves to serve God in love without comfortable apprehensions to the love of God towards them. I dare say there are no such prodigies in the new birth. Seventhly, what comfortless religion do those make that allow people no comfort beforehand to strengthen them for holy performances which are very cross, displeasing and grievous to their natural inclinations, as the plucking out a right eye, cutting off a right hand, but would have them first to do such things with love and delight, and all their present fears, despondencies, and corrupt inclinations, and to hope that, by doing the work thoroughly and sincerely, they shall at last attain to a more comfortable state. All true spiritual comfort, as well as salvation, is indeed quite banished out of the world, if it be suspended upon the condition of our good works, which has already appeared to be the condition of the law that works no comfort but wrath. Romans 4 verses 14 and 15. This makes the ways of godliness odious to many. They think they shall never enjoy a pleasant hour in this world if they walk in them, and they had rather comfort themselves with sinful pleasures than have no comforts at all. Others labor a while in such a comfortless religion with inward fretting and repining at the bondage of it, and at last grow weary and throw off all religion because they know none better. They that bind such heavy burdens upon men and grievous to be born will plead that they are not to be blamed because they do but preach the gospel of God and Christ whereas indeed they preach a gospel of man's own forging, contrary to the nature of the true gospel of Christ, which is glad tidings of great joy to all people. Luke 2 verse 16. An uncomfortable gospel cannot proceed from God the Father, who is the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3. Nor from Christ, who is the consolation of Israel. Luke 2 verse 25. Nor from the Spirit, who is the comforter. John 14 verse 16 and 17. God meets him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness. Isaiah 64 verse 5. He will be served with gladness and singing, as he showed by the type of variety of music, and great numbers of musicians in the temple. Christ speaks to us by his gospel, that his joy may abide in us, and that our joy may be full. John 15 verse 11. No sorrow is approved of by God, except godly sorrow, which can never be in us without some comfort of the love of God towards us. They that are offended at the uncomfortableness of a religious life, never yet knew the true way of religion, else they would find that the ways of wisdom are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. Proverbs 3 verse 17. Direction 10 part 1 of The Gospel Mystery of Sanctification by Walter Marshall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
that we may be prepared by the comforts of the gospel to perform sincerely the duties of the law we must get some assurance of our salvation in that very faith whereby christ himself is received into our hearts therefore we must endeavour to believe on christ confidently persuading and assuring ourselves in the act of believing that god freely gives to us an interest in christ and his salvation according to his gracious promise explication it is evident that those comforts of the gospel that are necessary to a holy practice cannot be truly received without some assurance of our interest in christ and his salvation for some of these comforts consist in a good persuasion of our reconciliation with god and of our future heavenly happiness and of strength both to will and to do that which is acceptable to god through christ as has been before shown hence it will clearly follow that this assurance is very necessary to enable us for the practice of holiness as those comforts that must go before the duties of the law in order of nature as the cause goes before the effect though not in any distance of time my present work is to show what this assurance is that is so necessary to holiness and which i have here asserted we must act in that very faith whereby we receive christ himself into our hearts even in justifying saving faith this doctrine seems strange to many that profess themselves protestants of late days whereas it was formerly highly owned by the chief protestants whom god made use of to restore the purity of the gospel and to maintain it against the papists for many years they commonly taught that faith was a persuasion or confidence of our own salvation by christ and that we must be sure to apply christ and his salvation to ourselves in believing and this doctrine was one of the great engines whereby they prevailed to overthrow the popish superstition of which doubtfulness of salvation is one of the principal pillars but many of the successors of the protestants have deserted them and left their writings to be shamefully insulted by the papists and this innovation has been of longer standing among us than several other parts of our new divinity and maintained by those that profess to abhor that corrupt doctrine which the papists have built upon such principles modern divines may think that they stand upon the shoulders of their predecessors whose labours they enjoy and that they can see further than they as the schoolmen might have like thoughts of the ancient fathers but for all this they may not be able to see so far if the eyes of their predecessors were better enlightened by the spirit of god to understand the mystery of the gospel and why may we not judge that it is so in the present case the eyes of men in these late years have been blinded in this point of assurance by many false imaginations they think because salvation is not promised to us absolutely but upon condition of believing on christ for it therefore we must first believe directly on christ for our salvation and after that we must reflect in our minds upon our faith and examine it by several marks and signs especially by the fruit of sincere obedience and if upon this examination we find out certainly that it is true saving faith then and not before we may believe assuredly that we in particular shall be saved on this account they say that our salvation is by the direct and our assurance by the reflex act of faith and that many have true faith and shall be saved who never had any assurance of their salvation as long as they live in this world they find by scripture and experience that many precious saints of god are frequently troubled with doubtings whether they shall be saved and whether their faith and obedience be sincere so that they cannot see assurance in themselves therefore they conclude that assurance must not be accounted absolutely necessary to justifying faith and salvation lest we should make the hearts of doubting saints sad and drive them to despair they account that former protestants were guilty of a manifest absurdity in making assurance to be of the nature and definition of saving faith because all that hear the gospel are bound to saving faith and yet they are not bound absolutely to believe that they themselves shall be saved for then many of them would be bound to believe that which is not declared in the gospel concerning them in particular yea that which is a plain lie because the gospel shows that many of those that are called are not chosen for salvation but perish for ever matthew twenty verse sixteen no wonder if the appearance of so great an absurdity move many to imagine that saving faith is a trusting or resting on christ as the only sufficient means of salvation without any assurance or that it is a desiring and adventuring to trust or rely upon him in a mere state of suspense and uncertainty concerning our salvation or with a probable opinion or conjectural hope of it at best another objection against this doctrine of assurance is that it destroys self-examination brings forth the evil fruits of pride and arrogance as if they knew their places in heaven already before the day of judgment causes carelessness of duty carnal security and all manner of licentiousness and this makes them commend doubtfulness of our salvation as necessary to maintain in us humility religious fears watchfulness much searching and trying our spiritual state and ways diligence in good works and all devotion against all these contrary imaginations i shall endeavour to maintain this ancient protestant doctrine of assurance which i have expressed in the direction and first i shall lay down some observations for the right understanding of it 
which will be sufficient to turn the edge of the strongest objections that can be made against it. First, observe diligently that the assurance referred to is not a persuasion that we have already received Christ and his salvation, or that we have been already brought into a state of grace, but only that God is pleased graciously to give Christ and his salvation to us, and to bring us into a state of grace, though we have been altogether in a state of sin and death until this present time, so that this doctrine does not at all tend to excite presumption in wicked and unregenerate men that their state is good already, but only encourages them to come to Christ confidently for a good state. I acknowledge that we may, yea, many must be taught, to doubt whether their present state be good, and that it is humility so to do, and that we must find out the certainty and sincerity of our faith and obedience by self-examination, before we can have a well-grounded assurance that we are in a state of grace and salvation already, and that such an assurance belongs to that which they call the reflex acts of faith, if any act of faith can be made of it, it being a spiritual sense of feeling of what is in myself, and is not of the essence of that faith whereby we are justified and saved, and that many precious saints are without it, and subject to many doubts that are contrary to it, so that they may not know at all that it shall go well with them at the day of judgment, and that it may be sometimes intermitted, if not wholly lost after it is gotten, and that we should strive to walk holily, that we may attain to it, because it is very useful for our growth and increase in faith and in all holiness. Most Protestants among us, when they speak or write of assurance, mean only that which is by reflection, and I have said enough briefly to show that what I assert is consistent with the doctrine which is commonly received concerning it and destructive to none of the good fruits of it, therefore not guilty of those evils that some falsely charge it with. This kind of assurance which I speak of answers not the question whether I am already in a state of grace and salvation. There is another great question that the soul must answer that it may get into a state of grace, whether God be graciously pleased now to bestow Christ and his salvation upon me, though I have been hitherto a very wicked creature. We must be sure to resolve this question comfortably by another kind of assurance in the direct act of faith wherein we are to persuade ourselves without reflecting upon any good qualifications in ourselves that God is ready graciously to receive us into the arms of his saving mercy in Christ, notwithstanding all our former wickedness according to that gracious promise. I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there they shall be called the children of the living God. Romans 9, verses 25 and 26. Secondly, the assurance referred to is not a persuasion of our salvation, whatever we do, or however we live and walk, but only in a limited way, through mere free grace in Christ, by partaking of holiness as well as forgiveness, and by walking in the way of holiness to the enjoyment of the glory of God. We shall not heartily desire or endeavor to assure ourselves of such a salvation as this is, if we be not brought first to see our own sinfulness and misery, and to despair of our own righteousness and strength, and to hunger and thirst for the sanctifying as well as justifying grace of God in Christ, that so we may walk in the ways of holiness to the enjoyment of heavenly glory. The faith whereby we receive Christ must have in it not only a persuasion of happiness, but these and the like good qualifications that will make it a most holy faith. Certainly an assurance thus qualified will not beget any pride in us, but rather humility and self-loathing, except any accounted pride to rejoice and glory in Christ when we have no confidence in the flesh, Philippians 3 verse 3. It will not destroy religious fear and excite carnal security, but rather it will make us fear going aside from Christ, our only refuge and security, and walking after the flesh. Noah had cause to enter into the ark and to abide there with assurance of his preservation, yet he might well be afraid to venture out of the ark because he was persuaded that continuance in the ark was his only safety from perishing in the flood. And how can a persuasion of salvation in a way of holiness produce slothfulness in duty, carelessness and licentiousness? It rather mightily allures and stirs us up to be always abounding in the work of the Lord, forasmuch as we know that our labor shall not be in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58 They that are persuaded of the free grace of God towards them in Christ are not indeed solicitous about earning their salvation by their own legal works. And Satan is ready to suggest to them that this is a sinful carelessness and tends to licentiousness. But they that will believe this false suggestion of Satan show plainly that they do not know what it is to serve God in love, and that they are held in to all their obedience by the bit and bridle of slavish fear, as the horse and mule that have no understanding. Psalm 32 verse 9. Thirdly, beware of thinking so highly of this assurance, as if it were inconsistent with any doubting in the same soul. A great reason why many Protestants have receded from the doctrine of their ancestors in this point is because they think there can be no true assurance of salvation in any that are troubled with doubts, as they may find many are whom they cannot but own as true believers and precious saints of God. 
true indeed this assurance must in the nature of it be contrary to doubting and so if it were perfect in the highest degree it would exclude all doubting out of the soul and it does now exclude it in some degree but is there not flesh as well as spirit in the best saints on earth galatians five verse seventeen is there not a law in their members warring against the law of their minds romans seven verse twenty three may not one that truly believes say lord help my unbelief mark nine verse twenty four can any on earth say they have received any grace in the highest degree and that they are wholly free from the contrary corruption why then should we think that assurance cannot be true except it be perfect and free the soul from all doubts the apostle accounts it a great blessing to the thessalonians that they had much assurance intimating that some true assurance might be in a less degree one thessalonians one verse five peter had some good assurance of christ's help when he walked on the water at christ's command and yet he had some doubtfulness in him as his fears showed when he saw the wind boisterous he had some faith contrary to doubting though it were but a little as christ's words to him show o thou of little faith wherefore didst thou doubt matthew fourteen verses twenty nine thirty and thirty one it is strange if the flesh and the devil shall never oppose a true assurance and assault it with doubts a believer may be sometimes so overwhelmed with doubts that he may not be able to perceive an assurance in himself he is so far from knowing his place in heaven already as some scoffingly object that he will say that he knows not any assurance that he has of being there and needs diligent self-examination to find it out yet if at any time he can blame his soul for doubting why art thou cast down o my soul and why art thou disquieted within me hope thou in god for i shall yet praise him psalm forty two verse eleven if he can condemn his doubting as sinful and say with himself this is my infirmity psalm seventy seven verse ten these doubts are of the flesh and of the devil if he still endeavour to call god father and complain to him that he doubts whether he be his father and pray that god will give him the assurance of his fatherly love which he is not sensible of and dispel those fears and doubts i say that such a one has some true assurance though he must strive to grow to a higher degree for if he were not persuaded of the truth of the love of god towards him he could not rationally condemn his fears and doubts concerning it as sinful neither could he rationally pray to god as his father or that god would assure him of that love that he does not think to be true do but grant that it is the nature of saving faith thus to resist and struggle with slavish fears of wrath and doubts of our own salvation and you grant in effect that there is and must be something of assurance of our salvation in saving faith whereby it resists doubts and you are in effect of the same judgment with me in the assertion however strange my expression seems to you if this that i have said concerning our imperfection in assurance as well as in other graces were well considered this ancient protestant doctrine would be freed much from prejudice and gain more esteem among us fourthly in the last place let it be well observed that the reason why we are to assure ourselves in our faith that god freely gives christ and salvation to us particularly is not because it is a truth before we can believe it but because it becomes a certain truth when we believe it and because it will never be true except we do in some measure persuade and assure ourselves that it is so we have no absolute promise or declaration in scripture that god certainly will or does give christ and his salvation to any one of us in particular neither do we know it to be true already by scripture or sense or reason before we assure ourselves absolutely of it yea we are without christ's salvation at present in a state of sin and misery under the curse and wrath of god only i shall prove that we are bound by the command of god thus to assure ourselves and the scripture sufficiently warrants us that we should not deceive ourselves in believing a lie but according to our faith so shall it be to us matthew nine verse twenty nine this is a strange kind of assurance far different from other ordinary kinds and therefore no wonder if it be found weak and imperfect and difficult to be obtained and assaulted with many doubts we are constrained to believe other things on the clear evidence we have that they are true and would remain true whether we believe them or not so that we cannot deny our assent without rebelling against the light of our senses reason and conscience but here our assurance is not impressed on our thoughts by any evidence of the thing but we must work it out in ourselves by the assistance of the spirit of god and thereby we bring our own thoughts into captivity to the obedience of christ none but god can justly require of us this kind of assurance because he only calleth those things that are not as though they were romans four verse seventeen he only can give existence to things that yet are not and make a thing to be true upon our believing it that was not true before he only can make good that promise what things soever ye desire when ye pray believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them mark eleven verse twenty four who is he that saith and it cometh to pass when the lord commandeth it not lamentations three verse thirty seven therefore this faith is due to god only and greatly redounds to his glory 
Men will often require a believing something like it, as when one says, I will forgive your offence and be your friend, if I can find that you believe it and that you take me for a friend. But their fallible word is not sufficient ground to make us persuade ourselves absolutely that we shall have their promised favour. The faith of miracles gives us some light in this matter. Christ assured them on whom they were wrought, and who had power given them of working them, that the miracles should be wrought if they believed without doubting of the event. Mark 11, verses 22 and 23. And there is a reason for this resemblance, because the end of working miracles was to confirm the doctrine of the gospel of salvation by faith in Christ's name, as the scriptures clearly show. And indeed, the salvation of a sinner is a very great miracle. It is reported that wizards often require that those who come to them should believe they shall obtain what they desire of them, or at least that they are able to fulfill their desires, whereby the devil, the master of those wizards, shows himself to be God's ape, and that he would fain have the honor and glory ascribed to himself that is due to God alone. Having thus explained the nature of that assurance which I have referred to, I shall now produce several arguments to prove that there is, and must necessarily be, such an assurance or persuasion of our salvation in saving faith itself. Firstly, this assurance of salvation is implied in the description before given of that faith, whereby we receive Christ and his salvation into our heart. I describe faith to be a grace of the Spirit, whereby we heartily believe the gospel, and also believe on Christ as he is revealed and freely promised to us therein for all his salvation. And I showed in the explanation that believing on Christ is the same with resting, relying, leaning, staying ourselves on Christ, or on God through Christ for our salvation. It may be some will like that description the better, because faith was there described by terms that are ordinarily used, even by those that deny the necessity of assurance. But these ordinary terms sufficiently include assurance in the nature of faith, and they cannot stand without it. And this shows that many hold the doctrine of assurance implicitly and profess it, though they think the contrary. Believing on Christ for salvation, as freely promised to us, must needs include a dependence on Christ with a persuasion that salvation shall be freely given, as it is freely promised to us. Believing with a divine faith, grounded on the infallible truth of the promise, if it did not in some measure exclude a mere suspense and wavering opinion or conjecture, were not worthy to be so called. Some may be so absurd as to say that faith is only a believing that we shall be saved by Christ if we perform such conditions as he requires, and then, indeed, it will leave us where it found us, as to any certainty of salvation until those conditions be performed. But I have already prevented such an absurdity by showing that this believing on Christ is itself not only the condition of our salvation, but also the instrument whereby we actually receive it. Believing, being the proper act of faith, must needs have the same contraries to it, as staggering, Romans 4 verse 20, wavering, Hebrews 10 verse 23, doubting, Matthew 14 verse 31, fear, Mark 5 verse 36. These contraries clearly illustrate the nature of faith and show that believing must have some confidence in it, else it would have doubting in the very nature of it. For what man that understands the preciousness of his immortal soul and his danger of losing it can ever avoid fear, doubting, and trouble of heart by any believing, whereby he does not at all assure himself of his salvation? The other terms of trusting and resting on Jesus Christ, etc., whereby faith is often described by orthodox teachers, must include assurance of salvation because they signify the same thing with believing on Christ. The soul must have its sufficient support to bear it up against oppressing fears, troubles, cares, despair, that it may thus trust and rest. The right manner of trusting and hoping in the Lord is by assuring ourselves against all fears and doubts that the Lord is our God and he has become our salvation. I trusted on thee, O Lord, I said, Thou art my God. Psalm 31 verse 14 The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust. Psalm 18 verse 2 Behold, God is my salvation, I will trust and not be afraid. Isaiah 12 verse 2 O my soul, hope thou in God, who is the health of my countenance and my God. Psalm 42 verse 11 True hope is grounded in God only, that he will bless us, that he may be an anchor for the soul, sure and steadfast. Hebrews 6 verses 17, 18 and 19 if you trust, rely, and stay yourselves on Christ, or hope in him without assuring yourselves at all of salvation by him, you make no better use of him than if he were a broken reed, or, if you would stay yourselves on the Lord, you must look upon him as your God, as the prophet teaches, let him trust in the name of the Lord, and stay upon his God, Isaiah 50 verse 10. If you will rest in the Lord, you must believe that he deals bountifully with you, Psalm 116 verse 7, or else, for aught you know, you may make your bed in hell and you will show little regard to Christ and to your own soul if you dare to rest under the wrath of God without any persuasion of a sure interest in Christ. 
people may please themselves with such a trusting or resting etc when they are at ease but in time of temptation it vanishes away and appears to be no true faith but is turned into shame the soul that lives in such wavering and doubting concerning salvation does not stay itself nor rest at all but is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed he is a double-minded man unstable in all his ways james one verses six and eight if you continue in mere suspense and doubt of salvation by christ your desire to trust is but a lazy desire without any fixed resolution and you dare not yet venture to trust on him steadfastly if you call it only your desire to trust and rely on jesus christ i may answer that you cannot do this much in a right manner except you desire and venture to persuade and assure yourselves of your salvation by christ notwithstanding all the causes that you have to doubt and fear the contrary if it be objected that we may trust on christ only as a sufficient means of salvation without any assurance of the effect i shall acknowledge that the sufficiency of god and christ is a good ground for us to rest on but we must understand by it not only a sufficiency of power but also of good will and mercy towards us for what have we more than fallen angels to do with the sufficiency of god and christ's power without his good will towards us and if this be truly believed it will exclude doubts concerning your salvation secondly several places of scripture declare positively and expressly that we are to be assured of our salvation in that faith whereby we are justified and saved i shall produce some instances we are exhorted to draw near to god with full assurance of faith hebrews 10 verse 22 many apply this text to that which they call the reflex act of faith because they imagine that all assurance must needs be by reflection but the words of the text clearly teach us to understand it of that act of faith whereby we draw near to god that is the direct act and it is that very faith whereby the just live even justifying saving faith verse 38 and this assurance must be full at least in the true and proper nature of it in opposition to mere doubt and uncertainty though we are yet further to labor for that which is full in the highest degree of perfection and the same faith whereby we are exhorted to draw nigh unto god and whereby the just lives is a little after chapter eleven verse one affirmed to be the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen why should saving faith have these high titles and attributes given to it if it did not contain in it a sure persuasion of the great things of our salvation hoped for making them evident to the eyes of our mind as if they were already present in their substance though yet not visible to our bodily eyes that faith whereby we are made partakers of christ and to be christ's house must be worthy to be called confidence and accompanied with rejoicing hope whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end hebrews three verses six and fourteen what is confidence concerning anything but trust concerning it with a firm persuasion of the truth of it if we have only a strong opinion concerning a thing without any absolute certainty we are accustomed to say that we are not altogether confident of it the faith whereby we are justified must be in a measure like to the faith whereby abraham against hope believed in hope that his seed should certainly be multiplied according to the promise of god though by reason of the deadness of his body and of sarah's womb he could have no evidence of his own qualifications to assure himself of it but all appearances were rather to the contrary as the apostle teaches clearly romans 4 verses 18 19 23 and 24 an absolute as to this promise was thus made to abraham yet it was not to be fulfilled without this assurance of faith and by the like faith the free promises of salvation by christ will be absolutely fulfilled to us the apostle james expressly requires that we should ask good things of god in faith nothing doubting which includes assurance manifestly and he tells us plainly that without it a man ought not to think that he shall receive anything of the lord therefore we may firmly conclude that without it we shall not receive the salvation of christ james one verses six and seven and that which the apostle james requires us not to doubt of is the obtaining the things that we ask as we may learn from an instruction to the same purpose given us by christ himself what things soever ye desire when ye pray believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them mark eleven verse twenty four more places of scripture might be alleged to the same purpose but these are sufficient to evince that we are bound to assure ourselves of our salvation in faith itself or else we are never likely to enjoy it and that it is not humility but rather proud disobedience to live in a state of mere suspense and doubt concerning our salvation and that this assurance must be in the direct act of faith whereby we are justified and saved for as for that which is called the reflex act of faith it is a certain truth and generally owned that it is not absolutely necessary to salvation to any and that it is sinful and pernicious to many to believe that they are already entered into a state of grace and salvation thirdly god gives us sufficient ground in scripture to come to christ with confident faith at the very first trusting assuredly that christ and his salvation shall be given to us without any failing and delay 
however vile and sinful our condition has been hitherto. The scripture speaks to the vilest sinners in such a manner, as if it were framed on purpose to beget assurance of salvation in them immediately. Acts 2, verse 39, and chapter 3, verse 26. This promise is universal, that whosoever believeth on Christ shall not be ashamed, without making a difference between Jew and Greek. Romans 10, verses 11 and 12. And this promise is confirmed by the blood of Christ, who was given for the world, and lifted up upon the cross for this very end, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, verses 14, 15, and 16. His invitation is free to any. If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. And this drink is promised to every one that believeth. John 7, verses 37 and 39. The command of believing is propounded not only in general, but in particular, and the promise of salvation upon believing is also applied personally and that to such as have been hitherto in a state of sin and wrath, as to the wicked, persecuting, self-murdering jailer. Acts 16, verse 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved in thine house. God commanded them that walked altogether in sin hitherto to call him their own father, in their very first returning. Jeremiah 3, verse 4. So Hosea 2, verse 25. God says, He will say, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God, confidently averring that personal interest in him. God hath joined confidence and salvation inseparably together. In returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. Isaiah 30, verse 15. What a poor, slender use and improvement do many make of these discoveries of the rich grace of God towards sinners, who say that if we see that we have performed the condition of believing, then we may take Christ confidently as our own. They skip over the first principal use that they ought to make of them. The very performance of the condition is to take Christ as our own immediately, and to eat him and drink him, by believing confidently on him for our salvation. If an honest rich man say to a poor woman, I promise to be thy husband if thou wilt have me, say but the word, and I am thine, may not she presently answer confidently, Thou art my husband, and I claim thee for my husband. And should she not rather say so than say, I believe not what thou sayest? If an honest man say, Do but take this gift, and it is your own, do but eat and drink, and you are freely welcome. May not I take the gift and eat and drink at first without any further ado, and with assurance that it is mine freely. If I do it doubtingly, I disparage the honesty and credit of the donor, as if he were not a man of his word. In like manner, if fearing to be too confident, lest we should believe a lie, we should come to Christ doubtingly and in mere suspense, whether we shall be freely entertained after God's free invitations and promises, should we not disparage the faithfulness of God, and should we not be guilty of making God a liar? as the Apostle John teaches, because of our not believing the record which God gave of his Son, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son, 1 John 5, verses 10 and 11. And what of the salvation promised be not absolutely intended for all to whom the gospel comes? It is enough that God gives us his faithful word that they that believe shall have it and none else, and has absolutely intended to fulfill his word that none shall find it to be a lie to them, and has joined believing and salvation inseparably together. On this ground, God may justly cause the promise of this salvation to be published to all, and may justly require all to believe on him assuredly for their own salvation, that so it may appear whether they will give him the glory of his truth, and if they will not, he may justly reject them and punish them severely for dishonouring him by their unbelief. In this case we must not look to the secret decrees of God, but to his revealed promises and command. Thus God promised to the Israelites in the wilderness that he would give them the land of Canaan, and would fight for them against their enemies and required them not to fear or be discouraged, that so the promise might be fulfilled to them. Yet God never absolutely decreed or intended that those Israelites should enter in, as the event quickly manifested, Deuteronomy 1, verses 20, 21, 29, and 30. Yet were they not bound in this case to trust confidently in God, to give them victory over their enemies, and to give them the possession of the land? Had they not sufficient ground for such a faith? Was it not just with God to consume them in the wilderness for their unbelief? Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being made of entering into this everlasting rest through Christ, we should come short of it and fall after the same example of unbelief. Hebrews 4 verses 1 and 11. Fourthly, the professors of true godliness that we read of through the scriptures of the Old and New Testament commonly professed their assurance and persuasion of their interest in God and his salvation, and were directed by the word of God so to do, and true saints had still some true assurance of it, and we have no cause to judge that this assurance was grounded on the certainty of their own good qualifications but rather on the promises of God by the direct act of faith. We may judge of the ordinary profession of the frame of spirit that was in saints by some instances. I shall begin with the profession that the church made when it was very corrupt, at its first coming out of Egypt, when few of them could assure themselves by their own good qualifications that they were in a state of grace already. 
which many now imagine to be the only way of assurance. Even in that corrupt time the children of Israel sung that triumphant song of Moses, The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation, he is my God, etc. Exodus 15, verse 2. Moses taught them in this song to assure themselves of their own personal interest in the salvation, and he guided them to the practice of their duty. And they did not find fault with Moses, as some do with ministers in these days, for putting them to express more confidence in their song than they can find ground for in their qualifications. But they applied themselves to the exercise of their faith, agreeably to the song, and doubtless this faith was unfeigned in some few of them, though but feigned in others, for it is testified of them that then they believed his words, they sang his praise. Psalm 106 verse 12. Several other psalms and songs that were by divine appointment in common use under the Old Testament are as clear an evidence as we can desire of that assurance of faith which is commonly professed, and that people were generally bound to under the Old Testament, as Psalm 23, Psalm 27, Psalm 44, and Psalm 46. Many other psalms or expressions in psalms might be alleged. The spirits of few in comparison could have thoroughly complied with such psalms, though they were true believers, if all the assurance of the love of God must altogether depend upon the certain knowledge of the sincerity of their own hearts. We have a great cloud of witnesses gathered out of the whole history of the Old Testament, Hebrews 11, who did and suffered and obtained great things by faith, whose examples are produced on purpose that we may follow them in believing to the saving of our souls, Hebrews 10 verse 39. And if we consider these examples particularly, we shall find that many of them evidently guide us to such a saving faith as has an assurance of the effect contained in the nature of it. I confess we read several times of the fears and doubts of the saints under the Old Testament, but we read also how their faith opposed such fears and doubts, and how they themselves condemned them as contrary to faith as in the Psalms, Psalm 42 verse 11, Psalm 31 verse 22, and Psalm 77 verses 7 and 10. The most mournful psalm in Scripture begins with an expression of some assurance, Psalm 88 verse 1. And we may note that the doubts that we meet with of the saints of old were commonly occasioned by some extraordinary affliction or some heinous transgression, not by common failings or the common original deprivation of nature, or the uncertainty of their election, or any thought that it is humility to doubt, and that they were not bound to be confident of God's salvation because then many might be bound to believe a lie. It is hard to find any of these occasions of doubting under the Old Testament, though they are grown so rife among us now under the New Testament. In the time of the Apostles we may well expect that the assurance of faith grew higher because the salvation of Christ was revealed, and the spirit of adoption poured forth plentifully, and the Church made free from its former bondage under the terrifying legal covenant. Paul could prove to primitive Christians, by appeals to their own experience, that they were the children and heirs of God, because they had not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption, whereby they cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirits, or beareth our spirits witness, as the Syriac and vulgar Latin render it, and as the like Greek phrase is rendered, Romans 9, verse 1, that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, Romans 8, verses 15, 16, and 17, Galatians 4, verse 6. And the Apostle tells the Ephesians that after they believed, they were sealed with the Holy Spirit, which was the earnest of their inheritance. Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14, that is, they were sealed from the same time that they believed, for the original words are in the same tense. If this witness, seal, and earnest of the Spirit had not been ordinary to believers, it would not have been sufficient to prove that they were the children of God, and such manner of arguing might have driven some to despair, who wanted this witness, seal, and earnest. Let us inquire now whether the Spirit bears witness that we are the children of God, and enables us to cry, Abba, Father, by the direct act, or by that which they call the reflex act of faith. For we must not think that it is done by an enthusiasm, without any ordinary means, nor can we reasonably imagine that no true believers can call God Father by the guidance of the Spirit, but only those few that are so sure of their own sincerity, that by reflecting upon it they can ground an act of faith concerning their own interest in Christ. No, surely. Therefore we may judge, rather, that the Spirit works this in us by giving us saving faith itself, by the direct act of which all true believers are enabled to trust assuredly on Christ for the enjoyment of the adoption of children, and all his salvation, according to the free promise of God, and to call God Father, without reflecting on any good qualifications in themselves, for the Spirit is received by the direct act of faith, Galatians 3 verse 2. And so he is the Spirit of adoption and comfort to all that receive him. They who assert that the Spirit witnesses our adoption, only by assuring us of the sincerity of our faith, love, and other gracious qualifications, and by the reflex act of faith, teach also commonly that you must again try whether the spirit thus witnessing be the spirit of truth or of delusion, by searching narrowly, whether our inward grace be sincere or counterfeit, 
so that hereby the testimony of the Spirit is rendered so hard to be discerned that it stands us in no stead, but all our assurance is made at last to depend on our own certain knowledge of our own sincerity. There are several other evidences to show that believers generally were persuaded of their salvation in the apostles' times. They loved and waited for the coming of Christ to judge the world, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 7, 2 Timothy 4 verse 8. They loved all the saints for the hope that was laid up for them in heaven, Colossians 1 verses 3, 4, and 5. The Corinthians, who were very carnal and but babes in Christ, were persuaded that they should judge the world and angels, and that their bodies were members of Christ and the temples of the Holy Ghost, 1 Corinthians 6 verses 2, 3, 15, and 19. The very first coming of the gospel to the Thessalonians was in the Holy Ghost and much assurance, so that they received it in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, when, as yet, they had no considerable time to get assurance by reflecting on their good qualifications, 1 Thessalonians 1 verses 5 and 6. Likewise, the believing Hebrews, when they were illuminated at their first conversion, took joyfully the spoiling of their goods, knowing that they had in heaven a better and an enduring substance, and this was their confidence, which they were not to cast off, because the just lives by faith, and therefore it appears that this confidence belongs necessarily to justifying saving faith. Hebrews 10 verses 32, 34, 35, and 38. Now let those that allege the examples or experiences of many modern Christians to disprove all that I have asserted, consider well whether these are fit to be laid in the balance against all the scripture examples and experience that I have produced out of the Old and New Testament. I confess that assurance of salvation is more rarely professed by Christians in these times than formerly, and we may thank some teachers for it who have deserted the doctrine of former Protestants on this point, and vented against it several errors such as have been already named, and now would take advantage to confirm the truth of their doctrines from those doubtings in Christians that have been chiefly occasioned by it. But, however, the nature of saving faith is still the same, and I assert that in these days as well as formerly, it always has in it some assurance of salvation by Christ, which does and will appear, at least in resisting and condemning all doubts and praying against them, and endeavouring to trust assuredly to call God Father, except in extraordinary desertions by which our case must not be tried. We are not to trust the judgment of many concerning themselves. They will judge falsely that they have no assurance at all because they know not yet by marks and signs that they are in a state of grace already, or because they think that there is no assurance when there are many doubts, and because it is so weak and so much oppressed with doubting that it can hardly be discerned, as life in a fainting fit. But if their judgments be better informed, they may be brought to discern some assurance in themselves. We are also to take heed of mistaking those for true believers who are not so, and of judging this point by their experience, which is a vulgar error. The blind charity of some moves them to take all for true believers who are full of doubts and troubles concerning their salvation, though it may be they only are convinced of sin and brought to some zeal of God that is not according to the knowledge of the way of salvation by Christ, and they think it duty to comfort such ignorant persons by persuading them that their state is good and their faith right, though they have no assurance of salvation. Thus they are brought to judge falsely concerning the nature of faith out of their blind charity to such as are yet in ignorance and unbelief, and instead of comforting such, they rather take the direct way to harden them in their natural state, and to divert them from seeking consolation by saving faith in Christ, and to ruin their souls forever. Fifthly, the chief office of this faith, in its direct saving act, is to receive Christ and his salvation actually into our hearts as has been proved, which office cannot be rationally performed except we, in some measure, persuade our hearts and assure ourselves in the enjoyment of him. As the body receives things into itself by the hands and mouth, so the soul receives these things to itself and lays actual hold on them by the faculty of the will, making choice of them and embracing them in a way of present enjoyment and possession, as by the faculty of the understanding it sees and apprehends them. Thus the soul receives comfort from outward things, as a righteous person cannot receive inward comfort from outward things, as from worldly estate, wife, husband, friends, etc., except he choose them as good and account them his own by a right and title. This is the only rational way whereby the soul can actively lay hold on Christ and take actual possession of him and his salvation as he is freely offered and promised to us in the gospel by the grace of faith, which God has appointed to be our great instrument for the receiving of him and closing with him. If we do not make choice of Christ as our only salvation and happiness, or if we be altogether in a state of suspense and doubt whether God will be pleased to give Christ to us or not, it is evident that our souls are quite loose from Christ and have no hold or enjoyment of him. They do not so much as pretend to any actual receiving or laying hold or choosing of him, neither are they fully satisfied that it is lawful for them so to do, but rather they are yet to seek whether they have any good ground or right to lay hold on him. 
let any rational man judge whether the soul does or can put forth any sufficient act for the reception and enjoyment of christ as its saviour head or husband while it is yet in doubt whether it be the will of christ to be joined with it in such a near relation can a woman honestly receive any one as her husband without being assured that he is fully willing to be her husband the same may be said concerning the several parts of christ's salvation which are to be received by faith it is evident that we do not receive aright the benefit of remission of sins for the purging of our consciences from that guilt that lies upon them, unless we have an assured persuasion of God's forgiving them. We do not actually receive into our hearts our reconciliation with God and adoption of children and the title to an everlasting inheritance until we can assure ourselves that God is graciously pleased to be our God and Father and to take us to be His children and heirs. We do not actually receive any sufficient strength to encourage our hearts to holiness in all difficulties until we can steadfastly believe that God is with us and will not fail nor forsake us. Hence then we may firmly conclude that he who seeks to be saved by faith and does not seek to have assurance or confidence of his own salvation does but deceive himself and delude his soul with a mere fancy instead of saving faith, and in effect seeks to be saved in his corrupt natural state without receiving and laying actual hold of the Lord Jesus Christ and his salvation. Sixthly, it is also a great and necessary office of saving faith to purify the heart and to enable us to live and walk in the practice of all holy duties by the grace of Christ and by Christ himself living in us, as has been shown before. Which office faith is not able to perform except some assurance of our own interest in Christ and his salvation be comprehended in the nature of it. If we would live to God, not ourselves, but by Christ living in us, according to Paul's example, we must be able to assure ourselves as he did, Christ loved me and gave himself for me, Galatians 2 verse 20. We are taught that if we live in the Spirit we should walk in the Spirit, Galatians 5 verse 25. It would be a high presumption if we should endeavour to walk above our natural strength and power by the Spirit before we have made sure of our living by the Spirit. I have showed that we cannot make use of the comfortable benefits of the saving graces of Christ, whereby the Gospel engages and encourages us to a holy practice, except we have some confidence of our own interest in those saving benefits. If we do not assuredly believe that we are dead to sin and alive to God through Christ, and risen with Christ and not under the law but under grace, and members of Christ's body, the temple of his spirit, the dear children of God, it would be hypocrisy to serve God upon the account of such privileges as if we reckoned ourselves to be partakers of them. He that thinks he should doubt of his salvation is not a fit disciple for this manner of doctrine, and he may reply to the preachers of the gospel, If you would bring me to holiness, you must make use of other more effectual arguments, for I cannot practice upon these principles, because I have not faith enough to believe that I have any interest in them. Some arguments taken from the justice and wrath of God against sinners and his mercy towards those that perform the condition of sincere obedience would work more powerfully upon me. Oh, what a miserable, worthless kind of saving faith is this, that cannot fit a believer to practice in a gospel manner upon the most pure and powerful principles of grace, but rather leaves him to work upon legal principles which can never bring him to serve God acceptably out of love. And as such a faith wholly fails in the right manner of obeying upon gospel principles, so it fails also in the very matter of some great duties which are of such a nature that they include assurance of God's love in the right performance of them. Such are those great duties of peace with God, rejoicing in the Lord always, hope that maketh not ashamed, owning the Lord as our God and our Saviour, praying to Him as our Father in heaven, offering up body and soul as an acceptable sacrifice to Him, casting all our cares of body and soul upon Him, contentment and hearty thanksgiving in every condition, making our boast in the Lord, triumphing in His praise, rejoicing in tribulation, putting on Christ in our baptism, receiving Christ's body as broken for us and His blood as shed for us in the Lord's Supper, committing our souls willingly to God as our Redeemer whenever He shall be pleased to call for us, loving Christ's second appearance and looking for it as that blessed hope. When we fall into any sudden doubt whether we are in a state of grace already, when we are called to any present undertaking as to require of the Lord's Supper, or any duty that requires assurance to the right performance of it, we must relieve ourselves by trusting confidently in Christ for the present gift of His salvation, or else we shall be driven to omit the duty or not to perform it rightly or sincerely. Can we judge ourselves already in a state of grace by the reflex act of faith, if we do not find that we perform these duties, at least several of them, sincerely, or if we do not find that we have such a holy faith as enables or inclines us to the performance of them? And can we be thus enabled and inclined by any faith that is without some true assurance of our salvation? Therefore I conclude that we must necessarily have some assurance of our salvation in the direct act of faith, whereby we are justified, sanctified, and saved, before we can, upon any good ground, assure ourselves that we are already in a state of grace, by that which they call the reflex act. Give me such a saving faith as will produce such fruits as these. 
no other faith will work by love, and therefore will not avail to salvation in Christ. Galatians 5, verse 6. The Apostle James puts thee upon showing thy faith by thy works. James 2, verse 18. And in this trial, this faith of assurance comes off with high praise and honor. When God calls his people to work outward miracles by it, all things have been possible to them, and it has frequently brought forth such works of righteousness as may be deservedly esteemed great spiritual miracles. From hence has proceeded that heroic fortitude of the people of God, whereby their absolute obedience to God has shone forth in doing and suffering those great things which are recorded in the Holy Scriptures and in the histories of the Church. And if we be ever called to the fiery trial as Protestants formerly were, we shall find their doctrine of assurance will encourage us in suffering for the sake of Christ. Seventhly, the contrary doctrine which excludes assurance out of the nature of saving faith brings forth many evil fruits. It tends to bereave our souls of all assurance of our salvation and solid comfort, which is the life of religion, by placing them after sincere universal obedience, whereas if we have them not first we can never attain to this obedience, nor to any assurance that depends on it, as has been proved. And this, as far as it prevails, makes us subject to continual doubts concerning our salvation, and to tormenting fears of wrath, which casts out true love to God, and can produce no better than slavish hypocritical service. It is one of the principal pillars whereby manifold superstitions in popery are supported, as their monkish orders, their satisfactions for sins by works of penance, bodily macerations, whippings, pilgrimages, indulgences, trusting on the merits of saints, etc. When once men have lost the knowledge of the right way to assure themselves of salvation, they will catch at any straw to avoid drowning in the gulf of despair. This is no way to administer any solid comfort to the wounded spirits of those who see themselves void of all holiness, under the wrath and curse of God, dead in sin, not able so much as to think a good thought. You but increase their terror and anguish if you tell them they must first get faith and obedience, and when they find that they have done that, they may persuade themselves that God will receive them into his grace and favor. Alas, they know that they cannot believe nor obey except God assist them with his grace and favor. And what if they be even at the point of death, struggling with death's pangs, so that they have no time nor leisure to get good qualifications and examine the goodness of them? You must have a more speedy way to comfort such by discovering to them the free promises of salvation to the worst of sinners by faith in Christ, and by exhorting them to apply those promises and trust on Christ confidently for remission of sins, holiness, and glory, assuring them also that God will help them to believe sincerely on Christ, if they desire it with all their hearts, and that it is their duty to believe because God commands it. Several other evils are occasioned by the same doctrine. Men are unwilling to know the worst of themselves and prone to think their qualifications better than they are, that they may avoid despair. Others please and content themselves without any assurance of their interest in Christ, because they think that it is not necessary to salvation, and that but few attain to it, and in this they show little love to Christ or to their own souls. Some foster doubts of salvation as signs of humility, though they will hypocritically complain of them. Many misspend their time in pouring upon their own hearts to find some evidence of their interest in Christ, when they should rather be employed in receiving Christ and walking in Him by a confident faith. Some are troubled with doubts whether they should call God Father, and what apprehensions they should have of Him in prayer, and are offended at ministers who in their public prayers use any expressions that the people cannot join in, as when they own God as their God and Father, and Christ as their Saviour, and upon the same account they are offended at the public singing of many of David's psalms, and avoid partaking of the Lord's Supper because they are not satisfied about their interest in Christ. Though true believers have some assurance of salvation in saving faith itself, yet it is much weakened in many by this contrary doctrine, and assaulted with many doubts, and then other good qualifications must needs be low and weak together with it, and so obscure that it is very hard to discern them. How hard a thing then will it be for true believers to assure themselves, by the certain knowledge of their own sincerity, that they are in a state of grace already, which some say is the only assurance of faith. Some prescribe such marks and signs to distinguish sincerity from hypocrisy that believers cannot sufficiently try themselves by them, except they have more knowledge and experience than ordinary. Thus many believers walk heavily in the bitterness of their own souls, conflicting with fears and doubts all their days. And this is the cause that they have so little courage and fervency of spirit in the ways of God, and that they so much mind earthly things and are so afraid of sufferings and death, and if they get some assurance by the reflex act of faith, they often soon lose it again by sins and temptations. The way to avoid these evils is to get your assurance and maintain it and renew it upon all occasions by the direct act of faith, by trusting assuredly on the name of the Lord, and staying yourselves upon your God, when you walk in darkness and see no light in any of your own qualifications, Isaiah 50 verse 10, I doubt not, but the experience of choice Christians will bear witness to this truth. Direction 11 
endeavour diligently to perform the great work of believing on Christ in a right manner without any delay, and then also to continue and increase in your most holy faith, that so your enjoyment of Christ, union and fellowship with Him, and all holiness by Him, may be begun, continued, and increased in you. Explication Having already discovered to you the powerful and effectual means of a holy practice, my remaining work is to lead you to the actual exercise and improvement of them for the immediate attainment of the end. And I think it may be clearly perceived by the foregoing directions that faith in Christ is the duty with which a holy life is to begin, and by which the foundation of all other holy duties is laid in the soul. It is before sufficiently proved that Christ himself, with all endowments necessary to enable us to a holy practice, is received actually into our hearts by faith. This is the uniting grace whereby the Spirit of God knits the knot of mystical marriage betwixt Christ and us, and makes us branches of that noble vine, members of that body joined to that excellent head, living stones of that spiritual temple built upon the precious living cornerstone and sure foundation, partakers of the bread and drink that came down from heaven and gives life to the world. This is the grace whereby we pass from our corrupt natural state to a new holy state in Christ, also from death in sin to the life of righteousness, and whereby we are comforted that so we may be established in every good word and work. If we put the question, what must we do that we may work the works of God, Christ resolves it, that we believe on him whom he hath sent. John 6 verses 28 and 29. He first puts us upon the work of believing, which is the work of God by way of eminence, because all other good works proceed from it. The first thing in the present direction is to put you upon the performance of this great work of believing on Christ, and to guide you therein. For you are to consider distinctly four things contained in it. 1. The first is, you are to make it your diligent endeavour to perform the great work of believing on Christ. Many make little conscience of this duty. It is not known by natural light as many moral duties are, but only by supernatural revelation in the gospel, and it is foolishness to the natural man. These are sometimes terrified, with apprehensions of other sins, and will examine themselves concerning them, and, it may be, will write them down to help their memories and devotion. But the great sin of not believing on Christ is seldom thought of in their self-examinations, or registered in the large catalogues of their sins. And even those who are convinced that believing on Christ is a duty necessary to salvation, neglect all diligent endeavours to perform it, either because they account that it is a motion of the heart which may be easily performed at any time without any labour or diligent endeavours, or, on the contrary, because they account it as difficult as all the works of the law, and utterly impossible for them to perform by their most diligent endeavours, except the Spirit of God work it in them by His mighty power, and that therefore it is in vain for them to work until they feel this working of the Spirit in their hearts, or because they account it a duty so peculiar to the elect that it would be presumption for them to endeavour the performance of it, until they know themselves to be elected to eternal life through Christ. I shall urge you to diligent performance of this duty, notwithstanding all these impediments, by the consideration that it is worthy of our best endeavours, as appears by the preciousness, excellency, and necessity of it already discovered. If the light of nature were not darkened in the matters of salvation, it would show us that we cannot of ourselves find out the way of salvation, and would condemn those that despise that revelation of the way of salvation that God has given us in the gospel, declared in the holy scriptures. The great end of preaching the gospel is for the obedience of faith, Romans 1 verse 5, that so we may be brought to Christ and to all other obedience. Yea, the great end of all revealed doctrines in the whole scripture is to make us wise unto salvation by faith that is in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 3 verse 15, the end of the law given by Moses was for righteousness to every one that believeth, Romans 10 verse 4, and Christ was that end for righteousness. The moral law itself was revealed in order to our salvation by believing on Christ, or else the knowledge of it had nothing availed fallen man who is unable to perform it. Therefore they that slight the duty of believing and account it foolishness, thereby slight, despise, and vilify the whole counsel of God revealed in the Scripture. The law and the gospel, and Christ himself, are become of none effect to the salvation of such. The only fruit that such a one can attain to by all the saving doctrines of the Scripture is only some hypocritical moral duties and slavish performances which will be as filthy rags in the sight of God in the great day. However many mind not the sin of unbelief in their self-examinations and write it not in their scrolls, yet let them know that this is the most pernicious sin of all. All the sins in their scrolls would not prevail to their condemnation, yea, they would not prevail in their conversation, were it not for their unbelief. This one sin prevailing makes it impossible for them to please God in any duty whatsoever. Hebrews 11 verse 6 if you will not mind this one main sin now, God will at last remind you of it with a vengeance, for he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John 3 verse 36 
the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 1 verses 7 and 8. 2. Believing on Christ is a work that will require diligent endeavor and labor for the performance of it. We must labor to enter into that rest, lest any man fall by unbelief. Hebrews 4 verse 11. We must show diligence to the full assurance of hope to the end, that we may be followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Hebrews 6 verses 11 and 12. It is a work that requires the exercise of might and power, and therefore we have need to be strengthened with might by the Spirit in the inward man, that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith. Ephesians 3 verses 16 and 17. I confess it is easy, pleasant, and delicious in its own nature, because it is a motion of the heart without any cumbersome bodily labor, and it is taking Christ and his salvation as our own, which is very comfortable and delightful, and the soul is carried forth in this by love to Christ and its own happiness, which is an affection that makes even hard works easy and pleasant. Yet it is made difficult to us by reason of the opposition that it meets with from our own inward corruptions and from Satan's temptations. It is no easy matter to receive Christ as our happiness and free salvation with true confidence and lively affection when the guilt of sin lies heavily upon the conscience and the wrath of God is manifested by the word and terrible judgments, especially when we have been long accustomed to seek salvation by the procurement of our own works and to account the way of salvation by free grace, foolish and pernicious. When our lusts incline us strongly to the things of the flesh and the world, when Satan does his utmost by his own suggestions, and by false teachers, and by worldly allurements and terrors, to hinder the sincere performance of this duty. Many works that are easy in their own nature prove difficult for us to perform in our circumstances. To forgive our enemies, and to love them as ourselves, is but a motion of the mind, easily to be performed in its own nature, and yet many that are convinced of their duty find it a hard matter to bring their hearts to the performance of it. It is but a motion of the mind to cast our care upon God for worldly things, and rich men may think they can do it easily, but poor men that have great families find it a hard matter. That easy, comfortable duty which Moses exhorted the Israelites to when Pharaoh with his chariots and horsemen overtook them at the Red Sea, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today, Exodus 14 verse 13, was not easily performed. The very easiness of some duties makes their performance difficult, as Naaman the Syrian could hardly be brought to wash and be clean because he thought it too slight and easy a remedy for the cure of his leprosy, 2 Kings 5, verses 12 and 13. So even in this very case, people are offended at the duty of believing on Christ as too slight and easy a remedy to cure the leprosy of the soul. They would have some harder thing enjoined them to the attainment of so great an end as this everlasting salvation. The performance of all the moral law is not accounted work enough for this end, Matthew 19, verses 17 and 20. However easy the work of believing seems to many, yet common experience has shown that men are more easily brought to the most burdensome, unreasonable, and inhuman observations, as the Jews and Christian Galatians were more easily brought to take upon their necks the yoke of Moses' law, which none were able to bear. Acts 15 verse 10. The heathens were more easily brought to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. Deuteronomy 12 verse 31. The papists are brought more easily to their vows of chastity and poverty, and obedience to the most rigorous rules of monastic discipline, to macerate and torture their bodies with fastings, scourges, and pilgrimages, and to bear all the excessive tyranny of the papal hierarchy in a multitude of burdensome, superstitious, and ridiculous devotions. They that slight the work of faith for its easiness show that they were never yet made sensible of innumerable sins, and the terrible curse of the law and wrath of God that they lie under and of the darkness and vanity of their minds, the corruption and hardness of their hearts, and their bondage under the power of sin and Satan, and have not been truly humbled, without which they cannot believe in a right manner. Many sound believers have found by experience that it has been a very hard matter to bring their hearts to the duty of believing. It has cost them vigorous struggles and sharp conflicts with their own corruptions and Satan's temptations. It is so difficult a work that we cannot perform it without the mighty working of the Spirit of God in our hearts, who only can make it to be absolutely easy to us, and who makes it easy or suffers it to be difficult, according as he is pleased to communicate his grace in various degrees to our souls. 3. Though we cannot possibly perform this great work in a right manner until the Spirit of God work faith in our hearts by his mighty power, yet it is necessary that we should endeavor it, and that before we can find the Spirit of God working faith effectually in us, or giving strength to believe. We can perform no holy duty acceptably, except the Spirit of God work it in us, and yet we are not hereby excused from working ourselves, but we are the rather stirred up to the great diligence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians 2 verses 12 and 13. 
the way whereby the spirit works faith in the elect is by stirring them up to endeavor to believe and this is a way suitable to the means that the spirit uses that is the exhortations commands and invitations of the gospel which would be of no force if we were not to obey them until we find faith already wrought in us neither can we possibly find that the spirit of god effectually works faith or gives strength to believe until we act it for all inward graces as well as all other inward habits are discerned by their acts as seed in the ground by its springing we cannot see any such thing as love to god or man in our hearts before we act it children know not their ability to stand upon their feet until they have made trial by endeavouring so to do so we know not our spiritual strength until we have learnt by experience from the use and exercise of it neither can we know or assure ourselves absolutely that the spirit of god will give us strength to believe before we act faith for such a knowledge and assurance if it be right is saving faith itself in part and whoever trusts on christ assuredly for strength to believe by his spirit does in effect trust on christ for his own salvation which is inseparably joined with the grace of saving faith though the spirit works other duties in us by faith yet he works faith in us immediately by hearing knowing and understanding the word faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of god Romans 10 verse 17. And in the word he makes no absolute promise or declaration that he will work faith in this or that unbelieving heart, or that he will give strength to believe to anyone in particular, or begin the work of believing in Christ, for faith itself is the first grace whereby we have a particular interest in any saving promise. It is a thing hidden in the secret counsel and purpose of God concerning us, whether he will give us his spirit and saving faith until our election be discovered by our believing actually therefore as soon as we know the duty of believing we are to apply ourselves immediately to the vigorous performance of the duty and in so doing we shall find that the spirit of christ has strengthened us to believe though we know not certainly that he will do it beforehand the spirit comes undiscernibly upon the elect to work faith within them like the wind that bloweth where it listeth and none knoweth whence it cometh and whither it goeth but we only hear the sound of it and thereby know it when it is past and gone john three verse eight we must therefore begin the work before we know that the spirit does or will work in us savingly and we shall be willing to set about the work if we be christ's people for thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power psalm 110 verse 3 it is enough that god discovers to us beforehand in the gospel what faith is and the ground we have to believe on christ for our own salvation and that god requires this duty of us and will help us in the performance of it if we apply ourselves heartily thereto fear not i command thee be strong and of good courage joshua 1 verse 6 arise and be doing and the lord will be with thee 1 chronicles 22 verse 16 therefore he who receives this gospel discovery as the word of god in hearty love is taught by the spirit and will certainly come to christ by believing john 6 verse 45 every one that receives it not despises god makes him a liar and deserves justly to perish for his unbelief for though the spirit works saving faith only in the elect and others believe not because they are not of christ's sheep john 10 verse 26 and on that account it is called the faith of god's elect titus 1 verse 1 yet all that hear the gospel are obliged to the duty of believing as well as to all the duties of the moral law and that before they know their own particular election and they are liable to condemnation for unbelief as well as for any other sin he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten son of god john 3 verse 18 the apostle paul shows that the elect israelites obtained salvation and the rest that were not elected were blinded and yet even these were broken off from the good olive tree because of their unbelief romans 11 verses 7 and 20 we cannot have a certain knowledge of our election to eternal life before we believe it is a thing hidden in the unsearchable counsel of god until it be manifest by our effectual calling and believing on christ the apostle knew the election of the thessalonians by finding the evidence of their faith that the gospel came to them not in word only but also in power and in the holy ghost and in much assurance and that they had received the word in much affliction with joy in the holy ghost 1 thessalonians 1 verses 4 5 and 6 we are to see our calling if we would find out that god has chosen us 1 corinthians 1 verses 26 and 27 therefore we must believe on christ before we know our election or else we shall never know it and shall never believe and it is no presumption for us to trust confidently on christ for everlasting life before we have any good evidence of our election because god who cannot lie has made a general promise that whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed without making the least difference among them that perform this duty romans 10 verses 11 and 22 the promise is as firm and sure to be fulfilled as any of god's decrees and purposes and therefore it is a good and sufficient ground for our confidence it is certain that all whom the father has given to christ by the decree of eternal election shall come to christ and it is as really certain that christ will in no wise cast out any that cometh to him whosoever he be john 6 verse 37 
and we need not fear that we shall infringe God's degree of election by believing on Christ confidently for our salvation before we know what God has decreed concerning us. For if we believe, we shall at last be found among the number of the elect, and if we refuse to believe, we shall thereby willfully place ourselves among the reprobates who stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they are appointed. 1 Peter 2 verse 8. I shall add further that, though we have no evidence of our particular election before we believe, yet are we to trust on Christ assuredly to make it evident to us by giving us that salvation which is the peculiar portion of the elect only. All spiritual saving blessings wherewith God blesses his people in Christ are the peculiar portion of them whom God has chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1 verses 3 and 4. Yet we must necessarily trust on Christ for those saving blessings who have none at all. We are to pray in faith, nothing doubting that God will remember us with the favour that he bears to his people, that we may see the good of his chosen and glory of his inheritance, Psalm 106 verses 4 and 5. Therefore we are to trust assuredly on God that he will deal with us as his chosen people. Thus it appears that it is not presumption, but your bounden duty to apply yourselves to the great work of believing on Christ for salvation, without questioning at all beforehand whether you are elected or not. Secret things belong to God, but those that are revealed belong unto us that we may do them. Deuteronomy 29 verse 29. The second thing directed to is that you shall endeavor to perform this duty in a right manner. This is a point of great importance because the want of it will render your faith ineffectual to sanctification and salvation. The great duty of love which is the end of the law and the principal fruit of sanctification must flow from faith unfeigned. 1 Timothy 1 verse 5. There is a feigned faith that does not really receive Christ into the heart and will not produce love or any true obedience, such as Simon Magus had, Acts 8 verses 13 and 23, for notwithstanding his faith he was in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity and such as those Jews had, to whom Christ would not commit himself, who did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, John 2 verse 23, and chapter 12 verse 43, and such as the apostle James speaks of, what doth it profit, my brethren, if a man says he hath faith and have not works? Can that faith save him? The devils also believe and tremble, James 2 verses 14 and 19. Take heed, therefore, lest you deceive your souls with a counterfeit faith, instead of the precious faith of God's elect. The way to distinguish the one from the other is by considering well what is the right manner of that believing which is effectual to salvation. Hypocrites may perform the same works as regards the matter with true saints, but they are defective in the manner of performance, wherein the excellency of the work chiefly consists. One great reason why many seek to enter in at the straight gate and are not able, Luke 13 verse 24, is because they are ignorant and defective in the right manner of acting this faith whereby they are to enter. Now I confess that God only is able to guide us effectually in the right way of believing, and we have this great consolation, when we see our own folly and proneness to mistake our way, that if we heartily desire and endeavor to believe on Christ aright, we may confidently trust on Christ to guide us. God has promised that the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err in the way of holiness, and that he will teach sinners in the way. The meek he will guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. Psalm 25 verses 8 and 9, and he commands them that lack wisdom, to ask it of God in faith, nothing doubting, James 1, verses 5 and 6. We are, however, to know that God guides us only according to the rule of his word, and we must endeavor to learn from the word the right way of believing, or else we are not able so much as to trust rightly on God for guidance and direction in this great work. To help you herein, I have given you before in this treatise a description of saving faith, and have showed that it contains two acts in it. The one is believing the truth of the gospel, the other is believing on Christ as revealed and freely promised to us in the gospel for all his salvation. Now your great endeavor must be to perform both these acts in a right manner, as I shall show concerning each of them in particular. In the first place, you are highly concerned to endeavor after a right belief of the truth of the gospel of Christ, that so you may be well furnished, disposed, and encouraged to believe on Christ as revealed and promised in the gospel. Hereby you are to remove all uncomfortable thoughts and objections of Satan and your own conscience, and to overcome all corrupt inclinations that hinder a cheerful embracing of Christ and his salvation. It is found by experience that when any fail in the second act of faith, the reason of the failing is commonly some defect in the first act. There is some false imagination or other in them, contrary to the belief of the truth of the gospel, which is a stronghold of sin and Satan, that must be pulled down before they can receive Christ into their hearts by believing on him. If they knew the name of Christ as he is discovered in the gospel, and judged aright of the truth and excellency of it, they would not fail to put their trust in him. And we are in great danger of entertaining such false imaginations, and to account many truths of the gospel strange paradoxes, yea, foolish and pernicious, because of our ignorance, self-conceitedness, guilty consciences, 
corrupt affections, and manifold errors, wherewith our judgments are prepossessed in matters of salvation, and because Satan labours to beguile us, as he did Eve, through his subtlety, to corrupt our minds from the simplicity of the gospel that is in Christ. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3. I shall therefore give you some particular instructions that are of greatest moment to prevent such defects as we are most liable to in the first act of our faith. 1. You must believe with a full persuasion that you are a child of wrath by nature as well as others, fallen from God by the sin of the first Adam, dead in trespasses and sins, subject to the curse of the law of God, and to the power of Satan, and to insupportable misery to all eternity, and that you cannot possibly procure your reconciliation with God or any spiritual life and strength to do any good work by any endeavours to get salvation according to the terms of the legal covenant, and that you cannot find any way to escape out of this sinful and miserable condition by your own reason and understanding, without supernatural revelation, nor be freed from it except by that infinite power that raises the dead. We must not be afraid, as some are, to know our own vileness and sinfulness, neither must we be willing to think ourselves better than we are, but must be heartily desirous and glad to know the worst of our condition, yea, when we have found out the worst that we can of ourselves, we must be willing to believe that our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked, beyond all that we can know and find out. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 This is all necessary to work in us true humiliation, self-despair and self-loathing, that we may highly esteem and earnestly seek the salvation of Christ as the one thing necessary. It makes us sick of sin and sensible of our need of the great physician, and willing to be ordered according to any of his prescriptions, whatsoever we suffer, rather than to follow our own wisdom. Matthew 9 verse 12 it was for want of this humiliation that the scribes and Pharisees were not so forward to enter into the kingdom of heaven as the publicans and harlots. Matthew 21 verse 31. 2. You are to believe assuredly that there is no way to be saved without receiving all the saving benefits of Christ, his spirit as well as his merits, sanctification as well as remission of sins, by faith. It is the ruin of many souls that they trust on Christ for remission of sins without any regard to holiness, whereas these two benefits are inseparably joined to Christ, so that none are freed from condemnation by Christ, but those who are enabled to walk holily, that is, not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans 8 verse 1 It is also the rule of souls to seek only remission of sins by faith in Christ, and holiness by our endeavours, according to the terms of the law, whereas we can never live to God in holiness, except we be dead to the law, and live only by Christ living in us by faith. That faith which receives not holiness as well as remission of sins from Christ will never sanctify us, and therefore it will never bring us to heavenly glory. Hebrews 12 verse 14 3. You are to be fully persuaded of the all-sufficiency of Christ for the salvation of yourself, and of all that believe on him, that his blood cleanseth from all sin. 1 John 1 verse 7 Though our sins be ever so great and horrible, and continued in ever so long, yet he is able to deliver us from the body of death and to mortify our corruptions, be they ever so strong. We find in Scripture that abominable wicked persons have been saved by him, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, covetous, drunkards, extortioners, etc. 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 and 10. Such as have sinned against the light of nature as the heathen, and the light of Scripture as the Jews. Such as have denied Christ as Peter, and persecuted and blasphemed him as Paul. Many that have fallen into great sins are ruined forever, because they do not account the grace of Christ sufficient for their pardon and sanctification, when they think they are gone and past all hope of recovery that their sins are upon them, and they pine away in them, how shall they live? Ezekiel 33 verse 10. This despair works secretly in many souls without such trouble and horror, and makes them careless of their souls and true religion. The devil fills with some horrid, filthy, blasphemous thoughts, on purpose that they may think their sins too great to be forgiven, though commonly such thoughts are the least of the sins of those who are pestered with them, and are rather the devil's sin than theirs, because they are hurried into them sore against their wills. But if their hearts be somewhat polluted with them, Christ testifies that all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven, except the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, Matthew 12, verse 31. And as for those that are guilty of the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, the reason why they are never forgiven is not because of any want of sufficiency in the blood of Christ or in the pardoning mercy of God, but because they never repent of that sin and never seek to God for mercy through Christ, but continue obstinate until death. For the scripture testifies that it is impossible to renew them again unto repentance. Hebrews 6 verses 5 and 6. So that the merits of Christ are sufficient for all that seek to him for mercy by believing. There are others that despair of ever getting any victory over their lusts, because they have formerly made many vows and resolutions, and have used many vigorous endeavours against them in vain. Such are to persuade themselves that the grace of Christ is sufficient for them, when all other means have failed as the woman that had the issue of blood, and was nothing bettered but rather grew worse by any remedies that physicians could prescribe. 
yet persuaded herself that, if she might but touch the clothes of Christ, she should be whole, Mark 5, verses 25 to 28. Those that despair by reason of the greatness of their guilt and corruption greatly dishonor and undervalue the grace of God, his infinite mercy and the infinite merits of Christ's blood and the power of the Spirit, and deserve to perish with Cain and Judas. Abundance of people who give up themselves to all licentiousness in this wicked generation lie under secret despair, which makes them so desperate in swearing, blaspheming, whoring, drunkenness, and all manner of wickedness. How horrid and heinous soever our sins and corruptions have been, we should learn to account them a small matter in comparison to the grace of Christ, who is God as well as man, and offered up himself by the eternal Spirit as a sacrifice of an infinite value for our salvation, and can create us anew as easily as he created the world by the speaking of a word. For you are to be fully persuaded by the truth of the general free promise in your own particular case that if you believe on Christ sincerely, you shall have everlasting life, as well as any other in the world, without performing any condition of works to procure an interest in Christ, for the promise is universal, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, Romans 9 verse 33, without any exception. And if God exclude you not, he must not exclude yourselves, but rather conclude peremptorily that, how vile, wicked, and unworthy soever you be, yet if you come, you shall be accepted, as well as any other in the world. You are to believe that great article of the creed, the remission of sins, in your own case, when you are principally concerned, or else it will little profit you to believe it in the case of others. This is that which hinders many broken, wounded spirits from coming to the great physician, when they are convinced of the abominable filthiness of their hearts, and that they are dead in sin, without the least spark of true grace and holiness in them. They think that it is in vain for such as they are to trust on Christ for salvation, and that Christ will never save such as they are. Why so? They can be but lost creatures at worst, and Christ came to seek and save those that are lost. If they that are dead in sin cannot be saved, then all must despair and perish, for none have any spiritual life until they receive it by believing on Christ. Some think themselves worse than any others, and that none have such wicked hearts as they, and though others be accepted, yet they shall be rejected. But they should know that Christ came to save the chief of sinners, 1 Timothy 1 verse 15, and that the design of God is to show the exceeding riches of his grace in our salvation, Ephesians 2 verse 7, which is most glorified by pardoning the greatest sinners. And it is only our ignorance which leads us to think ourselves like no one else. For all others, as well as we, are naturally dead in trespasses and sins. Their mind is enmity to God, and is not subject to his law, nor indeed can be, Romans 8 verse 7. And every imagination of the thoughts of their hearts are only evil and continually so, Genesis 6 verse 5. They have all the same corrupt fountain of all abominations in their hearts, though we may have exceeded many others in several actual sins. Others think they have outstayed their time, and therefore now they should find no place for repentance, though they should seek it carefully with tears. Hebrews 12 verse 17. But behold, now is the accepted time, behold, now is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2. Even as long as God calls upon you by the gospel, and although Esau was rejected who sought rather the earthly than the spiritual blessings of the birthright, yet they shall not be rejected who seek the enjoyment of Christ and his salvation as their only happiness. If you come to Christ's vineyard at the eleventh hour of the day, you shall have your penny as well as those who came early in the morning, because the reward is of grace and not of merit. Matthew 20 verses 9 and 10. And here you must be sure to believe steadfastly that Christ and all his salvation is bestowed as a free gift upon those that do not work to procure any right or title to him, or meetness or worthiness to receive him, but only believe on him that justifieth the ungodly. Romans 4 verse 5. If you put any condition of works or good qualifications between yourselves and Christ, it will be a partition wall which you can never climb over. 5. You are to believe assuredly that it is the will of God you, as well as any other, should believe in Christ and have eternal life by him and that your believing is a duty very acceptable to God, and that he will help you as well as any other in this work because he calls and commands you by the gospel to believe on Christ. This makes us to say cheerfully about the work of believing, as when Jesus commanded the blind man to be called, they said unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. Mark 10 verse 49. A command of Christ made Peter to walk upon the water. Matthew 14 verse 29. And here we are not to meddle with God's secret of predestination or the purpose of his will to give the grace of faith to some rather than others, but only with his revealed will in his revealed gracious invitations and commands by which we are required to believe on Christ. This will of God is confirmed by his oath. As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Ezekiel 33 verse 11 Christ testified that he would often have gathered the children of Jerusalem, 
even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and they would not. Matthew 23, verse 37. And the Apostle Paul testifies that God will have all men to be saved, etc. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. You are to reject and abandon all thoughts that are contrary to this persuasion. What if few be saved? Thy salvation will not make the number too great, for few will follow thee in the duty of believing. What if the wrath of God be revealed from heaven against thee in many terrible judgments, and the word, and thine own conscience condemn thee, and Christ seem to reckon thee no better than a dog, as he did the woman of Canaan? Matthew 15, verse 26. Thou art to make a good interpretation of all these things, that the end of them is to drive thee to Christ, as this was the end of the curses of the law, and all the terrible dispensations of them. Romans 10, verse 4. If a prophet or an angel from heaven were sent of God, on purpose to declare that the sentence of everlasting damnation is pronounced against thee, it would be thy duty to believe that God sent him to give thee timely warning for this very end, that thou mightest believe and turn to God by faith and repentance. Jeremiah prophesied against the Jews that God would pluck them up, pull them down, and destroy them for their sins, and yet he himself taught them, if they turn from their evil ways, God would repent him of the evil. Jeremiah 18 verses 7, 8, and 11. Jonah preached nothing but certain destruction to Nineveh, to be executed upon them within forty days, chapter 3 verse 4. Yet the intent of that terrible message was that those heathenish people might escape destruction by repentance. The most absolute and peremptory denunciations of divine vengeance against us while we are in the world must always be understood with a secret reserve of salvation for us upon our faith and repentance. And we are to account that the reason why God so terribly denounces his judgments against us by his word is that we may escape them by flying for refuge to his free mercy in Christ. Take heed of fostering any thoughts that God has absolutely decreed to show no saving mercy to you, or that you have already committed the unpardonable sin, or that it is in vain for you to attempt the work of believing, because God will not help you in it. If such thoughts prevail in your hearts, they will do you more hurt than the most blasphemous thoughts that terrify you, or any of the grossest abominations that ever you are guilty of, because they obstruct your believing on Christ for salvation. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, Christ saith, Whoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Revelation 22, verse 17. Therefore we are to abandon all thoughts that hinder our coming to Christ, as very sinful and pernicious, arising in us from our own corruptions and Satan's delusions, and utterly opposite to the mind of Christ and the teachings of the Spirit. And what ground can we have to entertain such unbelieving thoughts? Has God made us of his privy counsel that we should be able to know that he has decreed us to damnation before it be manifest by our final unbelief and impenitence? As for the unpardonable sin, it consists in renouncing the way of salvation by Christ with the whole heart, after we have attained to the knowledge of it, and are convinced of the truth of it by the gospel. It is the sin that the Christian Hebrews would have been guilty of if they had revolted from Christianity to the religion of the unbelieving Jews, who accounted Christ to be an impostor, and were most rancorous persecutors of him and his ways. Hebrews 6 verses 4 and 5. They who have committed that sin continue implacable malicious enemies to Christ and his ways to the end without any repentance. Therefore, if you can but find that you desire seriously to get an interest in Christ, and to be better Christians than you are, if you be troubled and grieved that your hearts and lives are so wicked, and that you want faith, love, and true obedience, yea, if your hearts be not maliciously bent to persecute the gospel, and to prefer atheism, licentiousness, or any false religion before it, you have no cause to suspect yourselves to be guilty of this unpardonable sin. 6. Add to all these a full persuasion of the incomparable glorious excellency of Christ and of the way of salvation by Him. You are to esteem the enjoyment of Christ as the only salvation and true happiness, and such a happiness as has in it unsearchable riches of glory, and will make our cup run over with exceeding abundance of peace and joy and glory to all eternity. We must account all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus our Lord, etc. Philippians 3 verse 8. Such a persuasion as this will allure and incline your wills and affections to choose and embrace Christ as the chief good, and never to rest satisfied without the enjoyment of him, and to reject everything that stands in competition with him, or the enjoyment of him. Christ is precious in the esteem of all true believers, 1 Peter 2 verse 7. Their high esteem of his incomparable preciousness and excellency induces them to sell all, that they may buy this pearl of great price, Matthew 13 verse 46. This makes them to say, Lord, evermore give us this bread, that cometh down from heaven and giveth life to the world. Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. John 6, verses 32, 33, 34, and 68. Because of the savour of his good ointments, his name is as ointment poured forth, therefore do the virgins love him. Song of Songs, chapter 1, verse 2. They are sick of love to him because he is, in their eyes, the chiefest amongst ten thousand. Song of Songs, chapter 5, verses 8 and 10. 
as the glory of God that appeared in the wonderful beauty of the temple and in the wisdom and glory of Solomon drew worshippers to God from the utmost parts of the earth, so the unparalleled excellency of Christ which was prefigured by the glory of Solomon and the temple more powerfully draws believers in these gospel days. The devil, who is the god of this world, knows how necessary it is for our salvation to discern all the glory and excellency of Christ, and therefore where the gospel is preached, he makes it his great work to eclipse the glory of Christ in his ministry, and to blind the minds of the people, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4 One who is convinced of the truth of the gospel may be averse to embracing it, until he sees also the goodness of it, that Christ is altogether lovely and excellent. I come now to the second principal act of faith, whereby Christ himself and his Spirit and all his saving benefits are actually received into the heart, which is believing on Christ as revealed and freely promised to us in the gospel for all his salvation. The Spirit of God habitually disposes and inclines our hearts to a right performance of this act by enabling us to perform the first act according to the former instructions, by believing assuredly those great things of the gospel delivered to us in a form of doctrine, Romans 6 verse 16, which we are to obey from our hearts, and to follow as our pattern in the manner of our acting faith in Christ for salvation. Therefore I need only exhort you briefly to act your faith in Christ according to that form and pattern in which you have been already so largely instructed. You are to believe in Christ as alone sufficient and all-sufficient for your happiness and salvation, despairing altogether of any attainment of happiness by your own wisdom, strength, works of righteousness, or any fleshly, worldly confidences whatever. We must be as dead people to all other confidences, and account them to be loss for Christ according to the example of the blessed apostle, Philippians 3, verses 3, 7, and 8. We must not be grieved that we have nothing to trust upon besides Christ for our salvation, but rather we are to rejoice that we need nothing else, and that we have a sure foundation to rely upon, incomparably better than any other that can be imagined. And we must resolve to cast the burden of our souls wholly on Christ, and to seek salvation no other way, whatever becomes of us. If the cripple lay not the whole weight of his body upon a strong staff, but part of it on a rotten one, he is likely to receive a fall. If the swimmer will not commit his body wholly to the water to bear him up, but catches at weeds or struggles to feel out ground, he may sink to the bottom. Christ will be all our salvation or nothing. If we seek to be saved any other way, as the Galatians did by circumcision, Christ will profit us nothing. Galatians 6 verse 2 You are also to receive Christ merely as a free gift given to the chief of sinners, resolving that you will not perform any conditions to procure yourselves a right and title to him, but that you will come to him as a lost sinner, an ungodly creature, and trusting on him that justifieth the ungodly, and that you will buy him without money and without any price whatsoever. Romans 4 verse 5, Isaiah 55 verse 2. Look not on your own faith or love or any good qualifications in yourselves as the ground of your trusting in Christ, but only to the free grace and loving kindness of God in Christ. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God! Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Psalm 36 verse 7 For if you make your faith, love, or good qualifications your first and principal foundation, and you build Christ upon them instead of building all upon Christ, you invert the order of the gospel, and Christ will profit you nothing. Another thing to be observed diligently is that you must come to Christ for a new holy heart and life, and all things necessary thereunto, as well as for deliverance from the wrath of God and the torments of hell. You must also come to him with an ardent love and affection to him, and esteem him better than a thousand worlds, and the only excellent portion, loathing and abhorring yourself as a vile, sinful, and miserable creature, and accounting all things dung in comparison of his excellency, that you may be able to say from the bottom of your heart, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides thee. Psalm 73 verse 25 Lastly, you must endeavor to draw near with full assurance of faith, Hebrews 10 verse 22, trusting on Christ confidently for your own particular salvation, upon the warrant of that general promise that whosoever believeth on Christ shall not be ashamed. Romans 9 verse 33. You must check yourselves for all doubtings, fears, or staggerings concerning your own salvation by Christ, saying with the psalmist, Why art thou cast down, O my soul, etc.? Psalm 43 verse 11. Direction 11, Part 3 of The Gospel Mystery of Sanctification by Walter Marshall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The third thing contained in this direction is the avoiding all delay in the performance of this great work of believing in Christ. Until we have performed it, we continue under the power of sin and Satan, and under the wrath of God, and there is nothing between hell and us but the breath of our nostrils. It is dangerous for Lot to linger in Sodom, lest fire and brimstone come down from heaven upon him. The manslayer must flee with all haste to the city of refuge, lest the avenger of blood pursue him, while his heart is hot and slay him. Deuteronomy 19 verses 5 and 6. We should make haste and not delay to keep God's commandments. 
Psalm 119, verse 60, and flee for refuge to the hope set before us, Hebrews 6, verse 18, and God commands us to flee thus by faith, without which it is impossible to please God in other duties. The work is of such a nature that it may be performed as soon as you hear the gospel. As soon as they hear of me, they shall obey me. Psalm 18, verse 44. As soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Isaiah 66, verse 8. We have many examples of those that received the word by faith at the first hearing of it. Three thousand were added to the church on the very same day wherein Peter first published the gospel in Jerusalem. Acts 2, verse 41. So many Jews and Gentiles were converted at the first hearing of the Apostle Paul at Antioch, Acts 13, verse 48. The jailer and all his house believed, and were baptized the same night wherein Paul first preached to them, Acts 16, verses 33 and 34. The gospel came at first to the Thessalonians, not in word only, but in power and in the Holy Ghost, 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 5 and 6. If God open the hearts of his people to attend diligently, they may be instructed in the knowledge of the gospel by one brief sermon, sufficiently to begin the practice of saving faith. And when they know their duty, God requires immediate performance, without allowing us the least respite in the state of unbelief. When Satan cannot prevail with people to reject wholly the duty of believing, his next attempt for the ruin of their souls is to prevail with them, at least to delay and shift off the performance of it from time to time, by several false reasonings and imaginations which he puts into their minds. The most ignorant and sensual are easily prevailed with to defer this duty until they have taken their fill of the pleasures, profits, and honors of this world, and are summoned to prepare for another world by infirmities, age, or sickness, praying and hoping that a large time of repentance will be granted to them before they die. But such delays show that they are really unwilling to repent and believe until they are forced by necessity, and that they prefer the pleasures, profits, and honors of the world above God and Christ and their own souls. Thus they unfit themselves more and more for this great duty by their customary walking in sin, and by misspending the precious time of their health and strength, which is best adapted for the performance of this great work. They highly provoke God never to give them time or grace to repent hereafter. Others imagine that, after they have heard the gospel of salvation by Christ, they may lawfully defer believing it, until they have sufficiently examined the truth of some other different doctrine, or until God be pleased to afford them some other means to assure them fully of the truth of the gospel. Thus they who are called seekers misspend the day of grace, ever learning but never coming to the knowledge of the truth, 2 Timothy 3 verse 7. But the truth of the gospel so clearly evidences itself by its own light that, if people do not willfully shut their eyes or blind themselves by their own pride and love of their lusts, they would easily perceive that it is the truth of God, because the image of His grace, mercy, power, justice, and holiness appears manifestly engraven upon it. It is a sign people are proud when they consent not to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. 1 Timothy 6 verse 3 If they were humble and sincerely inclined to do the will of God, they would know whether the doctrine be of God or not. John 7 verse 17 They would quickly be persuaded by Moses and the prophets, Christ and the apostles, of the truth spoken to them in the scripture. And if they will not hear them, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead, or whatever other miracle be wrought to confirm the divine authority of the gospel, Luke 16, verse 31. Another sort of people there are that delay the great work of believing to the ruin of their souls, resting in an attendance upon the outward means of grace and salvation, instead of any endeavors to receive Christ by faith, though they be convinced of the truth of the gospel. This they call waiting upon God at the doors of his grace and salvation, in the use of means appointed by him, and sitting under the droppings of the sanctuary. But let them know that this is not the right waiting on God required in Scripture. It is rather disobedience to God and to the means of His appointment, who requires that we should be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves, James 1 verse 22, and that we should come in to the spiritual feast, Luke 14 verse 23, and not only stand at the door or sit under the droppings of the house of God, lest Christ repute us no better than eavesdroppers. That holy waiting on the Lord commended to us in the Scripture is ever accompanied with believing and hoping in the Lord, and depends thereon. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Psalm 27, verses 13 and 14. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Lamentations 3, verse 26. What is it that these deluded ones wait for before they perform the duty of believing? Is it for more knowledge of the gospel? The way to increase thy knowledge as well as any other talent is to make use of what thou hast already received. Believe heartily on Christ for all thy salvation according to that little knowledge of the gospel which thou hast, and thou wilt have an interest in the promise of knowledge contained in the new covenant. They shall all know me, from the least to the greatest of them, saith the Lord. Jeremiah 31 verse 34.
Is it for the appointed time of thy conversion that thou waitest? Then thou waitest, as those impotent folk that lay at the pool of Bethesda, waiting for the season when the angel will come down and move the water. Know then, that if thou enter into Christ now by faith, thou shalt find in him waters of life, and the Spirit moving them for the healing and quickening of thy soul. God has appointed by his word that it shall be thy duty to endeavour that the present time should be the time of thy conversion. As the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if thou wilt hear his voice, harden not thy heart. Hebrews 3, verses 7 and 8. And thou shalt never know at what time God has purposed in his sacred counsel to give faith to thee, until thou dost actually believe. Dost thou wait for any manifestations or flowings in of God's saving love to thy soul? Then the way to obtain it is to believe that the God of hope may fill thee with all joy and peace in believing. Romans 15, verse 13. Thou hast sufficient manifestation of God's love to thy soul by the free promises of life and salvation by Christ. Do but trust on the name of the Lord, and stay upon thy God, when thou walkest in darkness, and seest no light, of sensible comforts any other way. Otherwise thou waitest for comfort in vain, and this shalt thou have at the Lord's hand. Thou shalt lie down in sorrow. Isaiah 50, verses 10 and 11. Dost thou wait for any qualifications to prepare thee for the work of believing? If they be good and holy qualifications, thou canst not have them before faith, but they are rather included in the nature of faith or are fruits of it, as has been largely proved. If they be bad and sinful, it is strange that any should wait for them, and yet no more strange than true. Some foolishly wait to be terrified with a sense of God's wrath and despairing thoughts, and these they call the pangs of the new birth, though in their own nature they are rather the pangs of the spiritual death and bring forth hatred to God rather than holiness. And therefore we should strive to prevent them by believing God's love in Christ rather than to wait for them. It is true God makes these despairing thoughts as well as any other sins works for good to them that are delivered from them by faith in Christ. They are moved thereby to hate sin and to prize Christ the more, and the comforts of his gospel, and to loathe and abhor themselves. Yet many are brought to Christ without them by God's giving them the knowledge of their own sins and of Christ's salvation together. Several examples of these were above mentioned, who received the word with joy at the first hearing of it. And we must not despair or wait for any evil of sin, such as these despairing thoughts are, that good may come of it. Neither should we expect to be worse before we are better, when we may and ought to be better presently by believing on Christ. The fourth thing in the direction is that we should continue and increase in the most holy faith, and that we may, we must not think that, when we have once attained to the grace of saving faith, and thereby are begotten anew in Christ, our names are up in heaven, and therefore we may be careless, but as long as we continue in this life we must endeavour to continue in the faith, grounded and settled, not moved away from the hope of the gospel, Colossians 1 verse 23, and to hold the beginning of our confidence and the rejoicing of hope steadfast to the end, Hebrews 3 verses 6 and 14, and to build up ourselves in our most holy faith, Jude verse 20, abounding therein with thanksgiving, Colossians 2 verse 7. Though we receive Christ freely by faith, yet we are but babes in Christ, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1, and we must not account that we have already attained or are already perfect. Philippians 3 verses 12 and 13, but we must strive to be more rooted and built up in him until we come unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4 verse 13. If the new nature be really in us by regeneration, it will have an appetite to its own continuance and increase until it come to perfection as the newborn babe. 1 Peter 2 verse 2. And we are not only to receive Christ and a new holy nature by faith, but also to live and walk by it, and to resist the devil, and to quench all his fiery darts by it, and also to grow in grace, and to perfect holiness in the fear of God. For we are kept by the mighty power of God through faith unto salvation. 1 Peter 1 verse 5. As all our Christian warfare is the good fight of faith. 1 Timothy 6 verse 12. All spiritual life and holiness continue, grow, or decay in us, according as faith continues, grows, or decays in vigor. But when this faith begins to sink by fears and doubtings, the man himself begins to sink together with it. Matthew 9, verses 29 and 31. Faith is like the hand of Moses. While it is held up, Israel prevails. When it is let down, Amalek prevails. Exodus 17, verse 11. This continuance and growth in faith will require our labor and industry, as well as the beginning, though we are to ascribe the glory of all to the grace of God in Christ, who is the finisher as well as the author of it. Hebrews 12, verse 2. The church meets with great difficulties in her marching through the wilderness of this world to the heavenly Canaan, as well as in her first deliverance from Egyptian bondage. Yea, we often meet with greater difficulties in going to perfection than we did in the beginning of the good work, the wisdom and mercy of God so ordering it that we shall be exercised with the sharpest dispensations of providence and the fiercest assaults of our own corruptions and Satan's temptations. 
after we have grace given us to stand in the evil day. We must therefore endeavour to continue, or go on in the same right manner as I have taught you to begin this great work of believing in Christ, that your faith may be of the same nature from the beginning to the end, though it increase in degrees. For our faith is imperfect and joined with much unbelief in this world, and we have need to pray still, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Mark 9 verse 24. And therefore we have need to strive for more faith, that we may receive Christ in greater perfection. If you find your faith has produced good works, you should thereby increase your confidence in Christ for salvation by his mere grace. But take heed of changing the nature of your faith from trusting on the grace and merits of Christ to trusting on your own works according to the popish doctrine that our first justification is by grace and faith only, but our second justification is also by works. Beware also of trusting on faith itself as a work of righteousness instead of trusting on Christ by faith. If you do not find that your believing in such a right manner as I have described produces such fruits of holiness as you desire, you ought not to diminish but rather increase your confidence in Christ, knowing that the weakness of your faith hinders its fruitfulness, and the greater your confidence is concerning the love of God to you in Christ, the greater will be your love to God and to his service. If you fall into any gross sin after the work is begun in you, as David and Peter did, Think not that you must cast away your confidence and expect nothing but wrath from God and Christ, and that you must refuse to be comforted by the grace of Christ at least for some time, for thus you would be the more weak and prone to fall into other sins, but rather strive to believe more confidently that you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and that he is the propitiation for our sins, 1 John 2 verses 1 and 2. And let not the guilt of sin stay at all upon your conscience, but wash it away with all speed in the fountain of Christ's blood, which is open for us, that it may be ready for our use on all such incidental occasions, that so you may be humbled for your sins in a gospel way, and may hate your own sinfulness, and be sorry for it with godly sorrow, out of love to God. Peter might have been ruined forever by denying Christ, as Judas was by betraying him, if Peter's faith had not been upheld by the prayer of Christ. Luke 26 verses 31 and 32. If a cloud be cast over all your inward qualifications, so that you can see no grace at all in yourselves, yet still trust on him that justifieth the ungodly, and came to seek and to save them that are lost. If God seemed to deal with you as an enemy by bringing on you some horrible affliction, as he did upon Job, beware of condemning your faith and its fruits, as if they were not acceptable to God, but rather say with holy Job, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But I will maintain mine own ways before him. Job 13 verse 15 Strive to keep and to increase faith by faith, that is, by acting faith frequently, by trusting on God, to keep and to increase it, being confident that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1 verse 6. Direction 12. Make diligent use of your most holy faith for the immediate performance of the duties of the law, by walking no longer according to your own natural state, or any principles or means of practice that belong unto it, but only according to that new state which you receive by faith, and the principles and means of practice that properly belong thereunto, and strive to continue and increase in such manner of practice. This is the only way to attain to an acceptable performance of those holy and righteous duties, as far as it is possible in this present life. Explication Here I am guiding you to the manner of practice wherein you are to make use of faith and of all other effectual means of holiness before treated of, which faith lays hold of for the immediate performance of the law, which is the great end aimed at in this whole treatise. And therefore, this deserves to be diligently considered as the principal direction for which all the foregoing and following are subservient. As for the meaning of it, I have already showed that our old natural state is that which we derive from the first Adam by natural generation, and it is called in the scripture the old man, and while we are in it we are said to be in the flesh, and our new state is that which we receive from the second Adam, Jesus Christ, by being newborn in union and fellowship with him through faith, and it is called in scripture the new man, and when we are in it we are said to be in the spirit. The principle and means of practice belonging to a natural state are such as persons do or may attain and make use of before they are in Christ by faith, such as belong properly to the new state are the manifold holy endowments, privileges, and enjoyments which we partake of in Christ by faith, such as have already appeared to be the only effectual means of a holy life. We are said to walk, according to either of these states, or to the principles or means that belong to either of them, when we are moved and guided by virtue of them, to such actings as are agreeable to them. Thus kings act according to their state in commanding authoritatively, and in magnificent bounty, poor men in the way of service and obedience, and children indiscriminately. Esther 1 verse 6, Proverbs 18 verse 24, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 11. 
So the manner of practice here directed to consists in moving and guiding ourselves in the performance of the works of the law by gospel principles and means. This is the rare and excellent art of godliness in which every Christian should strive to be skillful and expert. The reason why many come off with shame and confusion, after they have a long time laboured with much zeal and industry for the attainment of true godliness, is because they were never acquainted with this holy art, and never endeavoured to practise it in a right gospel way. Some worldly arts are called mysteries, but, above all, this spiritual art of godliness is, without controversy, a great mystery, 1 Timothy 3, verse 16, because the means that are to be made use of in it are deeply mysterious, as has been showed, and you are not a skilful artist till you know them, and can reduce them to practice. It is a manner of practice far above the sphere of natural ability, such as would never have entered into the hearts of the wisest in the world if it had not been revealed to us in the scriptures, and when it is there most plainly revealed, continues a dark riddle to those who are not inwardly enlightened and taught by the Holy Spirit, such as many godly persons guided by the Spirit in some measure walk in, yet but obscurely discern. They can hardly perceive their own knowledge of it, and can hardly give any account to others of the way wherein they walk, as the disciples that walked in Christ, the way to the Father, and yet perceived not that knowledge in themselves. Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? John 14 verse 5 this is the reason why many poor believers are so weak in Christ and attain so small a degree of holiness and righteousness. Therefore, that you may the better be acquainted with a mystery of so great importance, I shall show in the first place that the Holy Scriptures direct you to this manner of practice as alone effectual for the performance of holy duties, and then I shall lay before you some necessary instructions that you may understand how to walk aright in it, and continue and go forward therein till you be made perfect in Christ. For the first of these, the Holy Scriptures are very large and clear in directing us to this manner of practice, and to continuance and growth therein. And here it is useful for us to observe the great variety of peculiar words and phrases whereby the Holy Ghost teaches this mystery, which many who frequently read the Scriptures, yea, who pretend to be preachers of the Gospel, little understand or regard, showing thereby that the things of the Spirit of God are foolishness to them, and that they are not yet acquainted with the form of sound words, and are strangers to the very language of the gospel which they profess and pretend to preach. I shall therefore present to your view several of these peculiar words and phrases whereby this mysterious manner of practice is expressed in the Holy Scriptures, and commended to you as the only way for the sure attainment of all holiness in the heart and life. I shall rank such of them together as agree in sense, that the multitude of them may not produce confusion in your thoughts. 1. This is the manner of practice in Scripture which is expressed by living by faith, Habakkuk 2 verse 4, Galatians 2 verse 20, Hebrews 10 verse 38, walking by faith, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7, faith working by love, Galatians 5 verse 6, overcoming the world by faith, 1 John 5 verse 4, quenching all the fiery darts of the wicked by the shield of faith, Ephesians 6 verse 16. Some make no more of living and walking by faith than merely a stirring up and encouraging ourselves to our duty by such principles as we believe. Thus the Jews might account that they lived by faith because they professed and assented to the doctrine of Moses and the prophets, and were moved thereby to a zeal of God, though they sought righteousness not by faith, but, as it were, by the works of the law. Romans 9 verse 32. Thus Paul might think he lived by faith while he was a zealous Pharisee, but afterward he knew that the life of faith consisted in dying to the law and living to God, and that not himself but Christ lived in him. Galatians 2 verses 19 and 20 as it is one and the same thing to be justified by faith and by Christ believed on, Romans 5 verse 1. So to live, walk, and work by faith is all one with living, walking, working by means of Christ and his saving endowments, which we receive and make use of by faith to guide and move ourselves to the practice of holiness. 2. The same thing is commended to us by the terms of walking, rooted and built up in Christ, Colossians 2 verses 6 and 7, living to God and not to ourselves, but to have Christ living in us, Galatians 2, verses 19 and 20. Good conversation in Christ, 1 Peter 3, verse 16. Putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, that we may walk honestly as in the day, Romans 13, verses 13 and 14. Being strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, Ephesians 6, verse 10. Doing all things in the name of Christ, Colossians 3, verse 17. Walking up and down in the name of the Lord, Zechariah 10, verse 12. Going in the strength of the Lord, making mention of his righteousness, even of his only. Psalm 71 verse 16. These phrases are frequent and sufficiently explain one another and show that we are to practice holiness not only by virtue of Christ's authority, but also of his strengthening endowments moving us and encouraging us thereunto. 3. It is also signified by the phrases of being strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, 
2 Timothy 2 verse 1, having our conversation in the world, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 12, having or holding fast grace, that we may serve God acceptably, laboring abundantly in such a manner as that the whole work is not performed by us, but by the grace of God that is with us. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10. By grace, therefore, we may well understand the privileges of our new state given to us in Christ, whereby we ought to be influenced and guided in the performance of holy duties. 4. It is also signified, when we are to put off the old and put on the new man, yea, to continue in so doing, though we have done it in a measure already, and that we avoid our former sinful conversation, Ephesians 4, verses 21, 22, 24, and to avoid, because we have put off the old and put on the new man, Colossians 3, verses 9 and 10. I have already showed that by this twofold man is not meant merely sin and holiness, but by the former is meant our natural state with all its endowments, whereby we are furnished only to the practice of sin, and by the latter our new state in Christ, whereby we are furnished with all means necessary for the practice of holiness. 5. We are to understand the same thing when we are taught not to walk after the flesh, but after the spirit, that we may be free from the law of sin, and that the righteousness of the law may be fulfilled in us, Romans 8, verses 1, 2, and 3, and through the Spirit to mortify the deeds of the body, and to be led by the Spirit, because we live by the Spirit, and have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts, Galatians 5, verse 24. The Apostle shows by these expressions not only that we are to practice holiness, but also by what means we may do it effectually. By the flesh is meant our old nature derived from the first Adam, and by the Spirit is meant the Spirit of Christ, and that new nature which we have by him dwelling in us. We are said to walk after either of these natures when we make the properties or qualifications of either of them to be the principles of our practice. So when we are taught to serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter, that so we may bring forth fruit under God. The meaning is that we must endeavor to bring forth the fruits of holiness, not by virtue of the law, that killing letter to which the flesh is married, and by which the motions of sin are in us, but by virtue of the spirit and his manifold riches, which we partake of in our new state by a mystical marriage with Christ, Romans 7, verses 4, 5, and 6, and by virtue of such principles as belong to the new state declared in the gospel, whereby the Holy Spirit is ministered to us. 6. This is the manner of walking which the Apostle Paul directs us unto when he teaches us by his own example that the continual work of our lives should be to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable to his death, if by any means we may attain unto the resurrection of the dead, and to increase and press forward in this kind of knowledge. Philippians 3 verses 10, 11, 12, and 15. Certainly he means such an experimental knowledge of Christ and his death and resurrection as effectually makes us conformable thereunto in dying unto sin and living unto God. And he would hereby guide us to make use of Christ and his death and resurrection by faith as the powerful means of all holiness in heart and life, and to increase in this manner of walking until we attain to perfection in Christ. The second thing proposed was to lay before you some necessary instructions that your steps may be guided aright to continue and go forward in this way of holiness until you be made perfect in Christ. And seeing we are naturally prone to mistake this way, and are utterly unable to find it out or discern it by our own reason and understanding, we should the more diligently attend to these instructions taken out of the Holy Scriptures. And we should pray earnestly that God would give unto us the spirit of wisdom and revelation, that we may discern the way of holiness thereby, and walk aright in it, according to that gracious promise, The wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. Isaiah 35 verse 8 1. Let us observe and consider diligently in our whole conversation that though we are partakers of a new holy state by faith in Christ, yet our natural state remains in a measure with all its corrupt principles and properties. As long as we live in this present world, our apprehension of Christ and his perfection in this life is only by faith, whereas by sense and reason we may apprehend much in ourselves contrary to Christ. And this faith is imperfect, so that true believers have caused to pray to God to help their unbelief. Mark 9 verse 24 Therefore, though we receive a perfect Christ by faith, yet the measure and degree of enjoying him is imperfect, and we hope still, so long as we are in this world, to enjoy him in a higher degree of perfection than we have done. We are yet but weak in Christ, 2 Corinthians 13 verse 4, children in comparison to the perfection we expect in another world, 1 Corinthians 13 verses 10 and 11, and we must grow still till we come to the perfect man, Ephesians 4 verse 13 and some are weaker babes than others, and have received Christ in so small a measure that they may be accounted carnal rather than spiritual. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1 
and because all the blessings and perfections of our new state, as justification, the gift of the Spirit, and of the holy nature, and the adoption of children, are seated and treasured up in Christ, and joined with him inseparably, we can receive them no further than we receive Christ himself by faith, which we do in an imperfect measure and degree in this life. The Apostle Paul proposes himself as a pattern for all those that are perfect in the truth of grace to imitate, and yet he professes that he was not yet made so perfect in the degree or measure of saving endowments, but that he still presses forward towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, laboring still to apprehend and win Christ more perfectly, and to be found in him, not having his own righteousness, but that which is of God by faith, and to gain more experimental knowledge of Christ, and of the fellowship of his sufferings, and the power of his resurrection, being made conformable thereunto, Philippians 3, verses 8, 10, and 14. Believers are justified already, yet they wait for the hope of righteousness by faith, that is, for the full enjoyment of the righteousness of Christ, Galatians 5, verse 5. They have received but the first fruits of the Spirit, and must wait for a more full enjoyment of it. The Spirit witnesses now to them that they are the children of God, and yet they groan within themselves, waiting for more full enjoyment of adoption. Romans 8, verse 23. Now, seeing the degree and measure of our reception and enjoyment of Christ, with all the blessings of our new state in Him, is in this life imperfect, it follows clearly that our contrary natural state, with its properties, remains still in us in some degree, and is not perfectly abolished so that all believers in this world partake in some degree of these two contrary states. Believers have indeed put off the old man, and put on the new man, where Christ is all and in all, Colossians 3 verses 10 and 11, yet they are to put the old man off and the new man on more and more, because the old man still remains in a measure. They are said to be not in the flesh but in the spirit, because their being in the spirit is their best and lasting state, as denominations are usually taken from the better part but yet the flesh is in them, and they find work enough to mortify the deeds of it. Romans 8, verses 9 and 13. Therefore several things which are contrary to each other are frequently attributed to believers in the Scriptures with respect to these two contrary states, wherein one place seems to contradict another, and yet both are true in diverse respects. Thus holy Paul says truly of himself, I live, yet not I, Galatians 2, verse 20, because he lives to God by Christ living in him, and yet in another respect, according to his natural state, he did not live to God. Again, he professes that he was carnal, sold under sin, and yet, on the contrary, that he allowed not sin, but hated it. He shows how both these were true concerning himself in diverse respects. He says, In me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, and I delight to do the will of God according to the inward man. With the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Romans 7, verses 14, 15, 18, 22, and 25. John says, He that saith he hath no sin deceiveth himself, and is a liar. 1 John 1 verse 8, and also that it is true that whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed, that is Christ's, the new spiritual nature, remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. 1 John 3 verse 9, it is true that we are weak and can do nothing, and yet strong and able to do all things. 2 Corinthians 12 verses 10 and 11, Philippians 4 verse 13. It is true that believers are dead because of sin, but alive because of righteousness. Romans 8 verse 10 and that when they die by a natural death they shall never die. John 11, verses 25 and 26. They are sons that have the inheritance by their birthright, and yet in some respects may differ nothing from servants, and so they may be under the law in a sense, and yet under grace, and heirs according to the free promise at the same time. Galatians 4, verses 1 and 2. They are redeemed from the curse of the law, and have forgiveness of sins, and a promise that God will never be wrath with them, nor rebuke them any more. Galatians 3 verse 13, Ephesians 1 verse 7, Isaiah 54 verse 9, and yet, on the contrary, the curse written in the law is sometimes poured out upon them. Daniel 9 verse 11, and they have need still to pray that God would deliver them from their guiltiness and forgive their debts. Psalm 51 verse 14, Matthew 6 verse 12, and they may expect that God will punish them for all their iniquities. Amos 3 verse 2. These contrary things, asserted concerning believers in Scripture, sufficiently manifest that they partake of two contrary states in this life. And this is a plain, easy, and ready way to reconcile these seeming contradictions, whatever other ways be used to reconcile some of them. And what reason is there to question that the old state remains in believers in some degree, seeing all sound Protestants acknowledge that the sinful deprivation and pollution of our natures, commonly called original sin, which is one principal part of this old state, remains in all as long as they live in this world? Now, though some penal evils may be said to remain in us, yet we cannot suppose that this original pollution is continued in us, as considered in Christ, but as considered in our old state, derived from the first Adam, 
therefore the first sin of adam is imputed in some respect even to those that are justified by faith and they remain in a measure as aforesaid under the punishment and curse denounced genesis two verse seventeen in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die and on this account the same original guilt and pollution is propagated to the children of believing parents as well as others by natural generation and if such a great and fundamental part of the natural state continue in believers as subjection to the guilt of the first sin and original corruption which is one great part of the punishment and death threatened and by which we are prone and inclined to all actual sins why should we not judge that other parts of the same state likewise continue in them as the guilt of their own actual sins and subjection to the wrath of god and the curses and punishments denounced against them in the law and why should we not judge that all the miseries of this life and death itself are inflicted upon believers at least in some respect as punishments of sin it may be objected that this doctrine of a twofold state of believers in this life derogates much from the perfection of our justification by christ and from the fullness of all the grace and spiritual blessings of christ and from the merits of his death and the power of his spirit and that it greatly diminishes the consolation of believers in christ but it may be easily vindicated from this objection if we understand it rightly for notwithstanding this twofold state it still holds true that believers while they are on earth have all perfections of spiritual blessings justification adoption the gift of the spirit holiness eternal life and glory in and with christ ephesians 1 verse 3 in the person of christ who is now in heaven the old man is perfectly crucified they are dead to sin and to the law and its curse and they are quickened together with him and raised up with him and made to sit in heavenly places in christ jesus ephesians 2 verse 6 and believers in their own persons receive and enjoy by faith all these perfect spiritual blessings of christ as far as they receive and enjoy christ himself dwelling in them and no further thus far they are in a new state free from the guilt pollution and punishment of sin and so from the wrath of god and all miseries and death itself while they are in this world yea all the guilt pollution and punishment of sin and all evils whatever which they are subject to according to their natural state do them no harm according to this new state but work for their good and are no evils but rather advantages to them tending to the destruction only of the flesh and to the perfection of the new man in christ yet it holds true also that our reception and enjoyment of christ himself and all his perfections is but in an imperfect measure and degree until faith be turned into heavenly vision and fruition of christ and therefore our old sinful state with the evils thereof is not perfectly abolished during this life the kingdom of heaven or the grace of christ within us is like leaven in meal which does not unite itself perfectly to the meal in an instant but by degrees until the whole be leavened matthew thirteen verse thirty three or like the morning light that expels darkness by degrees shining more and more unto the perfect day proverbs four verse eighteen this cannot be justly accounted any derogation from the merits of christ's death or from the power of his spirit seeing christ never intended to bring to pass by his death or by the power of his spirit that we should enjoy his spiritual blessings any further than we are in him and enjoy him by faith or that we should be made holy or happy according to the flesh by a reformation of our natural state as has been shown neither does this diminish the consolation of believers in christ for thereby they may know that they have the perfection of grace and happiness in christ and that they enjoy it in this world as far as they enjoy christ himself by faith and that they shall enjoy it in a perfect measure and be fully freed from their sinful and miserable state when that frame of nature which they received from the first adam is dissolved by death this instruction is very useful to frame our souls aright for the practice of holiness by those gospel principles and means alone that belong to our new state which we are partakers of by faith in christ and thus it is easily vindicated from another great objection wherein the papists and quakers do much triumph they appeal to men's consciences to answer this question which doctrine is most likely to bring people to the practice of true godliness theirs which teaches that perfect holiness may be attained in this life or ours which teaches that it is impossible for us to keep the law perfectly and to purge ourselves from all sin as long as we live in this world though we use our best endeavours they think that common reason will make the verdict pass for them against our doctrine as that which discourages all endeavours for perfection and hardens the hearts of people to allow themselves in sin because they cannot avoid it but on the contrary the doctrine of perfectionists hardens people to allow themselves in sin and to call evil good as the papists account that the concupiscence of the flesh against the spirit is no sin but rather good matter for the exercise of their virtues because the most perfect in this life are not without it it also discourages those who labor to get holiness in the right way by faith in christ and make them to think that they labor in vain because they find themselves still sinful and far from perfection when they have done their best to attain it it hinders our diligence in seeking holiness by those principles and means whereby only it can be found for who will be diligent and watchful to avoid walking according to his own carnal principles if he think that his own carnal state with its principles is quite abolished and is out of him 
so that at present he is in no danger of walking according to them. Whatever good works the doctrine of the perfectionists may serve to promote, I am sure it hinders a great part of that work which Christ would have us to be employed in as long as we live in this world. We must know that our natural state with its evil principles continues still in a measure, or else we shall not be fit for the great duties of confessing our sins, loathing ourselves for them, praying earnestly for the pardon of them, sorrowing for them with a godly sorrow, accepting the punishment of our sins and giving God the glory of his justice, and offering to him the sacrifice of a broken and contrite spirit, being poor in spirit, working out our salvation with fear and trembling. Some have doubted how it can consist with our justification by Christ that we should be still liable to be punished for our sins and obliged to pray for the pardon of them, because they have not well considered the twofold state of believers in this life. And except we know this and keep it in mind, we shall never be fit to practice continually the great duties that tend to the putting off the old man and putting on the new man, and mortifying the deeds of the body by the Spirit, praying continually that God could renew a right spirit in us and sanctify us throughout pressing forward to perfection, desiring the sincere milk of the word and the enjoyment of other ordinances. Christ has appointed that his church on earth should be employed in such works, and perfectionists either do or fain would account them needless for them, and that they have no longer need of Christ himself to be their spiritual physician and advocate with the Father, and the propitiation for their sins. Therefore they are not fit to be members of the church on earth, and never are likely to be members of the church in heaven, except they can make a ladder and climb up thither before their time. 2. Despair of purging the flesh or natural man of its sinful lusts and inclinations, and of practicing holiness by your willing and resolving to do the best in your power, and trusting the grace of God and Christ to help you in such resolutions and endeavors, but rather resolve to trust on Christ, to work in you to will and to do by his own power according to his own good pleasure. They who are convinced of their own sin and misery commonly think first to tame the flesh and to subdue and root out its lusts, and to make their corrupt nature better, and inclined to holiness by their struggling and wrestling with it. And if they can but bring their hearts to a full purpose and resolution to do the best that lies in them, they hope that, by such a resolution, they shall be able to achieve great enterprises in the conquest of their lusts and the performance of the most difficult duties. It is the great work of some zealous divines in their preaching and writings to stir up people to this resolution, wherein they place the chief turning point from sin to godliness, and they think that this is not contrary to the life of faith because they trust on the grace of God through Christ to help them in all such resolutions and endeavors. Thus they endeavor to reform their old state and to be made perfect in the flesh instead of putting it off and walking according to the new state in Christ. They trust on low carnal things for holiness and upon the acts of their own will, their purposes, resolutions, and endeavors instead of Christ and they trust on Christ to help them in this carnal way, whereas true faith would teach them that they are nothing, and that they do but labor in vain. They may as well attempt to wash the Ethiopian white, as purge the flesh or natural man from its evil lusts, and make it pure and holy. It is desperately wicked, past all cure. It will unavoidably last against the Spirit of God, even in the best saints on earth. Galatians 5 verse 17. Its mind is enmity to the law of God, and neither is nor can be subject to it. Romans 8 verse 7. They that would cure it and make it holy by their own resolutions and endeavors act quite contrary to the design of Christ's death, for he died not that the flesh or old natural man might be made holy, but that it might be crucified and destroyed out of us, Romans 6 verse 6, and that we might live to God, not to ourselves, or by any natural power of our own resolutions and endeavors, but by Christ living in us, and by his Spirit bringing forth the fruits of righteousness in us. Galatians 2 verse 20 and chapter 5 verses 24 and 25. Therefore we must be content to leave the natural man vile and wicked, as we found it, until it be utterly abolished by death, though we must not allow its wickedness, but rather groan to be delivered from the body of this death, thanking God that there is a deliverance through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our way to mortify sinful affections and lusts must be not by purging them out of the flesh, but by putting off the flesh itself, and getting above into Christ by faith, and walking in that new nature that is by him. Thus the way of life is above to the wise, that he may depart from hell beneath. Proverbs 15 verse 24. Our willing, resolving, and endeavoring must be to do the best, not that lies in ourselves or in our own power, but that Christ and the power of his Spirit shall be pleased to work in us. For in us, that is, in our flesh, there dwelleth no good thing. Romans 7 verse 18. We have great ground to trust in God and Christ for help in such resolutions and endeavors after holiness, as in things that are agreeable to the design of Christ in our redemption, and to the way of acting and living by faith. It is likely that Peter sincerely resolved to die with Christ rather than to deny him, and to do all that he could by his own power for that end, but Christ made him quickly see the weakness and vanity of such resolutions. 
and we see by experience what many resolutions made in sickness and other dangers mostly come to. It is not enough for us to trust on Christ, to help us to act and endeavour so far only as creatures, for so the worst of men are helped. He is the Jehovah in whom they live, move, and have their being, Acts 17 verse 28. And it is likely the Pharisee would trust on God to help him in duty, as he would thank God for the performance of duty, Luke 18 verse 11. And this is all the faith that many make use of in order to a holy practice. But we must trust on Christ to enable us, above the strength of our own natural power, by virtue of the new nature which we have in Christ, and by his Spirit dwelling and working in us, or else our best endeavours will be altogether sinful and mere hypocrisy, notwithstanding all the help for which we trust upon him. We must also take heed of depending for holiness upon any resolution to walk in Christ, or any written covenants, or any holiness that we have already received, for we must know that the virtue of these things continues no longer than we continue walking in Christ and Christ in us. They must be kept up by the continual presence of Christ in us, as light is maintained by the presence of the sun, and cannot subsist without it. 3. You must not seek to procure forgiveness of sins, the favour of God, a new holy nature, life, and happiness, by any works of the moral law, or by any rites and ceremonies whatever, but rather you must work as those that have all these things already according to your new state in Christ, as such who are only to receive them more and more by faith, as they are ready prepared and treasured up for you, and freely given to you in your spiritual head, the Lord Jesus Christ. If we walk as those that are yet holy to seek for the procurement of such enjoyments as these, it is a manifest sign that at present we judge ourselves to be without them, and without Christ himself, in whose fullness they are all contained. And therefore we walk according to our old natural state, as those who are yet in the flesh, and who would get salvation in it, and by our carnal works and observances, instead of living altogether on Christ by faith. This practice is according to the tenor of the covenant of works, as I have before showed, and we have no ground to trust on Christ and his Spirit to work holiness in us this way, for we are dead to the legal covenant by the body of Christ, Romans 7 verse 4, and if we be led by the Spirit we are not under the law, Galatians 5 verse 18. When the Galatians were seduced by false teachers to seek the procurement of justification and life by circumcision and other works of the Mosaical law, the Apostle Paul rebukes them for seeking to be made perfect in the flesh, directly contrary to their good beginning in the Spirit, for rendering Christ of none effect to them, and for falling from grace. Galatians 3 verse 3 and chapter 5 verse 4. And when some of the Colossians sought perfection in the like manner by the observance of circumcision, holy meats, holy times, and other rudiments of the world, the same apostle blamed them for not holding the head, Jesus Christ, and as not being dead and risen with Christ, but living merely in the world, Colossians 2 verses 19 and 20, and chapter 3 verse 1. He clearly showed that those who seek any saving enjoyments in such a way walk according to their old natural state, and that the true manner of living by faith in Christ is to walk as those that have all fullness and perfection of spiritual blessings in Christ by faith, and need not seek for any other way to procure them for themselves. In this sense it is a true saying that believers should not act for life but from life. They must act as those that are not procuring life by their works, but who have already received and derived life from Christ, and act from the power and virtue received from him. And hereby it appears that the papists and all others that think to justify, purify, sanctify, and save themselves by any of their own works, rites, or ceremonies whatever, walk in a carnal way, as those that are without any present interest in Christ, and shall never attain to holiness or happiness until they learn a better way of religion. For think not that you can effectually incline your heart to the immediate practice of holiness by any such practical principles as only serve to bind, press, and urge you to the performance of holy duties, but rather let such principles stir you up to go to Christ first by faith, that you may be effectually inclined to the immediate practice of holiness in Him by gospel principles that strengthen and enable you, as well as oblige you thereto. There are some practical principles that only bind, press, and urge us to holy duties by showing the reasonableness, equity, and necessity of our obedience, without showing at all how we that are by nature dead in sin under the wrath of God may have any strength and ability for the performance of them, as for instance the authority of God, the lawgiver, our absolute dependence on him as our creator, preserver, governor, in whose hand is our life, breath, and all our happiness here and forever. His all-seeing eye that searches our heart, discerns our very thoughts and secret purposes, his exact justice in rendering to all according to their works, his almighty and eternal power to reward those that obey him and to punish transgressors forever the unspeakable joy of heaven and the terrible damnation of hell, 
Such principles as these bind our consciences very strictly, and work very strongly upon the prevalent affections of hope and fear, to press and urge our hearts to the performance of holy duties, if we believe them assuredly, and work them earnestly upon our hearts by frequent, serious, lively meditation, and therefore some account them the most forcible and effectual means to form any virtue in the soul, and to bring it to immediate performance of any duty, however difficult, and that the life of faith consists principally in our living to God in holiness, by a constant belief and meditation on them and they account those things that serve to remind them of such principles very effectual for holiness, as looking on the picture of death, or on a death's head, keeping a coffin by them ready-made, walking about among the graves, etc. But this is not that manner of living to God of which the Apostle speaks when he says, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2 verse 20. If a man make use of these impelling principles to stir him to go to Christ for strength to act bodily, he walks like one that has received Christ as his only life by faith. Otherwise, he walks like other natural men. For the natural man may be brought to act by these principles partly by natural light, and more fully by scripture light, without any true knowledge of the way of salvation by Christ, and as if Christ had never come into the world. And he may be strictly bound by them, and vehemently urged and pressed to holy duties. And yet, all the while, he is left to his own natural strength, or rather weakness, being not assured by any of these principles that God would give him strength to help him in the performance of these duties, and can do nothing aright until he get new life and strength by Christ by a more precious saving faith. There would be no need of a new life and strength by Christ if these principles were sufficient to bring us to a holy conversation. Therefore, this manner of practice is no better than walking after the flesh according to our corrupt state, and seeking to be made perfect in the flesh. No question, but Paul was very diligent in it while he was a blind Pharisee. Yea, the heathen philosophers might attain to it in some measure by the light of common reason. The devils have such principles as they believe assuredly, yet they are never the better for them. It is a part of the natural wisdom whereby the world knew not God, not that wisdom of God in a mystery discovered in the gospel which is the only satisfying wisdom and power of God unto salvation. What can you produce by corruption, by pressing with motives to holiness, one who has no soundness in him from the sole of the foot even to the head, only wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. He that is made truly sensible of his own vileness and deadness by nature will despair of ever bringing himself to holiness by principles that afford him no life and strength, but only lay an obligation upon him and urge and press him to duty. What are mere obligations to one that is dead in sin? While the soul is without spiritual life, Sin is the more moved and enraged by pressing and urging upon the soul the obligations of the law and its commands. The motions of sin are by the law, and sin, taking occasion by the commandment, worketh in us all manner of concupiscence. Romans 7, verses 5 and 8. And yet these impelling principles are very good and excellent in the right gospel use of them, as the apostle says of the law that it is good if it be used lawfully. 1 Timothy 1, verse 8. The humbled sinner knows well his obligations, but it is life and strength that he wants, and he despairs of walking according to such obligations, until he gets this life and strength by faith in Christ. Therefore these obligatory principles move him to go in the first place to Christ, that so he may be enabled to answer their end, by the strengthening and enlivening principles of God's grace in Christ. Some there are that make use of gospel principles only to oblige and urge to duty, without affording any life and strength for the performance, as they that think that Christ died and rose again to establish a new covenant of works for our salvation, and to give us a pattern of good works by his own obedience, rather than to purchase life, obedience, and good works for us. Such as these do not understand and receive the principles of the gospel rightly, but they pervert and abuse them, contrary to their true nature and design, and thereby render them as ineffectual for their sanctification as any other natural or legal principles. 5. Stir up and strengthen yourself to perform the duties of holiness by a firm persuasion of your enjoyment of Jesus Christ and of all spiritual and everlasting benefits through Him. Set not yourselves up on the performance of the law without any prevailing thoughts or apprehensions that you are yet without an interest in Christ and in the love of God through Him, under the curse of the law, the power of sin and Satan, having no better portion than this present world, no better strength than that which is in the purposes and resolutions of your own free will. While such thoughts as these prevail and influence your actions, it is evident that you walk according to the principles and practices of your old natural state. You will be moved thereby to yield to the dominion of sin and Satan, to withdraw yourselves from God and godliness, as Adam was moved from the sight of his own nakedness to hide himself from God. Genesis 3 verse 10. Therefore your way to a holy practice is first to conquer and expel such unbelieving thoughts by trusting confidently on Christ, 
and persuading yourselves by faith that his righteousness, spirit, glory, and all his spiritual benefits are yours, and that he dwells in you and you in him. In the might of this confidence you shall go forth to the performance of the law, and you will be strong against sin and Satan, and able to do all things through Christ who strengthens you. This confident persuasion is of great necessity to the right framing and disposing our hearts to walk according to our new state in Christ. The life of faith principally consists in it, and herein it eminently appears that faith is a hand not only to receive Christ but also to work by him, and that it cannot be effectual for our sanctification except it contain in it some assurance of our interest in Christ, as has been showed. Thus we act as those that are above the sphere of nature, advanced to union and fellowship with Christ. The apostle maintained in his heart a persuasion that Christ had loved him and given himself for him, and hereby he was enabled to love to God in holiness, through Christ living in him by faith. He teaches us also that we must maintain the like persuasion if we would walk holily in Christ. We must know that our old man is crucified with him, and we must reckon ourselves dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6 verses 6 and 11. This is the means whereby we may be filled with the Spirit, strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, which God would not require of us if he had not appointed the means. Ephesians 6 verse 20. Christ himself walked in a constant persuasion of his excellent state. He set the Lord always before him and was persuaded that, because God was at his right hand, he should not be moved. Psalm 16 verse 8. How should it be rationally expected that a man should act according to this new state without assurance that he is in it? It is a rule of common prudence in all worldly callings and conditions that everyone must know and well consider his own state, lest he should act proudly above it or sordidly below it. And it is a hard thing to bring some to a right estimate of their own worldly condition. If the same rule were observed in spiritual things, doubtless the knowledge and persuasion of the glory and excellency of our new state in Christ would more elevate the hearts of believers above all sordid slavery to their lusts, and enlarge them to run cheerfully in the way of God's commandments. If Christians knew their own strength better, they would undertake greater things for the glory of God. But this knowledge is with difficulty attained. It is only by faith and spiritual illumination. The best know but in part, and hence it is that the conversation of believers falls so much below their holy and heavenly calling. 6. Consider what endowments, privileges, or properties of your new state are most proper and forcible to incline and strengthen your heart, to love God above all, and to renounce all sin, and to give up yourselves to universal obedience to his commands and strive to walk in the persuasion of them, that you may attain to the practice of these great duties. I may well join these together, because to love the Lord with all our heart, might, and soul is the first and great commandment, which influences us to all obedience, with a hatred and detestation of all sin, as it is contrary and hateful to God. The same effectual means that produces the one will also produce the other, and holiness chiefly consists in these. So the chief blessings of our holy state are most meet and forcible to enable us for the immediate performance of them, and are to be made use of to this end by faith. Particularly, you must believe steadfastly that all your sins are blotted out, and that you are reconciled to God and have access into his favor by the blood of Christ, and that he is your God and Father, and altogether love to you, and your all-sufficient everlasting portion and happiness through Christ. Such apprehensions as these present God as a very lovely object to our hearts, and thereby allure and win our affections, that cannot be forced by commands or threatenings, but must be sweetly won and drawn by allurements. We must not harbour any suspicions that God would prove a terrible, everlasting enemy to us if we would love him, for there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us, 1 John 4 verses 18 and 19. David loved the Lord because he was persuaded that he was his strength, rock, fortress, his God, and the horn of his salvation, Psalm 18 verses 1 and 2. Love that causes obedience to the law, must proceed from a good conscience purged from sin, and this good conscience must proceed from faith unfeigned, whereby we apprehend the remission of our sins and our reconciliation with God by the merits of the blood of Christ. 1 Timothy 1 verse 5, Hebrews 9 verse 14. For the same end, that your hearts may be rightly fitted and framed for the performance of these principal duties, the Holy Spirit directs you to walk in the persuasion of other principal endowments of your new state, as that you have fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. 1 John 1 verse 3 that you are the temple of the living God, 2 Corinthians 6 verse 16, that you live by the Spirit, Galatians 5 verse 25, that you are called to holiness and created in Christ Jesus unto good works, that God would sanctify you wholly and make you perfect in holiness at the last, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23, Ephesians 2 verse 10, that your old man is crucified with Christ, and through him you are dead unto sin and alive unto God, 
and being made free from sin, you are become the servants of righteousness, and have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. Romans 6, verse 6 and 22. Ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, shall appear, then shall ye appear with him in glory. Colossians 3, verses 3 and 4. Such persuasions as these, when they are deeply rooted and constantly maintained in our hearts, strongly arm and encourage us to practice universal obedience in opposition to every sinful lust, because we look upon it not only as our duty, but our great privilege to do all things through Christ strengthening us. And God certainly works in us both to will and to do by these principles, because they properly belong to the Gospel or New Testament, which is the ministration of the Spirit and the power of God unto salvation. 2 Corinthians 3 verses 6 and 8, Romans 1 verse 16. 7. For the performance of other duties of the law, you are to consider not only these endowments, privileges, and properties of your new state, which are meet and forcible to enable you to the love of God and universal obedience, but also those that have a peculiar force and aptitude suitable to the special nature of such duties, and you must endeavor to assure yourselves of them by faith, that you may be encouraged and strengthened to perform the duties. I shall give you some instances of this manner of practice in several duties, whereby you may better understand how to guide yourselves in the rest. And, as to the duties of the first table, if you would draw near to God in a duty of his worship with a true heart, you must do it in full assurance of faith concerning your enjoyment of Christ and his salvation. And would you perform the great duty of trusting on the Lord with all your heart, casting your care upon him and committing the disposal of yourself to him in all your concerns? Persuade yourself through Christ that God, according to his promise, will never fail you nor forsake you, that he takes a fatherly care of you, that he will withhold no good thing from you, and will make all things to work for your good. And thus you will be strong and courageous in the practice of this duty, whereas if you live in a mere suspense concerning your interest in the privileges, you will be subject to carnal fears and carking cares in despite of your heart, and you will be prone to trust in the arm of flesh, though your conscience tell you plainly that in so doing you incur the heinous guilt of idolatry. Would you be strengthened to submit to the hand of God with a cheerful patience in bearing any affliction and death itself? The way to fortify yourselves is to believe assuredly that your afflictions which are but for a moment, work out for you a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, that Christ is your gain in death and life, that his grace is sufficient for you, and his strength made perfect in your weakness, and that he will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, and will at last make you more than conquerors over all evil. Until you attain to such persuasions as these, you will be prone to fret and murmur under the burden of affliction, and to use indirect means to deliver yourselves, notwithstanding the clearest convictions to the contrary. Would you limit yourselves to the observance of God's own institutions in his worship? Believe that you are complete in Christ, and have all perfection of spiritual blessings in him, and that God will build you up in Christ by the ordinances of his own appointment. This will make you account his ordinances sufficient, and men's traditions and inventions needless in the worship of God. Whereas, if you do not apprehend all fullness in Christ, you will be like the papists, prone to catch at every straw, and to multiply superstitious observances without end, for the supply of your spiritual wants. Would you confess your sins to God, pray to Him, and praise Him heartily for His benefits? Would you praise Him for affliction as well as prosperity? Believe assuredly that God is faithful and just to forgive your sin through Christ, that you are made a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices of prayer and praises that are acceptable to God through Christ, and that God hears your prayers and will fulfill them, so far as they are good for you, and that all God's ways are mercy and truth towards you, whether He prosper or afflict you in this life. If you be altogether in doubt or otherwise persuaded concerning these privileges, all your confessions, prayers, and praises will be but heartless lip labors, slavish or pharisaical works. In like manner, you will be enabled to hear and receive the word as the word of God, and to meditate on it with delight, and you will be willing to know the strictness and spirituality of the commands of God, and to try and examine your ways impartially by them, if you believe assuredly that the word is the power of God unto salvation, and that Christ is your great physician, willing and able to heal you, be the case ever so bad and where your sin abounds, his grace towards you doth so much the more abound, whereas without these comfortable apprehensions all the works of hearing, meditation, self-examination, will be but uncouth, heartless works, and they will be performed negligently and by halves, or hypocritically and out of slavish fear, with much reluctance, without any good will or readiness of mind. So also, for the right receiving the sacraments, you will find yourself much strengthened by believing that you may have communion with God and Christ in them, and that you have a great high priest to bear the iniquity of your holy things, and to make you forever accepted before the Lord. In the same way you are to apply yourselves to all duties towards your neighbor required in the second table of the law, by acting in a persuasion of such privileges of your new state, as have a peculiar force to encourage and strengthen you for the performance of them. 
that you may love your neighbour as yourself, and do to him in all things as you would he should do to you, without partiality and self-seeking, that you may give him his due honour, and abstain from injuring him in his life, chastity, worldly estate, or good name, or from coveting anything that is his, according to the several commands in the second table of the Decalogue, you must walk in a persuasion, not only that these things are just and equitable towards your fellow creatures, and that you are strictly bound to the performance of them, but that they are the will of your heavenly Father, who has begotten you according to his own image in righteousness and true holiness, and has given you his Spirit, that you may be like-minded to him in all things, and that they are the mind of Christ who dwelleth in you and you in him, that God and Christ are kind, tender-hearted, long-suffering, full of goodness to men, whether good or bad, friends or enemies, poor or rich, and that Christ came into the world not to destroy but to save, and that you are of the same spirit, that the injuries done to you by your neighbours can do you no harm, and you need not seek any good for yourselves by injuring them, because you have all desirable happiness in Christ, and all things, though intended by your enemies for your hurt, certainly work for your good through Christ. Such apprehensions as these, wrought in us by the spirit of faith, certainly beget in us a right frame of spirit, thoroughly furnished for every good work towards our neighbour. Likewise, your hearts will be purified to unfeigned love of the brethren in Christ, and you will walk towards them with all lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, if you maintain a steadfast belief and persuasion of those manifold bonds of love, whereby you are inseparably joined with them through Christ, as particularly that there is one body and one spirit, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. Finally, you will be able to abstain from all fleshly and worldly lusts that war against the soul and hinder all godliness, by an assured persuasion not merely that gluttony, drunkenness, lechery, are filthy, swinish abominations, and that the pleasures, profits, and honours of the world are vain, empty things, but that you are crucified to the flesh and the world, and are quickened and raised and sit in heavenly places together with Christ, and that you have pleasures, profits, and honours in Christ, to which the best things in the world are not worthy to be compared, and that you are members of Christ, the temple of his Spirit, citizens of heaven, children of the day, not of the night, nor of darkness, so that it is below your state and dignity to practice deeds of darkness and mind fleshly, worldly things. Thus I have given instances enough to stir you up to acquaint yourselves with the manifold endowments, privileges, and properties of your new state in Christ, as they are discovered in the gospel of your salvation, whereby the new nature is fitted for holy operations, as the common nature of man is furnished with the endowments necessary for those functions and operations to which it is designed, and also to stir you up to make use of them by faith, as they serve to strengthen you either for universal obedience or for particular duties, and by this manner of walking your hearts will be comforted and established in every good word and work, and you will grow in holiness until you attain to perfection in Jesus Christ. 8. If you endeavour to grow in grace and in all holiness, trust assuredly that God will enable you by this manner of walking to do everything that is necessary for his glory and your own everlasting salvation, and that he will graciously accept of that obedience through Christ which you are enabled to perform according to the measure of your faith, and will pardon your failings, though you offend in many things, and fall short of many others, as to degrees of holiness and high acts of obedience. And therefore attempt not the performance of duty in any other way, though you cannot yet do as much as you would in this way. This is a necessary instruction to establish us in the life of faith, that the sense of our manifold failings and defects may not move us, either to despair or to return to the use of carnal principles and means for help against our corruptions, as accounting this way of living and acting by faith to be insufficient for our sanctification and salvation. The Apostle Paul exhorts the Galatians to walk in the Spirit, though the flesh lusts against the Spirit, so that they cannot do the things that they would. Galatians 5, verses 16 and 17. We are to know that though the law requires of us the utmost perfection of holiness, yet the Gospel makes an allowance for our weakness, and Christ is so meek and lowly in heart, that he accepts of that which our weak faith can attain to by his grace, and does not exact or expect any more of us for his glory and our salvation, until we grow stronger in grace. God showed his great indulgence to his people under the Old Testament that Moses, the lawgiver, suffered them, because of the hardness of their hearts to put away their wives, though from the beginning it was not so, Matthew 19, verse 8, and also in tolerating the customary practice of polygamy. Though Christ will not tolerate the continuance of such practices in his church, since his spirit is more plentifully poured forth under the gospel, yet he is as forward as ever to bear with the failings of his weak saints that desire to obey him sincerely. We have another instance of God's indulgence, more full to our present purpose in his commanding that the fearful and faint-hearted should not be forced to enter into battle against their enemies, but suffered to return home to their houses, though fighting in battle against their enemies without fear and faint-heartedness was a duty that God did much exercise his people in at that time, Deuteronomy 20 verses 3 and 8. 
so under the gospel though it be an eminent part of christ's service to endure the greatest fight of afflictions and death itself courageously for his name's sake yet if any be so weak in faith that they have not sufficient courage to venture into the battle no doubt but christ allows them to make use of any honest means whereby they may escape the hands of persecutors with safety to their holy profession he will accept them in this weaker kind of service and will approve of them more than if they should hazard a denial of his name by venturing themselves upon the trial of martyrdom when they might have escaped it peter came off with sin and shame by venturing upon the measure of his faith into the hands of his persecutors when he went after christ to the high priest's hall whereas he should rather have made use of that indulgent dismissal that christ gave to him and the rest of his disciples let these people go their way john eighteen verse eight christ deals with his people as a good and careful shepherd that will not overdrive his sheep he shall gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young isaiah forty verse eleven he would not have his disciples urged rigorously upon the duty of fasting when their spirits were unfit for it because he knew that imposing duties above their strength is like putting a new piece of cloth into an old garment and new wine into old bottles which spoils all at last matthew nine verses fourteen fifteen sixteen and seventeen that precept of solomon be not righteous over much ecclesiastes seven verse sixteen is very useful and necessary if rightly understood we are to beware of being too rigorous in exacting righteousness of ourselves and others beyond the measure of faith and grace overdoing commonly proves undoing children that venture on their feet beyond their strength have many a fool and so have babes in christ when they venture unnecessarily upon such duties as are beyond the strength of their faith we should be content at present to do the best that we can according to the measure of the gift of christ though we know that others are unable to do much better and we are not to despise the day of small things but to praise god that he works in us anything that is well pleasing in his sight hoping that he will sanctify us throughout and bring us at last to perfection of holiness through jesus christ our lord and we should carefully observe in all things that good lesson of the apostle not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think but to think soberly according as god hath dealt to every man the measure of faith romans twelve verse three direction thirteen endeavour diligently to make the right use of any means appointed in the word of god for the obtaining and practising holiness only in this way of believing in christ and walking in him according to your new state by faith explication this might have been added to the instructions in the explication of the former direction because its use is the same to guide us in the mysterious manner of practising holiness in christ by the life of faith but the weight and comprehensiveness of it makes it worthy to be treated of by itself as a distinct direction two things are observable in it first that though all holiness be effectually attained by the life of faith in christ yet the use of any means appointed in the word for attaining and promoting holiness is not thereby made void but rather established this is needful to be observed against the pride and ignorance of some professors of the gospel who being puffed up with a conceit of their feigned faith imagine themselves to be in such a state of perfection that they are above all ordinances except singing hallelujahs and also against the papists who run into the contrary extreme by heaping together a multitude of means of holiness which god never commanded neither ever came they into his heart and to slander the protestant doctrine of faith and free grace as if it tended to destroy all diligent use of the means of holiness and salvation and to breed up a company of lazy solifedians we indeed assert and profess that a true and lively faith in christ is alone sufficient and effectual through the grace of god to receive christ and all his fullness so far as it is necessary in this life for our justification sanctification and eternal salvation but yet we also assert and profess that several means are appointed of god for begetting maintaining and increasing this faith and acting and exercising it in order to the attainment of its end and that these means are to be used diligently which are mentioned in the sequel true believers find by experience that their faith needs such helps and they who think themselves above any need of them reject the counsel of god against themselves like those proud pharisees and lawyers who thought it a thing beneath them and refused to be baptized of john luke seven verse thirty yet we account no means necessary or lawful to be used for the attainment of holiness besides those that are appointed by god in his word we know that holiness is a part of our salvation and therefore they who think men may or can invent any means effectually for the attainment of it ascribe their salvation partly to men and rob god of his glory in being our only saviour and they thereby plainly show that though they draw nigh unto god with their mouth and honour him with their lips yet their hearts are far from him and in vain do they worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men matthew fifteen verses seven eight and nine 
the second thing observable and principally designed in this direction is the right manner of using all the means of holiness for the obtaining and practising it in no other way besides that of believing in christ and walking in him according to our new state by faith which has been already demonstrated to be the only way whereby we may effectually attain to this great end we must use them as helps to the life of faith in its beginning continuance and growth and as instruments subservient to faith the principal instrument in all its acts and exercises whereby the soul receives christ and walks in all holiness by him we must beware lest we rather use them in opposition than in subordination to the way of sanctification and salvation by free grace in christ through faith and lest by our abuse of them they be made rather hindrances than helps to our faith we must not idolize any of the means and put them in the place of christ as the papists do by trusting in them as if they were effectual to confer grace on the soul by the work that is done in the use of them neither may we use them as works of righteousness to be performed as conditions for procuring the favor of god and the salvation of christ neither must they be accounted so absolutely necessary to salvation as if a true faith were void and of none effect when we are debarred from the enjoyment of several of them the holy scriptures with all the means of grace appointed therein are able to make us wise unto salvation no other way than by faith in jesus christ 2 timothy 3 verse 15 and therefore our wise endeavour must be not to use them in any opposition to the grace of god in christ for god's ordinances are like the cherubim of glory made with their faces looking towards the mercy seat they are made to guide us to christ for salvation by faith alone if any turn them to another use it is a great violation of divine institutions as if any sacrilegious person had presumed to turn the faces of the cherubim from the mercy seat some other way this right use of the means of grace is a point wherein many are ignorant who use them with a great zeal and diligence and thereby they not only lose their labor and the benefit of the means but also they rest and pervert them to their own destruction the jews under the law of moses enjoyed many more ordinances of divine worship than we do under the gospel but their table became their snare and they fell miserably from god and christ because the veil of ignorance was upon their hearts that they could not look to the end of those ordinances even to the lord jesus christ and they sought not salvation by faith but by the ordinances as works of righteousness and by others works of the law for they stumbled at the stumbling stone romans nine verses thirteen and thirty two and chapter ten verses four and five two corinthians three verses thirteen and fourteen that you may not stumble and fall by the same pernicious error i shall show particularly how several of the principal means of holiness appointed in the word of god are to be made use of in the right manner expressed in the direction one we must endeavour diligently to know the word of god contained in the holy scripture and to improve it to this end that we may be made wise unto salvation through faith which is in christ jesus one timothy three verse fifteen other means of salvation are necessary to the more abundant well-being of our faith and of our new state in christ but this is absolutely necessary to the very being thereof because faith comes by hearing the word of god and receives christ as manifested by the word as i have before proved rahab the canaanite was justified by faith before she had any visible communion with the church in any of god's ordinances yet not without the word of god even the same word for substance which was written in the scriptures and was then extant in the books of moses though that word was not brought to her by any book of holy scripture nor by the preaching of any holy minister but by the report of the heathens john two verses nine and eleven but here our great work must be to get such a knowledge of the word as is necessary and sufficient to guide us in receiving christ and walking in him by faith you must not be of their minds who think the knowledge of the ten commandments sufficient to salvation or who would have mysteries to remain hid from the understanding of the vulgar and nothing to be preached to them but what they can readily assent to and receive by the light that is in all men of which mind it may be some ministers are who unwittingly agree with the quakers in a fundamental point of their heresy but you must endeavour chiefly to know the mystery of the father and the son as it is discovered in the gospel wherein are hid all treasures of wisdom and knowledge colossians two verses two and three which to know is life eternal and ignorance of it is death eternal john fourteen verse three two corinthians four verse three you must know that christ is the end of the law romans ten verse four and therefore you must endeavour to know the commands of the law not that you may be enabled by that knowledge to practise them immediately and so to procure salvation by your works but rather that by your knowledge of them you may be made sensible of your inability to perform them and of the enmity that is in your hearts against them and the impossibility of being saved by your own works that so you may flee to christ for refuge and trust only to the free grace of god for justification and strength to fulfil the law acceptably through christ in your conversation and for this end you must endeavour to learn the utmost strictness of the commands to exact perfection and spiritual purity which they require that you may be the more convinced of sin and stirred up to seek unto christ for remission of sin for purity of heart and spiritual obedience 
and be brought nearer to the enjoyment of him, as Christ testifies that the scribe who understood the greatness of that command of loving the Lord with all the heart and soul was not far from the kingdom of God. Matthew 12, verse 34. The most effectual knowledge for your salvation is to understand these two points, the desperate sinfulness and misery of your own natural condition, and the alone sufficiency of the grace of God in Christ for your salvation, that you may be abased as to the flesh and exalted in Christ alone. And for the better understanding these two main points, you should learn how the first Adam was the figure of the second, Romans 5 verse 14, how sin and death came upon all the natural seed of the first Adam by his disobedience in eating the forbidden fruit, and how righteousness and everlasting life come upon all the spiritual seed of the second Adam, Jesus Christ, by his obedience unto death, even the death of the cross. You also should learn the true difference between the two covenants, the old and the new, or the law and the gospel, that the former shuts us up under the guilt and power of sin, and the wrath of God and his curse by its rigorous terms, do all the commandments and live, and cursed are ye if ye do them not, and fail in the least point. The latter, that is the new covenant, opens the gates of righteousness and life to all believers by its gracious terms. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and live. That is, all your sins shall be forgiven, and holiness and glory shall be given to you freely by his merit and spirit. Furthermore, you should learn the gospel principles that you are to walk by for the attainment of holiness in Christ. And here I shall remind you particularly that you would be a good proficient in Christian learning if you get a good understanding of the sixth and seventh chapters of Paul's epistle to the Romans, where the powerful principles of sanctification are purposely treated of and distinguished from those weak and ineffectual principles which we are most naturally prone to walk by. I need not particularly commend any other points of religion to your learning, for if you get the knowledge of these principal points, which I have mentioned, and improve it to a right end, which is to live and walk by faith in Christ, your own renewed mind will covet the knowledge of all other things that appertain to life and godliness, and if in anything you be otherwise minded than is according to saving truth, God shall reveal even this unto you. Philippians 3 verse 15. Yet let me caution you, lest instead of gaining Christ by your knowledge you rather lose him, by putting your knowledge in the place of Christ and trusting on it for your salvation. One cause of the Jews perishing was that they rested in a form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Romans 2 verse 20. And doubtless, all that many Christians will gain by their knowledge in the end will only be to be beaten with more stripes because they place their religion and salvation chiefly in the knowledge of their Lord's will and in their ability to talk and dispute about it without preparing themselves to do according thereto. Luke 12 verse 47. Much less are you to place your religion and hope of salvation in a daily task of reading chapters or repeating sermons without understanding more than the papists do their lessons in the Latin Mass and canonical hours. As sad experience shows that many seemingly devout and frequent hearers of the word do notwithstanding remain in lamentable and wonderful ignorance of the saving truth, and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah that in hearing they shall hear and not understand, and in seeing they see, etc. Matthew 13 verses 14 and 15. 2. Another means to be used diligently for the promoting the life of faith is examination of our state and ways according to the word whether we be at present in a state of sin and wrath, or of grace and salvation. That if we be in a state of sin, we may know our sickness and come to the great physician, while it is called today. And if we be in a state of grace, we may know that we are of the truth, and assure our hearts before God with the greater confidence, by the testimony of a good conscience. 1 John 3 verses 19 and 21. That so our hearts may be more strongly comforted by faith, and established in every good work. And that if our ways be evil, we may turn from them to the Lord our God through Christ, without whom none cometh to the Father. Lamentations 3 verse 40, John 14 verse 6. But your great care in this work of self-examination must be to perform it in such a manner that it may not hinder and destroy the life of faith as it does in many, instead of promoting it. Therefore beware, lest you trust upon your self-examination rather than upon Christ, as some do who think they have made their peace with God merely because they have examined themselves upon their sickbed, or before receiving the Lord's Supper, though they have found themselves destitute of holiness and do not depend on Christ to make them better, but on their own deceitful purposes and resolutions. Think not that you must begin this work with doubting whether God will extend mercy to you and save you, and that you must leave this a question wholly under debate until you have found out how to resolve it by self-examination. This is a common and very pernicious error in the very foundation of this work, which is hereby laid in the great sin of unbelief, which, as soon as it prevails, does, by its great influence, dash and obscure all inward gracious qualifications of peace, hope, joy, love to God and his people, before they be at all tried, whether they can give any good evidence for their salvation. And it makes people willing to think their own qualifications better than they are, lest they should fall into an utter despair of their salvation. 
and thus it wholly mars the good work of self-examination and makes it destructive to our souls for to them that are defiled and unbelieving there is nothing pure titus one verse fifteen you should rather begin the work with much assurance of faith that though you may at present find your heart ever so wicked and reprobate as many of god's choicest servants have found yet the door of mercy is open for you and that God will certainly save you forever if you put your trust in His grace through Christ. I have formerly showed that this confident persuasion is of the nature of saving faith, and that we have sufficient ground for it in the free promises of the gospel, when we walk in darkness and can see no light shining forth in our gracious qualifications. If we begin the work with this confidence, it will make us impartial and not afraid to find out the worst of ourselves, and willing to judge that our hearts are deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked, beyond what we can find out. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 and if we have any holy qualifications this confidence will preserve them in their vigour and brightness that they may be able to give clear evidence that we are at present in a state of grace mark well the difference between these two questions whether god will graciously accept and save me though a vile sinner through christ as before was said and whether i am already brought into a state of salvation the former of these i say is to be resolved affirmatively by a confident faith in christ the latter only is to be inquired into by self-examination misspend not your time as many do in pouring upon your hearts to find whether you be good enough to trust on christ for your salvation or to find whether you have any faith before you dare be so bold as to act faith in christ but know that you cannot find that you have any faith or holiness yet if you will now believe on him that justifieth the ungodly it shall be accounted to you for righteousness romans four verse five and if you love Christ and your own soul, misspend not your time in examining whether you have committed the unpardonable sin against the Holy Ghost, except it be with a full purpose to assure yourself more and more that you are not guilty thereof. For any doubtfulness in this point will but harden you in unbelief. Remember well that the question to be resolved is whether you are at present in a state of grace, and to resolve it you must be willing to know the best of yourself as well as the worst, and you must not think that humility requires you to overlook your good qualifications and to take notice only of your corruptions but your great work must be to find whether there be not some drop of saving grace in the ocean of your corruption. And it will consist well with humility to take notice of, and own any spark of true holiness that is in you, because the praise and glory of it belongs not to you, but to God. Philippians 1 verse 21. And you must try inherent grace by the touchstone, not by the measure, by its nature, not its degree, not denying any lustings of the spirit in you, because of the strong lustings of the flesh against the spirit, nor denying that you are spiritual in some degree and babes in christ because you find yourselves carnal in a more prevailing degree and the old man bigger than the new galatians five verse seventeen one corinthians two verse one especially you are to examine and prove whether you be in the faith for if you make sure of this you make sure of all the things that pertain to life and godliness and if you doubt of this you will certainly doubt of the truth of any other qualifications and will suspect them to be merely carnal and counterfeit because it is a known truth that to the unbelieving there is nothing pure, and that all who have not truly received Christ by faith are at present in an unregenerate state, though they seem ever so pure and godly. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, Titus 1 verse 5. And let not the issue of this trial depend at all upon your knowledge of the time, when, or of the sermon, conference, or place of scripture by which you were first converted to the faith, though that is good to know too, if it may be. And some who have formerly lived in gross ignorance, or in a manifest opposition to true faith and holiness, may know such circumstances of their conversion, and may reflect upon them comfortably, as the Apostle Paul did, who was turned of a sudden from his persecuting rage to be a disciple and apostle of Christ. Yet others, sincere believers, may be wholly ignorant of them, as John the Baptist, who was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb, Luke 1 verse 5, and they that have been trained up religiously, and know the Holy Scripture from their childhood, as Timothy, 2 Timothy 3 verse 15, yea, and many that are first turned from gross ignorance and profaneness to some external reformation, and then in process of time brought nearer to the kingdom of heaven, by insensible degrees, before they be really new-begotten by the spirit of faith. There are also some that deceive their souls by imagining they know at what time and by what text of scripture they were converted, and can make large discourses of the workings of God upon their hearts, and are prone to talk unseasonably with vain glorying of their own experiences when at last all their experiences are not sufficient to evidence that they ever attain to the least measure of true saving faith. Therefore, that we may not unjustly condemn or justify our faith by proceeding on insufficient evidences in its trial, our best way is to examine it by the inseparable properties of a true saving faith by putting to ourselves such questions as these. Are we made thoroughly sensible of our sinfulness and of the deadness and misery of our natural state, so as to despair absolutely of ever attaining to any righteousness, holiness, or true happiness while we continue in it? 
are the eyes of our understanding enlightened to see the excellency of Christ, and the alone sufficiency and all-sufficiency of his grace for our salvation? Do we prefer the enjoyment of him above all things, and desire it with our whole heart, as our only happiness, whatever we may suffer for his sake? Do we desire with our whole heart to be delivered from the power and practice of sin, as well as from the wrath of God, and the pains of hell? Do our hearts come to Christ and lay hold on him for salvation, by trusting on him only, and endeavouring to trust on him confidently, notwithstanding all fears and doubts that assault us? If you find in yourself a faith that has these properties, though as small as a grain of mustard seed, and opposed with much unbelief and manifold corruption in your soul, you may conclude that you are in a state of salvation at present, and that your remaining work is to continue and grow in it more and more, and to walk worthy of it. You should also examine the fruits of your faith, and try whether you can show your faith by your works, as you are taught, James 2, verse 18, that you may be sure not to be deceived in your judgment concerning it. And though it be true, as I have noted, that doubts concerning your faith will produce doubts concerning the sincerity of other qualifications that are fruits thereof, yet possibly you may get such clear evidences of your sincerity as may overcome and expel all your doubts. And here you are not only to inquire whether your inclinations, purposes, affections, and actions be materially good and holy, but also by what principles they are bred and influenced, whether it be by slavish fears of hell and mercenary hopes of getting heaven by your works, which are legal and carnal principles that can never produce true holiness, or by gospel principles as by love to God, because God has loved you first, and to Christ because he has died, and by the hope of eternal life as the free gift of God through Christ and dependence on God to sanctify you by his Spirit according to his promises. Remember that the New Testament is the ministration of the Spirit, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 6, and the Spirit will sanctify us not by legal, but by gospel principles. Take notice, Father, that you need not trouble yourself to find out a multitude of marks and signs of true grace, if you can find a few good ones. Particularly, you may know that you are passed from death to life, if you love the brethren, 1 John 3 verse 14, that is, if you love all whom you can in charity judge to be true believers, and that because they are true believers, and for the truth's sake, that dwelleth in them. As Solomon discerneth the true mother of the child by her affection towards her child, so the mother grace of faith may be distinguished by the love that it excites in us towards all true believers. To conclude this point, happy are you if you can find such evidence of the fruits of your faith as may enable you to express your sincerity in these moderate terms. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. Hebrews 13 verse 13. 3. Meditation on the word of God is of very great use and advantage for the attainment and practice of holiness through faith in Christ. It is a duty by which the soul, as it were, feeds and ruminates upon the word as its spiritual food, and digests it and turns it into nourishment, whereby we are strengthened for every good work. Our souls are satisfied therewith, as with marrow and fatness, when we remember God upon our beds, and meditate on him in the night watches, Psalm 63, verses 5 and 6. The new nature may well be called the mind, Romans 7, verse 25, because it lives and acts by minding and meditating on spiritual things. Therefore, it is a duty to be practised, not only at some stated times, but all the day. Psalm 119, verse 97, yea, day and night. Psalm 1, verse 2, even in our ordinary employments at home and abroad. An habitual knowledge of the word will not profit us without an active consideration of it by frequent meditation. Some think that much preaching of the word is not needful, where a people is already brought to the knowledge of those things that are necessary to salvation, but they that are regenerated by the word find by experience that their spiritual life is maintained and increased by often minding the same word, and therefore, as newborn babes, they desire the sincere milk of the word, that they may grow thereby, 1 Peter 2 verse 2, and would by the preachers be often put in remembrance of the same things, that they may feed upon them by meditation, though they know them already and are established in the present truth, 2 Peter 1 verse 12. But here our greatest skill and chief concern lies in practising this duty in such a manner as that it may be subservient and not at all opposite to the life of faith. We must not rely upon the performance of a daily task of meditation as a work of righteousness for the procurement of the favour of God, instead of relying on the righteousness of Christ, as indeed we are prone to do to catch at any straw rather than to trust on the free grace of God in Christ for our salvation. And the end of our meditation must not be mere speculation and knowledge of the truth, but rather the vigorous pressing it upon our consciences, and in stirring up ourselves to a holy practice, we must carefully observe how far the several parts of the truth of God are powerful and effectual for the attainment of this end, that we may make use of them accordingly. We must not imagine, as too many do, yea, and some great masters in the art of meditation, 
that we can bring our hearts effectually to the love of God and holiness, and can work strange alterations and frame in our hearts any holy qualifications of virtue, merely by working in ourselves strong apprehensions of God's eternal power and Godhead, his sovereign authority, omniscience, perfect holiness, exact justice, the equity of his law and reasonableness of our obedience to it, the unspeakable happiness prepared for the godly, and misery to the wicked, to all eternity. Meditation on such things as these is indeed very useful to press upon our consciences the strictness of our obligation to holy duties, and to move us to go by faith to Christ, for life and strength to perform them. But that we may receive this life and strength whereby we are enabled for immediate performance, we must meditate believingly on Christ's saving benefits, as they are discovered in the gospel, which is the only doctrine which is the power of God to our salvation, and whereby the quickening spirit is ministered to us, and that is able to build us up and give us an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Romans 1 verse 16, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 6, Acts 20 verse 32. You must take special care to act faith in your meditation, and mix the word of God's grace with it, or else it will not profit you. Hebrews 4 verse 2. And if you set the loving kindness of God frequently before your eyes, by meditating on it believingly, you will be strengthened to walk in the truth. Psalm 26 verse 3. And by beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, you will be changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. This kind of meditation is sweet and delightful to those who are guided to it by the spirit of faith, and it needs not the help of such artificial methods as the vulgar cannot easily learn. You may let your thoughts run in it, at liberty, without confining them to any rules of method. You will find yourselves much enlivened by it, and enriched with the grace of God, which cannot be affected by any kind of meditation, though it be ever so methodical and curiously framed according to the rules of art. 4. The sacrament of baptism must needs be of great use to promote the life of faith, if it be made use of according to its nature and institution, because it is a seal of the righteousness of faith, as circumcision was formerly, Romans 4 verse 11. But then we must take heed of making it a seal of the contrary righteousness of works, as the carnal Jews did who sought to be justified by the law of Moses, and as many Christians do who transform the new covenant into a covenant of works, requiring sincere obedience to all the laws of Christ as the condition of our justification into which new devised covenant they think themselves to be entered by their baptism. I must say of baptism thus perverted and abused, as the apostle says of circumcision, baptism verily profiteth, if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy baptism is made no baptism. Romans 2 verse 25. If thou be baptized, so long as thou continuest in the abuse of that holy ordinance, Christ shall profit you nothing. Christ is become of none effect to you, ye are fallen from grace. Galatians 5 verses 2 and 4. Beware also of making an idol of baptism and putting it in the place of Christ, as the papists do, who hold that it confers grace by the very work that is performed in the administration of it, and as many ignorant people do, who trust rather on their baptism than on Christ, like the Pharisees who place their confidence on circumcision and other external privileges, Philippians 3 verses 4 and 5. We are to know that God is not well pleased with many who are baptized, 1 Corinthians 10 verses 2 and 5. The time will come when he will punish the baptized with the unbaptized, as well as the circumcised with the uncircumcised. Jeremiah 9 verse 25. Beware also of advancing baptism to an equal partnership with your faith in your salvation, as some do, who account all baptism null and void, besides that which is administered to persons grown up to years of discretion, and they that refuse to be rebaptized at those years are to be accounted aliens from the true church, from Christ and his salvation, notwithstanding all their faith in Christ. If the baptism of infants were null and void, yet the want of true baptism would be no damning matter to those that are otherwise persuaded. Circumcision was as necessary as baptism in its time, and yet the Israelites omitted it for the space of forty years in the wilderness, without fearing that any should fall short of salvation for want of it. Joshua 5 verses 6 and 7 Many precious saints in the primitive times of persecution have gone to heaven through a baptism of suffering for the name of Christ before they had opportunity to be baptized with water. And in those ancient times when the custom of deferring baptism too much prevailed, we are not to think that none were in a state of salvation by faith in Christ who deferred that ordinance or neglected it. Take notice further that it is not sufficient to avoid the pernicious errors of those that pervert baptism contrary to its institution, but you must be also diligent in improving it to the ends for which it was instituted. And here let me desire you to put the question seriously to your souls, what good use do you make of your baptism? How often or seldom do you think upon it? The vulgar sort of Christians, yea, it may be feared, many sincere converts do so little think upon their own baptism, and study to make a due improvement of it, that it is of no more profit to their souls than if they never had been baptized. 
yea their sin is the more aggravated by rendering such an ordinance of none effect to their souls through their own gross neglect though baptism be administered to us but once in our lives yet we ought frequently to reflect upon it and upon all occasions to put the question to ourselves unto what were we baptized acts nineteen verse three what does this ordinance seal what did it engage us to and accordingly we must stir up and strengthen ourselves by our baptism to lay hold on the grace which it seals to us and to fulfil its engagements we should often remember that we are made christ's disciples by baptism and engaged to hear him rather than moses and to believe on him for our salvation as john baptized with the baptism of repentance saying to the people that they should believe on him that should come after him that is on christ jesus we should remember that our baptism sealed our putting on of christ and our being the children of god by faith in christ and our being no longer under the former schoolmaster the law galatians three verses twenty five twenty six and twenty seven and that it sealed to us the putting off the body of sin and our burial and resurrection with christ by faith and the forgiving of our trespasses colossians two verses twelve and thirteen our being made members of one body christ and to drink into one spirit one corinthians twelve verses twelve and thirteen we may find by such things as these which are more fully discovered in the gospel that it is the proper nature and tendency of baptism to guide us to faith in christ alone for remission of sins holiness and all salvation by union and fellowship with him and that a diligent improvement of this ordinance must needs be of great advantage to the life of faith five the sacrament of the lord's supper is as a spiritual feast to nourish our faith and to strengthen us to walk in all holiness by christ living and working in us if it be used according to the pattern which christ gave us in its first institution recorded by the three evangelists matthew twenty six verses twenty six twenty seven and twenty eight mark fourteen verses twenty two twenty three and twenty four luke twenty two verses nineteen and twenty it was extraordinarily revealed from heaven by christ himself to the apostle paul one corinthians eleven verses twenty three twenty four and twenty five that we be the more obliged and stirred up to the exact observance of it its end is not only that we may remember christ's death in history but in the mystery of it as that his body was broken for us that his blood is the blood of the new testament or covenant shed for us and for many for the remission of sins that so we may receive and enjoy all the promises of the new covenant which are recorded hebrews eight verses ten eleven and twelve its end is to remind us that christ's body and blood are bread and drink even an all-sufficient food to nourish our souls to everlasting life and that we ought to take and eat and drink him by faith and to assure us that when we truly believe on him he is as ready and closely united to us by his spirit as the food which we eat and drink is united to our bodies christ himself john six more fully explains this mystery furthermore this sacrament not only puts us in mind of the spiritual blessings wherewith we are blessed in christ and of our enjoyment of them by faith but also it is a mean and instrument whereby god really exhibits and gives forth christ and his salvation to true believers and stirs up and strengthens believers to receive and feed upon christ by present actings of faith while they partake of the outward elements when christ says eat drink this is my body this is my blood no less can be meant than that christ does as truly give his body and blood to true believers in that ordinance as the bread and cup and they do as truly receive it by faith as if a prince invest a subject in some honourable office by delivering to him a staff sword or signet and say to him take this staff sword or signet this is such an office or preferment or if a father should deliver a deed for conveyance of land to his son and say take it as thy own this is such a farm or manor how can such expressions import anything less in common sense and reason than a present gift and conveyance of the officers preferments and lands by and with those outward signs therefore the apostle paul asserts that the bread in the lord's supper is the communion of the body of christ and the cup is the communion of his blood one corinthians ten verse sixteen which shows that christ's body and blood are really communicated to us and we really partake of them as well as of the bread and cup the chief excellence and advantage of this ordinance is that it is not only a figure and resemblance of our living upon the crucified saviour but also a precious instrument whereby christ the bread and drink of life is really conveyed to us and received by us through faith this makes it a love token worthy of that ardent affection towards us which filled christ's heart at the time when he instituted it when he was on the point of finishing his greatest work of love by laying down his life for us one corinthians eleven verse twenty three and this is diligently to be observed that we may make a right improvement of this ordinance and receive the saving benefits of it one reason why many little esteem and seldom or never partake of this ordinance and find little benefit by it is because they falsely imagine that god in it only holds forth naked signs and resemblances of christ and his salvation which they account to be held forth so plainly in scripture that they need not the help of such a sign 
whereas if they understood that God really gives Christ himself to their faith, by and with those signs and resemblances, they would prize it as the most delicious feast, and be desirous to partake of it on all opportunities. Acts 2 verse 42 and chapter 20 verse 7. Another reason why many partake seldom or never of this ordinance, and know little of the benefit of it, because they think themselves brought by it into great danger of eating and drinking their own damnation, according to these terrifying words of the Apostle, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 9. Therefore they account it the safest way wholly to abstain from such a dangerous ordinance, or at least that once a year is often enough to run so great a hazard. And if they be brought to it sometimes by constraint of conscience, their slavish fears deprive them of all comfortable fruit of it, so that instead of striving to receive Christ and his salvation therein, they account themselves to have succeeded well if they come off without the sentence of damnation. As the Jewish rabbis write that the high priest's life was so eminently hazarded by his entering once a year into the Holy of Holies, that he stayed there as little time as he could, lest the people should think him struck dead by the hand of God. And when he was come forth alive, he usually made a feast of thanksgiving for joy of so great a deliverance. But there is no reason why we should be so much terrified by those words of the Apostle, for they were directed against such a gross profanation of the Lord's Supper among the Corinthians as we may easily avoid by observing the institution of it, which the Apostle proposes to them as a sufficient remedy against the gross abuse, in not discerning or distinguishing the Lord's body from other bodily food, and partaking of it as their own supper, with such disorder that one was hungry and another drunken. Besides, that terrifying word damnation may be rendered more mildly judgment, as it is in the margin. Yea, the Apostle himself, verse 22, interprets it of a merciful temporal judgment, whereby we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. We are indeed prone to sin in receiving this ordinance unworthily, and so we are also to pollute, more or less, all other holy things that we meddle with, so that the consideration of our danger might fill us with slavish fear in the use of all other means of grace, as well as of this, were it not that we have a great high priest to bear this iniquity of our holy things. Exodus 28 verse 38 Under the covert of whose righteousness we are to draw near to God without slavish fear, in the full assurance of faith, in this, as well as in other holy ordinances, and we are to rejoice in the Lord in this solemn feast, as the Jews were bound to do in their solemn feasts. Deuteronomy 16, verses 14 and 15. There are other abuses of this ordinance, like to those of baptism before mentioned, whereby it is rendered opposite, rather than subservient to the life of faith. Some put it in the place of Christ by trusting on it as a work of righteousness for the procuring of God's favor, or an ordinance sufficient to confer grace to the soul by the very work wrought. Others make it so necessary that they consider faith as not sufficient without it, and therefore they will partake of it, if they can possibly, though it be in a disorderly manner, upon their sick beds when they are in fear of death, as their viaticum. The papists horribly idolize it by their figment of transubstantiation and the adoration of their way for God, and their sacrifice of the Mass for the sins of the quick and the dead. We should remember that the true body and blood of Christ are given to us with the bread and wine in a spiritual, mysterious manner, by the unsearchable operation of the Holy Spirit, uniting Christ and us together by faith, without any transubstantiation in the outward elements. 6. Prayer is to be made use of as a means of living by faith in Christ according to the new man, and it is the making our requests with supplication and thanksgiving. That it is to be used so, as an eminent means, appears because God requires it. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17, Romans 12 verse 12. It is our priestly work, 1 Peter 2 verse 5, compared with Psalm 141 verse 2, and the property of saints, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2, and God is a God-hearing prayer, Psalm 65 verse 2. God will be prayed to by his people for the benefit that he intends to bestow on them when once he has enabled them to pray, though at first he is found of them that seek him not, Ezekiel 36 verses 27 and 37, Philippians 1 verses 19 and 20, that he may prepare them for thanksgiving and make benefits double benefits to them, Psalm 66 verse 16, 18 and 19, and Psalm 50, verse 15, 2 Corinthians 1, verses 10 and 11. Though his will be not changed by this means, yet it is accomplished ordinarily, and his purpose is to accomplish it in this way, and therefore trusting assuredly should not make us neglect, but rather perform this duty. 2 Samuel 7, verse 27. Christ, the mediator of the new covenant, by whom justification and sanctification are promised, is also the mediator for the acceptance of our prayers. Hebrews 4, verses 15 and 16. The Spirit who sanctifies us, begets us in Christ, and shows the things of Christ to us, is a spirit of prayer. Zechariah 12, verse 10, Galatians 4, verse 6. He is as fire inflaming the soul, and making it mount upward in prayer to God. Prayerless people are dead to God. If they are children of Zion, yet they are but stillborn, dead children who cry not. Acts 9, verse 11. 
not written among the living in Jerusalem, heathens in nature, though Christians in name. Jeremiah 10, verse 25. It is a duty so great that it is put for all the service of God as a fundamental duty, which, if it be done, the rest will be done well, and not without it. And other ordinances of worship are helps to it. Isaiah 56, verse 7. It is the great means whereby faith exerts itself to perform its whole work, and pours itself forth in all holy desires and affections. Psalm 62, verse 8. And so yields a sweet savour as Mary's box of precious spikenard. Mark 14, verse 3, John 12, verse 3. And so the same promises are made to faith and prayer. Romans 10, verses 11, 12, and 13. It is our continual incense and sacrifice whereby we offer ourselves, our hearts, affections, and lives to God. Psalm 141, verse 2. We act all graces in it, and must act it this way, or else we are not likely to act it any other way. And as we act grace, so we obtain grace by it, and all holiness. Psalm 138, verse 3. Luke 11, verse 13, Hebrews 4, verse 16, Psalm 81, verse 10. Our riches come in by it. Israel prevails while Moses holds up his hands. Exodus 17, verse 11. By prayer, Hannah is strengthened against her sorrows. 1 Samuel 1, verses 15 and 18. Peace is continued. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. The disordered soul is set in order by it, as Hannah. 1 Samuel 1, verse 18. Psalm 32, verses 1 to 5. Incense was still burnt while the lamps were dressed. Exodus 30, verses 7 and 8. It is added to the spiritual armour, not as a particular piece of it, but as a means of putting on all, and making use of all aright, that we may stand in the evil day. Ephesians 6, verse 18. It is a means of transfiguring us into the likeness of Christ in holiness, and making our spiritual faces shine as Christ was transfigured bodily while he prayed. Luke 11, verse 29. And Moses' face shone while he talked with God. Exodus 34, verse 29. Hence the frequent use of this duty is commended to us. Ephesians 6, verse 18. Praying always. Panti caro. On all seasons and opportunities, and by the example of the saints, in public, with the congregation. Acts 2, verse 49, and chapter 10, verses 30 and 31. Solemn acts of prayer should be continued daily. Matthew 6, verse 11. Yea, several times in a day, as morning and evening sacrifice. Daniel 6, verse 10. Psalm 92, verse 2. Or thrice. Psalm 55, verse 17. Besides special occasions, James 5, verses 13 and 15, and brief ejaculations that hinder not other business, Psalm 129, verse 8, 2 Samuel 15, verse 31, Nehemiah 2, verse 4, prayers should be solemn in our closets, Matthew 6, verse 6, in families, Acts 10, verses 30 and 31, and as sacrifices were multiplied on the Sabbath days and days of atonement, and at other appointed seasons, Numbers 28, besides the continual burnt offering, so ought prayer also, in a word, a Christian ought to give up himself eminently to this duty. Psalm 109, verse 4, without limits. Psalm 119, verse 164. But the great work is to practice this duty rightly for holiness, only by faith in Christ. Here, we have need to say, Lord, teach us to pray. Luke 11, verse 1. And that not only as to the matter, but as to the manner, both which are taught by Christ in some measure, in that brief pattern of prayer which he taught his disciples. But, for the understanding of it, we must consult the whole word, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. And we have need of the Spirit of Christ to guide us in the duty, and therefore we are taught to pray by the Spirit, that is, the Holy Ghost, Jude, verse 20, Ephesians 2, verse 18. The Spirit of God alone guides and enables our souls to pray aright. And that you may do so, take these rules. First, you must pray with your hearts and spirits, Isaiah 26, verse 9. John 4, verse 24, where the Spirit of Christ and of prayer principally resides. Galatians 4, verse 6, Ephesians 1, verse 17, with understanding. 1 Corinthians 14, verses 15 and 16, for we are renewed in knowledge. Colossians 3, verse 10, 2 Peter 1, verse 3, so that praying in ignorance cannot sanctify. And it must be with sincere, hearty desire of the good things we ask in prayer, for God seeth the heart. Psalm 62, verse 8, prayer is chiefly a heart work. Psalm 27, verse 8. God hears the heart without the mouth, but never hears the mouth acceptably without the heart. 1 Samuel 1 verse 23. Your prayer is odious hypocrisy, mocking of God, and taking his name in vain, when you utter petitions for the coming of his kingdom, and the doing of his will, and yet hate godliness in your heart. This is lying to God and flattering with your lips, but no true prayer. And so God takes it. Psalm 78 verse 36. And you must have a sense of your wants and necessities, and that God only can supply them. 2 Chronicles 20 verse 12. And fervency in these desires is required, James 5, verse 16. And you must pray with attention, minding yourselves what you pray, or else you cannot expect that God should mind it, Daniel 9, verse 3. 
Watch unto it, 1 Peter 4, verse 7. Set yourselves to this duty intently. God sees where your heart is wandering when you pray without attention. Ezekiel 33, verse 31. When you say ever so many prayers without understanding, attention, affection, it is not praying at all, but sinning and playing the hypocrite, as papists mumble over their Latin prayer upon the beads by tail, prating like parrots what they cannot understand. And thus ignorant people say over their forms of English prayers, and account that they have well discharged their duty, though their heart prayed not at all, and was minding other things. This is a mere lip labor, and bodily exercise offering a dead carcass to God. Plain deceit. Malachi 1, verses 13 and 14. A form of godliness, but denying the power. 2 Timothy 3, verse 5. Whereby popery has cheated the world of the power of this, and all other holy ordinances. They say God minds and knows what they speak, and approves it. I answer, he sees them so as to judge them for hypocrites and profane persons, for not knowing, minding, and approving what they utter themselves. He has no pleasure in fools. Ecclesiastes 5, verses 1 and 4. They would not deal so with an earthly prince. Second, you must pray in the name of Christ, for the Spirit glorifies Christ. John 16, verse 14, and leadeth us to God through Christ. Ephesians 2, verse 18. As I have showed that walking in the Spirit and walking in Christ is all one, so is praying in the Spirit, and praying by and through Christ. And as we are to walk in the name of the Lord, and to do all things in His name, so are we to pray in His name, as is commanded, John 14, verses 13 and 14. It is not enough to conclude our prayers through Jesus Christ our Lord, but we must come for blessings in the garment of our elder brother, and must depend upon His worthiness and strength for all. So also we must praise God for all things in His name, as things received for His sake and by Him. Ephesians 5, verse 20. We must lay hold on his strength only, and plead nothing, and own nothing, for our acceptance but him. We must not arrogantly plead our own works like the proud Pharisee, Luke 17, verses 11 and 12, except only as fruits of grace and rewards of grace, Isaiah 38, verse 3. Praying in the Spirit is upon gospel, not legal principles, Romans 7, verse 6, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 3, with great humiliation and sense of unworthiness, Psalm 51, with a broken spirit, with despair of acceptance, otherwise than upon Christ's account, Daniel 9, verse 18. If your enlargements, strugglings, meltings have been ever so great, yet without this all is abominable. Third, hence you must not think to be accepted for the goodness of your prayers, nor trust on them as works of righteousness, which is making idols of your prayers and putting them into the place of Christ, quite contrary to praying in the name of Christ. Thus papists hope to be saved by saying their tale of prayers upon their bead rows, and they have indulgences granted upon their saying so many prayers, and of such a sort. Yea, some ignorant Protestants trust on their prayers as duties of righteousness, and they think one prayer more acceptable than another by reason of the holiness of the form, if it were made by holy men, especially the Lord's Prayer, which they use to help them in any exigence or danger, how little soever they can apply it to their own case, they make an idol of it. And some use it and other places of Scripture as a spell or charm to drive away the devil, and others think their prayers more acceptable in one place than another by reason of the holiness of the place, John 4, verses 21 and 24, 1 Timothy 2, verse 8. Others trust on their much speaking, Matthew 6, verse 7, which they call the enlarging of their hearts. They think to put off God and to stop the mouth of conscience with a few prayers, and so to live as they please. Fourth, pray to God as your Father, through Christ as your Saviour, in faith of remission of sins and of your acceptance with God, and the obtaining all other things which you desire of Him, as far as is necessary for your salvation, James 1, verses 5, 6, and 7, and chapter 5, verse 15, 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15, Mark 11, verse 24, Hebrews 10, verse 14, Psalm 62, verse 8, Psalm 86, verse 7, Psalm 55, verse 16, Psalm 57, verses 1 and 2, and Psalm 17, verse 6. This is praying in Christ, Ephesians 3, verse 12, and by the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Adoption, Romans 8, verse 15, Galatians 4, verse 6. Without this, prayer is lifeless and heartless, and but a dead carcass, Romans 10, verse 14, Psalm 77, verses 1 and 2. By this you may judge whether you have prayed rightly, more than by your melting affection or largeness in expression. Though you be not assured that you shall have everything that you ask, yet everything that is good. This faith you must endeavor to act, and therefore, if any sin lie on your conscience, you must strive first to get the pardon of it. Psalm 32, verses 1 and 5, and Psalm 51, verses 14 and 15 and purification from it by faith, that you may lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. 1 Timothy 2, verse 8. The sin of wrath is there especially mentioned because it is contrary to love and to forgiving others. Here lies the strength, life, and power of prayer. Set faith at work, and you will be powerful and prevail. Fifth, you must strive in prayer to stir up and act every other sanctifying grace, 
through faith moving you thereto. Thus your spikenards will yield their smell as godly sorrow. Psalm 38 verse 18, peace, Isaiah 27 verse 5, joy, Psalm 105 verse 3, hope, Psalm 71 verse 5, desire and love to God, Psalm 4 verse 6, and love to all his commands, Psalm 119 verses 4 and 5, and to all his people out of love to him, Psalm 122 verse 8. You must seek the Spirit himself in the first place, Luke 11 verse 14, Psalm 37 verse 5, and all spiritual things, Matthew 6 verse 33. Praying only for carnal things shows a carnal heart and leaves it carnal. Pray for faith, Mark 9 verse 24, and for such things as may serve most for the glorifying God, 1 Chronicles 1 verses 11 and 12, and for outward things you must act faith in submission to his will. And this prayer sets you in a holy frame, Matthew 26 verse 52, Luke 22 verses 42 and 43. Hallowing God's name must be your aim, Matthew 6 verse 9, not your lusts, James 4 verse 3. Sixth, strive to bring your soul into order by this duty, however disordered by guilt, anguish, inordinate cares or fears. Psalm 32 verses 1 and 5, Psalm 55 verses 16, 17, 20 and 21, and Psalm 69 verse 32, Philippians 4 verses 6 and 7, 1 Samuel 1. A watch must be often wound up. You must wrestle in prayer against your unbelief, doubts, fears, cares, reluctance of the flesh, to that which is good, against all evil lusts and desires, coldness of affection, impatience, trouble of spirit, everything that is contrary to a holy life, and the graces and holy desires to be acted for yourselves or others. Colossians 4 verse 12, Romans 15 verse 30. Stir up yourselves to the duty. Colossians 2 verses 1 and 2, Isaiah 64 verse 7. Though the flesh be cross and reluctant, we must not yield, but resist by the Spirit. Matthew 24 verse 14. And thus we shall find the Spirit helping our infirmities. Romans 7 verses 26 and 27. Though God seem to defer long, we must not faint or be discouraged. Luke 18 verses 1 and 7. The greater our agonies be, the more earnestly we are to pray. Psalm 22 verses 1 and 2. Luke 22 verse 42. This is proskarterin te prosige. To continue instant in prayer. Romans 12 verse 12. Ephesians 6 verse 18. Thus you will find prayer a great heart work, and not such a thing as may be done while you think on other things, and that it requires all the strength of faith and affection that you can possibly stir up. Thus you may get a holy frame. Seventh, you must make a good use of the whole matter and all the manner of prayer, as ordinary and extraordinary exigencies may require, to stir up grace in you by wrestling and to bring your hearts into a holy frame. As in confession, you must condemn yourself according to the flesh, but not as you are in Christ. You must not deny the grace that you have, as if you were only wicked hitherto, and are now to begin again which hinders praise for grace received in those that are already converted. In supplication you must endeavor to work up your heart to a godly sorrow, Psalm 38 verse 18, and a holy sense of your own sin and misery, and lay before you the aggravations thereof, Psalm 51 verse 3 and Psalm 102. Complaint and lamentation are one great part of prayer as the lamentations of Jeremiah, and you must add pleadings to your petitions with such arguments as may serve to strengthen faith and to stir up and kindle affection, Job 23 verse 4, which pleadings are taken from attributes, Numbers 14, verses 17 and 18, Promises, to Samuel 7, verses 27 and 28, etc., Genesis 32, verses 9 and 12, The equity of our cause, Psalm 17, verses 2 and 3, The advantage and benefit of the thing, to the glory of God and our comfort, Psalm 115, verses 1 and 2, and Psalm 79, verses 9, 10 and 13. Naked petitions are not sufficient when the soul finds a special cause of struggling and wrestling against corruptions and dangers, and for mercies, Christ's large prayer, John 17, is made up of pleading and very few petitions. And we must make use also of praise and thanksgiving to stir up peace, joy, love, etc. Genesis 33, verse 10, Psalm 18, verses 1, 2, and 3, Psalm 33, verse 1, Psalm 74, verse 14, and Psalm 104, verse 34. Especially be much in praising God for mercies of the new state in Christ, Ephesians 1, verse 3, and then you will the better give thanks for all benefits on this account. Ephesians 5 verse 20, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18, and plead those benefits to stir up to faith and duty. That brief ejaculation, God have mercy on me, is very good to be used, but it will not answer the end and use of the whole duty of prayer, as some lazy carnal people would have it, and so harden themselves in the neglect of the duty. Though the large improvement and use of all the matter of prayer at all times is not required, but only as ordinary and extraordinary occasions may require. Eighth. You must not confine and limit your prayers by any prescribed form. 
seeing it is impossible that any such forms should be contrived as should answer and fit all the various occasions and necessities of the soul at all times. I do not condemn all forms as that made by Christ the Lord's Prayer, though it were easy to show that Christ never intended it for a form of prayer, so as to bind any to the precise form of words, and it is plain the Spirit of God has expressed it in different words, Matthew 6, Luke 11, but better to pray by that form or other forms than not at all. It is uncharitable to take away crutches or wooden legs from lame people, yet none will look upon them but as dead helps. I say it is utterly unlawful to bind ourselves to any form, because none can answer the duty fitly and suitably to particular occasions. Ephesians 6 verse 18, Philippians 4 verse 6, John 15 verse 7, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18, Ephesians 5 verse 20. You must make the whole scripture your common prayer book, as the primitive church did, being the language of the Spirit reaching all occasions and conditions, and fittest to speak to God in. And if you use a form, you must follow it by the Spirit farther than the form goes, according as he shall guide you by the word, or else you'll quench the Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 19. If you know the principles of prayer and have a lively sense of your necessities and hearty desires for God's grace and mercies, you will be able to pray without forms, and your affections will bring forth words out of the fullness of your heart. And you need not be over-solicitous and timorous about words, for doubtless the Spirit, who is the help to us in speaking to men, will also much more help us to speak to God if we desire it. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 5, Mark 13 verse 11, Luke 12 verses 11 and 12. And God regards not eloquent words, nor artificial composition, neither need we regard it in private prayer. Isaiah 38 verse 14. And if you limit yourself to forms, he will thereby grow formal and limit the spirit. 7. Another means appointed of God is singing of psalms, that is, songs of any sacred subject composed to a tune, hymns or songs of praise and spiritual songs of any sublime spiritual matter, as Psalm 45 and the Song of Solomon. God has commanded it in the New Testament, Colossians 3 verse 16, Ephesians 5 verse 19, though now in these days many question whether it be an ordinance. And there were many commands for it under the Old Testament, Psalm 149 verses 1, 2, and 3, Psalm 96 verse 1, and Psalm 100. Moses and the children of Israel sang before David's time, Exodus 15. David composed psalms by the Spirit to be sung publicly, 2 Samuel 23 verses 1 and 2, yea, privately too, Psalm 40 verse 3, 2 Chronicles 29 verse 30, Psalm 105 verse 2. Other songs also were made upon several occasions and used, whether they were parts of the scripture or not, as Solomon made a thousand and five, 1 Kings 4 verse 32, and they made songs upon occasion which teach that it is lawful for us to do so if they be according to the word, Isaiah 38 verses 9 and 14. The matter of scripture may be sung, Psalm 119 verse 54. Christ and his disciples sung a hymn, Matthew 26 verse 30, supposed to be one of David's psalms, and they were written for our instruction as well as other parts of scripture, Romans 15 verse 4, etc., and so to be used now in singing. They speak of the things of the New Testament either figuratively or clearly, and we may understand them better now than the Jews could under the Old Testament. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 16, Galatians 2 verse 17. Christians heretofore practice this duty as well as Jews, Acts 16 verse 25. Hence their ante lucani humni. The hymns they sung before daylight were noted by Pliny, a heathen. These songs or hymns may be used at all times, especially for holy mirth or rejoicing, James 5 verse 13. But this text is not to be taken exclusively in singing any more than in prayer, Psalm 38 verse 18, 2 Chronicles 35 verse 25. But the right manner of this duty is chiefly to be noted. And here first, trust not upon the melody of the voice, as if that pleased God who delights only in the melody of the heart, Colossians 3 verse 16. Neither let the recreation of your senses be your end, which is but a carnal work. Non musica cordula sed cor, non clamans sed amans, psalit in aure dei. Not a musical string but the heart, not crying but loving, sounds in the ear of the Lord. This spiritual music was typified by musical instruments of old. Second, you must use it for the same end as meditation and prayer according to the nature of what is sung, that is, to quicken faith, 2 Chronicles 20, verses 21 and 22, Acts 16, verses 25 and 26, and joy and delight in the Lord, glorifying in Him. Psalm 104, verses 33, 34, Psalm 105, verse 3, Psalm 149, verses 1 and 2, and Psalm 33, verses 1, 2 and 3. You are never right until you can be heartily merry in the Lord, to act joy and mirth holily. James 5, verse 13, Ephesians 5, verse 19, 
and also to get more knowledge and instruction in heavenly mysteries, and in your duty, teaching and admonishing, Colossians 3 verse 16. Many psalms are masculs, as their title is, that is, psalms of instruction. Thus we are to sing such psalms as speak in the first person, though we cannot apply them to ourselves as words uttered by ourselves concerning ourselves, and in this we do not lie. David speaks of Christ as of himself, as a pattern of affliction and virtue to instruct others, and we sing such psalms not as our words, but words for our instruction. And therein we do not lie any more than the Levites, the sons of Korah, or Jeduthun, or other musicians bound to sing them, Psalm 5, Psalm 39, and Psalm 42. Though it be good to personate all the good that we can, yet we have so much liberty in the use of psalms, that though we cannot apply all to ourselves as speaking and thinking the same, yet we shall answer the end if we sing for our instruction, as in Psalm 6, Psalm 26, Psalm 46, Psalm 51, and Psalm 131. And psalms have a peculiar fitness for teaching and instructing, because the pleasantness of meter said or sung is very helpful to the memory. See Deuteronomy 31, verses 19 and 21. And there is a variety of curious artifice in the placing of words in the psalms upon this account. And there are some alphabetical psalms, as Psalm 25, Psalm 34, Psalm 37, Psalm 111, Psalm 112, Psalm 119, and Psalm 145. And by the melody of the psalm, the instruction comes in with delight, as a physical dose sugared. And sorrow is naturally allayed to fit the mind for spiritual joy, and distempered passions appeased. 2 Kings 3 verse 15, 1 Samuel 16 verses 14, 15, and 16. So Orpheus, Amphion, and others were famous for civilizing rude and barbarous people by music. 8. Fasting is also an ordinance of God to be used for the same purpose and end, and is commended to us under the New Testament. Matthew 9 verse 15, and chapter 17 verse 21, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 5. And we have examples of it, Acts 13 verses 2 and 3, and chapter 14 verse 23. Under the Old Testament there were frequent commands for it and examples, chiefly upon occasion of extraordinary afflictions, 1 Samuel 7 verse 6, Nehemiah 9 verse 1, Daniel 9 verse 3, and chapter 10 verses 2 and 3, 2 Samuel 12 verse 16, Psalm 35 verse 13, 2 Samuel 3 verse 31, Joel 2 verse 13, beside the anniversary great day of atonement, Leviticus 16 verses 29 and 31, when everyone was to fast on pain of cutting off. There is a prophecy of the same for the times of the New Testament, Zechariah 12 verse 12. It was used most on extraordinary occasions, and it is a help to holiness by faith, because it is a meet help for extraordinary prayer and humiliation, Joel 1 verse 14 and chapter 2 verse 12. But the great matter is to use it rightly as follows. First, trust not in it as meriting or satisfying as papists and Pharisees do, Luke 17 verse 11, putting it in the place of Christ, or as a means of itself conferring grace and mortifying lusts as many do, who may sooner kill their bodies than their lusts, or as any purifying rite, yea, or in, or for itself acceptable to God. 1 Timothy 6 verse 8, Hebrews 12 verse 9, Colossians 2 verses 16, 17, 20, and 23. Imagine not that prayer is not acceptable without it, for this is against faith. Fasts, as well as feasts, are no substantial parts of worship, because not spiritual but bodily, though under the Old Testament they were parts as instituted rites, figurative and teaching. But that use is now ceased, as that on the Day of Atonement, and so many significative rites are joined to fasting as sackcloth, ashes, rending garments, pouring out water, lying on the earth. The kingdom of God consists not in these things, Romans 14 verse 17. The soul is hardened by trusting in them, Isaiah 58 verses 3 and 6, Zechariah 7 verses 5, 6 and 10. Second, use it as a help to extraordinary prayer and humiliation, that the mind may not be unsuited for it by eating, drinking, or bodily pleasures. Joel 2 verse 13, Isaiah 22 verses 12 and 13, Zechariah 12 verses 10 to 14. It is good only as a help to the soul, removing impediments. The best fast is when the mind is taken off from delights, as in John the Baptist's case, Matthew 3 verse 4, when heaven and godly sorrow takes off the soul, Zechariah 12 verses 10 to 14. Third, use it in such a measure as may be proper for its end, without which it is worth nothing. If abstinence divert your mind by reason of a gnawing appetite, then you had better eat sparingly, as Daniel in his great fast, chapter 10 verses 2 and 3. Some have not enough of spiritual mindedness to give themselves up to fasting and prayer without great distraction, and such had better eat than go beyond their strength in a thing not absolutely necessary, which produces only a slavish act, as in the case of virginity, 1 Corinthians 7 verses 7, 8, 9, 34, 35, and 36. 
Christ would not have his weak disciples necessitated to the duty, Matthew 9, verses 14 and 15. In the meantime, such should strive to be sensible of the weakness and carnality that hinders their use of this excellent help. 9. You may expect here something to be said of vows, but I shall only say this of them, think not to bring yourselves to good by vows and promises, as if the strength of your own law could do it, when the strength of God's law does it not. We bring children to make promises of amendment, but we know how well they keep them. The devil will urge you to vow, and then to break, that he may perplex your conscience the more. 10. Another great means is fellowship and communion with the saints. Acts 2 verse 42. First, this means must be used diligently. Whoever God saves should be added to some visible church, and come into the communion of other saints, and if they have no opportunity for it, their heart should be bent towards it. Sometimes the church is in the wilderness, and hindered from visible communion and ordinances, but they who believe in Christ are always willing and desirous so to add and join themselves. Acts 2 verses 41, 44, and 47. And they continued steadfastly in fellowship. 1 John 2 verse 19. And God binds his people to leave the fellowship and society of the wicked as much as may be. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 17. And so far as we are necessitated to keep company with them, we ought to show charity to their souls and bodies. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 9. This communion with saints is to be exercised in private converse. Psalm 101 verses 4, 5, 6, and 7. And in public assemblies, Hebrews 10 verse 25, Zechariah 14 verses 16 and 17. And doubtless it ought to be used for the attainment of holiness, as may be proved. First, in general, because God communicates all salvation to a people ordinarily, by or in a church, either by taking them into fellowship or holding forth the light of truth by his churches to the world. A church is the temple of God, where God dwells, 1 Timothy 3 verse 15. He has placed his name and salvation there, as in Jerusalem of old, Joel 2 verse 32, 2 Chronicles 6 verses 5 and 6. He has given to his churches those offices and ordinances whereby he converts others, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 28. His springs are there, Psalm 87 verse 7. He makes the several members of a church instruments for the conveyance of his grace and fullness from one to another, as the members of a natural body convey to each other the fullness of the head, Ephesians 4 verse 16. All the newborn are brought forth and nourished by the church, Isaiah 66 verses 8 and 11, chapter 49 verse 20 and chapter 60 verse 4, and therefore all who would be saved should join to a church. They shall prosper that love the church so as to stand in its gates and unite as members, brethren, and companions. Psalm 122 verses 2, 4, and 6. And wrath is denounced against those who are not members of it, at least of the mystical body. They cannot have God for their father, who have not the church for their mother. Song of Songs, chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. This makes those who desire fellowship with God to take hold of the skirts of his people. Zechariah 8 verse 23. Secondly, in particular, fellowship with the saints conduces to holiness in many ways. 1. By manifold helps to holiness which are received thereby, as first the word and sacraments, Acts 2 verse 42, Isaiah 2 verse 3, Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20, and all the ministerial office and labor in watching over souls, Hebrews 13 verse 17, 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 12 and 13, Isaiah 25 verse 6. None of these helps can be enjoyed without fellowship of saints with each other. And were believers obliged to stand singly by themselves and not maintain fellowship with each other, for mutual assistance and common good, none of these things could have continued, neither could any believer have been extant at this day in an ordinary way, but even the very name of believers had been abolished. Second, mutual prayer, which is the more forcible when all pray together. Matthew 18 verses 19 and 20, 2 Corinthians 1 verses 10 and 11, James 5 verse 16, Romans 15 verse 30. Third, Mutual admonition, instruction, consolation, to help each other when they are ready to fall, and to promote the good work in each other, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 14, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, Proverbs 13 verse 20, Woe to him that is alone when he falleth, see Ecclesiastes 4 verses 9 to 12. In church fellowship there are many helpers, many to watch. Soldiers have their security in being in company, and the church is compared to an army with banners, Song of Songs, chapter 6 verses 4 and 10. So, for quickening affections, iron sharpeneth iron, Proverbs 22, verse 17. Likewise, the counsel of a friend, like ointment and perfume, rejoiceth the heart, Proverbs 27, verse 9. Yea, the wounds and reproofs of the righteous are as precious balm, Psalm 141, verse 5. Fourth, external supports which mitigate afflictions and are to be communicated mutually, Ephesians 4, verse 28, 1 Peter 4, verses 9 and 10. The affliction is increased when none careth for our souls, Psalm 142, verse 4. Fifth, 
excommunication when offences are exceeding heinous or men continue obstinate in sin this ordinance is appointed for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved one corinthians five verse five better and more hopeful it is to be cast out by the church for a person's amendment than to be wholly without the church at all times and better to be a lost sheep than a goat or swine for excommunication cuts off actual communion only until repentance be evident and does not absolutely abolish the title and relation of a brother and church member though it judges one to be an unnatural brother and a pernicious member at present not fit for acts of communion besides admonition is still to be afforded to thessalonians three verse fifteen and any means are to be used that may serve to cure and restore him the church reaches forth a hand to help such a person though it do not join hands in fellowship with him or it communicates to him not with him yet if he have not so much grace as to repent it were better he had never known the way of righteousness two peter two verse twenty one sixth the lively examples of saints are before our eyes in church fellowship to teach and encourage philippians three verse seventeen and chapter four verse nine two timothy three verses ten and eleven two corinthians nine verse two thirdly by those holy duties that are required and which appertain to this fellowship and communion all acts that belong to this fellowship are holy as hearing receiving the sacrament prayer mutual admonitions etc i shall consider some such holy acts whereby we are rather doers than receivers and which we perform towards others as first godly discourse teaching admonishing comforting others in christ which we cannot so perform in others as towards those with whom we have strict fellowship in christ others like swine trample those jewels underfoot and saints therefore are forced to refrain from godly discourse in their company amos five verses ten and thirteen and chapter six verse ten but holy discourse is most acceptable to the saints and to be practised with them malachi three verse sixteen and is greatly to the advantage of holiness proverbs eleven verse twenty five second in helping succouring and conversing with christ in his members we do good to christ in his members in church fellowship and we ourselves as members of christ act as well from christ as towards christ whereas if we do good to others without we do good only for christ's sake and not to christ matthew twenty five verses thirty five to forty nine psalm sixteen verses two and three we have advantage in general to do all duties that belong to us as members of christ to fellow members which we cannot do if separate from them as a natural member cannot perform its office to other members if separate from them secondly the means to be used rightly for attaining holiness only in christ one one rule is do not trust on church membership or on churches as if this or that relation in fellowship commended you to god of itself whereas church communion is but a help to fellowship with christ and walking in the duties of that fellowship the israelites stumbled on christ by trusting on their carnal privileges and set them in opposition to christ whereas they should only have made them subservient to christ confidence in them should have been abandoned as paul's example teaches philippians three verses three four and five etc we must not glory in paul apollos cephas but in christ else we glory in the flesh and in men one corinthians one verses twelve thirteen and chapter three verse twenty one trusting on church privileges is an inlet to formality and licentiousness jeremiah seven verses four eight nine and ten and thence the corruption of churches isaiah one verse ten two timothy two verse twenty two follow no church any farther than you may follow it in the way of christ and keep fellowship with it only on account of christ because it follows christ and has fellowship with christ one john one verse three zechariah eight verse twenty three if a church revolt from christ we must not follow it how ancient soever it may be as the israelitish church was not to be followed when it persecuted christ and his apostles and many by adhering to that church fell from christ philippians three verse six acts six verse thirteen and fourteen and chapter twenty one verse twenty eight we are indeed to hear the church but not every one that calls itself so and none any farther than it speaks as a true church according to the voice of the shepherd john ten verse twenty seven we must subject ourselves to ministers of christ and stewards of his mysteries one corinthians four verse one but must give up ourselves first to christ absolutely and to the church according to the will of christ two corinthians eight verse five our fear must not be taught by the precepts of men matthew fifteen the doctrines of any body of men are to be tried by scripture whatever authority they pretend to acts seventeen verse eleven an unlimited following of church guides brought the church into babylon and into all manner of spiritual whoredoms and abominations you are not baptized into the name of the church but into the name of christ one corinthians one verse thirteen three do not think that you must attain this or that degree of grace before you join yourself in full communion with a church of christ in all ordinances but when you have given up yourself to christ and learnt the duty of communion give up yourself unto a church of christ though you find much weakness and inability for church ordinances are special communion serve to strengthen you and how can you get heat being alone the disciples as soon as converted embraced all fellowship acts two verse forty two and churches 
that they may forward holiness in themselves and others, must be willing to receive Christ's weak ones, and to feed his lambs, as well as better grown sheep, and bear them on their sides. Isaiah 66 verse 12. How else shall Christ's weak ones grow strong by that nourishment that other parts supply? They are very unreasonable who expect Christians should grow out of church fellowship to as high a degree of grace as those that are in those pastures of tender grass, and are unwilling to receive any that they are likely to have occasion to bear with, whereas bearing and long-suffering are great duties of church fellowship. Ephesians 4 verses 2 and 3, Romans 14 verse 1. The weakest have the most need to be strengthened by church communion, and we are bound to receive them as Christ has received us. Romans 15 verse 7. We do not reject or separate the weaker parts of the body, 1 Corinthians 12 verses 23 and 24, but put more honor and comeliness on them. Admission into the churches in the apostolic times was gained upon profession with a show of seriousness, though tears got in among the wheat, and many scandals arose to the reproach of the ways of Christ, and the greatest strictness will not keep out all hypocrites, yet the best care must be taken so far as not to hinder any that have the least truth of grace. 4. Keep communion with the church for the sake of communion with Christ. 1 John 1 verse 3, Zechariah 8 verse 23. Therefore you must keep communion in Christ's pure ways only, and in them seek Christ by faith, that in the enjoyment of those advantages you may receive and act the godliness and holiness before mentioned, and aim at spiritual nourishing and growth in grace. Choose therefore fellowship with the most spiritual churches. Judge of churches and men according to the rule of the new creature, 2 Corinthians 5 verses 16 and 17, and try them, Revelation 2 verse 2 and chapter 3 verse 9. Otherwise a church may corrupt you. See that thy communion answer its end, tend to thy edification, not to destruction, which you ought to take all the advantages of, not only in the church where you are a member, but by communion with other churches, as occasionally providence casts you among them, for your communion with a particular church obliges to communion with all churches of Christ in his ways, as you are called thereto, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 27. And it is an abuse to say we are members of a church in London, and therefore refuse fellowship with a church in the country, seeing if we are members of Christ we are members of one another, whether single persons or churches and endeavour to join in fellowship with the godly in the place where you live, that you may have the more frequent and constant communion. Onesimus, though converted at Rome, must be one of the church of the Colossians because he lived there. Colossians 4 verse 9 compared with Philemon verse 10. The union of the saints together in distinct societies, according to the places where they lived, was the apostolic practice and cannot be violated without sin. Such can best watch over one another, admonish, comfort, and edify each other, which is the benefit of communion and they indeed destroy communion who seek a communion where they cannot have this benefit. I only add to this head that church fellowship without practicing the ways of Christ is but a conspiracy to take his name in vain, and a counterfeit church fellowship of hypocrites. It is impudence for such to invite others to their communion, tyranny to compel them. Every Christian is bound to seek a better church fellowship by reformation, and those who do so are the best sons of Christ's church, who inquire, is this the way to enjoy Christ? Church communion being appointed to enjoy Christ therein. 5. Especially leave not the church in persecution when you need its help most, and are then most tried whether you will cleave to it. This is a sign of apostasy. Hebrews 10 verses 25 and 26, Matthew 24 verses 9, 10, 12, 13, and 14. We should cleave to one another as one flesh, even to prisons and death, or else we deny Christ in his members. Matthew 25 verse 13. Direction 14. That you may seek holiness and righteousness only by believing in Christ and walking in Him by faith according to the former directions, take encouragement from the great advantages of this way and the excellent properties of it. Explication This direction may serve as an epilogue or conclusion by stirring us up to a lively and cheerful embracing those gospel rules before mentioned by several weighty motives. Many are kept from seeking godliness because they know not the way to it, or the way that they think of seems uncouth, unpleasant, disadvantageous, and full of discouragement like the way through the wilderness to Canaan, which wearied the Israelites and occasioned their many murmurings, Numbers 21 verse 4. But this is a way so good and excellent that those who have the true knowledge of it and desire heartily to be godly cannot dislike it. I shall show the excellency of it in several particulars, but you should first call to mind what is the way I have taught viz. union and fellowship with Christ and by faith in Christ as discovered in the gospel, not by the law, or in a natural condition, or by thinking to get it before we come to Christ, to procure Christ by it, which is striving against the stream, but that we must first apply Christ and his salvation to ourselves, for our comfort, and that by confident faith, and then walk by that faith according to the new man in Christ, and not as in a natural condition, and use all means of holiness rightly for this end. Now that this is an excellent, advantageous way appears by the following desirable properties of it. 
First, it has this property, that it tends to the abasement of all flesh, and the exaltation of God only in his grace and power through Christ. And so it is agreeable to God's design in all his works, and the end that he aims at. Romans 11, verse 6, Isaiah 2, verse 17, Ezekiel 36, verses 21, 22, 23, 31, and 32, Psalm 145, verse 4, and a fit means for attaining the end that we ought to aim at in the first place, which is the hallowing, sanctifying, and glorifying God's name in all things, and is the first and chief petition, Matthew 6, verse 9, and is the end of all our acting, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, and was the end of giving the law, Romans 3, verses 19 and 20. God made all things for Christ, and would have him have the preeminence in all, Colossians 1, verses 17 and 18, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, John 14, verse 13. And this property of it is a great argument to prove that it is the way of God, and has the character of his image stamped upon it. We may say that it is like him, and a way according to his heart, as Christ proves his doctrine to be of God by this argument, John 7, verse 18. And Paul proves the doctrine of justification and of sanctification and salvation by grace through faith to be of God because it excludes all boastings of the creature. Romans 3, verses 27 and 28. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 29, 30 and 31. Ephesians 3, verses 8 and 9. This property appears evidently in the mystery of sanctification by Christ in us through faith. For one, it shows that we can do nothing by our natural will or any power of the flesh, and that God will not enable us to do anything that way. Romans 7, verse 18, however nature may be stirred up by the law or natural helps. Galatians 3, verse 21. And so it serves to work self-loathing and abasement, and to make us look upon nature as desperately wicked and past cure, and not to be reformed, but put off by putting on Christ. It remains wicked, and only wicked after we have put on Christ. 2. It shows that all our good works and living to God are not by our own power and strength at all, but by the power of Christ living in us by faith, and that God enables us to act not merely according to our natural power, as he enables carnal men and all other creatures, but above our own power by Christ united to us and in us through the Spirit. All men live, move, and have their being in him, and by his universal support and maintenance of nature, in its being and activity they act, Hebrews 1 verse 3, so that the glory of their actings as creatures belongs to God. But God acts more immediately in his people, who are one flesh and one spirit with Christ, and who act not by their own power, but by the power of the Spirit of Christ in them, as closely united to them, and being the living temples of his Spirit, so that Christ is the immediate principal agent of all their good works, and they are Christ's works properly, who works all our works in us and for us, and yet they are the works of believers by fellowship with Christ, by whose light and power the faculties of the saints act and are acted, Galatians 2 verse 20, Ephesians 3 verses 16 and 17, Colossians 1 verse 1 so that we are to ascribe all our works to God in Christ, and thank Him for them as free gifts, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10, Philippians 1 verse 11. God enables us to act, not by ourselves, as He does others, but by Himself. The wicked are supported in acting only according to their own nature, so they act wickedly. Thus all are said to live, move, and have their being in God, Acts 17 verse 27. But God enables us to conquer sin, not by ourselves, but by Himself, Hosea 1 verse 7, and the glory of enabling us not only belongs to him, which the Pharisee could not but ascribe to him, Luke 18 verse 11, but also to the glory of doing all in us. And yet, we work as one with Christ, even as he works as one with the Father, by the Father working in him. We live as branches by the juice of the vine, act as members by the animal spirits of the head, and bring forth fruit by marriage to him as our husband, and work in the strength of him as the living bread that we feed on. He is all in the new man, Colossians 3 verse 11, and all the promises are made good in him, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 20. Secondly, it has this property that it consists well with other doctrines of the gospel, which contrary errors do not, and hence this is the way to confirm us in many other points of the gospel, and therefore appears to be true by its harmony with other truths, and fit linking with them in the same golden chain of the mystery of godliness, and evidences them to be true by their harmony with it. I have showed that men's mistaking the true way of sanctification is the cause of perverting the scriptures in other points of faith, and of declining from the truth to popish, Socinian, and Arminian tenets, because men cannot seriously take that for truth which they judge not to be according to godliness. But this way of holiness will evidence that these gospel doctrines which they refuse are according to godliness, and that those tenets which a blind zeal for holiness moves them to embrace are indeed contrary to holiness. However, Satan appears to their natural understandings as an angel of light in such tenets. Whatever men say, it is certain that legalists are indeed the antinomians. I shall instance in some truths confirmed by it.
1. The doctrine of original sin is not only the guilt of Adam's sin and a corrupt nature, but utter impotency to do spiritual good and proneness to sin, which is death to God, and all people according to nature. Psalm 51 verse 5, Romans 5 verse 12. There is an utter inability to keep the law truly in any point. Many deny this doctrine because they think that if people believe this, they will excuse their sins by it, and be apt to despair of all striving to do good works, and leave off all endeavors and grow licentious, and they think it will be more conducive to godliness to hold and teach, either that there is no original sin or corruption derived from Adam, or at least it is done away either in the world, by universal redemption, or in the church by baptism, and that there is free will restored whereby people are able to incline themselves to do good, that men may be more encouraged to set up good works, and their neglect be made inexcusable. All this is indeed forcible against seeking and endeavouring for holiness by the free will and power of nature, which is the way of endeavouring which I directed you to avoid, and if there were no new way to holiness since the fall, original sin might make us despair. But there is a new birth, a new heart, a new creature, and therefore we have directed you to the seeking of holiness by the Spirit of Christ, and freely willing good by a spiritual power, as new creatures, partakers of a divine nature in Christ. Yea, it is necessary to know the first Adam that we may know the second, Romans 5 verse 12, to believe the full and original sin that we may be stirred up to fly to Christ by faith, for holiness by free gift, knowing that we cannot attain it by our own power and free will, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9, Matthew 9 verses 12 and 13, Romans 7 verses 24 and 25, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 3, Ephesians 5 verse 14. There were no need of a new man or a new creation if the old were not without life and strength. John 3 verses 5 and 6, Ephesians 2 verse 8. But original deadness cannot hinder God's working faith and hungerings and thirstings after Christ by the Spirit through the Gospel in those that God chooses to walk holily and blamelessly before Him in love. 1 Thessalonians 1 verses 4 and 5, Acts 26 verse 18. And so we are made alive in a new head and become branches of another vine, living to God by the Spirit, not by nature. 2. It confirms us in the doctrine of predestination, which many deny, because they say it takes men off from endeavour as fruitless, by telling them that all events are predetermined. This argument would be more forcible against endeavours by the power of our own free will, but not at all against endeavours for holiness by the operation of God, giving us faith and all holiness by His own Spirit, working in us through Christ. We are to trust on Christ for the grace of the elect, and God's good will towards men, Matthew 3 verse 17, Luke 2 verse 14, Psalm 106, verses 4 and 5. Election by grace destroys seeking by works, but not by grace. Romans 11, verses 5 and 6. And we are here taught to seek for salvation only in the way of the elect, and we may conclude that holiness is to be had by God's will, and not by our own. And it may move us to desire holiness by the will of God. Romans 9, verse 16. Psalm 110, verse 3. And seeing it appears by this doctrine of sanctification through Christ, that we are God's workmanship, as to all the good wrought in us, Philippians 2 verse 12 and 13, Ephesians 2 verse 10, we may well admit that he has appointed his pleasure from eternity without infringing the natural liberty of our corrupt wills, which reaches not unto good works, Acts 15 verse 18 compared with verse 36. Man's natural free will may well consist with God's decree as in paradise, decretum erratix contingentiae. 3. It confirms us in the true doctrine of justification and reconciliation with God by faith, relying on the merits of Christ's blood, without any works of our own, and without considering faith as a work to procure favour by the righteousness of the act, but only as a hand to receive the gift, or as the very eating and drinking of Christ actually, rather than any kind of condition entitling us to him as our food. This great doctrine of the gospel many hate, as breaking the strongest bonds of holiness, and opening a way to all licentiousness, for they reckon that the conditionality of works to attain God's favour, and to avoid his wrath, and the necessity of them to salvation, are the most necessary and effectual impulses to all holiness, and they account that the other doctrine opens the floodgates to licentiousness. And truly this consideration would be of some weight if people were to be brought to holiness by moral persuasion, and their natural endeavours stood up by the terms of the law, and by slavish fears and mercenary hopes, for the force of these motives would be altogether innovated by the doctrine of justification by free grace. But I have already showed that man, being a guilty, dead creature, cannot be brought to serve God out of love by the force of any of these motives, and that we are not sanctified by any of our own endeavours to work holiness in ourselves, but rather by faith in Christ's death and resurrection, even the same whereby we are justified, and that the urging of the law stirs up sin, and that freedom from it is necessary to all holiness, as the Apostle teaches, Romans 6 verses 11 and 14, and chapter 7 verses 4 and 5, 
and this way of sanctification confirms the doctrine of justification by faith, as the Apostle informs us, Romans 8 verse 1. For if we are sanctified and so restored to the image of God and life by the Spirit through faith, it is evident that God has taken us into his favor and pardoned our sins by the same faith without the law, or else we should not thereby have the fruits and effects of his favor to our eternal salvation, Romans 8 verse 2. Yea, his justice would not admit his giving life without works, if we were not made righteous in Christ by the same faith. And we cannot trust to have holiness freely given us by Christ upon any rational ground, except we can also trust on the same Christ for free reconciliation and forgiveness of our sins for our justification. Neither can guilty, cursed creatures, who cannot work by reason of their deadness under the curse, be brought to a rational love of God, except they apprehend his loving them first freely without works. 1 John 4 verse 19 the great objection and reason of so many controversies and books written about it is because they think that men will trust to be saved however they live, but sanctification is an effect of justification and flows from the same grace, and we trust for them both by the same faith and for the latter, in order to the former. And such a faith, be it ever so confident, tends not to licentiousness but to holiness, and we grant that justification by grace destroys holiness by legal endeavors, but not by grace, so that there is no need to live a papist and die an antinomian. 4. It confirms us in the doctrine of real union with Christ, so plentifully held forth in Scripture, which doctrine some account a vain notion and cannot endure it, because they think it works not holiness but presumption. Whereas I have showed that it is absolutely necessary for the enjoyment of spiritual life and holiness which is treasured up in Christ, and that so inseparably that we cannot have it without a real union with him. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, 1 John 5 verse 12, John 6 verse 53, and chapter 15 verse 15, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30, Colossians 3 verse 11. The members and branches cannot live without union with the vine and head, nor the stones be part of the living temple, except they be really joined mediately or immediately to the cornerstone. 5. It confirms us in the doctrine of certain final perseverance of the saints. John 3 verse 36, chapter 6 verse 37, and chapter 5 verse 24. 1 John 3 verse 9, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 24, Philippians 1 verse 6, John 10 verses 23 and 29, and chapter 4 verse 14. They think this doctrine makes people careless of good works. I answer, it makes people careless of seeking them by their own natural strength and in a way of slavish fear. But careful and courageous in trusting on the grace of God for them when they are brought, by regeneration, heartily to desire them. Romans 6 verse 14, Numbers 13 verse 30, setting about the doing of them in that grace. 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 8 and 11. And I have showed that all fears of damnation will never bring persons to work from the impulse of love and that nothing will do it but a comfortable doctrine. Thirdly, it has this excellent property, that it is the never-failing, effectually powerful, alone sufficient and sure way to attain to true holiness. They that have the truth in them find it, and the truly humbled find it. People strive in vain when they seek it any other way, therefore venture with the lepers, else you die. 2 Kings 7, Isaiah 55, verses 2, 3, and 7. All other ways either stir up sin or increase despair in you, as seeking holiness by the law and working under the curse does, and produces but slavish, hypocritical obedience at best, and restrains sin only instead of mortifying it. Galatians 4 verse 25. The Jews sought another way and could not attain it. Romans 9. And all who seek it another way shall lie down in sorrow. Isaiah 51 verse 11. And that first, because as we are under the law, in our natural state we are dead and children of wrath. Ephesians 2 verses 1 and 3. And the law curses us instead of helping us. Galatians 3 verse 10, and gives no life by its obligation. Galatians 3 verse 21, and we cannot work holiness in ourselves. Romans 5 verse 6. So that an humbled person finds it in vain to seek holiness by the law or by his own strength. For the law is weak through our flesh. Seeking a pure life without a pure nature is building without a foundation. And there is no seeking a new nature from the law, for it bids us make brick without straw, and saith to the cripple, walk without giving any strength. Second, in this way only God is reconciled to us even in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19, Ephesians 1 verse 7, and so he loves us and is a fit object of our love, 1 John 4 verse 19, and so in this way only we have a new and divine nature by the Spirit of Christ in us, effectually carrying us forth to holiness with life and love, Romans 8 verse 5, Galatians 5 verse 17, 2 Peter 1 verses 3 and 4, and have new hearts according to the law, so that we serve God heartily according to the new nature, and cannot but serve him, 1 John 3 verse 9. So that here is a sure foundation for godliness, and love to God with all our heart, might, and soul, and sin is not only restrained but mortified, and not only the outside made clean but the inside, and the image of God renewed and holy actings surely follow. 
We sin not according to the old nature, though we are not perfect in degree because of the old nature remaining in us. Fourthly, it is a most pleasant way to those that are in it, Proverbs 3, verse 17, and that in several respects. One, it is a most plain way, easy to be found, to one who sees his own deadness under the law, and is so renewed in the spirit of his mind as to know and be persuaded of the truth of the gospel. Though such may be troubled with many legal thoughts and workings, yet when they seriously consider things, the way is so plain that they think it folly and madness to go another way, so that the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. Isaiah 35, verse 8, Proverbs 8, verse 9. The enlightened soul cannot think of another way when truly humbled, Proverbs 1, verse 8, and when we are in Christ we have his Spirit to be our guide in this way, 1 John 2, verse 27, John 16, verse 13, so that we need not be filled with such distracting thoughts about knowledge of our way, as legal spirits are about thousands of cases of conscience, which so multiply upon them that they despair of finding out the way of religion by reason of such various doubts and manifold intricacies. Here we may be sure that God will so far teach us our duties as that we shall not be misled with error, so as to continue in it to destruction. Psalm 25, verses 8, 9, and 14. What a trouble is it to a traveller to be doubtful of his way and without a guide when his business is of great importance upon life and death. It is even a heart-breaking. But those who are in this way may be sure that, though they sometimes err, yet they shall not err destructively, but shall discern their way again. Galatians 6, verses 7 and 10. 2. It is easy to those who walk in it by the Spirit, though it be difficult to get into it, by reason of the opposition of the flesh or devil, scaring us or seducing us from it. Here you have holiness as a free gift received by faith, an act of the mind and soul. Whosoever will may come, take it, and drink freely, and nothing is required but a willing mind. John 7, verse 38, Isaiah 55, verse 1, Revelation 22, verse 17. But the law is an intolerable burden. Matthew 23, verse 5, Acts 15, verse 10. If duty be laid on us by its terms, we are not left in this way to conquer lusts by our endeavours, which is a hopeless work. But what his duty is given, and the law, is turned into promises. Hebrews 8, Ezekiel 31, verses 25 and 26, Jeremiah 31, verse 33, and chapter 32, verse 40. We have all now in Christ. Colossians 3, verse 11, and chapter 2, verses 9, 10, 15, and 17. This is a Catholic medicine instead of a thousand. How pleasant would this free gift, holiness, be to us if we knew our own wants, inabilities, and sinfulness. How ready are some to toil continually and macerate their bodies in a melancholy legal way to get holiness, rather than perish forever. And therefore how ready should we be when it is only take and have, believe and be sanctified and saved. 2 Kings 7 verse 13. Christ's burden is light by his spirits bearing it. Matthew 11 verse 30. No weariness but renewing of strength. Isaiah 40 verse 31. 3. It is a way of peace. Proverbs 3 verse 17. Free from the fears and terrors of conscience which those unavoidably meet with who seek salvation by works, for the law worketh wrath. Romans 4, verse 15. It is not the way of Mount Sinai, but of Jerusalem. Hebrews 12, verses 18 and 22. The doubts of salvation that people meet with arise from putting some condition of works between Christ and themselves. It has appeared in this discourse, but our walking in this way is by faith which rejects such fears and doubts. John 14, verse 1, Mark 5, verse 36, Hebrews 10, verses 19 and 22. It is free from fears of Satan or any evil, Romans 8, verses 31 and 32, and free from slavish fears of perishing by our sins, 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2, Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Faith laying hold on infinite grace, mercy, and power to secure us. The Lord is the keeper and shade on the right hand, Psalm 121, verse 5. Free and powerful grace answers all objections. 4. It is a way that is paved with love like Solomon's chariot, Song of Songs, chapter 3, verse 10. We are to set God's loving kindness and all the gift of his love still before our eyes. Psalm 26, verse 2, Christ's death, resurrection, intercession before our eyes, which excite peace, joy, hope, love. Romans 15, verse 15, Isaiah 35, verse 10. You must believe for your justification, adoption, the gift of the Spirit, and a future inheritance, your death and resurrection with Christ. In believing for these things, your whole way is adorned with flowers, and has these fruits growing on each side, so that it is through the Garden of Eden rather than the wilderness of Sinai, Acts 9 verse 31. It is the office of the Spirit or guide to be our comforter, and not a spirit of bondage, Romans 8 verse 15. Peace and joy are great duties in this way, Philippians 4 verses 4, 5, and 6. God does not drive us on with whips and terrors, and by the rod of the schoolmaster, the law, but leads us and wins us to walk in his ways by allurements, 
Song of Songs, chapter 1, verse 3, Hosea 11, verses 3 and 4, see such allurements, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 15, and chapter 7, verse 1, Romans 12, verse 1. 5. Our very moving, acting, walking in this way is a pleasure and delight. Every good work is done with pleasure. The very labor of the way is pleasant. Carnal men with duties were not necessary, and they are burdensome to them. But they are pleasant to us because we do not gain holiness by our own carnal wrestling with our lusts and crossing them out of our carnal fear with regret and grief and setting conscience and the law against them to hinder their actings. But we act naturally according to the new nature and perform our new spiritual desires by walking in the ways of God through Christ. And our lusts and pleasures in sin are not only restrained but taken away in Christ and pleasures in holiness freely given us and implanted in us. Psalm 8 verse 5 Galatians 5, verses 17 and 24, John 4, verse 34, Psalm 40, verse 8, and Psalm 119, verses 14, 16, and 20. We have a new taste and savour, love and liking by the Spirit of Christ, and look on the law not as a burden but as our privilege in Christ. Fifthly, it is a high exalted way above all other ways. Unto this way the prophet Habakkuk is exalted when, upon the failure of all visible helps and supports, he resolves to rejoice in the Lord and joy in the God of his salvation, and making God his strength by faith, his feet should be as hinds feet, and should walk upon his high places. Hebrews 3, verses 18 and 19. These are the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that God has set us in, being quickened and raised up together with him. Ephesians 2, verses 5 and 6. 1. We live high here, for we live not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, and Christ in us, with all his fullness. Romans 8, verses 1 and 2. Galatians 2, verse 20 and chapter 5, verse 25. We walk in fellowship with God, dwelling in us and walking in us. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 16 and 18. And therefore our works are of higher price and excellence than the works of others, because they are wrought in God. John 2, verse 21. And are the fruits of God's Spirit. Galatians 5, verse 23. Philippians 1, verse 11. And we may know that they are accepted and good by our gospel principles, which others have not. Romans 7, verse 6. 2. We are enabled to the most difficult duties. Philippians 4, verses 1 and 3. And nothing is too hard for us. See the great works done by faith. Hebrews 11, Mark 9, verse 23, works that carnal men think folly and madness to venture upon, they are so great, and honourable achievements in doing and suffering for Christ. 3. We walk in an honourable state with God, and on honourable terms, not as guilty creatures to get our pardon by works, nor as bondservants to earn our meat and drink, but as sons and heirs, walking towards the full possession of that happiness to which we have a title. And so we have much boldness in God's presence, Galatians 4, verses 6 and 7. We can approach nearer to God than others and walk before him confidently, without slavish fear, not as strangers, but as such who are of his own family. Ephesians 2, verses 19 and 20. And this prompts us to do greater things than others, walking as free men. Romans 6, verses 17 and 18. John 8, verses 35 and 36. It is a kingly way. The law to us is a royal law, a law of liberty and our privilege, not a bond and yoke of compulsion. 4. It is the way only of those that are honourable, precious in the eyes of the Lord, even his elect and redeemed ones, whose special privilege it is to walk therein. No unclean beast goeth there. Isaiah 35, verses 8 and 9. No carnal men can walk in this way, but only those who are taught of God. John 6, verses 44, 45, and 46. Nor would it have come into our hearts without divine revelation. 5. The preparing this way cost Christ very dear. It is a costly way. Hebrews 10, verses 19 and 20. 1 Peter 3, verse 18. 6. It is a good old way wherein thou mayest follow the footsteps of all the flock. 7. It is the way to perfection. It leads to such holiness which shall, in a while, be absolutely perfect. It differs only in the degree and manner of manifestation from the holiness of heaven. There the saints live by the same Spirit, and the same God is all in all. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 28, John 4, verse 14, and have the image of the same spiritual man. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 49. Only here we have but the first fruits of the Spirit. Romans 8, verse 24, and live by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7, and are not full grown in Christ. Ephesians 4, verse 13. Sanctification in Christ is glorification begun, as glorification is sanctification perfected. If you enjoyed this recording, please support our channel by subscribing, liking, and sharing our content. We would also be happy to receive any comments or feedback below.